Chapter 451 Battle of the Town The Nanai warrior Andrew and the half-elf archer Samira stood aside and witnessed the whole process. Serdak used a dried cow leg to trick the ogre Gulitum into the desolate place of the Padlos Mountains of the Hellanza Guard Camp. The whole process of the local security team. That's right. A few days after joining the Helensa City Guard Camp, the two men finally understood that, after becoming members of the security team of the guard camp, the Helensa City Guard Camp was paid on a weekly basis. And this part of the salary was just right. It offset the part of the remuneration paid in advance by Knight Serdak. Knight Serdak only advanced this part of the salary in advance. The two people were actually working for the Helensa Guard Camp. However, without the recommendation and application of Knight Serdak, the Nanai natives and half elf archers would never have the chance to join the Helensa Guard Camp in their lifetime. Andrew calculated his monthly salary. And it seemed that this part of the salary would be if you take it all out. It should be enough for the ogre to eat a delicious barbecue every week. Although beef is not cheap. With a salary of 15 silver coins per week. Eating beef should not be a problem. Seeing the ogre Gulitum happily holding the dried beef leg in front of him. The indigenous warrior Andrew seemed to see himself yesterday. Andrew remembered that he was squatting at the gate of the airport terminal. Serdak was wearing a suit. The gorgeous magic pattern structure stood in front of him. And then said to himself in an extremely firm tone, Hey, big man, join my security team. His appearance at that time was deeply imprinted in Andrew's heart. No one knows what kind of despair he experienced at that time. He worked hard in the Wazamala City Defense Department for nearly six years. After being injured, he was sent home with only a little bit of repatriation. Jean, for a family of old and young who are waiting for their salary to buy rice for cooking, they can't hold on for long. This is why he has to run to the airport terminal to carry his bags before his injuries heal. After losing his job as a city defense guard, Andrew needed to make money as soon as possible. At this moment, the ogre Gulitum was still holding the hard dried beef leg in his hand, and his eyes showed infinite hope. Just like himself standing outside the airport terminal wall. After seeing that hope, there is a beautiful longing in the eyes. Greetham's eyes seem to have an image of himself running wildly in a desolate wilderness. The team walked outside along the valley. Now that they found the magician guy, the mission of Serdak's reconnaissance team was successfully completed. They did not continue to approach the town of Mangin. But before the H, L dogs arrived. Quickly left the valley. I like the great Gobi. The ogre kept chattering as he followed Serdak. His voice was a little thick. And it sounded like he was playing a drum. It was as if a person had lived alone for too long and was very eager to communicate with other people. So he kept talking along the way. I'm fed up with the humidity and warmth here. The climate is so bad. If I continue to live here, I can't guarantee whether mushrooms will grow in my feet. It's too humid here. Every time it rains, the forest will be full of mushrooms. Serdak couldn't help but glance at his big feet. Those big feet hadn't been washed for an unknown amount of time. They were covered with mud, and the insteps were covered with a layer of moss. A gust of wind blew, and the smell was slightly sour. The ogre Gretum was still chattering at this moment. I've had enough of those bland mushroom soups. I hate everything related to mushrooms. Sometimes after eating mushrooms, my whole body will be covered with red spots. Sometimes, I would fall into a drowsy sleep for several days, seeing countless herds of cattle in front of me. But none of them belonged to me. Of course I knew it was an illusion. But I longed for the illusion to come true. Serdak thought about how to convince the big man to take a good bath. It seemed that he didn't like bathing very much considering that there are no bison in the barren land, and to prevent the ogre from being too disappointed when he arrives there. Serdak decided to introduce some local delicacies to the ogre Gulitum. Soldak said, There is a very delicious gray rock iguana in the deserted land. Put them on an iron drill. Roast them on a charcoal fire until they are golden in color. And then brush them with a layer of secret sauce. And you will know there's more to this world than just roast beef. The ogre wiped the saliva from his mouth and took a lick from the dried beef leg in his hand. The salt on the surface of the dried meat made the ogre narrow his eyes in happiness. Soldak continued, But you have to be alert enough to catch those gray rock iguanas. They are a very delicious lizard. But they usually live in rock crevices. They are the most experienced hunters in the area who want to hunt. It's not an easy task for the gray rock iguana either. Greetham was a very serious listener. When Serdak said this, he immediately touched his big head with his hand, as if he saw himself distressed because he could not catch the gray rock iguana. Andrew walked up from behind and faced the ogre, who was more than three meters tall. Andrew's head could only reach his ribs. He stretched out his hand and pressed the rock-hard muscles of the ogre's body, 
sighing at his heart about the ogre's bloodline inheritance, and then said to the ogre, But it doesn't matter. Maybe Samira has a way. I will do it this morning. I saw her hunting the most famous golden-tailed pheasant in the Maka Plain. Do you know what she did? She ran directly from one side of the forest to the other, chasing away all the golden-tailed pheasants hiding in the grass nest. Come out, and then aim at the golden-tailed pheasants flying in the air. Swish, swish, swish. Everything is so simple. I only need to stand in the forest and pick up the falling golden-tailed pheasants into the basket. It feels like standing it's like picking fruits under the tailor tree. Sirdak saw the half-elf archer Samira selling game under a big tree in the camp in the morning and couldn't help but ask her, By the way, Samira, you have such good arching skills. What about why didn't you come here to hunt these golden-tailed pheasants before? The half-elf archer glared at Andrew fiercely. When he turned to look at Sirdak, his eyes were full of, How do you know I don't come here to hunt? Seeing that Sirdak still seemed to be looking forward to his answer, Samira pointed to the mountain ridge in front of her and said to Serdak, This is the private territory of the nobles of Mejin Town. This mountain forest is the territory of Larkin. In the territory of Earl Lever, outsiders hunting any prey here are considered poaching. They will not restrict the general adventure groups. But if they are local hunters, they will have to pay a certain tax. And the tax officials in Mejin Town are not strict with mixed race. Humans are not that friendly. And usually I would come out here at night. After saying this, Samira smiled. She was often poaching like this. She sighed softly. But when the H.L. dogs come, we can only hide in Wazamala's city. The ogre Greedom also said with deep emotion. These abominable guys have eaten all the edible meat in the forest. Their meat is sour and hard. And their stomachs will hurt for a long time after eating. Aren't there some golden-tailed pheasants? Andrew did not agree with the ogre's statement. The ogre widened his eyes and said confidently to Andrew. Those birds and H. L dogs can't catch them. Do you think I can catch them? You can't be. Do you think I have that much dignity to let other knights in the guard camp accept this new colleague? In the guard camp of Alinsa, Carl saw the ogre sitting under a tree and being watched by a group of knights. He quickly pulled Serdak into a tent and almost pointed his finger on Serdak's head. He was hysterical. He said to Serdak. Serdak sat down opposite Carl calmly. He also knew that it might be difficult for the Hellanza guard camp to accept it over this time. He scratched his head and asked Carl, If I let him be my knight threaten you, that should be okay. Right. He was a little unsure. In this regard, the laws enacted by the Green Empire were actually extremely vague. Carl poured a glass of water and poured it down his smoky throat. He rubbed the corners of his eyes in distress. Serdak's investigation team found the missing magician guy from the valley this time. So his achievements this time were endorsed by the magician investigation team. However, while completing the task, he also got himself a big reward. Trouble. An ogre was brought back. The first time Carl saw the ogre, his head grew three times. Thinking about the countless questions and explanations he had to face because of this ogre, Carl was going crazy again. After this mission is over, help me find a way to bring it back to Helanza City. Serdak lowered his voice and said to Carl. Carl also almost roared out the depression deep in his heart. Toldak, I must remind you that I am the squadron leader of the Helensa City Guard Battalion Support Group. My sister is not married to Marquis Luther. And I am not there are many things I can't do for Marquis Luther's relatives. You can do it. Soldak smiled and comforted Carl. Having been friends for so long, he knew what kind of character Carl was. Carl showed an expression of I can't do anything with you and said feebly to Soldak. That won't be the case. But you may not be able to win so many military honors. For such an ogre from a barbaric land. What do you think? Is it worth it? Serdak nodded seriously and said, It's worth it. As long as you are happy. Carl said somewhat feebly. Before the two of them finished chatting, they heard chaos in the camp. This Count Emmett's voice came from outside the tent. Carl, quickly line up. Marquis Luther's constructed swordsman group is almost here. Carl hurriedly walked out of the tent. He lifted the curtain and just saw Viscount Emmett striding over with a group of squadron leaders. The news of the attack on the small town of May Jean came to the camp in the morning. Unexpectedly, just after the afternoon, the army from Wazimra City immediately arrived here. Carl stared at Viscount Emmett with a puzzled face and asked, How long has it been? Didn't they prepare to break out of the city just this morning? How come they arrived so soon? Seeing that Viscount Emmett did not stop, Carl quickly followed. A squadron leader next to Viscount Emmett said to Carl with a playful smile, I brought two entire regiments of armored swordsmen. 
Do you think those Bena swordsmen need armored knights in front to escape from the age, L dogs? When they come out of the siege, can't they fight their way out on their own? If the H, L dogs dare to fight to the death, maybe the siege of Wazimra city can be lifted today. The most famous of the Bena province is the Bena swordsman. This Count Emmett turned his head and scolded. Where does all this nonsense come from? Hurry up and line up. The squadron leader immediately put away his smile and said to Viscount Emmett, I think Marquis Luther must be eager to capture the town of Meijin at this time. The camp was in chaos at this time. The knights from the guard camp came out of their tents one after another and formed a square formation in the forest clearing. The knights from the Plex guard camp and the knights from the Constantinople guard camp next door also separated. List two square matrices. Ten magicians riding magic harpoons appeared in the sky. These magicians kept hovering over the camp. Then a group of swordsmen appeared at the foot of the mountain. They were wearing gorgeous magic patterned leather armor. Each swordsman carried a double-edged sword on his back. They quickly passed through the jungle. They did not intend to enter the guard camp, but ran all the way to the small town of Meijin. The three guard battalion commanders made a prompt decision and led the next group of guard battalion knights to follow quickly, leaving only a few logistics personnel to guard the station. At dusk, Two regiments of constructed swordsmen from Marquis Luther had arrived outside the small town of Meijin. Marquis Luther and a middle-aged magician stood under a tree outside the town. A map of the town of Mezu was placed in front of him. This Count Emmett stood aside and kept telling Marquis Luther about the town. Situation there. This time, two groups of constructed swordsmen will serve as the main force to attack the town of Meijin, and the magician's magic team will assist in the battle. The mission of the three guard battalions this time is to form an encirclement around the town. Once the H, L dogs in the town are defeated, the three guard battalions can rush into the town of Meijin to do some search and cleanup work. As for the defense work outside the town, the heavy armored infantry regiment will take over. Until dusk, heavy armored infantry regiments are still coming one after another from the direction of Wazamala city. At the beginning of the army of constructed swordsmen, the H, L dogs on the outskirts of the town were killed by the constructed swordsman group and fled. Not long after, all the H, L dogs outside Meijin town had retreated into the town. And a large number of imperial troops began to appear outside the town. Marquis Luther is also patiently waiting for nightfall to start this battle. Although fighting at night has brought great inconvenience to the constructed swordsmen of the constructed swordsman group, it is even more inconvenient for the held dogs. During the period when the two sides were confronting each other, Dozens of giant H, L dogs appeared in the town of Meijin. These giant H, L dogs stood on the rooftops outside the town, staring eagerly at the imperial army outside. Each one the giant H, L dogs were surrounded by dozens of H, L dogs. A three-headed H, L dog was hidden among a group of H, L dogs. The three heads kept looking left and right. At the same time, a large number of H, L dogs slowly gathered in the jungle outside the town. As night fell, the charge horn of the Bene Constructed Swordsman Regiment finally sounded, and a column of swordsmen wearing heavy leather armor rushed towards the town. The H, L dogs in the town seemed to realize that the battle was about to break out, and a group of H, L dogs kept making low roars. Chapter 452 Battle of Small Town 2 The rooftops around the town of Yumizu are crowded with H, lounds with rivers of lava flowing from their bodies. At night, these H, L dogs are like a dark red light band, and the roars of countless H, L dogs are connected together, as a thousand swordsmen from the constructed swordsman corps slowly approached the town. The H, L dogs in the town finally couldn't restrain their ferocious desire to attack. They jumped off the roofs one after another and crossed over to the grass outside the town. Overwhelming them, rushed out of the town and pounced on the oncoming constructed swordsmen. Different from the charge of the constructed knight, each swordsman showed strong personal abilities as soon as he came into contact with the H, L dog. The magical light on the magic pattern structure made the battle at this night particularly gorgeous. The swords in the hands of the swordsmen in the structure seemed to be dyed with various colors. Some long swords were burning with a layer of flames. And some long swords were covered with smoke. There was a trace of cold air. And some long swords were surrounded by a cloud of white air. The moment the H, L dogs pounced on them. Sharp edges burst out from these swordsmen. The hell dogs fangs and claws were no match for the constructed swordsmen. The hell dog rushed forward and was cut in half by a white sword light from a swordsman in front of him while his body was still in the air. As soon as the two sides came into contact, hundreds of H, L dogs were killed by the constructed swordsman with one blow. The corpse of the H, 
L Dog sprinkled a piece of purple blood in the air. And he died before he could even cry out. The H, L Dog behind him rushed towards the swordsman, who sheathed his sword without hesitation. Countless H, L Dogs gave their lives to those behind him. Companions create opportunities to siege the constructed swordsmen. These swordsmen were experienced in many battles. And they did not get disorganized because of the large number of H, L Dogs facing them. However, the real killing weapons hidden among these H, L Dogs are the giant H, L Dogs that are far taller than ordinary H, L Dogs. These H, L Dogs are almost the same size as a one-horned bison. And they have a physical advantage over the giant H, L Dogs. The vicious dogs and the constructed swordsmen are almost evenly matched in battle. And there are actually hundreds of these giant H, L Dogs hidden in the small town of Mainjin. In an instant, although hundreds of H, L Dogs were killed by the constructed swordsmen. These dead H, L Dogs also created opportunities for the giant H, L Dogs to get close. The battle did not go as Marquis Luther imagined before the war. With the constructed swordsmen group rushing into the town with overwhelming force. Instead, they encountered desperate resistance from the H, L Dogs side just after the battle. The number of giant H, L Dogs on the other side was far greater. Several times more than in the intelligence. A giant H, L Dog raised its huge claws. And the sharp claw blades left three claw marks on the chest of a constructed swordsman. Not to be outdone. The constructed swordsman used the long sword burning with flames in his hand to kill the giant monster. The H, L Dog's two front paws were chopped off. Before the construct swordsman could chop off the giant H, L Dog's head, several H, L Dogs took the opportunity to pounce on the construct. The pretend swordsman threw himself to the ground. The constructed swordsman didn't expect that the H, L Dog could be so ferocious. He quickly changed to holding the sword with both hands and lowered his center of gravity. A shadow of a crusader swordsman appeared behind him. He raised his sword and swept across. The crusader swordsman behind him, the shadow, also made the same move. The long sword in the swordsman's hand erupted with a crescent moon-like sword light. The several H, L dogs that rushed towards him almost didn't have a chance to dodge. And they were all slashed by this white sword light. In half, the constructed swordsman was also frightened into a cold sweat. He did not expect that just after the fight, the H, L dog on the opposite side rushed up regardless of casualties, forcing him to take out his trump card. This kind of power involved in the attack consumes a lot of mental energy of the first turn swordsman himself. A newly promoted first turn swordsman can probably only use this attack method once in a battle. The swordsmen in this group of constructed swordsmen are obviously not first level swordsmen who have just been promoted. But they can only perform it two or three times in a battle at best. I didn't expect that the H, L dogs in the small town of Meizu would actually hide such strong combat power. When Viscount Emmett, Earl Collins, and Viscount Owen saw such a battle scene, chills ran down their spines. Fortunately, they went to the guard camp last night. The knights did not attack the town of Meizu rashly. Instead, they lured some hell dogs from the town to a battlefield in a valley in the jungle. If the knights from the guard battalion were to attack the town of Meizu, they might not be able to withstand this wave of hell dogs. Confrontation. But last night, the investigation team that went deep into the town did not see so many giant H, L dogs hiding in the town. And the scout team during the day did not find a large number of H, L dogs around the town of Mainjin. Obviously, these giant H, L dogs were dogs are a force lurking in the small town of Yumiza. The middle-aged magician next to Marquis Luther glanced at the ten magicians behind him and nodded silently to them. These magicians quickly walked out of the team and came to the rear of the battlefield. A group of shield warriors guarding the magician squatted down with their shields in hand. Ten magicians began to recite magic spells at the same time. A stream of hot fire elemental breath was drawn out from all around and converged on the magicians. In front of him, a scorching light appeared in the magic pattern array. And then several fireballs formed instantly. These fireballs are particularly dazzling at night. The fireballs burning fiercely in the dark night keep rolling and rotating. Turning into lines of fire and flying towards the battlefield ahead. Fireballs explode in the places where the H, L dogs are densest. This immediately disrupted the attack rhythm of the H, L dogs. Some H, L dogs were directly ignited by the fireballs. And their bodies were blown apart. The participation of the magicians immediately tilted the balance of victory in the battle to the side of the constructed swordsmen. However, these H, L dogs were not afraid at all. And they tried to keep the constructed swordsmen out of the town despite huge casualties. At this time, 
Dazzling flames appeared on the rooftops of the town opposite. And the H, L dogs guarding the rooftops retreated one after another. Marquis Luther frowned slightly and looked at an officer standing next to him. The officer immediately understood and whispered an order to a subordinate behind him. The ordering soldier standing high up waved the military flag in his hand. And the team behind him a group of long archers quickly moved closer to the edge of the battlefield. A group of little demons burning with H, fire suddenly appeared on the roof of the town. Flames burned in their hands. As soon as they appeared on the roof, they threw balls of fireballs onto the battlefield. These fireballs were not too powerful. It was large. But it caused a lot of trouble for the constructed swordsman group. With the achievements of the held dog, the little advantage the magician had when joining the battlefield was quickly evened out. Carl had a certain understanding of the H, L demons. He and Serdex stood in front of the military formation of the knights in the guard camp and lowered their voices and said to Serdek, Those are Greg! Soldak had never seen such a little devil who could control fire. He didn't know what Gugu meant. So he asked, What is that? Carl said with a look of disgust. That's a little devil who is good at controlling fire. Serdak immediately asked, Son of the devil? Carl quickly looked around and found that no one noticed the conversation between the two and quickly explained to Soldak, They are just low-level little demons. In addition to being good at controlling fire, their bodies are extremely fragile. They are not demons. Son, I said this is all knowledge from the general history of demons in the first grade of the Knight Academy. It seems that you have not learned this. If you want to pass the graduation defense of the Knight Academy, this book is a must-read. Carl's words made Soldak speechless. He wanted to tell Carl that with so many incidents happening one after another in the guard camp, how could he still have time to study at the Knight Academy? But thinking about it, this is his own problem after all. So Soldak swallowed this complaint again. Marquis Luther had already judged this. And the longbow archers mobilized very promptly. The longbow archers standing in the front row fired several flaming arrows. And the flaming arrows would draw several parabolic trajectories in the night sky. It is the most experienced longbow archers who are calibrating the range of the longbow archer group. They will judge the distance between the roof of the town and the edge of the battlefield based on the flaming arrows and pass the data on adjusting the power of the bow string and the pitch angle of the arrow to the entire shooting group. The longbow in the longbow archer group is a standard weapon, and the usual training is to strengthen combat experience. Therefore, when the gidges on the opposite roof smash the second round of fire bombs, the first round of the longbow archer group the rain of arrows had already been suppressed. The fine steel arrow clusters would not cause fatal injuries unless they hit the vital parts of the H, L dog. However, Gidge, who had a huge head on the roof with his thin arms and thin legs, was shot. It is a huge threat. Suddenly, the Gidges on the roof were hit by arrows and fell to the ground. The fire elements were chaotic on the roof, forming small firestorms, and a puff of fire rain exploded with a slight cough. Following this wave of arrows, the constructed swordsman group continued to suppress Yumiza Shao. Dozens of giant H, L dogs were killed one after another by the constructed swordsmen who released their power. The small fireballs of the ten magicians exploded one after another among the H, L dogs. And the H, L dogs were constantly blown into the sky by the small fireballs. The guard battalion knights also received orders from Marquis Luther. Once the constructed swordsman regiment breaks through the town of Main Jean, the three guard battalions will also coordinate with the constructed swordsman regiment to rush into the town and quickly occupy all areas of the town. Clean up the age, lounge in the town. At this time, all the knights in the guard camp took out their shields and swords, walked to both sides of the long archers in the military formation, and waited quietly for the next military order. Several squadron leaders in the Helensa city guard camp have already activated the night halo. Boom, boom, boom. Three consecutive magic bullets of different colors flew out of the town, landed in the Construct Swordsman group and exploded. Although the Construct Swordsman jumped to dodge, the magic flame explosion still affected several Construct Swordsmen. The swords in the hands of several swordsmen exploded with sword light and were still blown away by a fire bomb spit out by the H, L dog. Another magic bullet that fell on the Constructed Swordsman group was an ice bullet. The three Constructed Swordsmen, together with several H, L dogs, were instantly shrouded in ice mist. After the ice mist dissipated, everyone was covered in ice. A thick ice sh. L condenses. The lava magic patterns on the hell dog's body disappeared, revealing its pitch black body, with countless black rock flakes interspersed between its skin. 
the moment it broke free from the ice sh l it was like the three constructed swordsmen biting it the constructed swordsman broke away from the ice sh l a little slower and was immediately thrown to the ground by the h l dog if the three of them had been slower their heads would have been bitten by the h l dog the reaction of several swordsmen was quite fast the moment they broke free from the ice sh l the swords in their hands pierced the throats of the h l dogs but the h l dogs behind them pounced on them and they could only roll to the side without having time to stand up from the grass the last magic bullet with a shadow or a flew toward Serdek. Of course, the three H, L dogs did not discover anything different about Serdek among the thousands of troops. But because Serdek was next to the camp of the longbow archers, this shadow bullet came towards the longbow archers. Under the cover of the dark night, it was not until the shadow bullets crossed the battlefield of the constructed swordsmen that they were discovered by the longbow archers with outstanding eyesight. However, at this moment, it was too late for the longbow archers to escape, and the team captains only had time. Shout, squat down. A shadow bullet, which was completely dark and constantly condensed with shadow aura, fell head on. The knights in the guard camp were hesitating whether to raise their shields for defense when they saw a figure leaping across the crowd, jumping in front of the longbow archers in two big steps, and raised the dwarf chain shield in his hand against the shadow bullet. A double faced, four armed demon statue appeared behind him. At the same time, the shadow bullet exploded in front of Serdek. A ball of violent dark aura instantly swallowed Serdek. And at the same time, a shadow appeared on Serdek's shield. A layer of sacred light. This light is like countless sharp swords, stabbing the exploded shadow bombs into pieces. The shadow aura dissipated immediately, and a rock shield suddenly appeared in front of Soldek, blocking him from the final aftermath of the shadow bullet. Serdek single-handedly blocked all the explosions of shadow bombs. The commander of the Longbow Archer Regiment shouted at the top of his voice. Longbow archers are ready to release arrows. Another round of arrows was shot out. And almost all Gugu on the rooftop of the town opposite fell to the rain of arrows. A three-headed H, L dog that was even larger than the white rock rhino stood on the roof with one paw. Three heads poked out from behind the house. Looking coldly at the battlefield. Its three heads were spitting out three series magic auras of different colors. The eyes of the head on the far left were filled with the breath of fire. The head in the middle was shrouded in an unreal darkness. And the nostrils and mouth of the head on the right were spitting out a trace of cold air. The moment the three H, L dogs appeared, the giant H, L dogs on the field became violent. The half elf archer Samira rolled forward in a small circle. And her lithe body jumped to Serdek's side. She squatted and held a forest bout tightly. At this moment, the hood fell down with her movements, revealing the almost with the face of an elf woman. A ball of green aura lit up in the palm of her right hand that pulled the bow string and her entire right arm bulged instantly. The ball of green aura followed Samira's long bow and turned into a green vine-like arrow. A trace of unbearable pain appeared on Samira's face, but the crystal clear tree vine arrow shot out instantly, like a jumping green light in the night sky. Towards the three H, L evil songs on the distant roof, the dog flew away. Almost at the same time that Serdak blocked the shadow bullet, Samira immediately retaliated, when the tree and vine arrows landed on the heads of the three H, L dogs. They exploded to form a huge tree and vine network. When the three H, L dogs hesitated, the net of tree vines covered the three H, L dogs. Chapter 453 Battle of Small Town 3 A figure with countless afterimages of swords rushed out of the constructed swordsman group. Almost all the H, L dogs in front of him were cut in half by the broad-edged sword with white sword aura in his hand. He moved toward three H, lounge rushed forward. The entire constructed swordsman group exploded with powerful combat power at this moment. And thousands of constructed knights formed an attacking wave. Second level great swordsman. Someone in the crowd behind him burst out in exclamation. That's the leader of the constructed swordsman group. Someone immediately corrected his name. The captain of the swordsman sees the opportunity of the three H. L-headed vicious dogs being trapped in the net of tree vines on the battlefield. Regardless of his own safety. He decisively rushed in front of the three H. L-headed vicious dogs. The constructed swordsman group behind him, he also felt the fighting spirit ignited by the leader, and instantly burst out with stronger fighting power. And the entire swordsman group rushed towards Shaoxin. A ball of sword light burst out in front of the swordsman leader. And 3H, L-dogs were fighting together. The sword light cut out a deep wound on the neck of the eye's head. And the head was almost he was chopped down by the swordsman leader with one sword. 
but the other two heads of the 3H, L-fronted vicious dogs were able to retaliate and sprayed a fire bomb and a shadow bomb at the swordsman leader. The swordsman leader's body turned into an afterimage, dodging the shadow bullets shot by the vicious dog's middle head, and smashed the fire bullets with one sword. The other H, L dogs on the roof rushed towards the swordsman leader one after another. All the attacks were nimbly avoided by the swordsman leader. The swordsman bit his body was light, coordinated and balanced. The captain showed that this is different from the knight charging from the front and piercing the opponent with the knight's spear. The swordsman is more sharp, like a dancer standing on the edge of the blade. Every step is extremely dangerous, but it gives the opponent the pressure is also extremely huge. If you are not careful, you will be cut open by a sharp sword. After Gidge, who was throwing fire bombs, was shot dead by a long archer, the constructed swordsman once again took the initiative on the battlefield. Under a wave of charge, although H, L dogs continue to rush out of the town, but these H, L dogs can't stop these crazy swordsmen. The battle lasted for nearly an hour. Under the cover of magicians and longbow shooters, Marquis Luther's constructed swordsman group successfully entered the small town of Mezu. Serdak pulled the half-elf archer back to the guard camp and saw the bright red blood seeping out of her arm bandage again. He finally understood why the blood vessels and meridians in her arm always exploded. It turned out that she had used her the power she couldn't control backfired and caused a hidden injury to her arm that could not heal itself. Serdak covered her face with the half-elf archer's hood again and said to her cautiously, If you want to save this arm, you should use less of that kind of power these days. The half-elf archer hugged his right arm with his left hand, a trace of stubbornness showing on his delicate face. Soldak, prepare quickly. It's our turn. Carl greeted this restless subordinate in the night team. Oh. Serdak agreed and walked quickly back to his team. Serdak walked back, and the knights around him looked at him with admiration. As he walked in the procession, the knights raised their fists to him and clashed with Serdak's fist to show their deepest admiration. After all, the strength he showed on the battlefield made him the best in the guard camp. There is also a striking big man beside Serdak, standing like a mountain of meat among the knights. In order to avoid being stared at, the ogre Gretum basically sat on the ground while waiting to attack. This Count Emmett's order came down, and everyone began to prepare for the battle. The ogre Gretum stood up from the ground and immediately became a white tower in the dark night. He heard Andrew say that the spoils of the battle belonged to him. And every H, L the heads of vicious dogs are very valuable. So he prepared a linen bag for himself. And in the other hand, he carried his favorite big wooden stick. Serdak could not provide him with armor. But he still found a set of armor for war horses in the guard camp. This is a square armor piece that can protect the body of the war horse. Serdak will wear it. There was a big hole cut in the middle of the armor. And it looked like a small waistcoat with a belly button exposed on the ogre. After it was tied with a leather buckle. It looked a little funny. But at least, it was considered a piece of armor. Originally, Serdak wanted to find a big axe for the ogre. But Greedham thought that a big wooden club would be more useful. After winning this battle, will you have a good meal? The ogre couldn't help but ask Serdak. Andrew said to the ogre on the side. As long as you put the head of the H, L dog you killed in your pocket and bring it back from the battlefield. You can eat canned meat. I guarantee that the stew is the best you have ever eaten. Delicious. The ogre greed and blinked and said seriously. I have eaten it. Except that the outer skin is a bit hard. The rest is really good. I found it from Guy the Magician's magical travel bag. Did you eat it with the skin on? Andrew asked in surprise. Magic Guy also told me to cut it open before eating it. But I don't have a knife. The ogre said shyly, before the two men finished chatting. They heard the attack horn blowing from the guard camp. The three guard battalions formed three sharp arrow formations and rushed towards the small town of Mainchin, because the constructed swordsman group in front had already opened a passage on the battlefield. The knights of the guard battalion did not encounter effective resistance along the way and rushed forward very smoothly. Entered the small town of Mainchin. The ogre shook off Padfoot and Andrew, who followed Serdak closely and rushed into the town with dense houses. The main task of the three guard battalions is to clean up the remaining held dogs in various areas of the town. After defeating the held dog legion guarding the town, the constructed swordsman group must attack the temple of the town as soon as possible to ensure that they can kill those demon sons in the temple. When Serdak rushed into the small town of Mainjin, the constructed swordsman group had already surrounded the three-headed H, L dog. The leader of the great swordsman with the second level strength killed two of the three-headed evil dogs. With a head. 
More than twenty constructed swordsmen surrounded this H. L. Dog. When Serdak rushed in, he only had time to see the swordsman leader leaping high, raising the giant sword in his hand above his head, and instantly erupted with a sword light of more than ten meters, and knocked out the three-headed sword. The huge body of the Hell Hound was split in half. The constructed swordsman group ignored the corpses of the three H. L. Dogs and rushed towards the temple without hesitation. At this time, the knights of the guard camp were vigorously resisted by other H. L. Dogs in the town. This was a life and death battle without prisoners. The ogre greeted him chanted, Can beef! Can beef! He stood out in the town. Many H. L. Dogs rushed out and pounced on him immediately. He rolled up the big wooden stick in his hand. Not only killed the H. L. Dog that rushed towards him, but also destroyed many buildings in the town. He raised his big feet, stepped on the corpse of the H. L. Dog, reached out to grab the head of the H. L. Dog, twisted it hard and pulled off the head of the H. L. Dog, and put it into a linen bag. At this time, Andrew would get close to the ogre to ensure that he would not be attacked by the H. L. Dogs when he sees the loot. Serdak stands in the team of knights. He has an aura of strength, and his role alone is far less than that of a team. With his presence, the strength of the support squadron was greatly improved. Everyone cooperated with each other and rushed into an alley, fighting with the H. L. Dogs on the street. The magician behind the military camp released a low-light illumination technique into the sky over the town, and then rode a magic harpoon directly into the night sky, providing fire support to the constructed swordsman regiment from the air. If you look down at the town of Yumiza from the air at this moment, you will see that the Bena swordsman regiment is like a big net spread out in the town, quickly surrounding it in the direction of the temple. And the knights of the guard camp behind are like with the construct knight as the center. Nearly a hundred combat teams were formed and quickly dispersed in the streets and alleys of the town to eliminate the H. L. Dogs in the town. Serdak still clearly remembered the basement where the boy named Buta was hiding. So under the leadership of the half-elf archer, the knights of the rescue squadron quickly passed through the alleys. There were flames of war and cannibalism everywhere in the alleys. Demon and Andrew fell behind the team, like a sword thrust into the streets deep in the town. Carl followed the team and said to Soldak out of breath, Dak, can you run slower? We rushed a little too deep and are now out of touch with the guard camp. Before Soldak could speak, a squad leader in the team whispered to Carl, Boss, if we don't grab more loot now, other squadrons will rush over soon and we won't be able to grab anything. Seeing his men chasing H, L dogs all over the streets, even if someone was injured in the battle, everyone was fearless and their fighting will was unprecedentedly high. Carl knew that it was not a good time to pour cold water on him, so he could only order the team captains around him. Everyone, be careful. After all, there are still many giant H, L dogs in this town. While Carl was talking, Samira suddenly jumped up on the nearby wall, opened the forest bow, and shot an arrow through the head of a gidge on the roof. A giant H, L dog suddenly jumped out from the roof and threw down a knight from the guard camp, who was rushing in front. Its huge mouth instantly bit his shoulder. Before Carl could call his men to rush to the rescue, he saw the Nanai tribe. The indigenous warrior turned into a white light. Charge. The big axe in his hand struck at the head of the giant H, Lound. The giant dog threw away the falling guard camp knight, opened its bloody mouth, and bit into Andrew's big axe. While wrestling with Andrew, at that moment, a huge wooden stick fell head on and the giant dog hurriedly bit back at the ogre. But Andrew, who was chasing after him, opened a long wound on his body with an axe. The ogre Gretamu did not dodge. His thigh was bitten by the giant dog. He shouted beef, and smashed the giant dog's waist with a wooden stick in his hand. Chapter 454 Combat Guide The Small Town of Yumizu at Night As the knights of the guard battalion quickly captured the streets and alleys of Meizu Town, the longbow archers gradually occupied the commanding heights of the town forming distant fire coverage in all areas of the town. Most of the town was controlled in this way. In the hands of Marquis Luther, the Knights of the Guard Battalion played a significant role in this night battle. No other regiment is as familiar with street fighting as the Knights in the Guard Camp, and can be so skilled in chasing and intercepting these H. L. Dogs that are escaping in the streets and alleys. At the beginning, these H. L. Dogs were still fighting to the death with the Knights in the Guard Camp. But when several consecutive shrill roars came from the direction of the temple, the fighting will of the last remaining H, L dogs in the town quickly collapsed. Continuous fire burst out in the night sky in the direction of the temple. It was a team of magicians riding magic harpoons. 
providing fire support to the constructed swordsman group. Magicians cannot concentrate on reciting magic spells in the air. So almost all magic relies on expensive magic scrolls. Unless necessary. Magicians will not waste the magic scrolls they carry. After all, no one knows how long this battle will take. How long to do it? The cheers of the giant H, lounge that were besieged and killed could be heard everywhere in the town. The giant H, L dog has broken away from the category of low-level H, L monsters. Not only does it have precious fur, but it may also contain this magic core in its skull. Not only can it gain merit in the army, but it can also collect valuable fur and magic core. This is an unstoppable temptation for any fighting team. There are even scenes of some fighting teams fighting for the hell dog in the town. Serdak led the knights of the rescue squadron to quickly move through the small town of Mainjin, and soon found the hiding place of the boy Buta. When the knights held high torches and came to the vent outside the basement, the brave boy Buta just happened to huddle inside the vent, cautiously exploring the situation outside. The corpse of a vicious H, L dog fell in front of Buta with a thud, causing him to quickly retract his head in fright. Then he saw a big foot stepping on the H, L dog whose skin was burning with lava flow, and a big rough skin hand quickly grabbed the H, L dog's head with a click sound. The evil dog's head was forcibly torn off, and purple sticky blood splashed on Buddha's face. The boy stared blankly at the ogre in front of him whose calves were thicker than his. He was so horrified that he couldn't speak for a moment. It wasn't until Serdak's figure appeared in the boy's sight that the boy slowly recovered from his panic. This nightmare-like day of more than a month has allowed him to undergo some transformations, like a rebirth. Although there is fear in his eyes, he is not one of those civilians who only know how to close his eyes and wait for death. The moment he was on the ground, he had several plans in mind. He is bold and careful, physically agile, and calm-minded. Perhaps in the near future, a great warrior will appear in the Maka Plain. The Knights of the Rescue Squadron had no intention of staying here to rescue the townspeople trapped in the basement. Now the town is not completely under the control of Benna's army, and there are still a large number of H, L dogs in the city that need to be cleaned up by the guard camp knights. Eliminating the H, Lounds in the town is the first priority of the rescue squadron. Serdak told Buta that everyone could save themselves first. If there was no way to escape from the basement, then the guard battalion would have to wait until the battle was over before the guard battalion could spare their hands to rescue them. The boy Buta nodded solemnly, and his small figure retracted into the vent with a whoosh, and disappeared in the blink of an eye. Carl on the side didn't understand why Soldak led everyone through most of the town and rushed here with the support squadron. Could it be just to tell the boy in front of him that the Bina army had invaded the small town of Meijin? Please ask the surviving town residents to save themselves? The answer is undoubtedly no. If that's all, obviously there's no need to go to great lengths. Buta disappeared from the vent in the basement. Serdak did not let Carl leave with the combat team, but waited for a while. Night shrouded the small town of Meijin, and soldiers' cries of killing could be heard from all around. From time to time, fires appeared from all over the town and some age, L dogs fled everywhere in the town. As the longbow archers gradually occupied the small town of Meijin, there are fewer and fewer places for the H, L dogs to escape. After only waiting for a short while, Buta's figure reappeared from the vent. He blinked his bright big eyes and looked at the knights in the yard. He bravely climbed out of the vent and came to Serdek. He stood up straight with his short and slender body and said bravely, Master Knight, I want to fight with you. You fight together. Looking at the little guy in front of him whose clothes were torn by the passage. Soldak smiled and touched the soft curly hair on his head and said, Okay, if you are not afraid of death, I promise you. He popped up his thin chest and said very seriously, I'm not afraid of death. My mother was bitten to death by these guys and dragged away. My father also died in front of us in order to push my sister and me into the sewer pipe. I want to do it myself. They take revenge. Serdak glanced at the dark residential area in front of him. The alleys inside were as dense as spider webs. Even in the daytime, the combat team might get lost if they walked in hastily. Serdak asked the boy Buta. I want to hunt down the giant H, L dog hiding in this town. Buta, can you help us? Buta clenched his fists and said to Serdak confidently. Of course. No one knows their hiding places better than me. Okay. Buta, you will be responsible for leading the way and Samira will be on guard, Serdak said to the boy Buta. Carl and the battle team didn't quite understand why Serdak did this at first. But after Buta joined the battle team, he directly replaced the half-elf archer 
and became the guide of the battle team in the small town of Mainjin. The giant H, Lound in the town launched a highly targeted hunting operation. And Carl finally understood what kind of talent Zerdek had found for the team. The combat team passed through a courtyard, crossed a stone arch, and then came from an alley in front to a back alley filled with stench. Butal leaned against the wall and pointed carefully not far ahead, and said to Soldak, There is a big guy lurking deep in the alley at the left turn in front. Note, we can just turn a corner from here. Walk over. But this alley is very narrow and only three or four people can fight the big guy head-on. Zerdak stepped in the alley full of garbage, carefully observed the surrounding terrain, and asked Butaw, Butaw, is there a way to go around it from behind and let our knights intercept it from behind? He was worried that when the giant H, Laun saw the fighting team, he would immediately choose to run away. Butaw covered his mouth with his hand and explained to Soldek, The other end of this alley is a dead end. There used to be a butcher shop in it, so it has always been here. I have a way to take you through it from the side. The roofs here are not too high. And from here, you can go directly to the second floor terrace of this house and onto the roof next door. He pointed to a nearby fire escape. Zerdak ordered the ogre who squeezed out of the narrow door with his waist bent. Britam, when you walk in from the front later, don't be polite when you meet the giant H, L dog. Give me a good beating. It. When the ogre heard that there was no need to continue drilling through the low doorway, he immediately became energetic raised the big wooden stick in his hand, and grunted twice. Saldak then said to Carl and several captains of the support squadron, Carl, you take some people through the roof on the left side of this alley, and Andrew follows Carl. Although Carl expressed his dissatisfaction with Serdak many times in private about Serdak's unauthorized taking of his leadership, he had no objection to Serdak's deployment, and quickly took ten the knight quickly climbed onto the terrace from the safety ladder over there. Serdak told the last remaining knights, I and the others climbed onto the roof from the right. Samira, you also follow me. The group of people quickly split into three groups and disappeared into the night in the alley. Not long after, a giant H, lound with shiny black hair, had a gash on its head. I don't know how badly it was injured. It always shook its head from time to time. And its huge body jumped up the wall with a whoosh. Its sharp claws scratched a few pieces of rubble on the wall. But before it could stand firm on the wall, and extend its head to the roof. It met the team led by Carl head-on. The ogre's big wooden stick had already hit from behind, and the giant dog could only bite the bullet and rush to the roof. Carl stood on the roof and drew his knight's sword and stabbed the giant dog's mandible. Andrew followed behind Carl, carrying a big axe. He smashed into the giant dog's bloody mouth. The giant dog did not dare to bite Carl again, allowing Carl to cut a wound on his neck, and then went back to the alley in embarrassment. The giant H. L dog did not want to face the ogre chasing from behind. The moment his body fell into the alley, it bounced up again. Its sharp claws scratched several deep claw marks on the stone wall, and its body climbed towards the opposite wall. This time it rushed towards the roof, preparing to escape over the roof. Just after the giant dog completely climbed onto the roof, it was discovered that there was a group of knights standing on the ridge. Serdak held the dwarf chain shield and gave the giant dog no chance to breathe. The shield exploded with a layer of silver light and hit the giant dog instantly. With a bang sound, the giant dog fell from the roof. In midair, he was hit again by an ogre wielding a big wooden stick. The body flew sideways for more than 10 meters and hit the wall at the end of the alley with a bang, making a big hole in the wall. The collapsed rocks almost buried most of the giant dog's body. The ogre strode to the front of the ruins. He stepped on the belly of the dying giant dog and smashed the giant dog with a stick until it breathed its last breath. With almost no effort, six giant H, L dogs were eliminated one after another, including countless ordinary H, L dogs. However, for hiding places of giant H, lounge were subsequently cleared out. Most of the town of Mei Jin had been captured by Bina's army, and the giant dogs that usually hid in the town were also dispatched to join the battle. At this time, they were probably hunted by other combat teams. Unable to find any more giant dogs, Buddha seemed a little uneasy at the next moment, and he reluctantly smiled at everyone. Sorry, they seem to have left, Buddha said. Carl took the initiative to stand up at this time, patted Buddha on the shoulder, and comforted. This is not your fault. There is more than just our team fighting in this town, and with the results we have now, it has been very long. Not bad. Although Carl's words were the sentiments of many knights in the battle team, they could not comfort Buddha. He seemed a little depressed. But when he led everyone out of a messy alley, 
he saw the big bell tower a few hundred meters away. Butaw's eyes lit up. And he quickly pointed there and said, In that bell tower there were originally some little monsters that were all on fire. When they first came in, they burned down a lot of houses in the town. And then, they lived in the clock tower for some reason. I didn't dare to get close. For fear of being discovered by them. A quarter of an hour later, Carl's combat team occupied the clock tower in the small town of Limousin and killed four Gidges hiding in the oil tank in the gear room. This kind of fire-controlling monster is also the lowest existence in the Flaming Age, L. Their bodies are weaker than those of Kobolds. Although they can throw fire bombs, the power of the fire bombs they throw is not very good, and they do not form a certain amount of fire bombs. Gitch had no fighting ability at all. The knights in the guard camp were wearing armor and killed them almost effortlessly. Although these guys don't have much ability, their number is much smaller than that of H, L dogs. So the military department rewards a lot of merit points. The boy Budok pointed to an alley where he fought and muttered with some annoyance. There should be a giant H, L dog on this street. As the battle progresses, the H, lounge in the town become increasingly difficult to find. Several combat teams encountered along the way even began to expect Serdak to take action to treat the wounded. Serdak felt that the sound of the battle in the direction of the temple was gradually weakening, especially when the magician's fireball stopped exploding. He realized that the battle in the town was probably coming to an end. So Serdak quickly changed his mind. He asked Buta beside him. Buta, if those giant H, L dogs in the temple want to evacuate the town, which road can they take to leave the town as quickly as possible? The boy immediately began to think seriously. Then he looked in the direction of the temple and said to Serdak, I know this. After going through several alleys, the boy finally stopped on a street near an inland river. He told everyone that this road was the only way to leave the town of Mezu from the temple, because the temple originally had a huge fountain. Therefore, there is a dedicated inland river leading to the temple. If you don't want to cross the inland river, you have to walk along the river for a while. And this is obviously the only way to go. Carl and a group of guard camp knights were crouching on the roof. They saw several H, L dogs quietly walking out of the dark alley. And a giant H, L dog was hiding the figure of a little devil. Everyone finally came to their conclusion. He was convinced by Serdak's keen combat intuition. And the half-human, half-dog body of the little devil lying on the giant dog is terrifying. As if it is a demonic face growing on the body of a H, L dog. But it is obviously still a cub. Even himself he can't walk yet. But the face full of symbols is really scary. And there are devil's horns on the top of his head. Carl resisted the discomfort and said, Is this the son of the devil? Serdak ignored his knowing question and just ordered the half-elf archer beside him. Samira, first shoot the little devil riding on the back of the giant H, L dog. Chapter 455 Your Name The inland river in Meijin town is one of the main water sources for the residents of the town. Compared with the limited wells in the four areas of the town, the inland river provides Meijin town with a more convenient water source. The plantations in the city can be irrigated as usual and the residential areas can be irrigated as usual. There are some simple canals for bathing and washing. And some drainage ditches are also built along the river. The stone roads built along the inland river are wider and flatter than in other areas. The grassland and flowering trees on the river bank are surrounded by stone foundations. And many trees are covered with smooth pebbles and fine sand. The small town of Meizu has been occupied by H. Lounds for nearly a month. But this area still looks quite clean and tidy. There are only dried blood stains somewhere indicating that some horrific tragedies have occurred here. But under the cover of Night Next, everything is not so obvious. A group of H, L dogs walked quickly through the stone road built along the inland river. On the back of one of the giant H, L dogs was a devil's son with horns on his head. The devil's son was only a few days old and his body was covered with a layer of blood. He had dark hair and a pair of purple magic eyes staring around nervously. But the giant H, loud carrying it looked back at it from time to time. Suddenly, a mountain of meat appeared at the end of the stone road ahead. An ogre with a wooden stick in his hand blocked the way of the pair of H, L dogs. The H, L dogs were almost lying on the ground, raising their heads towards the ogre. Mogolitum barked. The ogre waved his big wooden stick without fear and rushed forward. His big feet stepped on the ground, and his footsteps sounded like war drums. The three H, L dogs clamped their tails between their legs, curled up and barked at the ogre. The lava flow on their backs emitted the most dazzling light, blocking the middle of the road, trying to prevent the ogre from approaching. The ogre stood it was like a mountain of meat on the street. 
The big wooden stick in his hand was hitting the three H L dogs. The three H L dogs jumped away in all directions. However, although they were agile, they still did not escape from the four meter long dog. Lots of sticks. As one H L dog was hit by the ogre, it let out a miserable, whimpering sound. The other two H L dogs seemed to be frightened. Their backs were pressed to the ground, and their legs were lifted up to make a continuous miserable sound. Scream. The rest of the H, L dogs took the opportunity to quickly retreat to the rear. Only the indigenous warrior Andrew and a few knights appeared on their retreat. Only then did the giant H, L dogs realize that they were surrounded by layers of waves. One side of the road was surrounded by waves. On the other side of the sparkling inland river is a row of small buildings facing the street. Soldiers besieging the road appeared in both directions. And the H, L dogs advanced and retreated. The hellhound possesses the flow of lava and is extremely repellent to river water. So they looked towards the roof of the townhouse on the roadside. Serdak and a team of knights stood on the roof, holding swords and shields and looking down at these H. L. dogs eagerly. Just when they discovered these guard camp knights, the half-elf archer Samira stood on the high roof attic. On the night, she was so calm that she almost blended into the night. The forest bow in her hand was like an extension of her arm. She opened her arms fully pulled the bowstring under the knight, and focused on a wisp of nature in the arrow in her hand. Interest. The next moment, the feather arrow in Samira's hand turned into a vine dyed with wood and flew out of the forest bough, and then exploded on the back of the giant H, L dog. Countless vines grew rapidly, and the entire devil's sun wrapped in a kind of green vines. These thorny vines turned into countless sharp spikes, piercing the body of the devil's sun from all directions. The devil's horn on the forehead of the devil's son erupted with huge magic power fluctuations. It didn't even cry out before being penetrated by several vines and died. The giant H, L dog let out a shrill roar and pounced toward Samira, who was standing quietly on the roof with her forest bow folded and holding her right arm. The giant H, L dog jumped five or six meters high. He easily ran up to the roof, but was stopped by Serdak, who was waiting on the roof with his shield. The remaining H, L dog indigenous warriors Andrew and the ogres and a group of knights from the guard camp attacked the remaining H L dogs on the street. In just a moment, the ground was turned into dog corpses. The ogre happily tore off the heads of all the H L dogs and threw it into the pocket that was already bulging to the point of bursting. As for the giant H L dog on the roof, its defeat was doomed from the moment it jumped onto the roof. It was almost impossible to stand on the roof with four legs. Every step, he took was likely to break the rubble and sink. The giant H, Loun seemed to be stuck in a mire, and it was heavily surrounded on the roof and had no way to retreat. Serdak swung the dwarf chain shield to knock out the giant H, L dog, and several knight spears took turns piercing the giant H, L dog's head. Carl gasped, standing next to the huge giant H, Loun, watching its head being pinned to the roof by several knight spears. He decisively raised the knight's sword in his hand, and slashed the giant sword several times. The head of the age, Lound was chopped off. The small-scale fighting that broke out on the bank of the inland river subsided after only a quarter of an hour. Just when the knights in the battle team began to collect their trophies, at the end of the long street, a three-headed H, L dog broke through the dark fog and appeared in front of everyone. Its body was as strong as an adult white rock rhinoceros. One of the, the heads stared in front. One head looked behind. And the middle head saw the son of the devil, who died tragically by the river. The three H, L dogs let out an angry roar. And three magic bullets shot out from the three H, L dogs in no particular order. Spewed out from the dog's mouth. The ogre is squatting by the river. Ready to reach out to grab the corpse of the devil's son entangled in thorns. An inexplicable uneasiness suddenly arose in his heart. Just like the feeling of being targeted by an adult flying dragon, when he encountered the revenge of the flying dragon group in the tribe. He was still very young at that time and was no match for the adult flying dragon. In the face of death, the power of his ancestors will give him some enlightenment, allowing him to escape misfortune. At this moment, the ogre felt like this, so he quickly retracted his hand, held his head in his hands, curled up and rolled to one side. A ball of fire exploded from the side of the ogre, and the flames instantly swallowed the ogre's body. Greedom was blown into the air and fell into the river. Two knights from the guard camp, who were on guard duty on the outside decisively raised their spears, emerged from behind the low wall, and stabbed the ribs of the three H, L dogs with their spears. However, the three H, 
L dogs had three heads and three pairs of eyes. He was watching the surrounding situation at a 360 degree angle. The moment the spear appeared, the 3H L dogs had already turned their heads. Just as the spear stabbed 3H L dogs, two heads bitten two guard camp knights at the same time. The sharp teeth bit through the hard metal armor, and the two guard camp knights screamed in agony. Andrew got ahead of the 3H lounge and grabbed the body of the devil's son in his hands. The 3H L dogs abandoned the two guard camp knights and rushed towards the indigenous warrior Andrew. Serdak immediately jumped down from the roof and blocked it in front of it. Carl also jumped off the roof quickly and stood side by side with Soldak. The two of them held swords and shields and stood side by side with Andrew. Three hells the vicious dog pounced on him without hesitation. It was extremely difficult for Soldak, Carl, and Andrew to face such a H. L monster whose strength had reached the mid-level third level. Although Andrew has awakened the berserker soul in his body, he does not control all the power of his body. And without the blessing of the power of the magic pattern structure, his own strength is a bit lower than that of the 3H, L dogs and 1H, L dog. The head was bitten. And even if Andrew tried his best, he was forced to take a few steps back and was surrounded by danger. In contrast, Carl's situation is better than Andrew's relying on the magic pattern structure on his body. Carl raised his shield to block the bite of one head of 3H, L dogs. At this time, he discovered that these 3H, L dogs could actually fight on three fronts. The three heads not only had independent with their own thinking, they can also coordinate and cooperate with each other. This three-headed H, L dog has powerful power and can twist Carl's shield into shape with one bite. Serdak was able to carry the most powerful head among the 3H, L dogs alone and the dwarf chain shield in his hand erupted with layers of silver light. Possessing the blessed body, it is still inferior to the 3H, L dogs in terms of power. However, the sacred aura in the body just restrained the black magic bullet on the middle head. Serdak raised his shield to block the 3H, L dogs again. Pounce and bite, and see Andrew being forced back by the lava ejected from the mouth of the 3H, L dogs. He quickly threw out the craftsman's sword in his hand, and the craftsman's sword hit the hell dog's eye socket hard. The lava spewing from the hell dog's head with the power of fire stopped abruptly, and it looked at Serdak fiercely. Coming over, Andrew was able to take a breather, and opened a long wound on the face of the 3H, L dogs with an axe. The ogre crawled out of the river covered in wounds, and saw Serdak, Carl, and Andrew locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat with 3H, Lounds. Samira on the roof was being chased by 3H, L dogs, and was jumping around. Although there was no danger for the time being, she could not provide any help to the battlefield here. Other guard camp knights were surrounding. But before anyone could rush to help, five more giant H, L dogs jumped out from behind the three H, L dogs. The combat team of the support squadron immediately fell into chaos. Even if there were powerful warriors like Ogre, the battle situation was instantly reversed after five giant vicious dogs joined the battle group. Two giant H, L dogs relied on their huge strength advantage, biting the knights of the guard camp one after another. In just a short time, two knights were bitten by giant H, L dogs and were seriously injured, and fell to the ground. The three H, Lounds put on a desperate stance and spit out black magic bullets and fire bombs continuously. Serdak and Andrew were chased by the three H, Lounds and fled in all directions. Even the ogre was chased by the three H, Lounds. The fire bombs forced them not to come near. Although Carl is a construct knight, his own strength is not outstanding. And he is extremely lacking in combat experience. He also has the most difficulty facing the 3H, L dogs. Although he faces the one who controls the power of ice among the 3H, L dogs. This head is the weakest. But it is still forced by this head to be unable to fight back. Just under Carl's negligence. The knight's light shield in his hand was bitten by the vicious dogs. Carl was also pulled close to the 3H, L dogs. He was about to be hit by an ice bullet. A blast of ice exploded behind Soldak. A two-faced, four-armed demonic shadow appeared. The shadow stretched out two golden hands to protect Carl. The ice bullet hit the big golden hand. And the demon shadow behind Serdak quickly disappeared. But the golden hand of the demon shadow helped Carl block the fatal blow. Carl sat on the ground with a pale face. Breathing heavily, his face covered with sweat and blood. And Serdak held the holy light torch in his hand a ball of incandescent flame flickering in the night wind. The three vicious H, L-Dog sprayed a black magic bullet at Serdak. 
completely extinguishing the flames on the holy light torch. The three heads actually gave up on Carl and Andrew, and bit at Serdak at the same time. Su Erdak tried his best to block the middle one with his shield, and hit the head of the power of flame with the holy light torch in his hand. But the other head spitting out ice air bit towards Serdak's waist. Serdak had no way to avoid it, and was unable to block it. Just before the head bit Serdak, a sword beam broke through the night sky from the roof. Like a beam of light shining on the three H, L dogs. The heads of the three H, L dogs with the power of ice immediately raised their heads and opened their mouths to swallow the sword light. However, they saw a dazzling sword light erupting from the sword light. The three H, L dogs did not dare to he resisted hard and spit out an ice shield. The sword light instantly twisted the ice shield into a piece of ice powder. At the same time, dozens of constructed swordsmen jumped onto the roof one after another, occupying the most advantageous position on the battlefield. 3H, L dogs were also under the sword light, and the heads of the ice power were cut off with a single sword. The sword light dissipated, and the leader of the constructed swordsman group appeared in front of the 3H, L dogs. The pressure of the second level strongman made the 3H, L dogs immediately turn around and run away. Serdak was not willing to let this H, L dog escape at this time. The holy light torch in his hand hit the middle head of the H, L dog hard. Andrew on the side also waited for the opportunity and rolled under the 3H, L dogs. Taking the opportunity to slit the abdomens of the 3H, L dogs with an axe. The 3H, lounge roared at the top of their lungs and collapsed onto the long street. After more than a dozen constructed swordsmen joined the battle, everyone quickly dealt with these H, L dogs. Only then did Buta, who was hiding in the shadow of the roof, run out tremblingly and look at the three strongest H, L dogs in the town. He was also beheaded, and his face was still pale with fear. The leader of the swordsman group stood in front of Carl and Soldek. He could tell at a glance that they were the captains of this combat team. He said to them gently, Which guard battalion are you from? Knights? If your guard battalion is as strong as you, I will never dare to slander the knights in the guard battalion in front of the Marquis in the future. Young lads, well done. Cal, the commander of the Helensa City Guard Battalion's response squadron, has met your excellency. After saying that, he didn't forget to secretly kick Soldak with his foot to signal him to take the initiative to introduce himself. Helensa City Guard Battalion Relief Squadron Sheriff Soldak of the desolate land of Mount Paglos has met your excellency. Serdak quickly saluted the leader of the constructed swordsmen with a knightly salute. Chapter 456 The Guard Camp is not a shelter. The war-torn town of Mei Jean finally ushered in the dawn of the next day. Overnight, the H, L dogs in the town were completely eliminated by Benna's army. There is no doubt that Marquis Luther's battle deployment this time was very successful. Two regiments of constructed swordsmen and a heavy armored infantry unit the corps. A long archer regiment and three guard battalion knights successfully occupied the small town of Yumizu and destroyed all the strongholds in the town that were breeding the sons of devils. Except for a succubus who took advantage of the chaos and took away a devil child. Almost no other devil children escaped from the town, breaking through the clouds on the horizon. A morning sun gradually rose from the horizon. In this jungle land, the night quickly receded. The members of the rescue squadron combat team standing on the roof of the town suddenly saw a figure with dark gray flesh wings flying in the sky. She had human limbs and head, except for a pair of wings on her back. Looks more like a passionate and unrestrained green empire woman. Her eyes are full of hatred, and she holds a demon child in her arms. There were several arrows stuck on her fleshy wings, which were constantly flapping in the air, and trailing behind her was a tail with a sharp barb at the end like an anchor. She spread her wings and glided in the air for a certain distance. But wherever she went, the long archer standing on the roof shot arrows that penetrated the clouds one after another. Her body was very flexible, and she occasionally slid out in the air. The S-shaped arcs avoided the rain of arrows shot from the roof. A group of magicians followed closely behind on magic shackles. Fire bombs and wind blades roared from behind. The succubus seemed to have a pair of eyes behind it, flying nimbly through the fire bombs and wind blades. Serdak was a little confused. Marvel at this succubus's remarkable flying skills. The boy Buta was sitting on the roof terrace eating half a piece of scone. When he saw the succubus being chased by the magician investigation team, he asked Serdak curiously, What is that? Serdak rubbed his eyes and withdrew his gaze from the sky. The morning sun was also particularly dazzling. Serdak lowered his head and looked at Buta and said to him, It should be a succubus. I once worked in magic. 
I've seen a similar one in a glass jar in the Union Terbarium. And it's said to be a low-level intelligent creature from the Hell Demon Clan. Carl stood next to Soldek, looking up at the succubus's back gradually disappearing into the sky, and said in a tone of sour grapes, I heard that they have the most perfect female bodies, but so a pair of fleshy wings is really disgusting. In the aristocratic society of the Green Empire, elves, Janna mermaids and succubi are all high in goods that are coveted by nobles with special habits. These are far more advanced than those lizard women and dwarf women. However, due to the upper class society of the Green Empire, there are still some alliances with the nobles of the Silver Moon Elves, and there is some close strategic connection. Therefore, elf slaves, like orc slaves, are banned in the Green Empire. Unlike the prohibited sale of elven slaves, Orc slaves are not only for sale according to certain laws of the empire, just because the powerful orcs will hunt down those who sell orc slaves all over the world. Buddha took a bite of the dry wheat cake and drank another mouthful of hot soup. He would automatically ignore the words he didn't understand. Seeing the short boy sitting obediently on the roof, Carl secretly pulled Serdak aside. Carl put his arm on Serdak's shoulder and asked Serdak privately, Dak, you don't want this kid to join your security team. Do you? There was some worry in his eyes. He didn't want to take the blame for Serdak. So he took precautions as early as possible and wanted Serdak to give up this idea early. In fact, Serdak really has no intention of absorbing Buta into the security team. After all, Buta is too young. He can't help Serdak do anything in the security team. And Serdak doesn't have the patience to spend a few years. Teach a child that there are a lot of things waiting for him to do in the village of Vol and the Knights. Serdak spread his hands and said, of course not. Buta is just very familiar with this town. I have no intention of taking him away from here. Hearing Suldak's promise, Carl breathed a sigh of relief, patted his chest and said, That's good. I'm really worried that you will drag a child under 10 years old from Mejin Town to join your security team. That's the biggest joke in our guard camp. Serdak smiled and said nothing. In fact, he really wanted to tell Carl, hoping that when he saw Buta in a few years, he could still say such words. Buddha's bravery, keen perception of danger, sense of survival in dangerous situations, and perseverance in difficulties all indicate that he will grow up rapidly in the next few years. After this plane war, his body a powerful seed has been planted. As long as he is given a little time, he will be the best warrior in the Maka plane. The things Buddha has experienced are not comparable to those of the academy students in the Night Academy. Soldat glanced in the direction of the basement and said to Carl, I just think it's time for us to fulfill our promise. Promise? Carl asked doubtfully. Regardless of Serdak, Carl probably forgot that there was a group of survivors trapped in the basement over Buta. Serdak leaned close to Carl's ear and lowered his voice and said, I promised him that when we occupy Mejin Town, we will help him rescue the survivors of Mejin Town from underground. Carl asked with some astonishment. Those people hid in the basement and were trapped in there and couldn't get out. Did they bury themselves? Serdak whispered. How else do you think they avoided the search of those H, L dogs? When discussing these topics, you should avoid Buta as much as possible to avoid irritating Buta if you say something wrong, which would be more gain than loss. Of course it's no problem. No one is better at this than us, Carl said, patting his chest. He is such a warm-hearted person with the greatest good intentions in his heart, which reminds Soldak of the first time he met Carl. The combat team of the support squadron did not participate in the subsequent search mission of the guard battalion knights in the town of Mainchin. Carl asked Buta to lead the combat team to find a blacksmith shop first, and found some tools such as picks and crowbars from the blacksmith shop. A group of knights carried these rescue tools across the town of Mezu, and led by Buta back to the basement yard. The knights of the guard camp had a full understanding of the architectural pattern of the empire, and quickly found the correct location of the basement with the help of Buta because the entrance to the basement had been buried in the ruins of a building, and they wanted to remove the chaos. Clearing out the stone cannot be completed in a day or two. Carl took the advice of the knights in the support squadron, found the location of the basement, and dug directly from above. A group of knights wielded pickaxes and dug down in the garden of this house. The basement was not too deep, and in order to avoid collapse, a lot of reinforcement work was done on the roof of the basement. It was only two meters dug down from the garden grass. It was so deep that it already touched the compacted layer of lus on the roof of the basement. This layer of soil was so hard that it took the knights of the guard camp half a day to dig down to the brick layer of the arched dome. A knight pried open a brick with a pickaxe in his hand. 
and found a dark hole inside. Excited exclamations came from the basement. The combat team rescued more than 20 survivors from the town of Mainjin. These survivors were already starved to death in the basement. They hid in the basement for nearly a month. After all the food stored in the basement was eaten. Relying only on some food that Buta gets back from the vents every day. But Buta is still young after all. And he also has to avoid the H. L dogs patrolling the town. He can get it in a town surrounded by H. L dogs. Food is not easy to come by. So these foods cannot meet everyone's needs. It is the greatest gift to them that no one has starved to death for so many days. After the survivors of the Meijin town saw the light of day again, what they saw was the ruins of the Meijin town after the gunpowder smoke. 23 town residents stood on the rubble and gravel. Looking at the dilapidated Meijin town, the streets except for some Bena soldiers, there were almost no other people on the ground. Many people instantly collapsed and sat helplessly on the ruins. A middle-aged nobleman took the initiative to stand up. He could tell at a glance that Kaikar and Suldak were the captains of this team. After expressing his gratitude to the two, he began to ask about the situation outside. Most of the residents of Meijin Town did not survive this war. The Hell Dogs chose Meijin Town as their breeding base. Probably because the town was densely populated. All the residents of the town were hunted by the Hell Dogs. After it was transported to the temple, there was a real Shura field. According to Carl's understanding, only a small number of people in the town of Mejin fled the town with a noble armed force and arrived safely in Wazimra city. The middle-aged noble's face turned pale. After listening to Carl's introduction to the situation, he sat on the ruins for a long time, covering his heart and being speechless. A little girl hugged Buta tightly. She was crying. However, it seemed that she was well taken care of by everyone. If there is anyone in this group of survivors who looks the best, it is obviously Bibu. The little girl, who is one head shorter than the other, has glistening tears hanging on her almost cute little face. Don't worry. Wazamala City has already issued a resettlement order for the survivors of this plane war. They will not become homeless wanderers, Carl whispered to Serdak. Obviously, he was still a little worried that Serdak would take in the boy Buta if his heart softened, which was not in line with war doctrine. The H, L dogs have been temporarily defeated, and the living people have to rebuild their homes. However, currently, Neither the Constructed Swordsman Regiment, nor the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, nor the Guard Battalion Knights can stay in the small town of Meizu for a long time. And Meizu was destroyed. The H. L. Dog breeding ground in the town. I am afraid that Marquis Luther will lead the Constructed Swordsman Group to fight everywhere next. The Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment and the Guard Battalion Knights did not receive orders to garrison the town of Yumizu. And they did not even build any defenses for the town. Marquis Luther had no intention of allocating his limited troops to this ruined town. The combat team led by Carl hunted H. L. Dogs everywhere in the town of Mezu. With Buta's familiarity with the town of Mezu, Carl's combat team became one of the teams with the most fruitful results. And this hunting only lasted one day and one night. The fire in the temple also lasted for a day and a night. The bones of countless town residents were burned to ashes in the temple. Finally, the middle-aged magician of the magician investigation team took out an earth-type collapse magic scroll and raised the ruins of the temple to the ground. A total of 35 town survivors were rescued during this attack on the small town of Meijin. These survivors erected an unwritten stone tablet in front of the temple. At the bottom of the stone tablet, there was only one line written by the town to commemorate those who died in the war, people who died in the plain war. It is said that the names of the victims of the town will be filled in the empty spaces on the stone tablet after the war in the Maka Plain ends. And even if hundreds of names can be written on one stone tablet, if all the names are written down, it is estimated that these stone tablets can be enough to surround the temple. On the morning of the third day after occupying the town of Meizu, the magician investigation team discovered that a large number of H. L. dogs were gathering in the town of Meizu. Marquis Luther didn't want the constructed swordsman corps to be held back by the H. L. dogs around Vatsamala city. So Wazamala City dispatched 10 magic airships and evacuated all the Bena troops from Meijin Town that day. Came out, and of course took away 35 survivors of Meijin Town. The two regiments of constructed swordsmen were rushing to the next combat location to join the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, Long Archer Regiment, and Heavy Cavalry Regiment there. The Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment and Long Archer Regiment participated in the Battle of Yumiza Town. The three guard battalion knights temporarily took the magic airship to return to Wazamala City to rest and recuperate. Because the town of Meijin is not far from Wazamala City, 
The magic airship cannot rise to high altitudes and fly rapidly with the help of wind. Therefore, it can only rely on the flotation device and booster on the magic airship to move forward slowly. The guard battalion knights arrive it was also the night of the same day in Wazamala City. The airport terminal of Wazamala City was filled with various magic airships. It was as if all the magic airships in Bina province had gathered in the Maka Plain. Countless airships were still continuously transporting various supplies from Wazamala City. Of course, there were also some airships rushing back from the outside with supplies. All these material airships had to make way for the troop transport airships. The knights of the guard camp did not wait too long before they left the airport terminal in formation and returned to their station in the city. The square near the main city gate. Buta and his sister were to follow the survivors of Mejin town to accept resettlement in Wazamala city. At the entrance of the airport terminal, Serdak and Buta said a simple farewell. Serdak handed over two gold coins. She secretly gave them to Buta and said to him, Hide them better and don't bring them with you. I really hope you don't need these. Buta, protect your sister well. I hope we can meet again one day. Buta nodded solemnly and stuffed two golden coins into his pants. Then he took the hand of the confused little girl and quickly followed the survivors and boarded a carriage in the resettlement camp. The carriage gradually moved away. And Serdak looked away. It was only at this moment that he completely gave up the idea of keeping Buta. Chapter 457 Sleepless Night The knights of the guard battalion returned to the square station with a large amount of loot on their backs. The feeling of victory was indescribable. The knights dragged their tired bodies to set up tents while discussing the gains and losses of the battle. Soon the square was filled with white tents like fish scales. Although the situation in the Maka Plain is still very serious, there are already many war merchants who came after hearing the news and are waiting outside the square station hoping to establish relationships with the knight commanders of the three guard battalions and conduct a round of war supplies and trophies. Transactions. But there are also some merchants who will contact some knights privately, offer better prices, and strive to trade some loot. The fountain in the center of the square has long been surrounded by a curtain, and it has become the bathroom of the guard camp. The first thing the knights of the guard camp did after putting down their bags was to take off their armor and wash themselves in the fountain. The dirt and blood stains need to be scrubbed repeatedly with a brush to clean them thoroughly. A huge torch with a base was lit outside the bathroom, illuminating the place brightly. In order to prevent the knights of the three city guard battalions from concentrating on bathing and causing some unnecessary conflicts, the commanders of the three guard battalions decided to divide the washing time, and the knights from the same city would wash together within a fixed period. The two teams that arrived at the square also lined up behind the Plux guard camp during the wash time. Serdak and Andrew set up the marching tent. Due to the huge size of the ogre, this kind of marching tent is obviously not suitable for him. Fortunately, the climate of the Maka Plain is warm and pleasant. Serdak found a few he built a pergola next to his tent with a wooden pole and bought a straw mat from a local businessman, which gave the ogre Gulitum a decent temporary residence. Half-elf archer Samira couldn't wash up at the fountain in the square. As a Wazamala native, the guard camp had just arrived in the square to set up camp and half-elf archer left the camp carrying a bag full of loot. Soldak and Andrew sat by the fountain, using a brush to clean off the sticky purple blood on the armor. This purple blood dried like a scab and stuck to the surface of the armor, making it very difficult to clean. Andrew tried using a brush. After brushing it for a few times, he threw the brush aside and complained to Serdak. In the past, when I came home and licked my fingers, people would rush to do it. I thought it was very simple to clean the armor. One thing, now that I have cleaned it up, I realize that it is really not easy. After the Helensa Guard Battalion returns to Wazamala City, it will enter a period of rest and recuperation. Therefore, the senior guards of the Guard Battalion do not restrict the freedom of the knights. As long as they ask for instructions from their superiors and note the itinerary, they will basically get approval. Soldak guessed that Andrew probably wanted to visit his family. So he asked him, Would you like to go home and see? Andrew was slightly startled and looked at Soldak with a puzzled expression. Serdak soaked the magic pattern armor in the pool at his feet and said to Andrew, While our guard camp is still in Wazimra City, if you have time, go visit your family more. You can take your trophies with you and deal with them yourself. If you feel it's a bit troublesome to deal with it yourself, you can also hand it over to the guard camp. But it's usually difficult to sell it for the highest price. The only advantage is that it's convenient. You don't need to deal with merchants yourself, and you won't encounter scammers. After speaking, Serdak filled a clay pot with water, raised it to his head, and poured it down. 
The burn scars on his body have faded a lot, but they still look a bit shocking every time he takes a shower. He doesn't know what kind of fire he went through before to leave so many scars. Andrew also has many scars on his body, especially his arms and legs, which are covered with many scars caused by being bitten by H. L. Dogs. Now these scars have scabbed and fallen off, revealing tender pink new flesh inside. In recent days, the hidden injuries on his body have also improved rapidly under the blessing of the blessed body. Andrew stood up from the edge of the pool and asked excitedly, Captain, can I ask for leave and leave the guard camp? Serdak glanced at him in surprise. He couldn't remember when he said he was not allowed to leave the camp. So he said, Of course, but be careful that you have to come back every two days to cancel your leave. It may happen at any time after the guard camp rests. When you receive a new mission, when it's time to set off, no one will be waiting for you here, and you will also have to accept the punishment of the guard camp. Then I'll go back first. I really want to share the joy of victory with my family. Maybe I can let them have a good meal. Andrew said, as he put on the wet linen shirt again, and put on a whole set of clothes. There was no clear and clean armor, and a giant axe trapped together. He carried it behind his back, and strode out of the square camp with a wet body. The ogre on the side was much simpler. Sitting in the corner of the fountain, constantly raising the barrel above his head, letting the clear water wash away the blood stains all over his body. But he was also a little distressed at the moment, because Serdica gave him a brush. Originally, the ogre thought that this small brush was a bit too small for scrubbing the body. Then Serdak stood in front of the ogre and took out a toothbrush to demonstrate how to clean the ogre's teeth. It took the ogre a long time to understand that the brush in his hand was also used to brush his teeth. The ogre greeted him was a little hesitant. He had never done this before, and he didn't think there was anything wrong with a mouth full of rotten teeth. He reluctantly stuffed the hard bristled brush into his mouth. Brush well, Serdak said to the ogre while standing on the stone foundation in the pool. If you don't want to eat beef anymore and can still recall the taste of the sour meat from Hell's Hounds, just do as I say. This will allow you to taste more delicious food. Like the delicious wheat porridge for lunch? The ogre immediately cheered up and asked. His voice was thick and his voice attracted the attention of the other knights in the baths. Serdak shook his head and said, Those are the most common marching rations we eat. If you like to eat those, I can satisfy you later. But I plan to fulfill my promise and treat you to a sumptuous meal. Beef dinner. Barbecue? The ogre said expectantly. Soldak took out a box of canned luncheon meat from his magic waste bag, tossed it again and again in his hands, and gave the answer. Canned beef. The ogre Gulitum immediately cheered. Dak? I like cans. Serdak's original idea was to prepare a barbecue feast for the ogres. But according to Carl, Wazimra City has been experiencing a shortage of supplies recently and prices have soared. Especially fresh meat on the market, which has skyrocketed to a silver coin. After being able to buy two pounds, which was not always available, Soldak temporarily decided to switch to grilled luncheon meat. As the Knights of Constantinople began to enter, the Knights of the Guard Camp of Alensa City left the fountain bath in the center of the square one after another. It is said that the water flowing out of the fountain in the square this night was lavender and had a, a faint smell of blood. Walking back to the tent, Serdak saw some injured knights from the guard camp waiting there eagerly. When they saw Serdak, the eyes of these knights were full of expectation. After the Battle of Meza Town, the injured knights from the guard battalion of Alensa City all received treatment from Serdak after the war. Now most of the knights, who come to seek treatment from Serdak are the knights from the guard battalions of the other two cities. They heard that Serdak had the holy light technique that could heal wounds bitten by H. L. Dogs. So they did not want to go to the field hospital to ask those water magicians with higher eyesight for treatment. And the camp was closer. Serdak didn't think anything was wrong. He immediately put down the things in his hands, got into the tent to prepare, and placed the items for the sacrificial ceremony inside the tent. After everything was ready, he got out of the tent and placed the items in the tent. A table was set up outside the tent to receive the injured knights. Although the ogre had some reluctance on his face, the honest big guy sat quietly next to him and did not mention the sumptuous dinner that Soldek had promised. It will be daybreak in a while, and the ogre is lying on the straw mat in the pergola, looking up at the starry sky above his head and feeling unable to sleep. Only the bathroom side of the square was still brightly lit. Many knights in other places had already gotten into their tents and fell asleep after taking a bath. Only in front of Serdak's tent were there still many knights who were treating injuries. The knight who was slightly injured did not need to pay anything. Serdak simply treated the wound and then used holy light 
to speed up the healing of the wound. Without Andrew's help, some of the subsequent bandaging would have needed to be done by Saldek himself. However, this situation did not last long. When those long legs appeared in front of him, Serdak knew that the half-elf archer Samira had returned. There was still a faint smell of soap locust on her body, and her head was her broken hair was still a little damp. She did not hide her face in her hood, but covered her face with a dark scarf. The half-elf archer took the hemostatic bandage from Serdak's hand. Her bandaging skills were not inferior to Andrew's, but she lacked a little bit of Andrew's bone-setting skills. For some knights who were seriously injured, Serdak needed to bless them with a blessed body in order to increase their recovery power and speed up the healing of their wounds. He had to hand over the head of A.H., L. Dog and also take out a box. The canned luncheon meat came, which was regarded as a reward from Suldak. These canned luncheon meats were piled higher and higher in front of the tent. Seeing those canned luncheon meats, the ogre suddenly felt that this boring treatment suddenly became interesting. He really wished there could be more serious injuries. Nowadays, Serdak's power is a demon statue that can send blessings. It is no secret among the three guard camps. Many knights even think that the blessed body is an enhanced version of the great holy light technique. It wasn't until the dawn of dawn spread across the city of Wazimra and the rising sun greeted the square that the number of knights waiting for treatment gradually decreased. This time, the battle in the small town of Mezu was a complete victory. After capturing the town, they stayed in the town for more than a day. Therefore, many injured knights received treatment from Serdak in the town. It's actually not too much to wait until returning to Wazimra City for treatment. Seeing the canned luncheon meat piled outside the tent, Serdak drove away the little sleepiness he had. He took out the fire-gathering rune board from his magic waste bag and placed it on the ground. He set up a barbecue grill and used a dagger to remove the canned luncheon meat. The box is cut open, and a large piece of meat is twisted up with a wooden hammer to make huge meat skewers, which are grilled on the grill. The luncheon meat, which was originally cooked meat, gave off a rich meaty aroma when roasted by the magic flame. The ogre lying in the pergola couldn't bear it for a long time and sat up from the straw mat like a big child. Sitting quietly in the pergola, waiting for Soldak to grill those delicious meat skewers, his big innocent face was full of anticipation. Serdak was worried that the ogre was not full. So in addition to grilling ten large skewers of meat, he also brought back a large pile of baked wheat cakes and threw them into the ogre's arms. While the ogre was chewing wheat cakes aside, Serdak came to the half-elf archer and asked her to untie the bandage on her right arm. Samira paused for a moment before untying the bandage on her right arm as instructed. What Serdak saw was still the right arm that had cracked with countless tiny wounds. Although this arm was nearly twice as thick as Samira's left arm, but there is still not enough carrying capacity to bear the magical power of the forest bow. And Samira always uncontrollably inspires that powerful power, which is the main reason why her arms continue to collapse. The condition of your arm is getting worse and worse. If you continue like this, you will soon be unable to draw the bow. Serdak warned the half-elf girl again. Samira was a little unimpressed, lifted up her black veil, and took a bite of a green date. Click, click, sweet and crispy. Serdak felt that Samira should pay more attention to her arm. Although she had the recovery power of the blessed body, her arm still did not get any better. This in itself was a very bad situation. He said to Samira, I know an excellent magic scholar in Helensis City. His name is Ferdinand. If this arm eventually collapses into a pile of rotten flesh, maybe he can help you graft a newer arm. Okay, but I need to know your preferences beforehand. The half-elf girl looked a little ugly. Serdak ignored her expression and continued. The arms with the most talent for archery are of course the winged people in Yunjong City. Their arms have the power of wind, which can make the arrows fly farther. But in the it is said that the last cloud city has disappeared for nearly a hundred years. And now those winged men are harder to find than giant dragons. And it is not easy to find a winged man's arm. Then he changed the topic and said, But I heard that the lizard people in the wild swamp have good bow and arrow talents. The only bad thing may be that there are fine scales on them. But I heard that they are the result of the degradation of the original scales. The trace is left behind. Actually the skin of the lizard people is still very delicate. But the color is a little darker. I'm not going to replace my arm. Samira finally couldn't help but protested. Then you have to cherish it and take good care of it. Don't let it get hurt frequently. Saldak reminded her quickly. And then pointed to the new scar on her arm and said. You have too many wounds on this arm. It is estimated that you will not be able to draw magic pattern structures on it in the future. But you can consider magic pattern breeding equipment. I mean, 
if you encounter a suitable magic pattern breeding equipment in the future. You may wish to consider it. Samira looked at the exposed half of Cernak's arm, which was covered with hideous burn scars, and asked him, Are you also planning to draw a magic pattern? Yes, I am looking for it everywhere, but this thing is hard to come by. Soldak nodded and admitted. In addition, the magic pattern breeding equipment does not need to be drawn. You only need to find a suitable breeding equipment and implant it. But carrying capacity is still the key. I don't lack carrying capacity. But for the magic pattern, I need to increase my agility and instantaneous explosive power. Samira knew exactly what direction she wanted to strengthen. Chapter 458 Elite Exploration Team The city of Wazamala seemed even more crowded than it had been in the past few days. You can always see warriors walking together on the busy streets. They wear leather trousers, long boots, and thin linen shirts on their upper bodies. They rarely travel with weapons. At most, they have a dagger tied to their thigh. As for the knights, their clothes were much more orthodox. They wore hard leather armor and knight swords on their waists. Even when they walked, they had to straighten their backs, which made them look a little different among the crowd. Bina province continuously delivers military equipment and relief supplies to the Maka plane. The carriages driving out from the airport terminal drive to the material warehouses in various areas of Wazamala city. A group of poor children often chase the food trucks all the way. They always expect that a piece of wheat cake will fall out of a certain grain bag in the car that is not tied properly. However, the chance of this is very small. Usually the wheat cakes they picked up were secretly thrown away by the members of the logistics department who were sitting in the carriage. A group of infantry regiments wearing neat armors passed through the main street, and the carriages driving on the street ducked to both sides of the road. Serdak stood on the bell tower of Wazamala City and looked out over the city. He could see the troops who had received the mission to participate in the war gathering along the streets towards the city gate. Outside the city, the flames of war and gunpowder smoke filled the air. The heavy cavalry regiments were already standing in offensive formation outside the city gate along the suspension bridge across the moat. Half-elf archer Samira sat on the edge of the stone eaves outside the clock tower, her legs dangling in the air, her arms supporting her body and leaning backwards. The morning breeze blowing in her face blew through her fine hair, and the corners of her rhombus-shaped mouth were slightly raised. Looking outside the city at this time, the number of H. L. dogs that besieged the city had become much smaller. There is a huge pile of corpses made of held dogs on the edge of the moat outside the city. Amid the billowing smoke, you can vaguely see the flames that are constantly rising. It is said that it has been burning for three days. But because there are always new corpses of held dogs every day, he was thrown into a pile of corpses. So the fire shows no sign of extinguishing even now. Some alchemists in the city said that this was a waste. If there was a big enough pot, a lot of fat could be refined. The Bina army gradually took the initiative on the battlefield outside Vatsamala city, allowing the residents here to see the hope of victory in the plain war especially since Marquis Luther's constructed swordsman group has already set off for the second battlefield. I believe that it will not be long before good news will follow soon. A heavy cavalry regiment rushed into the held dog camp and killed the siege dogs outside the city to pieces. However, even in such a disadvantageous situation, the held dogs still did not choose to evacuate Wazimra. City, Serdak asked strangely. Why don't you think this H. L. Dog has evacuated Wazamala? Half-elf archer Samira looked at the H. L dogs outside the city, shook her head and said nothing. In order to celebrate the victory in the Battle of Mangin Town, the guard battalions of the three cities held a celebratory dance at the square station. The knights of the guard camp are usually responsible for managing the security of the city and are already semi-detached from the scope of the army. Therefore, military discipline is loose. In addition to allowing drinking at this dance, the bold knights of the guard camp also invited the dancers from Wazamala City into the military camp. This made the Plain War Command very dissatisfied. That night, the three commanders of the Guard Battalion, including Viscount Emmett, Viscount Owen, and Earl Collins, were called to the war headquarters for an interview. The three commanders returned to the station with livid faces, and the celebration dance ended hastily. The second campaign of the Constructed Swordsman Regiment led by Marquis Luther also ended prematurely due to the early transfer of the Hell Dogs. The H. L dogs in this area had already evacuated the area before the constructed swordsman group arrived. The guard battalion reconnaissance team responsible for this area did not find the Devil's Gate or the Hell Passage. Subsequently, these guard battalion reconnaissance teams, it was decided to form several small teams and disperse in the jungle to expand the search area. 
since the Devil's Gate was not found. The army of Hell Dogs continued to pour towards Wazimra City. The battle between the Hell Dogs and the heavy cavalry besieging the city began to turn into a stalemate tug of war. The giant Hell Dogs and 3H, L Dogs appeared one after another. And the heavy cavalry regiment also began to suffer casualties. This war beast in the Maka Plain swallowed tens of thousands of strategic supplies every day. The Magic Guild of Bena Province once again mobilized 50 magicians to join the magic investigation team and conduct a large-scale search of the area where the Hell Dogs appeared in the Maka Plain. Although the magician investigation team was able to determine that the area where the Hell Dogs appeared was the jungle area north of Wazamala City. But the exact location has never been found. In order to find the Devil's Door as soon as possible, Marquis Luther decided to increase the intensity of the ground search. This search changed the previous centralized search mode of battalion units into a dispersed search by small elite combat teams. One night, nearly 150 reconnaissance teams entered the jungle swamp north of Wazamala City. At the same time, Marquis Luther led two regiments of constructed swordsmen, nearly a thousand men, a heavy armored infantry regiment of 1,500 men, and a longbow archer regiment of 500 men and immediately rushed to the third place to explore area. The situation here is a bit complicated. The three guard battalions that went to explore this area were dragged tightly by a group of H.L. dogs. The three guard battalions were never able to completely escape the battle. Planar War Command recruits an elite combat team into the jungle to investigate the whereabouts of the Demon Gate. The dangerous jungle, unfamiliar environment, changeable climate, dangerous monsters, a large number of H, L dogs and other factors have directly increased the risk factor of this task to the point where ordinary soldiers are intimidated. Marquis Luther called on the constructed knights to be able to stand up bravely and actively participate in this operation for the sake of early peace on the Maka Plain. However, Thanks to the efforts of Viscount Emmett, the Hellenza Guard Battalion finally joined the battle sequence outside Wazimra City. Although it required going out of the city to fight, it was much safer than leaving the city for reconnaissance. Viscount Emmett hopes to bring back all the knights from the Hellenza City Guard Battalion for this expedition. 57 knights from the Hellenza Guard Battalion died in the Battle of Mezu Town. And they will remain in the town of Mezu forever. Suburbs. Serdak was having dinner. Although the garrison in the city does not need to eat marching rations. There are very few vegetables and meat for the meals. Only the ogres sitting in the arbor eat it with gusto and hope that the knights in the guard camp will eat less so that the ogres can be there at the end of dinner. Wrap any leftover food into balls. Carl came back from the camp, sat down in front of Soldak, rubbed his forehead with his fingers and said to Soldak, There are two paths for you to choose. One is to exchange military merit for teleportation tickets. And the other is to we have to wait for the first half of the year. As long as the war in the Maka Plain is over and the order of the teleportation gate returns to normal, it will be much easier for us to get a teleportation ticket through the relationship in Beta City. Doesn't that mean we have to wait half a year? Soldek said hesitantly. If you want this big guy to pass through the portal, you have to go through very strict approval. It will definitely not be possible during the war. Carl patted Serdak on the shoulder and said to him, Carl wanted to prepare a battle plan for tomorrow, chatted briefly, and then returned to the military tent. Serdak put down the dinner plate in his hand, took a sip of the bland soup, and then walked out of the Halanza guard camp. The half-elf archer Samira sitting in the tent looked like a nimble deer, followed after a few steps. The next morning, this Count Emmett announced today's battle plan to the knights in the guard camp. Today, the knights in the guard camp need to capture a hillock occupied by the H. L. Dogs outside the city and laid down on the hillock to block the H.L. dogs, dog iron nets and large animal traps. These animal traps specially made for H.L. dogs have been continuously transported from Bena City to Wazamala. Carl's support squadron was in the first offensive echelon. This Count Emmett also considered that the support squadron performed extremely well in the town of Meijin, with construct knights like Serdak and strong ogres. Soldiers. So they were placed at the front to gain military merit. Serdak stood next to Carl and said in a low voice, Carl, I have decided to join the elite reconnaissance team. Carl didn't expect that Serdak would choose to take risks. He turned to look at Serdak and asked, Dak, are you serious? Serdak nodded. Of course. After thinking about it, I decided to exchange my military exploits for a teleportation ticket for Gulitum. Hey! Dark. Carl turned to look at Serdak. At this time, he wanted to persuade him. But he saw Serdak took out a piece of parchment order with a red stamp printed on it. Carl shut up. 
Serdak stepped forward, hugged Carl, smiled at Carl, and said, I have received the transfer order from the headquarters, and I will take the magic airship to the northern suburbs of Wazimra City later. If you want, if you can do something for me, then wish me good luck. Carl pushed Soldak away fiercely, punched him hard on the shoulder, and said with veins on his forehead, You really shouldn't be allowed to join the guard camp. You are a madman on the battlefield. Under Carl's gaze, Soldak led three members of the security team to leave the guard camp. Soldak, Carl stood in the square, pointed his finger at the scorching sun in the sky, and shouted loudly, No matter where you go, don't forget the way back. Serdak also raised his right hand high in response and pointed at the scorching sun in the sky. Serdak led Samira, Andrew, and Gulidam to the airport terminal. The tall ogre immediately attracted the attention of many people around him. Serdak did not stop because of this. He walked directly to an officer in charge and handed a parchment order in his hand to the officer. The officer glanced at Serdak and nodded slightly. Nodding. He turned around and took out a map of the outskirts of Wazimra City from the box behind him and handed it to Serdak. He also said to him, Bring your own weapons, armor and marching rations. A magic airship will arrive every seven days. Return to the ground and use magic flares if you encounter danger. I wish you good luck. Many construct knights gathered from various places in the city in front of the airport terminal, came to the officer in charge to receive the map, and then boarded the magic airship. Two magic airships were parked at the dock. The coolies near the dock looked at the two magic airships eagerly, hoping that the captain on the airship would step down and select a few strong workers to fill his spaceship with cargo. It's a pity that more and more construct knights are waiting. These construct knights don't know each other, but they have the same mission. The atmosphere at the airport terminal was a bit heavy, and some people were chatting quietly with the surrounding construct knights. Serdak's team is a bit special. They chose to stand in the corner of the magic airship. The ogre Gulidum sat on the side of the magic airship, looking at the bustling airport terminal with novelty. No one wanted to stand up to it. The pressure brought by the ogre came to exchange information with them. Just like this, they waited until the crew on the airship withdrew the planks of the airship and loosened the rope tied to the airport terminal. As the winch retracted the rope little by little, the flotation device made a rumbling roar, and the magic airship floating into the air little by little. The three-masted sail on the ship slowly rose, and the warm south wind blew the airship northward like an invisible hand. Cernak unfolded the map on the airship. This search mission included the vast northern suburbs of Vosmara City. Since the general range previously given by the magician investigation team was empty, the search area was expanded by nearly 10%, 20 times, in order not to miss any place where the devil's door might be hidden. There are actually 14 pickup points on this map where the magic airship docks. In addition, there are 14 pickup points marked in another color on the map. It is said that they are the pickup points for another magic airship. Every seven days, Airships will go to these areas to pick up the constructed knights back to Wazamala City. There are already many construct knights sitting on the deck, discussing with the team members around them the area where the Devil's Gate is hidden, in order to find the nearest landing point to disembark. Serdak set his sights on the hooded half-elf archer Samira. Samira opened her hood, revealing her eyes that were bright red due to mixed blood. She pointed to the farthest place on the map and said directly, Since these nearby areas have been searched countless times, we can target it here. The terrain in this area is relatively complicated, and there are not so many water systems. It is likely to be the area where the H, L dogs are active. But this place has almost faded out of the main search area, and according to the markings of the magician investigation team, there are no signs of a large number of H, L dogs in this area. Andrew, an indigenous warrior, gave a different opinion. The half elf archer looked up at Andrew and said, Those marks don't mean anything. Okay. Let's choose here. Serdak had no better choice and was about to determine the landing site. Watching the elite teams on the airship disembark at various landing points, the magic airship quickly became empty. At the last two farthest landing points, only Serdak's team was left on the magic airship. The captain of the magic airship walked up to Serdak. He held a wine bottle in one hand and a map in the other. He pointed to the farthest connection point on the map and warned Serdak. This is the farthest place. Don't go too far to the pickup point. There are almost no hell dogs here. And there are very few magical investigation teams here. So you have to pay more attention to safety. No one can help you if you are in danger. Sardak glanced at the gray-haired captain gratefully and nodded. Chapter 459 Jungle Hunter The booster on the magic airship's tail slowly extinguished. And after a long slide, 
it finally reached the final landing point. In the jungle on the northern outskirts of Wazamala City, it is rare to find such gentle mountains outcropping the surface. The slopes are covered with lush grass and low shrubs. New trees growing out of the surrounding jungle are constantly encroaching on this open space. The ring-shaped outline of the surrounding young forest belt is clearly visible. The captain told Soldak that an adventure group once discovered an ironwood forest here and hired many lumberjacks to cut down all the ironwood forest. Even the roots of the trees were dug up by the team that came after them. Yes, in the past few years, the hillside here was full of pits left by excavations. In recent years, the grass has grown up, covering up this slope. The captain told Serdak the specific conditions of this slope, mainly because he must pay attention to the path under his feet after getting off the boat. Otherwise, he may fall into the remaining tree pits if he accidentally steps on the ground. Because there is no airport terminal to berth the ship, the magic airship can only continue to move slowly at low altitude. The two crew members lowered the rope from the exit on the side of the ship. The members of the Serdak combat team came to the side of the ship one after another. The first one grabbed the rope and went down. It was the half-elf archer Samira. Soon Samira came to the end of the rope, then released the rope with both hands, opened her body in the air, curled up the moment she landed, and rolled several times on the grass. Stand up steadily. Her footsteps did not stop, and she continued to chase the airship that kept moving forward. In the waist-deep grass, Samira was like a light-bodied deer, able to jump very far with every leap. What the ogre ghoul item did was even simpler. He didn't even grab the rope and jump directly between the gap between the two floating devices. His huge body was like a white cannonball, which exploded. It landed on the hillside with a loud sound, and the air wave it raised almost made a big hole in the grass. Only Andrew and Serdak followed the steps and slid down the rope to the end. Serdak found the right moment to pounce on a dense bush. This bush was like a soft mattress, holding Soldak steady. It was held firmly in the middle, but those thorns were also very flexible ropes. The moment Serdak's body fell, those thorns left a few blood stains in places that Serdak's armor couldn't take care of. The smell of tree oil in the bush is very strong. This is a bush with dark purple berries the size of fingernails. The berries are very watery. If you accidentally touch those berries, the peel will burst and a stream of water will flow out. The sticky purple slurry looks a bit disgusting. And there are some not sharp thorns all over the rock tan. The five finger shaped leaves exude a strong aroma of tree oil. Serdak struggled to stand up from the cane. The indigenous warrior Andrew then jumped into the bushes. Seeing the berries all around, Andrew cheered. He seemed to know that the berries would explode when touched. And he did not reach out to touch them leaned over and stuck out his tongue to roll the berries hanging on the branches into his mouth, and then showed an expression of great enjoyment. But when he grinned at Soldak, his mouth was dyed blue. This kind of dark blue berry is called blue burst fruit. It is very famous in Wazamala City. The biggest feature is that it cannot be picked. Andrew used a hatchet to cut through the brambles and create a path through the bushes. Two people walked out of the bushes, and Samira and Gulitam were chasing them from behind. They were at the edge of the slope. According to the map, there are almost no H, L dogs in this area, which is why the magician investigation team gave up the investigation in this area. The jungle has dense vegetation and thick bushes. The Nanai indigenous warrior Andrew held a hatchet in front of him to open the way, and he could barely walk through the jungle. Soldak had performed half a year's patrol mission with the second team in the Gandor Mountains in Handanar County in the Warsaw Plain, so he did not find it difficult to cross the jungle. The ogre has been living in the jungle on the outskirts of Wazimra City. Traveling through the jungle is the ogre's daily life. So naturally, he doesn't think it's anything. Before the hell dogs besieged the city, the half-elf archer Samira was the guide of Wazimra City. He would usually be hired by adventure groups to travel in the jungle near Wazimra City and walk along the ridge of the high mountains. For a long time, it turned out that there was no H. L. dog to be seen. Not only were there no H. L. dogs, except for some birds on the top of the trees. There were almost no other jungle beasts. This jungle was eerily quiet. Andrew walked under a big banyan tree, smelled a pile of feces between the roots of the tree, and distinguished it carefully before frowning and saying to Soldak, We have now broken into the territory of a monster. The aura left behind shows that this monster is powerful enough to scare away other beasts in the area. We must leave here as soon as possible. Samira looked around the jungle and said, they should be new immigrants. She jumped onto the big banyan tree, stood on the branch and looked around, saying at the same time, this place used to be very safe, 
Otherwise, there would be no adventure group here to develop the Ironwood Forest. I'll go check it out and find out what's going on. After saying that, she flew to the top of the tree and jumped to another tree through the dense branches. Her body was as flexible as a monkey. The team continued to walk north along the ridge. This direction ran counter to Wazimra City. The shadow of the monster in the jungle had always shrouded everyone's minds. The road on the ridge was not easy to walk, and there was no prey in the jungle, which made the ogre a little irritable. Sernak kept making some notes on the map in his hand. He found that his combat team had reached the edge of the map on the outskirts of Wazimra. He continued walking to the outside and almost walked out of the map. The jungle here was like as Samira said. The terrain between the mountains has become a bit complicated. And there are no signs of hell dog activity here. If Samira hadn't returned to the team, Sernak even thought of giving up. Area search. No H. L dogs can be seen in this area. Since we are investigating the Devil's Gate, of course there must be a large number of H. L dogs. Samira caught up with the fighting team. She jumped down from the tree with a strange look in her eyes. What did you find? Did you find the H. L dog? Soldak stopped and asked curiously when he saw Samira with a hint of excitement on his face. Samira shook her head, pointed to the southeast and said, I know what kind of monster is occupying this place. It's an injured monster ape. I found its lair, which is in the cave opposite this ridge. Serdak had seen an introduction to the demonic ape in the Encyclopedia of Warcraft. This is a magical beast with strength ranging from level 2 to 3. The adult demonic ape is extremely powerful and usually lives in dense mountain forests. It is not only intelligent, but also very powerful, and is also proficient in the magic of natural elements and can control trees. Andrew was obviously very familiar with the demon ape and asked Samira, Shouldn't that thing build a nest on the top of the tree? Samira shook her head and said, I don't know. I think it was injured. No wonder I can't see this guy's shit, Andrew said. He found an excuse for not identifying what kind of monster the feces under the banyan tree belonged to. Serdak thought that if he could hunt this demonic ape, his trip would not be in vain even if he did not find the whereabouts of the H. L. Dog. It's just that he can't understand that this place is not far from Wazamala City. Only the outer suburbs of Wazamala City. The nobles of Bina province have operated so much in Wazamala City. How can there still be Warcraft here? This is a bit too unrealistic. The adventure groups in Wazimra City really did nothing. Can't they clear out the monsters in the surrounding area? Or is this jungle too rich in resources? Thinking of this, Serdak said, The competition between the magic beasts in the Maka Plain is so fierce that even the magic apes want to settle on the outskirts of Wazimra City? This guy belongs to the category of second-level magic beasts. And the magic on his body, the materials can be sold at a high price. And there must be a magic core hidden in the skull. Samira also echoed. In the past, many adventure groups went to the Maka Plain to hunt the great demon ape. There were several times when the adventure groups found guides to go deep into the Shindi Mountains. But I went to all if you have never been there. How can you serve as a guide for them? Captain, do you want to vote for this? Andrew also asked excitedly. You've come here. How can you come back empty-handed? Go and have a look. Serdak made a decision. Only the ogre was not so willing. He had eaten monkeys before, which was considered one of the most unpalatable foods in the jungle. He didn't want to catch a bigger monkey if he didn't have to. The team walked down the slope on one side of the ridge. In the overgrown jungle, the low spaces were crowded with unknown shrubs. Fortunately, there were Nanai warriors opening the way in front. Even so, they continued walking all the way. It is also very hard. The terrain here is relatively complicated, and the path you choose may end up on a cliff while walking. Even with Samira as a guide, the shortcut she chose would have to climb two cliffs dozens of meters high. Climbing down from the cliff is not difficult for the team members but it undoubtedly takes a little time. And there are rugged rocks under the cliff. So the ogre dare not jump directly. The team worked hard to reach the bottom of the valley. And in front of them was another rushing river valley. This river was not very wide. But the water flow was fast. The ogre jumped and jumped to the rocks on the other side of the river at the narrowest part of the river valley. Samira crossed the river valley directly from the top of the tree and pulled up a rope from the river. Serdak and Andrew slid directly across rope continuing forward. We entered a muddy swamp. The swamp was covered with mangroves, with well-developed root systems. The road here was even more difficult to walk. And this swamp was a breeding ground for venomous insects, mosquitoes, and ants. Swarms of venomous insects and mosquitoes ants live here. And a large banyan tree houses countless birds. 
It can be said that this mangrove supports a large number of mosquitoes. The large swarms of mosquitoes make this place a paradise for birds. Fortunately, there are Samira and Nanai indigenous warriors who are very familiar with the environment in the jungle. They also found a kind of tree with branches and leaves with a faint smell and weave the branches and leaves of this tree into garlands and put them on the neck and head. Can effectively repel the most vicious mosquitoes. After walking out of this mangrove forest, the jungle trees in front became taller. From time to time, you can see a sky-gazing tree with countless tree vines hanging from the crown. These tree vines are all over the entire forest area and the half-elf girl becomes to be more careful. Andrew also raised the hatchet with both hands and stared at the trees and vines above his head. Only the ogre followed at the back without any scruples. Suddenly, a tree shadow shot out from above his head, like a giant python wrapping around the ogre's arm. The ogre reacted very quickly and swung towards the ogre with one hand. With the next swing, he grabbed the vine with his backhand and suddenly pulled the vine, which was about the thickness of an adult's arm, straight next to him. Andrew quickly cut off the vine with a knife. The vine looked like the living giant python rolled on the ground for a while before slowly becoming rigid and turning into a ball of curled tree vines. This kind of magic vine fruit is a very precious magic herb. Every autumn, herbal medicine dealers always go to Wazamala City to buy magic vine fruits. There are also many Nanai tribe members who die every year because of collecting magic vine fruits. Andrew looked like said somewhat sadly. With the ogre and the team, the magic vines on the canopy will not choose to attack others. Andrew reacts quickly. Every time the ogre is attacked, he can cut off the vines immediately and pass through this area. In the forest area, the ogres were attacked more than 20 times. No wonder the birds in the river valley could hardly live in the trees. But not even a bird could be seen in this jungle. After walking through the forest with the actively stalking demonic vines, I discovered a cave halfway up the mountain wall. This cave was covered by dense trees. It was almost difficult to find it without getting closer. I didn't know that Samira was so. How did we discover this place in such a short period of time? I have been here before. This cave was originally the residence of a group of main people. Later, the main people here were hunted down by the adventure group. The cave here became the location of the adventure group. I also want to find a place to rest at night. I just wanted to take a look at this place. But I didn't expect to encounter a demonic ape. The half-elf archer pushed aside the bushes in front of him with his hands and explained as he stared at the cave not far away. We have to block it in the hole. Once it escapes, as long as it jumps to the tree, almost no one can stop it from escaping. Andrew looked at the dense forest around him and said in a low voice, Ghoul item, you and Samira will guard the entrance of the cave. Andrew and I will go into the cave to hunt the demon ape, Serdak said. The ogre looked at the cave, which was less than three meters high, and knew that even if he could barely duck his head to get in, it would be difficult for him to spread out in the cave. So he nodded to Serdak. Seeing Samira take out a branch full of green and put it on the forest bough, Soldak quickly said to Samira, Unless necessary, try not to use your ability to shoot arrows. Keep it carefully. This arm may be able to recover. Chapter 460 Demonic Ape A gray cloud on the horizon was rimmed with gold by the setting sun, and even the undulating mountains in the jungle were dyed with a layer of pale gold. The stone wall on the east side of the valley was still bathed in the setting sun. A beam of golden sunlight shone into the cave from the entrance and fell on the belly of a big demon ape. The fire element rich in the sunlight was slowly absorbed by the big demon ape, absorbing it into the body, constantly nourishing the wound on its belly that was more than a foot long. The big devil turned over lazily, put his thick arms under his head, and continued to sleep in a comfortable position. The cave was dry and warm, and he could also take a bath. It is indeed an excellent place to rest in the afternoon sunshine. The soft brown fur leaned against the stone wall. The great demon ape closed its eyes, and its muscular body was stronger than that of the ogre. It fled here from its own territory, and has stayed here for nearly half a month. Unfortunately, it did not find the magic herb to heal the injury. Instead, it almost fell into the hands of a human magician. This made the big devil ape have lingering fears. It knew this place. We can't stay in the hiding place for long. And we plan to leave here after getting enough sleep. After all, this place is too close to a human city. It needs to bypass the previous town and go south through the jungle to a warmer place. A gust of wind blows into the cave. The demon ape suddenly smelled a dangerous smell in the wind blowing from the entrance of the cave. Perhaps the smell of sweat and food. 
It suddenly opened its golden pupils, and two golden lightning flashed in its eyes. It raised its horn's teeth. He sat up suddenly and looked towards the entrance of the cave. Serdak didn't expect this demon ape to sleep so lightly. He had tried to walk as gently as possible. But as soon as he entered the cave entrance area, he was alerted by the big guy in the cave. His head the size of a wash basin moved towards Serdak. Looking over, a pair of eyes shot out two sharp golden lights. Roar! The great demon ape made a huge sound in the cave, which shocked Serdak's ears so much that he could hardly understand any sounds from the outside world. While Serdak's body was shaking slightly, the big demonic ape lunged forward, and an arm thicker than the ogre's leg stretched out, aiming towards Serdak's body. The head was grabbed, and its movements were as fast as lightning. Serdak only had time to lift up the dwarf chain shield. He didn't even take a defensive stance. The giant demon ape's giant hand had already hammered hard on Serdak's shield. A silver light burst out from the shield, canceling out most of the force coming from the demon ape's arm. Just like this, Serdak's body leaned back, and the demon ape's big hand had already grasped the edge of the shield. With a sudden pull back, Serdak's whole body was lifted up by the demon ape, and the demon ape took advantage of the situation. He wanted to throw Serdak against the stone wall of the cave, but he was forced to turn his head to avoid the sword light and used his other big dark hand to grab the sword edge. Serdak felt an irresistible force pulling him off the ground. He quickly stabbed the demon ape's eyes with the blood-red crescent moon in his hand. The demon ape tilted its head and hit the demon ape with a scimitar for the first time. On the ear, the sharp scimitar left a shallow wound on it, and it was caught by the big demon ape. Serdak cut the demon ape's hand tendon with his backhand, only to find that the scimitar was tightly locked by the demon ape. It's stuck, and I can't get out no matter what. The demon ape only felt a sharp pain in his ears. This feeling made him furious. Its arm span was more than four meters. It grabbed the edge of the dwarf chain shield with one hand, and the edge of the blood-red crescent sword with both hands. Pulling to both sides, intending to tear Serdak in half, a pair of big black hands were as strong as gold and stone. Grasping the edge of the blood-red crescent sword, but there was no scratch at all. Serdak realized it was bad, but couldn't let go. With the blessing of the blessed body and the halo of power, Serdak's power was still completely suppressed in front of the demon ape. Subsequent moves were unsustainable, and he could only passively resist the pull of the demon ape. Unexpectedly, the power of the demon ape was so terrifying. Serdak did not dare to be careless at all, and quickly concentrated on releasing his power. A two-faced, four-armed demon god appeared behind Serdak. Serdak's power reached a new level. His whole body tensed up, resisting the pull of the demon ape. While Serdak and the demon ape were fighting in the cave, the indigenous warrior Andrew also strode up from the entrance of the cave. There was a special rhythm on the rocky ground, like the sound of a rapid war drum and Andrew's hand holding a giant axe in his hand. Andrew strode toward the demon ape against the rock wall, just when the demon ape opened its arms and was about to tear Serdak in half. Andrew jumped up high and held the giant ape with both hands. Raising it above the head, the body appeared in a reverse arch shape in midair, like a god descending to earth, and struck down on the top of the demon ape's head. A pair of glaring eyes appeared behind Andrew, and together with the deep nasolabial folds on both sides of his nose. The shadow was clearly the glare of a certain giant. After the awakening of the berserker soul, it meant that Andrew had an extremely powerful position. As he slowly learned to master his position, his strength increased day by day, and the giant axe he produced pierced the air, bringing out a trace of white marks. The demon ape felt the murderous intent on the axe blade, and was frightened and hurriedly threw Suldek away. His thick arms were crossed above his head. The giant axe struck by Andrew hit the demon ape's arm. Click. The sound of bone cracking was clearly audible. The demon ape let out a thundering roar. And the blade of the giant axe was deeply embedded in the demon ape's arm bone. The demon ape's golden eyes were instantly dyed with blood. He grabbed the axe handle with his backhand and swung his right arm towards Andrew. Andrew didn't expect that the arm bones of the demon ape were so hard. His full blow failed to cut it off. Instead, he was caught by the demon ape with one hand. When he was stunned, the demon ape came over with an iron fist, hitting Andrew in the middle. There was a loud bang on the chest of the full-covered metal armor, and the full-covered chest armor quickly dented. Andrew's body flew backwards and hit the wall with a bang. The demon ape let out a thundering roar again, and slammed its strong body towards Andrew, who was hanging on the stone wall, preparing to use its thick shoulders to knock Andrew directly into the stone wall. However, 
he suddenly felt a sharp pain in his abdomen. When he lowered his head, he saw that the old wound on his abdomen had burst. Not only was blood splattered out, but a section of his intestines was also exposed from the wound. The demon ape let out an unwilling roar and stopped quickly. He held the intestines in his hand with one hand and stuffed it back into his stomach haphazardly. But when he removed his hand, the internal organ still flowed out. The demon ape put a hand on his stomach and continued to rush towards Andrew. It noticed a sharp pain in its thigh, lowered its head and looked behind it, and saw that Serdak was holding a blood-red crescent moon in both hands and inserting it into the thigh behind him. And the demon ape's big hand, like a cattail fan, was fanning behind him. Serdak felt a strong wind coming over him, and he quickly raised his shield. The demon ape's big hand hit the dwarf chain shield with a bang. Serdak put on a defensive posture, but still could not stop the demon ape. A furious blow. The body flew out upside down and was kicked out of the cave. At this time, Andrew had already escaped from the stone wall. He held the giant axe again. A pair of giant eyes behind him stared at the demon ape, preparing to fight the demon ape again. Facing such a fierce Andrew, the demon ape suddenly stopped. It hammered its chest hard with one hand, and then its chest lit up with a gorgeous green magic pattern. The huge iron fist was covered with a touch of green aura. The demon ape poured into the ground, and the entire cave made a loud noise. Countless wood-type auras were inspired from the arms of the demon ape and spread along the rock ground, forming a green magic array. By the time Andrew realized something was wrong, it was already too late, for waist-thick tree vines emerged from the rocky ground. As the rubble flew, these four thick tree vines twisted and entangled Andrew, weaving them together in an instant. The wooden cage not only imprisoned Andrew, but also locked Andrew's axe. Andrew was imprisoned in midair in the cave by a huge tree vine. He couldn't break free without using any strength in his hands and feet. The demon ape's bloody eyes regained a trace of clarity. It hesitated for a moment, covered the wound on its abdomen with one hand, and rushed towards the entrance of the cave. At this time, Serdak was holding a shield to block the entrance of the cave. Without thinking, the demon ape swung his giant fist and hit the shield in Serdak's hand. It wanted to smash Serdak away again. As long as there was some gap, it can rush into the jungle outside where it belongs. The fur of the demon ape's right arm lit up with golden veins, which looked like they were coming from the bones. The violent aura also came out of the demon ape's arm. The phantom of the demon god appeared again behind Serdak. The demon ape's fist hit Serdak's shield. The scimitar in Serdak's hand also cut a wound in the demon ape's abdominal groin. A huge fist mark clearly appeared on the dwarf chain shield. The entire shield was hit by the demon ape's punch and hit Serdak's body. An earth-colored magic shield emerged from Serdak's body. Withstood the full blow of the demon ape. Every time the earth shield appears, it means that at least one-third of the magic crystals on the earth shield magic pattern structure have been burned. Serdak didn't have time to feel sorry for the lost magic crystal. He took a step towards the side of the demon ape and made another cut in the demon ape's abdominal groove. The demon ape looked at his fist and wondered why his full blow didn't knock Serdak away. It felt pain in its abdomen again and then it grabbed at random. But before the demon ape could swing its hand out, it was blocked by a big hand stretched out from outside the cave, and a fist hit the demon ape firmly, face, and smashed it back into the cave. The ogre's burly body was blocking the entrance of the cave like a mountain of meat. The demonic ape took two steps back, with magic aura oozed from his chest and right arm. The light green hexagram array appeared again under his feet. The demonic ape's arms nearly doubled in thickness in the magic pattern array and the brown fluff all over his body was revealed. There was a trace of golden light, and the hand that the demon ape was covering the wound on his abdomen was raised, with both hands tightly clenched into fists. He slowly walked out of the cave step by step. At this moment, the demon ape's lower body was stained with his own blood. Every time he took a step, even the footprints on the ground were bloody. It first grabbed Serdak. Serdak did not raise his shield to resist this time, but took three steps back. The demon ape's hand fell on the stone wall behind Serdak. And suddenly the gravel flew away. Several huge cracks appeared on the edge of the cave. Looking at these cracks, the demon ape's eyes seemed to have discovered a new world. And he fisted smashing hard against the cracked stone wall. The rubble flew away. The demon ape actually avoided the entrance of the cave. Smashed open a hole with his fist. And emerged from the cave against the flying rubble. The escaped demon ape didn't dare to hold back and rushed towards a giant tree with long strides. When the ogre saw the demon ape actually escaping from the cave, he quickly waved the big wooden stick in his hand and chased after him. Go up. 
The demon ape used its hands and feet to run very fast in front. With the help of Soldek, Andrew also broke out of the wooden cage from the collapsed cave and rushed out. Seeing that the demon ape had rushed under a big tree, using its hands and feet, it dragged its scarred body up the tree. Just when it climbed to the middle of the trunk, it suddenly saw a slender body standing on the horizontal branch of the tree crown, holding a forest bow in one hand and an emerald green arrow in the other. Samira frowned slightly. A trace of blood filled her eyes. Her bandaged arms clapped again, and a green light flew out from the forest bow, hitting the demon ape's eyebrows. The demon ape's eyes widened, and its face became extremely ferocious. It wanted to pull out the arrow stuck in its forehead, but found that the power in its body was rapidly draining away. It had never felt this way before, and its body became extremely heavy. When its hands touched the top of its head, it fell down from the tree trunk uncontrollably. A flash of panic flashed in the eyes of the demon ape, and it saw the food rushing towards it. The human demon saw the big round wooden stick in the ogre's hand. The next moment, I felt my head was hit by a huge external force. Click. The big wooden stick in the ogre's hand hit the devil ape on the head, and the wooden stick broke with a sound. The demon ape lost consciousness as soon as his eyes darkened, and his heavy body hit the tree with a loud noise. Andrew, who arrived from behind, stared at the demon ape who was unconscious on the ground. He raised the giant axe in his hand and chopped off the demon ape's head with one blow. Samira also held her arms and jumped down from the top of the tree nimbly. Serdak did not hesitate this time. Before skinning the demon ape, he directly set up a sacrificial altar next to the demon ape sacrificed the head of A.H. L. Dog to the demon god, and obtained the blessing power of the Eye of True. And then, then he took out his skinning knife and started to peel off the most precious fur from the demon ape. The fur on the chest of this demon ape had natural magic patterns. In order to maintain the integrity of this part of the magic patterns, Serdak could only cut off the magic ape's fur. The ape split its fur behind its back. Samira stood aside with her right arm folded, looking enviously at Serdak's skillful skinning. It was not until Serdak peeled off the fur of the demon ape's arm that he felt that there was still a lot of magic power fluctuations in the demon ape's right arm. He originally thought it was natural magic patterns on the fur. But then Serdak discovered the fact. Not so. He used a skinning knife to slowly cut open the fascia and muscles of the demon ape, revealing the arm bone of the demon ape. The arm bone was clearly printed with golden demon patterns. The demon ape's arm actually has a devil pattern spirit bone. Chapter 461 Crisis is Everywhere As night fell, a strange starry sky appeared above Soldak, with seven rivers of stars dividing the night sky into pieces. Perhaps it was the hustle and bustle of the city that covered up this beautiful night sky. Only when he arrived outside the northern suburbs did Soldak notice such a beautiful night scene. In the vast star field, the star closest to the Maka plane is as big as a pumpkin. The other three look like oranges surrounded by a circle of energy, and the rest are countless stars. A bonfire was lit in front of the collapsed cave, and the branches of the oleifera pine were crackling in the fire. The branches are rich in oil. The locals like to use the pine branches to wrap twine soaked in tree oil to make torches. A wooden barbecue frame was set up, and the demon ape's two skinned arms were placed on the wooden frame for barbecue. The grease kept dripping into the charcoal fire, exuding a faint aroma of meat. Regular consumption of Warcraft flesh and blood can strengthen one's physique. Among many Warcraft ingredients, Dragon meat has always been a precious ingredient highly respected by the nobles of the Green Empire. However, few people can see real dragons now, so demon hunters can hunt them. Most of them are from the Yalom clan, among which the domesticated dragons are considered frequent guests in high-end restaurants. While the swamp poisonous dragons and subspecies flying dragons can only be eaten at the tables of the Empire's top banquets, demonic ape meat is not commonly found in high-end restaurants in Wazimra City. Besides the heart, the best part of a demonic ape's body is naturally the most edible part of its arms. In the past, these demonic apes usually had hiding in the deep mountains and swamps. It is not easy to hunt down a magic ape. Andrew, an indigenous warrior of the Nanai tribe, kept turning over the demon ape meat on the wooden frame. The temperature of the charcoal fire was so high that the demon ape's arms were a little burnt. He used a wooden stick to push the charcoal blocks out of the fire, dissipating the heat from the charcoal pile. The ogre Gulitum sat next to Andrew, looking longingly at the barbecue on the bonfire, with his hands on his knees as quietly as a child. Serdak said to the half-elf archer Samira, who was sitting in the shadow of the mountain wall, When this mission is over and I return to Wazimra City, I will detect which attribute direction this magic spirit bone belongs to. Yes, 
if the magic pattern is for explosive power, strength, and agility. It depends on how well this spiritual bone matches you. If the match is up to standard, as long as you have enough carrying capacity, I will find a way to convert this magic bone. The spirit grain bones are made into a magic pattern clothing and implanted into your right arm. He picked up a wooden stick with a burnt end and drew a simple picture on the ground. But the symbols on it were a bit messy. At first, the great wizard Inoatilla only taught Serdek some superficial knowledge about the magic pattern breeding equipment. In order to obtain the strongest power, the great wizard Inoatilla would almost cover it with complete monster skins. Most of the tribal warriors could not bear the carrying capacity of the indigenous warriors. In the end, the strength of the indigenous warriors implanted in colonial clothing exceeded their physical limits, and they exploded to death. Samira was chewing on an unknown fruit. This green fruit was a bit sour. Do I want to replace my arm bone with this one? Samira asked. She looked at the messy lines on the ground and couldn't understand what Serdak was drawing. So she focused her attention on the huge magic pattern spirit bone next to Serdak. The demon ape was nearly 4 meters long. With an arm span of nearly 5 meters. The piece of magic pattern spirit bone belongs to the ulna on the arm of the demon ape. This piece of magic pattern spirit bone alone is nearly 1 meter long. And it is unusually strong. It wants to be completely inserted into Samira's arm. Implanting such a spiritual bone is simply impossible. Serdak rubbed his eyebrows with his fingers, shook his head, and said to Samira, No! The magic pattern transplantation equipment is to peel off the part with the magic pattern from the spiritual bone and implant it into your arm. In a sense, it is said that colonial clothing is like a tattoo. Except that colonial clothing has very strict requirements for natural magic patterns. Samira, who was leaning in the shadow of the stone wall, breathed a sigh of relief and whispered, That's good. I was really worried just now that my right arm will become as thick as that big guy in the future. To be honest, I don't like this kind of arm. It's really hard to accept. After saying that, the half-elf archer ate the last bite of the green fruit while spinning the demon ape meat on the grill. Andrew said, I think this demon ape is probably as strong as a third-level demon beast. If it hadn't been injured beforehand, maybe we wouldn't be its opponents. Regarding the battle just now, although the magic ape has become food on the barbecue grill, everyone still has lingering fears. In terms of size and strength, the demon ape has an overwhelming advantage. If the half-elf archer hadn't shot a sharp arrow at the critical moment, it is likely that everyone's hunting operation would have ended in failure. Serdak took off the arm of a half-cooked demon ape and handed it to the ogre, who was already impatient. He turned to Andrew and said, Anyway, this time is not in vain. The ogre ghoul item was not afraid of the heat either. He took the hot roast and stuffed it into his mouth. He inhaled when the hot roast made him sizzle. Captain, what should we do next? Andrew sliced off a piece of roasted meat from the arm of another demon ape, put it on a silver plate, and handed it to Soldak. Serdak took the plate, looked at the silent jungle outside and said, Since we have come here, let's follow the previously planned route and walk around this area. There may be unexpected gains. Andrew used a carving knife to cut off a bloody piece of meat and threw it into his mouth, squinting to taste the delicious food. The ogre sat next to the collapsed cave and quickly chewed the devil's arm clean. Andrew saw that the ogre refused to sleep until he was full, so he had to put a rib on the charcoal fire. Row. A simple tent was set up outside the cave, but each member of the team had a unique way of spending the night. The half-elf archer chose to hang his sleeping bag on the horizontal branch of the tree crown, while the indigenous warrior lay next to the campfire and chatted with the cannibals. The devil was sitting on the ground, and only Serdak was sleeping in the tent. Aboriginal warrior Andrew offered to stay on night watch. In his sleep, he felt someone push him gently. Serdak opened his eyes and saw Samira squatting at the entrance of the tent, staring at him with light red eyes. Samira put her hand between her lips and signaled to Sue. Erdak was silent. Serdak crawled out of his sleeping bag. It was dark outside at this time. The bonfire outside the tent had dimmed. Occasionally, a spark would burst out from the ashes. The indigenous warrior Andrew sat in front of the fire and dozed off, holding his big axe. The ogre was lying next to the indigenous warrior, holding a half-eaten rib in his hand. The ogre's mouth was wide open, as if he was eating a big meal in his dream. Just as he was about to ask Samira what happened, he saw a dozen pairs of green eyes suddenly appear in the surrounding woods. They were pairs of eyes full of greed, suspicion, and irritability. They seemed to have some kind of fear, did not dare to approach the camp. But they lingered around the camp, because it was pitch dark at night. The jungle was even darker, 
and their faces could not be seen clearly. Samira was half crouching outside the tent, holding a forest bow in her hand. She put an arrow on the bowstring and aimed at the green eyes in the forest. They are ghost monkeys on the Maka plane. To be precise, they should eat everything. They are a group of timid, cutting and greedy guys. Apart from being similar to us in body structure, the civilization level of the group is even worse than that of the mines. The cobalt in. As she spoke, Samira wanted to shoot these guys hiding in the darkness with her bow. However, Zerdek held her down with his hands. Before her arm was completely healed, every time she fired a bow and arrow, it would cause a new wound to her right arm. Zerdek reached out and threw the bones beside the campfire into the forest. And suddenly there were countless howls and fighting sounds in the jungle. Obviously those ghost monkeys were attracted by the smell of bones with meat residue beside the campfire. Zerdak did not let Samira shoot unnecessary bows and arrows, but kept throwing gnawing food into the dark woods. Clean bones. He felt that as long as the bones of the demon ape were fed cleanly, the ghost monkeys would disappear before their eyes after they were full, or until dawn the next morning, when the sun shone in the jungle. Zerdak threw away the bones with meat residue next to the campfire, and the ghost monkeys in the darkness disappeared. But early the next morning, when Andrew was cooking porridge with marching rations, those ghost monkeys appeared in the woods again. This time they were even bolder. They actually jumped up the branches one after another and looked at the combat team eagerly in the jungle. The dawn sun shines through the lush forest into the glade and dappled light spots appear on the grass. Those ghost monkeys are holding blow darts and just have a few leaves hanging under their crotches. They are not tall and look like monkeys covered in fine downy hair. They are cunning and insidious, full of greed and desire. They are squatting on the branches one by one looking at the camp of the combat team, letting out a sharp scream. Samira squatted on the grass and opened the forest bow in her hand again. The arrow with white feathers turned into a fleeting light and accurately penetrated a ghost monkey squatting on a horizontal branch. The ghost monkey squatted the place where it landed happened to be the place where she slept last night. It lay on the horizontal branch and used its ugly nose to stick to the branch and smell the smell on it. The obscene look finally made Samira couldn't help but shoot an arrow. A group of ghost monkeys dispersed in the tree, leaving only one ghost monkey with an arrow stuck between his eyebrows and a blow dart tightly held in his hand. Andrew said, Don't pay attention to these guys. You can't kill them all. These guys are territorial. As long as we leave their territory, they will not dare to follow us. After eating breakfast, the combat team put away the tent at the entrance of the cave and the ghost monkeys gathered again. This time, more ghost monkeys gathered. The ogre complained to Serdak that these little ghost monkeys were not delicious at all. If he ate too much, his stomach would hurt. The ogre yelled at these ghost monkeys several times. But he could only kill them. Rushing a little further away won't scare them away. The fighting team passed through the jungle. And hundreds of ghost monkeys followed the team in the trees behind them. Until they came to a river valley. The river was not too deep. But the river was seven or eight meters wide. Andrew stepped into the river and said to Soldak excitedly. Captain, those ghost monkeys are not if you know how to swim. Let's cross the river quickly and take advantage of this opportunity to get rid of them. The team quickly crossed the waist-deep river. When the ghost monkeys saw the team crossing the river, they jumped down from the trees one after another. They stood impatiently on the gravel beside the river and kept sending out branches. A whooping cry. Several ghost monkeys boldly jumped into the river, and the water quickly covered their heads. They were washed away by the river without even being able to struggle. The other ghost monkeys didn't even dare to go into the water. Zerdak led the combat team quickly into the dense jungle on the opposite side. As soon as he entered the jungle, he noticed that something seemed to be moving outside the woods. Silent breathing followed the sound of the wind and reached Zerdak's ears. About a hundred meters away, there was a growl like A.H. L. Dog. And then, there was a harsh sound like nails scraping against wood. After walking for so long, I finally met A.H. L. Dog in the jungle. Zerdak quickly rushed over with his combat team. A strange howling sound came from the distance again, melancholy and continuous, and it became quiet after a long time. A croton tree more than 30 meters high fell down, and its branches spread out in all directions like a huge house. Andrew warned everyone to stay away from these branches and leaves, which can irritate the skin. The native warriors then pushed the branches aside and squeezed through other branches. After crossing a distance of just a few hundred meters, the landscape here has actually undergone earth-shaking changes. The jungle is full of jagged and strange rocks. Following the sound. Looking for it. 
after passing through this strange rock area. Several people were attracted by the scene in front of him. Shot. It was covered in a plant with huge leaves, making it look like we were standing in a tomato garden 20 times smaller. There are thick, curly leaves everywhere, exuding a numb and astringent smell. Those huge vegetation do not look like trees, but like tomato vines, with huge red fruits hanging on them. Each fruit is as long as it can reach 2 meters. It hangs red on the tree and shines flickeringly. The surface of the peel is covered with honeycombs, like honeycombs. And they are constantly squirming. That weird low roar came from here. But when everyone arrived here, the sound disappeared quickly. There was a strange atmosphere in the entire forest. Even Samira and Andrew seemed to have never seen the strange plants here. Andrew stretched out his hand to touch a thick green tree trunk. And the tall plant, about two meters in diameter, actually moved slightly. For a moment, he avoided Andrew's hand as if he was thinking. The broad and thick leaves at the top of the plant curled up, as if the entire plant withered instantly. What kind of tree is this? Serdak asked the indigenous warrior curiously. Andrew shook his head, and he set his eyes on Samira. Unexpectedly, I didn't recognize the half-elf archer either. Chapter 462 Underground Cave Serdak discovered that these plants with huge leaves actually blended well with the surrounding trees. The huge red fruits were hidden under the canopy of the trees. The magicians rode magic handles to patrol the sky. I don't notice anything strange here. Samira, who is the guide of Wazamala City, and Andrew, a native of the Nanai tribe in the Maka Plain, both said that they did not recognize these plants. Serdak thought to himself, this kind of plant with huge red fruits the plant recognition can be said to be very high, and it grows in such a large area in this valley. How could it be a new and unknown species? Although the main trunks of these plants are up to 2 meters in diameter, their skin is green and does not look as old as trees. Moreover, there are some more than a foot long, almost transparent thorns growing on the branches. And the leaves at the top are like a huge parasol. It tightly covers the space below. Huge red fruits hang in the air. And some of them are still squirming. The ogre looked up at the huge red fruit hanging in the air and swallowed several mouthfuls of saliva. He grabbed a handful of sand on the ground, wiped it hard on his hands, and used a big wooden stick to break off the thorns. Regardless of how prickly the remaining thorns were, he climbed up the green branches to the top of the tree. And the green plant it actually seems to be resisting the ogre, constantly shaking the green branches. The ogre moved very quickly. When Serdak wanted to make a sound, his big hand had already grabbed the red fruit. In his eyes, the huge red fruit seemed to be an unparalleled delicious food. In Serdak's impression, ogres usually like to eat meat. So he didn't think these giant red fruits would be attractive to ogres. But the scene before him completely subverted his view of ogres. Cognition. Greedom also likes to eat brightly colored fruits. But when Guidem just touched the giant fruit, the delicate red fruit suddenly fell from the calyx and fell to the ground, exploding into a large pool of red juice. The thing wrapped in the giant fruit was also exposed. It was clearly the body of a huge beast. But it had been corroded by the red juice until only a skeleton with carrion remained. It was hard to tell what kind of beast it was. The skeleton was in the red juice crumbled all over the place. And the thin layer of peel quickly gathered into a ball. The red pulp on the ground exuded a rotten smell, which made Serdak want to gag. But at this time, he had no time to care about this. Because after the red fruit fell, the calyx of the giant plant hanging in midair turned into a big mouth full of sharp teeth. And the branches and vines behind it extended rapidly. Like an adult the giant python, as thick as its waist, bit the ogre. The ogre Gulitum was startled. He wanted to grab the huge calyx covered with sharp teeth with both hands. But he forgot that he was hugging the main trunk of the giant plant. When his hands were released, his body fell from a height of 10 meters. He fell down, but his body was still strong. He adjusted his posture in the air and landed steadily on the open ground. The huge calyx's bite was in vain, and it immediately chased after the ogre. Gulitum was also extremely brave. He stretched out his hand with a big wooden stick and smashed it towards the calyx, that was as flexible as a python. The calyx was caught by the ogre. The magic force hit it hard and the juice was dripping, leaving only a section of the vine that quickly retracted. Before the ogre Gulitum could celebrate his victory to everyone in the team, almost at the same time, a dozen vines full of sharp teeth protruded from the surrounding tree crowns and wrapped around the members of the battle team. The ogre was still thinking about fighting back, but he tripped over a tree vine that came out from behind. The moment his body fell, the tree vine had already wrapped around the ogre's thigh. The ogre stretched out his hand and grabbed the calyx of the vine. 
trying to tear the vine off. But in an instant, several more vines wrapped around him. The ogre was so frightened that the ogre rolled and crawled away from the entanglement of the vines and followed. The fighting team ran towards the outside of the forest behind them. All the flower trees seemed to come alive at this moment, turning into demons and demons with teeth and claws. The vines hung from the top of the flower trees with calyxes full of sharp teeth. Andrew and Samira were frightened. Run outside, planning to escape from this area where flowers and trees grow. Serdak finally remembered what these plants were. When he bought insect repellent powder and cannibal pollen at the magic apothecary store, the box of cannibal pollen clearly had this kind of plant painted on it. With just a few strokes, the relief did not leave much impression on Serdak's mind. The scene in front of him was almost exactly the same as the relief on the cannibal pollen box. Serdak pulled out the blood red crescent scimitar and shouted to the team Quickly retreat! These are the piranha flowers of H. L. As the four of them ran desperately back and forth, Serdak felt that the fruits on the piranha trees were constantly bursting, and more and more vines with calyxes gathered around them. The whole forest was filled with the smell of corpses. Serdak Dark poured the power of holy light into the blood red crescent moon in his hand. The edge of the blood red crescent moon changed from red to dazzling white flames, and he cut off a tree vine, and a large section of the tree vine withered instantly. The ogre can take seven or eight meters in one step and runs much faster than others. However, he is huge and cannot avoid the vines extending from both sides and above his head. These vines drag him down. It stopped him in his tracks, leaving him exhausted among the piranha trees. Samira's body was light and agile, and she spread her long legs to dodge left and right under the attack of the piranha vines. She quickly rushed to the front. But when she saw the piranha vines laying a thick layer of vines on the way of everyone, he immediately turned around and ran back as hard as he could. Andrew, who was following Samira, cut off a tree vine, and the four members of the team could only escape toward the hillside along the edge of the piranha tree. The path we came here was already covered with snarling tree vines, trying to find an outlet to break through. The entire forest was filled with a rotten and sweet smell. It is said that the piranha tree can secrete a hallucinogenic substance. Toxin. Serdak quickly reminded the team members to cover their mouths and noses. Even the ogre's head was covered with a rag. Andrew wielded a big axe to open the way in front and Soldak was responsible for cutting off the rear. Seeing that the road ahead was about to be blocked by layers of trees and vines, Andrew strode forward and a pair of phantoms with staring eyes appeared behind him. He took a step forward, jumped high, and struck down hard with a giant axe he held tightly in both hands. The axe blade brought out a flash of white light, splitting the tree vines in front of him into two pieces. The four members of the team ran to a rock wall in a panic and saw a cave between the mountain walls. Everyone in the battle team ran towards the cave and quickly got into the cave before the tree vines caught up. As soon as Serdak stepped into the cave, the crazy piranha vines had already blocked the entrance of the cave. There were still some flower vines extending along the cave. But after all, the length of these flower vines was limited. The team retreated and pursued them. Andrew chopped the remaining flower vines into several sections. And the remaining flower vines shrank back in embarrassment. A large piranha tree grew outside the entrance of the cave and all kinds of birds and animals were seen in this area. Obviously, once those animals got close to this place, they became food for the piranha flowers. Only Serdak's combat team was affected by the battle. Because of his strong strength, he was not caught by the piranha. But he was trapped in this cave. A large number of piranha tree vines almost blocked the entrance of the cave. Now it seems that the only thing to do is to wait and see how long it will take for these piranha vines to disperse. Go! Andrew walked to the entrance of the cave with a big axe in hand and tried to clean up these piranha vines. After the Nanai indigenous warrior cut off seven or eight piranha vines in succession, the piranha vines were obviously not attracted by the indigenous warriors. No, it will easily extend its calyx with sharp teeth into the cave. And these piranha vines begin to secrete a pale pink poisonous mist. The poisonous mist spreads into the cave. And the cave is filled with a strange smell of rottenness and sweetness. In order to avoid being poisoned by inhaling too much poisonous mist, Serdak immediately led the combat team to explore the depths of the cave. When he first entered this cave, the ogre climbed in almost half kneeling. However, he did not expect that the cave was much wider than the entrance outside. After walking more than 20 meters inside, the ogre could already stand in the cave. Inside, although there are no towering mountains in this area, the caves look very deep. Waiting at the entrance of the cave will only cause those piranha vines to continue to guard the outside of the cave. Serdak looked deep into the cave and said to several members of the team, 
Will the other end of this cave lead to the other side of the mountain? On the other hand, since we are already trapped here, we might as well go in and take a look. Andrew sat on a stone, polishing the axe blade with a whetstone, raised his head and said to Soldek, I have no objection. The half-elf archer walked into the cave first. At this time, Soldak hurriedly took out the holy light torch from the magic belt bag, poured a trace of holy breath into it, and let the holy light torch ignite a white flame. This flame while the light surrounding the cave is revealing every detail, as if dispelling the coldness in the cave. The three of them walked more than ten meters inside before the ogre behind them strode up and said to a few people, I have no objection to exploring the cave. But should we consider lunch? I mean there is nothing to find in this cave. If you find something to eat, or I'll rush out from the cave entrance and see if I can get some food back. Hey! Hey! Wait for me! The ground in the cave was full of large rocks that blocked the road at any time. It was very difficult to walk. In some impassable places, Andrew had to use a big axe to break the rocks. After walking and walking like this for most of the day, the team and the team people followed the cave to the heart of a mountain. In the cave, hundreds of stalactites hung down from the top of the cave. These stone pillars were still dripping water. The ogre ran to a pool of stalactite execution ground, knelt on the rocky ground and tried to drink the water inside, but was stopped by Serdek. Serdek said, Don't drink it to your stomach. After saying that, he took out a water-gathering rune board from his magic backpack, stuck it on the stone wall, and embedded a magic crystal fragment into the gem base of the rune board. Soon, a funnel-shaped water collector appeared in front of the rune board. A lot of water gathered in the middle. Andrew helped Soldak set up the water collector next to the rune board, and then asked Serdek, Captain, do we still want to go in? Serdek rested on a stalactite and said, These H. Alperana flowers will not appear at the entrance of the cave for no reason, so I wanted to take a look inside the cave. Andrew looked at the broken axe in his hand with some distress, and responded honestly, Oh, the marching rations we carry are enough for us to last in the cave for five days, so we don't have to worry about your stomach. Serdek said to the ogre next to him. You put me at ease when you say that. The feeling of being hungry is really uncomfortable. The ogre showed a relieved smile on his face. Samira, were there many caves in this area before? Serdek asked Samira, who had been a guide for a while. The half-elf archer took the map and used the holy light torch in Serdek's hand to find the current location of the team. He also drew a deep mark on the map where there was a mountainous area. And said, I have heard before that there is an underground cave network in the northern suburbs of the city. But this place is usually occupied by ghost monkeys. And the cave paths here are complicated. Very few adventure groups are willing to enter. Those ghost monkeys like to hide in dark caves and blow poison. Arrows themselves are of little value. And this cave is almost their range of activities. But now I can't even see a ghost monkey in the cave. Andrew looked around the cave and found no living creatures. Serdak thought for a moment before saying, the piranha trees outside the cave can grow so lushly, probably because they have absorbed a large number of ghost monkeys as nutrients. Captain, could there be something specifically hunting those ghost monkeys in the cave? And only some of the ghost monkeys escaped from this underground cave? Andrew couldn't help but ask, as if he had thought of something terrible. So we have to continue to explore inside and see what is in this cave. The more Soldak thought about it, the more he felt that the combat team might have gone on the right path due to an accidental collision. A blue flame burst out from the fire-gathering scroll. Andrew put the cooking pot on the fire and waited for the water in the pot to boil before adding the batter-like marching rations so that the cooked porridge would not stick to the bottom. The team ate something before continuing deeper into the cave. Along the way, no trace of the held dog was found. And Serdak couldn't help but feel that he might have thought too much. I don't know how deep this cave is. And the team also encountered some intricate forks. In order to avoid getting lost in the cave, Samira made clear road signs at the most inconspicuous locations at each fork. Here going deep underground. Once you lose your way in the cave, it is not easy to get out of the cave network. The road continued downward. Although the slope was relatively gentle, Serdak could still feel that the team had gone deep into the ground. It was very quiet in the cave. There was not even any living creatures. There was not even moss growing on the stone walls. You could hear the echo clearly when you spoke. The silence was like boundless terror slowly growing in the hearts of everyone. Even Andrew, who had a simple and honest personality, also became a little irritable. The team rested in the cave for a night and walked inside for half a day. Just when Serdak felt that there might really be nothing in the cave, the low roar of H. 
L dogs could be heard faintly from deep in the cave. Chapter 463 Ancient Ruins Worried that the light of the holy light torch would reveal the team's whereabouts. Serdak extinguished the holy light torch. And the surrounding area immediately fell into a cold darkness. The ground in the cave is not flat. There are protruding stone edges everywhere on the stone walls. Some gravels under the feet are as sharp as knives. The stalactite pillars standing on both sides are like spears in the hands of knights. In the darkness where you can't see your fingers, you can see a little bit. If you accidentally hit these rocks, the four members of the team will be unable to move forward. Andrew hit the protruding rock with his head, making a dull sound. Soldak quickly grabbed Andrew and said, Wait! This won't work! Maybe they will have run away before we find the age, L dogs! After all, we still can't adapt to the lightless world. Andrew rubbed his forehead, which had a big bump, with his hands, and said depressedly, But if we light the torch, we become targets in the dark. Serdak squatted down and placed four pottery bowls on the rocky ground, igniting the blue flames inside. A cold light emitted from the cave, and the flames turned everyone's face green, especially the ogre Gullet. Moo's face looked the most terrifying. This was the first time that Serdak started a sacrificial ceremony in front of the team members. Although several sacrificial rituals had been carried out before, the altars were always hidden in tents, and the team members had not seen the complete ceremony. You are the holy essence of light and sound the most beautiful and harmonious, the most dazzling, the most pure and untainted. After Serdak finished reciting this prayer, the face of the two-faced and four-armed demon god turned to Serdak, and the hollow and deep eyes under the mask stared into the distance. Serdak took out two H, L dog heads and placed them on the altar. The two H, L dog heads slowly disappeared in the air, for beams of light fell on the team members. Serdak prayed this time. Is the eye of truth, the Eye of Truth can not only see the mana fluctuations of the magic patterns in the body of Warcraft, but also has the function of detecting invisibility and night vision. The only disadvantage is that the effect of the Eye of Truth can only last for one or two hours, which is far inferior to that of God's blessing. The body is so durable. The ogre rubbed his eyes vigorously and said with surprise, Hey, Andrew, I can see. There was still darkness in front of everyone, but in the darkness, the rock walls and gravel beneath their feet suddenly had light outlines, like some kind of perspective. Samira reached out to touch the stone wall and touch the cold and hard rock wall. Obviously the outlines composed of simple lines in the eyes are real. The half-elf archer suddenly understood why Serdek asked the guards, who treated wounds in the treatment room at the edge of the city wall, to hand over the corpses of H. L. Dogs, and was very lucky to find magic-marked spirit bones from the bodies of these H. L. Dogs. I didn't see him dissecting all the corpses of H. L. Dogs, but he was able to accurately find the precious spiritual bones. Samira asked in surprise. Captain, how did you discover the magic marked spirit bone in the body of the H. L. Dog? Knowing that this matter could not be concealed, Soldak admitted frankly. That's pretty much it. After Andrew possessed the eye of reality, he also knew what this ability meant. He thought of the H. L. Dogs that were killed on the battlefield outside Wazimra City and lamented. Most of the H, L dogs after the dog's body died. It was carried directly to the corpse pile and burned without even looking at it. I don't know how many precious magic marked spirit bones were burned. Samira said flatteringly to Serdak. Captain, otherwise, after this mission is over, we will go outside the city to help clean up the battlefield after returning to the city. We will definitely gain something by then. Serdak knew that the half-elf archers would not let go of any good opportunity to make money, especially after possessing Nye of Truth. The corpses of those H. L. dogs on the battlefield were like untapped treasures. As long as they found that the magic spirit bones made a lot of money. If I blocked Samira's way of making money, the half-elf archer would probably hate me for the rest of his life. However, the issue of principle still needs to be raised up front. Serdak said to Samira, The premise is that it cannot affect the dispatch mission of the Halinsa Guard Battalion. Of course. Samira agreed readily, holding the holy light torch in his hand. Soldak stood next to the stone wall and said to Samira and Andrew, I will help you bless the effect of the Eye of Truth when the time comes. As for who can pick up the spiritual bones, it all depends on its personal luck. You can handle these magic pattern spirit bones on your own so that you can supplement your family income. Samira and Andrew did not expect that Serdak would be so generous and directly gave them all the proceeds from the search for spiritual bones. Both of them were overjoyed. The half-elf girl held her right arm with one hand stood beside Serdak, and said to Serdak excitedly, Captain, 
I want to hear your story about the city of Halanza. Perhaps in her heart, she believed that Halanza city was a prosperous city. Otherwise, how could there be such generous people? Serdak didn't know how to speak for a moment. So he had to organize some words before saying, Well, it is still a cold winter in Halanza city. There have been three heavy snowfalls this winter. It is a very beautiful building. Mountain town. The people in the city are very enthusiastic. Just like Captain Carl. He recalled the scene when he came to the city of Halanza alone on horseback. Before he could finish describing the city of Halanza, Samira, who was walking beside Serdek, stopped and put her finger on her lips. Bien said in a low voice to everyone in the team, Hush! There's a H, lound ahead. The team no longer chatted in low voices, but followed Samira's footsteps and moved forward. In fact, H, L dogs are also very unadapted to extremely dark environments. They rarely attack a city at night unless there are enough firelights on the top of the city. The H, L dog is at the fork in front of the cave. You can see the burning lava flow on it from a distance. This H, L dog is like a moving flame in the darkness. It is in this section of the cave. It was swimming back and forth. But since it was the only light source in the cave, it could not see the space outside the surrounding light. It lowered its head and kept sniffing around with its sensitive nose and listened with its ears. The movement around. Maybe it had heard the conversation of the Serdak team. But in this cave full of echoes, he still needed to carefully identify the source of the sound. It was precisely at this fork in the road that the target suddenly became silent. And the H, L dog could not know which way to go. Suddenly it smelled a strange smell. And it rushed towards the darkness. Before he even had time to cry out, he was struck in the forehead by a large axe that appeared from the darkness. The H, L dog fell to the rocky ground before he even had time to make a whimpering sound. A gash was cut by a sharp axe on its forehead. Its brains burst and it died almost instantly. Even though the bones of its head are the hardest part of the body, it seems a bit fragile compared to a big axe mixed with magic black iron. Unfortunately, this H, L dog did not have precious demon pattern spirit bones. Andrew quickly chopped off the head of the H, L dog. The ogre squatting aside was a little hesitant. He had been eating marching rations for the past two days. When I saw such a big H, L dog, even though I knew eating too much meat from the H, L dog would cause stomachache. I still felt reluctant to part with it. Serdak walked up to the ogre, reached out and patted the ogre's broad shoulder, and said to him, This food is not delicious. When we complete the mission this time, I promise you, we will stay in Wazimra, the city will buy you a whole cow and roast it. You may have never eaten that kind of whole roast cow. There will also be a sheep wrapped in its belly, and there will be a fat chicken in the sheep's belly. These meats will marinate it with spices and salt for a day and a night and there is nothing more delicious than that. Okay, Serdak, I know you will definitely take me to eat such delicious food. Right. The ogre swallowed his saliva and asked with anticipation. Of course, I will definitely do what I promised. Serdak patted his chest and said to the ogre, I really can't wait. How long are we going to stay in this age, lish place? The ogre complained with a depressed look on his face. Samira walked in the front. She followed the path that the age, L dog had taken and walked into the cave. When we find out the secret here, we will find a way out of here, Serdak said to the ogre Gretum. After walking for nearly a kilometer along the path that the hellhounds had taken, a faint howling sound could be heard in the distance. It was unknown how many hellhounds there were in front of them, but the team did not stop because of this. The combat team walked to a stone door that was nearly 10 meters high. Through the eye of reality, Soldak saw that the stone door was carved with simple patterns. They couldn't understand the specific meaning of the patterns on it. From a distance, it looked like a book. Huge magic book. The door was half open. And the sound of the H, L dogs came from inside the door. Serdak could vaguely see the precise gear mechanism hidden in the stone door shaft. He knew that the Green Empire did not have such exquisite mechanical craftsmanship. The combat team passed through this huge stone door and felt gusts of cool wind blowing out through the stone door. At the same time, a faint light came from inside the stone door. Serdak stood at the entrance of the stone gate, and beneath his feet was a huge cave that could accommodate nearly an entire city. There were some dim moonstones on the top of the cave, like stars in the sky. This was the source of all the light in this underground ruins. There is an ancient city ruins hidden in the cave that can't be seen at a glance. Although most of the buildings are dilapidated, and only a pile of gravel and gravel are left. There are still some standing stone buildings among these gravel and gravel. It's just that most of the buildings lack complete roofs. At this time, 
He looked at the team's position carefully and carefully. He found that the team had actually arrived at a long stone platform, where they could almost overlook the extremely vast arched space in front of them. The stone platform where the team was sitting looked like a huge window sill. Maybe only only a giant can build such a tall building. And this 10 meter high stone door doesn't look like a stone door at all. This stone door opens in midair. With no stairs leading down on both sides. It looks more like a huge space. Ventilation window inside. Obviously Samira and Andrew didn't know that there was such a large area of ancient ruins hidden here. A group of H. L. dogs with dark red lava flows on their bodies shuttled through the ruins at their feet. And in front of them, a group of ghost monkeys were scattering. Running. In the dim light. These huge H. L. dogs are rampaging through this building complex. There will always be some slow running ghost monkeys who fall under the claws of the H. L. dogs. When those vicious H. L. dogs bite a lively ghost monkey, they will leave the hunting team and walk along a wide road to the depths of the ruins with the prey in their mouths. This ruins is much larger than the small town of Medjin and is almost as big as the city of Wazimra. Although the city is so dilapidated that only ruins are left, the orderly streets and the buildings turned into gravel say the layout it possesses is incomparable to that of Wazimala city today. A group of underground giants once lived in the Maka Plain? Serdek asked the half-elf archer in a low voice. Although the half-elf archer Samira was once the guide of Wazimala city, she did not know the history of the Maka Plain. So she was unable to answer Serdek's question for a while. She set her sights on Andrew, who explained in the lowest voice. I am just a native of the Nanai tribe. The civilization inherited by our tribe is not as long as you think. Serdak squatted on the stone platform and observed the underground ruins below. This stone platform is dozens of meters high. God knows how the H. L. Dog climbed up. However, if the team members want to get down from here, they need to use a strong rope. Serdak brought a rope in his magic waste bag. But when he originally bought this rope, he only considered the weight of ordinary knights. It is not yet known whether this rope can withstand the weight of the ogre. Soldak said to Andrew and Samira. Those H. L. dogs have occupied this underground ruins. Maybe the devil's door or H. L. passage that the command is looking for is here. We have to find a way to sneak in. The head said to the ogre again. Gritton will stay here to guard our last retreat. Don't worry. I will leave enough food for you to ensure that you will not be hungry. When the ogre heard that there was food, he naturally had no objection. Andrew sighed at this time. It would be great if there was a secondary invisibility potion like the one in Meijin Town. Serdak thought of being among a pile of scrolls in the magic grocery store with Carl in Benna City. At that time, he thought of the battle at Ice Lake Manor. Serdak spent a lot of money and actually bought a few. Secondary invisibility scroll, he said to Andrew. Wait, it seems that I really brought a few bottles. This kind of secondary invisibility potion is not rare in the Green Empire. As he spoke, he rummaged through his magic pocket for a long time before digging out five bottles of secondary invisibility potions from a pile of scrolls. Shall we drink it now? Andrew asked. Samira quickly stopped Andrew's suggestion. She said, In fact, you can drink it when you are in danger. There is nothing more interesting than disappearing under the eyes of those H. L. dogs. And no one knows this. How big are the ruins? How long do we have to wander here? Chapter 464 Civilization in Ruins the three members of the combat team slid down the rope from the high vent. Samira quickly hid behind a broken stone wall. She bent down and stared at a group of H. L. dogs a few hundred meters away. Those H. L. dogs the vicious dog wandered around here for a while, but did not notice that the reconnaissance team had sneaked into the ruins. Serdak stepped on the rubble under his feet and hid behind a broken stone wall with Samira. There was a section of the mouth of a clay pot buried under the gravel. Seeing the exquisite patterns on the mouth of the bottle, he picked it up from the gravel. However, he picked it up very lightly. When he picked it up, he realized that the pot only had a bottle mouth was broken off from the neck of the clay pot, and part of the bottle body remained in the sand. The ruins are full of a sense of age, and most of the mottled stone walls have collapsed. Even those that just stand in the ruins cannot withstand any external force. A light touch may completely collapse the entire wall. Lose. The team of H. Lounds walked farther and farther down the street and finally disappeared from sight. The light on the roof of the cave was very weak. This underground ruins was like the darkest moment at dusk. Only blurry black shadows could be seen a hundred meters away. However, the combat team stood at a high place and could see better. Farther away, the buildings in the ruins of this city are all extremely tall. Soldak walked into a relatively well-preserved residence. 
although the roof had completely collapsed. The basic pattern of the foundation could still be seen clearly. What was left in the ruins, there were some broken stones and pottery fragments. Serdak found that these pottery vessels were very delicately made. And almost every fragment had patterns. Andrew, an indigenous warrior of the Nanai tribe, found a stack of silver plates in a room. However, these silver plates were only palm-sized and covered with a layer of gray-black hard skin. He picked up the heavy ones and scraped off the black skin with a dagger. You can see the pure silver inside. Even if it is covered with a layer of black leather, you can still see the exquisite patterns printed on these silver plates. I hope the archaeologists in Wazimra City will like these silver plates. Andrew happily put the pile of silver plates into his backpack. Serdak walked to a room that looked like a kitchen. Samira was squatting next to a broken low wall. From a stone platform that looked like a stove, she took out a piece of green rusty stone. He lifted off the red copper rune plate and dusted it off vigorously. Smoke and dust filled the air for a while. And Samira was surrounded by thick dust. The magic circle engraved on the rune plate has been damaged beyond recognition. But the magic patterns engraved on it can still be vaguely visible. From the rough outline inside, you can also see the magic patterns on the scroll of Soldak's fire gathering technique. You can find lots of similarities. However, the magic patterns on this ancient magic rune board are much more complicated. This rune board should be worth some money. The half-elf archer rubbed the patina on it hard, trying to see the extent of the damage to the rune board. Serdak was in the corner of the room, looking for a complete-looking clay pot among the gravel. He moved the pot hard and found that it was not moving at all. This made Serdak feel strange about the pot. Even more curious, he took out the craftsman's sword and carefully dug up the sand next to the pot. Captain, you seem to like these pottery very much? Andrew came over and helped Soldak dig out a pottery pot buried in the fine sand. Soldak couldn't explain that he had a very unique attachment to ceramics in terms of antiques. So he smiled lightly at Andrew. This clay pot felt heavy in my hand. It was hard to imagine how this clay pot that looked as big as a king could be so heavy. Serdak used the horn of his dagger to break the calcified mud seal on the top of the clay pot and found that it was half filled with gold sh. ls that looked like small sh. ls. Oh my god! Captain! You found a pot of gold! Andrew exclaimed, which immediately attracted Samira, who was not far away. The half-elf girl also looked at the half-pot of gold with glittering eyes, with an unbelievable look in her eyes. Samira reached out and took out a plump gold sh. L from the jar which was only as big as a thumbnail. Looking at the fine patterns on the SH. L. She exclaimed. I have never seen this kind of gold SH. L. The craftsmanship of these patterns is really exquisite. Andrew also said with great interest. The ruins of this city are really full of surprises. The people who live here do not seem to be giants. These pottery pots and silver plates are not enough to make wine cups for giants. Could it be ancient times? The ruins of an ogre's underground city? Soldak and Samira turned to look at Andrew. And Andrew could only shrug his shoulders and said, Okay, I didn't say anything. These small discoveries inside the ruins completely aroused the team's desire to search. After the three of them left the ruins, they quickly crossed a street and searched for a larger ruin. However, these ruins looked more dilapidated, and there were many of the ruins all had some traces of later life. And they searched for three or four more building ruins in succession except for Samala finding a copper candlestick. Soldak and Andrew didn't gain anything. The initial desire to search and explore gradually calmed down, and the three of them discovered that they had unknowingly walked into the ruins of the city. They were already a long way away from the edge of the ruins. The ruins of the city were very large, and could only be seen occasionally. A group of H, lounged passed by on the main road. The three of them were all stained with cannibal pollen. So the H, L dog's noses couldn't feel their presence at all. These H, L dogs seemed to have poor vision. The darker the place, the less able they were to see very far. So the combat team was Samira's sharp vision. She almost always avoided the H, L dogs searching in the city ruins in advance. Along the way, they saw no trace of the ghost monkey. Some exposed flat strips of rock can be seen on the ground. And in front of them is a square covered by ruins. The building ruins around the square are arranged very neatly. There is also a huge dilapidated ruin in the middle of the square. It looks like this dilapidated ruins like a high tower. After the collapse, only the magnificent base part and the thick stone remain. There are many giant stones scattered around the base. And there are still some exquisite reliefs on many of them. However, judging from the patterns of these reliefs, apart from elves and winged men, the ones that appear most often on the reliefs are a group of races smaller than dwarves. 
They look a bit like those ghost monkeys seen in the jungle. But this race, it seems to have an extremely glorious civilization. They have their own language and writing. And they seem to have created powerful war beasts that can actually wage war against the ancient elven dynasty and the winged people of the sky city. Samira's fingers lightly touched a relief sculpture, which instantly turned into a handful of gravel. The elf girl Samira turned to look at Serdak and asked, What are they? They don't look like humans. Ancestors? Definitely not. Soldak replied firmly. Samira added, Is it the ancient dwarf dynasty? It doesn't look like it either. Soldak shook his head and said, The biggest symbols of the dwarves are the long beards that can be braided, fine wine, huge furnaces, and underground fire veins. And this is just an underground city in a large mountain cave. Why are we bothering with this? Andrew said honestly, standing on a huge gear. He stood on tiptoe and moved a knight's spear with all his strength. This knight's spear was fixed in the center of a huge and flat circular wall. The spear was covered with dust, but it could not hide its exquisite shape. This wall there are three spears with different lengths and thicknesses. The longest one can reach five meters, and the shortest and thickest one is four meters long. Andrew failed to remove the spear from the wall, but his huge strength made the circular stone wall make a dull sound. When dust was flying on the stone walls, after the dust settled, what appeared in front of Serdak was a clock dial with a diameter of more than 10 meters, with 12 areas clearly divided on it, and a very strange text engraved on it. Even though Serdak could didn't recognize it, but he could guess that those above should be some numbers. What Andrew wanted to remove was not the knight's spear at all, but the giant hands on the clock face. Serdak did not expect that this place turned out to be a collapsed clock tower, and after so many years, the clock dial that fell from the clock tower was actually preserved so completely. Andrew's face was covered with dust, hanging on a pointer, and he could not move the pointer with all his strength. At this moment, Andrew's attention had been diverted from these hands. He also found that he could not take away these huge hands with his own strength. He saw a row of hammers under the dial. These hammers should be used by the bell tower. To tell the time, the handles of these hammers are more than three meters long. One side of the hammer head is cylindrical, and the other side is tapered. After the dust has cleared, these hammers actually reveal their bright black color. Serdak didn't know how much magic metal was mixed into these hammers to keep them rustless for thousands of years. At this time, Andrew had already used all his strength to remove a hammer from the metal frame. He laughed and said, This hammer is probably Gree. Timmy likes it. This is much stronger than his big wooden stick. Are you sure you are going to carry this away? Samira looked at the heavy battering ram in Andrew's hand and asked doubtfully. Andrew used all his strength to lift the battering ram in front of Soldek, and said with a smile, I'm going to hand this to the captain. He must have a way to take it away. Perhaps the loud noise just now attracted some creatures around. A ghost monkey crawled out of the drainage channel with a hard scale on its head and a blow dart in its mouth when it saw Serdak and his party and was so frightened that he fled into the ditch. Serdak saw the ferocious face of the ghost monkey. It had short limbs and a disproportionately large head. It was full of sharp teeth. Its big eyes were full of bloodshot eyes. Full of greed and cunning. It had a tooth in its mouth. A blow dart looks a little crazy. As he was running, the figure was somewhat similar to the race on the stone relief. Serdak said with some confusion. Do you think it is possible that the former owners of this underground city ruins were these wild monkeys? When Andrew heard what Serdak said, he immediately laughed and said, Are you talking about these uncivilized subspecies of wild monkeys? If I am the owner of this civilization relic, then I will be the supreme god of this world. Don't talk nonsense. Serdak still had some respect for the gods. He always felt that the sacrificial ceremony was a blessing from a certain god. But these blessings were equivalent to him. This city is very well planned. With neat streets and well-proportioned buildings. Although it is so dilapidated that only a few foundation stones remain. You can still see the drainage trenches dug out on both sides of the road and some intersections are decorated with exquisite carvings. In the public pool, Serdak regretted that he did not study the general history of the world in more depth when he was at the Knight Academy. He just read through the history of the Green Empire and took a general look. From a distance, I saw a three-headed H, L dog leading a large group of H, L dog searching in this direction. The three-headed H, L dog was like a king, patrolling his territory. Serta, of course. The three of them did not want to meet these H, L dogs head on. So the three of them immediately got into the depths of the ruins to avoid these H, L dogs. The three of them did not go far. 
but hung far behind these H, L dogs, following them through half of the ruins of the city. The number of H, L dogs here was obviously more, but the three of them did not find any connection. The evil gate of the underworld. The three H, L dogs led a group of subordinates into a library-like building. This is almost the only building in this ruined city that is still intact. There are nearly a hundred H, L dogs surrounding the library, which can be said to be heavily guarded. Seeing that they could not go deep into it, the three of Serdak carefully withdrew from the area and hid in the ruins. Andrew guessed. Could this be another incubation room for the children of the devil? Soldak shook his head and said noncommittally. We withdraw. As long as we bring this information back, the mission should be completed. The combat team bypassed the patrolling hellhound and planned to return the same way, just as she was passing a ruins not far from Gu Library. Samira, who was responsible for exploring the path, suddenly stopped. Her eyes were looking into a circular ruins. What's wrong? Soldak asked in a low voice. Samira nimbly jumped onto a low wall of a ruins, put her hands on a transparent pointed ear, and listened. After a short while, he said with absolute certainty, There's a shout over there. Hell dog or ghost monkey? Serdek asked casually without reacting for a moment. Green Empire people, Samira said. Serdek stopped and said, Let's go over and take a look. After walking into the circular ruins, I discovered that this area was also filled with a large number of H, L dogs. It was also heavily guarded, and the three of them had no way to get close. Serdak saw a high platform a few hundred meters away, which looked like an altar. So he pointed there. The three members of the team immediately moved over there. As expected, there were not many patrolling H, LS here. Using Samira's keen intuition to avoid the vicious dogs, the three of them secretly climbed up to the dozens of meters high altar and looked down at the circular ruins. This circular ruin looks like a coliseum. There are huge cages in the field. And the shouts are coming from the cages. Chapter 465 Execution Ground The light was dim, and it was difficult to see clearly what kind of prisoners were held in the cages of the Coliseum. The three of them climbed down from the altar platform and hid behind a boulder on the north slope. The field of vision here was very narrow, but they could also see a corner of the Coliseum. Several H, L dogs walked slowly on the street below the altar, with lava flowing slowly on their backs, emitting a dark red light. The two H, L dogs in the middle held twitching and struggling ghost monkeys in their mouths. The two ghost monkeys also screamed, squeaking. The three members of the team hurriedly hid behind the boulder, and the surrounding area became quiet. They could only hear the screams of the ghost monkeys, and could still vaguely hear the hysterical screams in the cages of the Coliseum. After the group of H, L dogs passed the altar, Andrew sat up straight and gently exhaled the breath he was holding. At this time, the Nanai warrior looked at the cages in the Colosseum with puzzled faces and asked strangely, Didn't you say that you never take prisoners when fighting against the H, Lish demons? Why is there a prison here? Serdak thought for a while and said, Maybe there are prisoners of other races being imprisoned. Maybe they are hiding some ulterior secrets. Samira so happened to look up at the dome of the cave, and she whispered, Lower your head. Everyone hurriedly retreated behind the boulder again. A succubus slid over the altar, leaving a dark shadow on the starry cave dome. The succubus fully unfolded its wings and slid far into the air. Then it was fighting again. After hovering in the air for a few times, he landed firmly in front of a cage. His wings folded behind him, as if there were two black flags behind him. Serdak became curious about the cage in the Colosseum. He lowered his head and thought about it. He couldn't convince himself to turn around and go back the same way. So he said to Andrew and Samira, I want to sneak in and see what's inside. The Nanai native warriors and half-elf archers began to check their armors and weapons without saying a word. Serdak added, This operation is a bit risky. We may encounter some emergencies. We must have someone here. Here, I need someone to bring back the intelligence here. When Andrew heard what Serdak said, he immediately said angrily to Serdak, Captain, are you going to leave me here and let me stay as a deserter? We Nanai warriors can't do such a thing. If you want to go, just go together. If you want to go, just go together. He spoke in an unusually firm tone. Serdak also wanted to persuade Samira. He did not want all three of the combat team to take risks. The thin half-elf archer wore a set of red salamander leather armor. In the cave, she did not wear the hood on her head. And an extremely delicate face was exposed under the broken hair. That face was as graceful as an elf. Just a pair of eyes showing a light red color with a kind of eerie beauty. 
She usually rarely speaks because her sweet voice can always destroy the coldness she deliberately maintains. She looked at Soldak and said before he spoke, If you want to go, just go together. If I carry such a reputation again, maybe there will no longer be a place for me in Wazimra City. Many people and guides think that I always like to leave the adventure group and return to Wazimra alone. Those people in the city don't know that I don't want to die with those adventure groups. But this time, I am ready to take a gamble. The three members of the combat team all have something they want to insist on. So Serdak failed to succeed in this combat deployment. The three members of the team prepared to sneak into the Coliseum together. I originally wanted to save a bottle of stimulating invisibility potion. But it seemed that it was not going to work. Serdak sighed softly. Under dim light. After drinking the stimulating invisibility potion, a faint outline will remain in the air. Only by hiding in the shadow of the wall can the body be completely invisible. The three members of the team walked down the altar along the shadow under the wall. A group of H, L dogs had just walked slowly through the street. The three of them quietly crossed the street behind the group of H, L dogs. The H, L dogs heard the subtle footsteps and turned around to look. Looking behind them, the purple eyes revealed a cold murderous aura. But the street behind them was empty. A H, L dog, whimpered, and took a few steps back, trying to sniff the surrounding air to see if there was anything strange. There was a faint stench of piranha in the air, and the H, L dog couldn't help but sneeze twice, and quickly moved away from the disgusting smell. The three members of the team who were hiding in the corner across the street saw the H, L dog, who was only a few steps away from them sneeze twice in a row and left. They didn't even dare to breathe out, and hurriedly followed the shadow of the corner towards the Colosseum. Touch the outer wall. The three members of the team all had experience in sneaking into the small town of Meijin, and they had gradually become proficient in controlling the distance of the secondary invisibility effect. They found opportunities to shuttle back and forth between several patrol teams of held dogs, getting closer and closer to the Colosseum. Entrance. The Hell Demon Clan's vicious dog legions guard the Colosseum extremely tightly. Almost all three entrances to the Colosseum are guarded by giant hell dogs. It is almost impossible to pass by the giant hell dogs without being discovered. The three members of the team waited in the shadows for a long time, but failed to find a chance to sneak in. So they had to give up their plan to sneak into the Colosseum. Samira, who was in the shadow, quietly pointed at the mottled and deserted stone wall outside the Colosseum. Every ten meters on this wall, there was a Roman column with completely blurred carving patterns. She was worried that touching the Roman column would make these the ancient stone pillars were broken into pieces. So the three of them did not touch those stone pillars that would collapse at some point. Samira stood in the shadow of a Roman column and spread her arms. She hooked her hands on the upper edge of the Roman column. Like a juggler, she turned her body upward and folded it in the air. Her two long legs it was extremely light and hooked on the stone slab of the upper window sill climbed up to the second floor upside down, and then squatted on the windowsill. While the H, L dog was not paying attention, he quickly slid down a rope. Serdak quickly grabbed the rope with both hands and stepped on the outer wall with his feet to climb up. Every step he took on the outer wall would cause some gravel to fall. Fortunately, no H, L dog noticed this at this time. The rope hung it was swinging constantly on the outer wall of the Colosseum and was very conspicuous. It wasn't until Andrew quickly climbed up to the second floor that Samira quickly retracted the rope. Not long after the three of them boarded the second floor of the Colosseum, a group of H, L dogs passed by where the three of them were hiding. There is a circular corridor on the second floor of the Colosseum. However, due to the long years of erosion, only most of this circular corridor is left. A large section of the perfect O-shaped corridor collapsed, and now it has become an Omega type. This circular outer corridor has a total of 12 exits which can lead to the second floor stands inside. But now there are only nine exits left, and three exits have also collapsed into ruins. Only the outer wall has not collapsed. Every exit of the corridor is guarded by H, L dogs, making it almost impossible to sneak into the second floor stands. The three of them quietly walked to the collapse of the corridor and wanted to board the outer corridor of the Colosseum's third floor stand from here. However, they found that there were more H, L dogs guarding the fault so they had no choice but to give up the idea and quietly walked around to the nearest corridor. From the position of a row of cages, looking down across the second floor bleachers, you can just see two black iron cages through the gap between the columns of the inner corridor. These two cages are made like huge circular bird cages. The iron black fence is full of thorns. Through the dense black iron railings, you can see the figures inside. Among those people are nobles and knights. 
one there were more than a dozen prisoners squeezed into the iron cage. In order to avoid hitting the thorns on the iron bars, these people gathered in a group in the center of the cage. However, one of the two cages was crowded with people, and the other only held a slender figure. I couldn't get too close to the cage and couldn't see the face of the slender figure clearly. I could only tell that it was a woman with a good figure. A female. She was sitting in the center of the cage, holding her knees with her hands and burying her head between her knees. She was wearing a tight-fitting black leather jacket, and she was carrying something unknown on her back. In the invisible state, all the scenes in the outside world are just shadows. Serdak couldn't see clearly. He moved closer, but couldn't find a better opportunity. At this time, two succubi suddenly appeared in front of the two cages, and the cages containing human prisoners became excited. These prisoners cursed the two succubi, but obviously the two succubi were not what a good temper. He threw the whip in his hand through the cage. Amidst the crackling sound, the prisoners in the cage screamed one after another and quickly became quiet. Obviously, these two succubi were not prepared to tangle with these prisoners. So they directly opened the door of another cage and escorted the female prisoner, who was held alone from inside. The cage became very quiet, and soon the woman in black was taken away by two succubi and a team of H. L. dogs. There are not many succubi in the Maka plane. Serdak has only seen three succubi in total so far. One of them was seen in the small town of Meijin. The succubus left at that time. A son of a demon. It can be seen that there must be some restrictions on the demon gate. And the high level H. L. demons cannot pass through. As for how these succubi sneaked over. It is still unknown. The three members of the team could not find a way to get close to the prison. So they prepared to leave the Colosseum. When they wanted to climb out of the outer window. They happened to see the two succubi with two black flags on their backs escorting the woman in black out of the Colosseum. Under the protection of a bunch of H. L. dogs. They headed towards walk towards the ruined altar. Serdak quickly jumped down from the second floor of the Colosseum. And then hid in the shadow of the corner. Andrew slid down the rope. And Samira retracted the rope. Followed behind Andrew. And jumped down from the second story window sill. She was as light as a swallow and made no sound when she landed. When Soldak saw that the two succubi escorting the woman in black were not escorting the woman in black to the heavily guarded library, he felt the urge to follow them. Fortunately, there were not many patrolling H. L. dogs along the way they were walking. A team of H. Lounds accompanied him to protect him. These two succubi did not climb onto the high altar, but went around behind the altar. Serdak did not expect that behind the altar was a pile of bones filled with all kinds of bones. However, there were mountains of bones here instead. They were the bones of numerous ghost monkeys, as well as the corpses of some H. L. dogs. The stench in the yard was overwhelming. Due to the limited sight distance, Serdak did not see the human bones. There is a stone platform in the open space in the center of the yard. A tall torture demon is standing on the stone platform. The torture demon is holding a guillotine in his hand. He has only four limbs and torso. He is like a headless horseman. Wearing of the tattered armor looks very much like the death knights of the undead clan. But these torture demons are also low-level existences of the demon clan. It can even be said that they do not belong to the H. L. race. But are products derived from black magic. They are not even as good as H. L. dogs. They are puppet monsters that have no thoughts at all and only know how to obey the summoner. There was almost no communication between this group of people. The two succubi escorted the woman in black to the stone platform and delivered a magic stone to the torture demon. It seemed like a talisman or something like that. The torture demon got it. The magic stone climbed onto the stone platform step by step. This team of H. L. Dog guards stood guard around the stone platform. The two succubi seemed unwilling to stay here any longer. They couldn't wait to leave the smelly execution ground. Only a thoughtless torture demon and a team of H. L. Dogs were left on the execution ground. The woman in black knelt on the stone platform of the execution ground and did not resist. She just folded her hands in front of her chest and made a prayer. She looked like this, with her long black hair covering her face, and her leather armor stretched tightly around her body, revealing her bumpy body. Serdak quickly made a few gestures towards Samira and Andrew in his invisible state, indicating that Samira would guard the exit of the execution ground. Soldak and Andrew continued to approach the execution site, waiting for an opportunity. Samira knew that she could not be willful at this time, so she lightly jumped onto a pile of ghost monkey bones and guarded the entrance to the execution ground. Serdak signaled Andrew to approach the group of H. L. dogs and kill the only giant H. L. dog in the group. He was hiding under the stone platform. 
preparing to kill the torture demon on the platform as soon as possible and save the platform. The girl in black was tortured. There were very few women in the Bena army. And Serdak thought the woman in black might be a magician. At this time, the torture demon standing on the stone platform seemed to have received some kind of instruction. His somewhat dull body moved behind the girl in black and quietly raised the guillotine in his hand. Just when the guillotine was about to fall, Soldak signaled Andrew to take action, supported the stone platform with one hand, jumped up, and the craftsman's sword in his hand turned into a white light, instantly killing the executioner. The demon split into two pieces. Serdak rushed to the side of the girl in black, cut off the chains on her body, and stretched out his hand to hold the girl in black's arm. He was startled by a strange slippery feeling. Then, he saw the long curved horns exposed from the purple hair of the woman in black. The woman in black turned her head and looked at Soldak with a horrified expression. Her magnificent amethyst-like eyes released a strange light. The stream of light almost made Serdak's eyes darken, and he fainted on the spot. After going through all kinds of hardships and risking the entire army to be annihilated, the one he saved turned out to be a succubus. Serdak's first reaction was that it was a trap. Chapter 466 A Succubus's Self-Redemption she is an alien among the demons in H. L. She had something special in mind. She likes to breathe the fresh air with the fragrance of green grass. And like to lie on the grass and bask in the sun. She is compassionate. Including other races besides demons. Although she is a succubus. She is unwilling to harm others. Before her death. Her grandma told her never to tell other succubi what she was thinking. Not even her best friend. She had many alternative ideas buried in her heart. And she was unwilling to learn. Regarding the black magic of enchantment, even though her talent is the most outstanding among the succubus clan, she is unwilling to learn black magic. So her own strength has always been the worst among the succubi. Her name is Aphrodite. The blood moon rises and sets on the black land. The people in the cave caves sow the seeds of the night charm in the barren mountains. The seeds of the night charm take root, sprout, bloom and bear fruit. The cave cave people will harvest most of the produce and hand it over. Give it to her. Every other month, she will send a batch of night charms to the Sin King city. Her life is monotonous and boring. She often lies in the field full of night charms, looking up at the blood moon above her head, imagining these things into grass and sunshine. She thought she would live here forever. Until one day, a passage appeared in the territory of Amazdan, the king of Sin, completely breaking the tranquility of the H. L. world. According to rumors, a mysterious human black magician opened the hell passage. Because the power of this demon gate was too weak, the higher demons in the H. L. world could not pass through this H. L. passage. Therefore, King Amazdan sent the largest number of his men. The Hellhound Legion has entered a new world. Among the Hellhounds, even the highest ranking leader of the three Hellhounds only has rudimentary wisdom. In order to strengthen this H. L. passage, King Amazdan found some of the lowest level succubi among the succubi clan and allowed these weak but good black magic succubi to pass through the H. L. passage. Aphrodite was weak because of her low strength, happened to be chosen to be one of them. Many of her companions died in that H. L. passage, but she was lucky enough to reach the new dimension alive. The succubi possessed black magic knowledge from the H. L. world. According to King Amazon's will, they imparted some black magic knowledge to the black magician, and began to assist the black magician in reinforcing the H. L passage and establishing a stable demonic power. Gate. Unfortunately, after a lot of detection and calculation, the coordinates of this plane are still unable to be accurately located. In order to obtain first-hand information, the arrogant king of Mazdan sent an army of H. L dogs to besiege the city of Wazimra, hoping to when the city of Wazimra is captured. The plane coordinates on the astrolabe of the portal in the city must be captured. The war went smoothly at the beginning. But unfortunately, this victory did not last long. After the Imperial Army appeared in Wazimra City, the Hell Dog Legion was immediately caught in a dilemma. King Amazdan even injected pure demon blood into the body of a female H. L. Dog, allowing the pregnant female dog to pass through the H. L. Passage and breed demon sons with demon blood in the new plane. He hoped that these demon sons could become the seeds of the H. L. Demons entering the new world are slowly growing in this world. But Aphrodite didn't want to hide in the dark cave all day long. She wanted to find a chance to go to the ground to have a look. She planned this for a long time before she came up with a feasible plan. It didn't matter if she didn't know the way to the surface. She just needed to rescue a human noble and let him lead the way. So she offered to take charge of the prison here at the Colosseum, taking advantage of her position. 
Aphrodite began to secretly contact human prisoners, learn the language of the human empire, and learn everything about the human world. Succubi are among the demons whose learning ability is second only to the real demons. She quickly mastered the green empire language and learned about many things in the plain world. This also caused more desire to grow deep in her heart. And he couldn't wait to leave the underground cave. But just before leaving the cave, the matter was revealed. The noble showed his flaws while escaping and was captured by the black magician. Aphrodite and Aphrodite were also tried by the black magician. King Amazin gave the black magician great power. In the new dimension, he has the power to deal with any H, L demon. And the black magician sentences Aphrodite to death. At this time, the tribesmen who came out of the H, L passage alive stood up one after another. They collectively begged the black magician and were willing to give up the power to lead the reinforcement of the H, L passage. Aphrodite was saved from death, but was chopped off on the spot. A pair of flesh wings, losing most of the succubus power. Aphrodite was imprisoned in a cage in the Colosseum. But she was not willing to squat in the H, L cage and wait to die. She began to constantly encourage the human nobles, knights, and merchants to launch riots and strive to break out of the cage and regain their freedom. Free. The second plan was exposed. This time, even several tribesmen could not help her. She was sent to the execution ground by two tribesmen. Aphrodite thought she was dead this time. The moment Demon Shing raised his guillotine, she even saw her grandma in the flames. Her grandma's kind smile made her feel like she had returned to the happiest time. She closed her eyes and raised her head. She felt that even if she even if you are dead, you should also be beautiful. Before she could reach the executioner's guillotine, she heard a strange noise behind her. Aphrodite turned around and saw that the executioner behind her was split into two halves by a human knight. He bravely rushed to her side and chopped he broke the chains on his body. Roughly grabbed her wrist and pulled her up from the stone platform. Aphrodite heard that the nobleman said that his men would definitely rush over to save him. So she looked at Soldak with wide eyes and asked excitedly, You are Gilmore's companion. Are you are you here to save him? Do you know imperial dialect? Serdak was dumbfounded when he heard the succubus speak a non-standard imperial dialect. He couldn't hear it clearly for a moment and asked quickly, Who are you talking about? Gilmore, one of your nobles. Are you here to rescue him? I know where he is being held. Aphrodite stood next to Serdak and looked at him expectantly. At this time, she had forgotten how painful the injury on her back was. Soldak was speechless. He had never heard of the name Gilmore. Under the stone platform, Andrew and the giant H, L Dog started a fierce hand-to-hand -hand battle. Samira, who was guarding the exit of the execution ground, shot the ordinary H, L Dogs with bows and arrows. In order to end the battle as soon as possible, Serdak waved his sword and joined the battle group. Aphrodite stood aside obediently, neither resisting nor running away, her face even showed excitement and anticipation. A group of H. L. Dogs did not pose any threat to Serdak. Andrew and Samira. The three of them were only worried that fighting the H. L. Dogs would attract more H. L. Dogs. But they were everywhere around the execution ground. They were all piled up like mountains of bones and relatively secluded. The battle broke out suddenly. The indigenous warriors burst out with powerful combat power. The half-elf archers specialized in hunting down the escaping H. L. Dogs. They eliminated all the H, L dogs in just a few breaths. Dog. Soldak led Andrew and Samira over the dilapidated ruins. And the succubus followed up panting. But she was clumsy and injured. So she couldn't climb the sand fossil wall. Seeing the pitiful look on her eager face. Serdak lay on the sand wall and hesitated for a moment. Then stretched out his hand to her. Chapter 467 Library A sweet smile bloomed on Aphrodite's face. She put her little hand on Serdak's outstretched arm and used Serdak's strength to climb up the heavily deserted stone wall. The four of them did not have time. Pack up the corpse of the H, L dog and escape from the execution ground in a hurry. The sound of fighting in the execution ground quickly attracted the nearby H, Lound Patrol. There were nearly a dozen corpses of H, L dogs lying near the stone platform. Some of the sticky purple blood flowed to the sand and quickly formed black and purple scabs. The giant H, L dog was cut in half with a sharp weapon and the internal organs in its belly flowed. A large group came out, and other H, L dogs. Some had their heads smashed, and some were shot in the eyes by sharp arrows and died on the spot. Ouch! The howls of H, Lound sounded like an alarm in the ruins of the city. The two succubi who heard the warning from the hell dogs were standing on the street, not far from the execution place. They looked at each other, 
with a somewhat complicated mood. They did not fly to the execution place immediately, but saw them appear at the intersection of the street. A large number of H. L. dogs spread their wings and flew into the air, rushing back to the execution ground first. The two succubi saw the body of the executioner demon split in half on the stone platform, and after confirming again and again that Aphrodite had escaped, they returned to the execution ground and pretended to look for clues. At the same time, a three-headed H. Lound arrived with a large group of minions. The three head shot out fearful fury, constantly looking left and right for clues on the scene. Seeing the mess on the execution ground, almost all of which were the corpses of H. L. Dogs. These three H. L. Dogs couldn't help but let out waves of low sounds. Roar. Its three pairs of eyes glared fiercely at the two succubi on the side. Their eyes full of threats and warnings. The three H. L. Dogs and the two succubi did not communicate at all on the execution ground. His men quickly surrounded all areas of the execution site. Not long after, a black magician rode a magic weapon and came from the direction of the library. The three H, L dogs and the succubus looked at the black magician at the same time. The magic weapon brought up a strong wind and fell down. The black magician saw that the H, L dogs and the succubus were standing clearly apart on the execution ground without saying a word, and took the lead, climbing onto the stone platform of the execution ground. He squatted down next to the body of the torture demon that was split into two. Watching the torture demon that he had spent several precious magic materials to summon being split into two halves. The black magician just silently said put the torture demon's broken body into the magic waste bag and prepare to go back and check again to see if it is possible to repair it again. But thinking about drawing an extremely complex magic summoning array, the black magician had a headache. He told the three-headed H, L dog with a sullen face. Instruct your men to capture her again. I want to know the truth about this matter. His demon language was not very fluent. The three heads of the three-headed H, L dog looked over at the same time. The three heads showed different expressions. And their eyes burst out with anger. The head stared at the stone platform without any emotion. He said politely, Every giant dog is the best warrior in the clan. Their death will not be in vain. I will cut into pieces the enemies who killed them. The head with eyes like ice stared at the stone platform and said, At least a team of human construct knights can kidnap the criminals in such a short time. The head in the middle of the three H, L dogs opened a pair of black pupils, and the eyes were filled with deep silence. He said to the black magician, The Imperial Knights team has been mixed into the ruins of this city. They must not be here yet. Go far away. It's probably not too late to look for him now. Seeing that the black magician was noncommittal, it turned around and growled a few times at the giant H, L dogs that had been following behind it. The giant H, L dogs jumped up on the pile of bones and ran out in all directions, mouthing let out bursts of howls. Suddenly, the ordinary hell dogs around him, who heard the howlings gathered towards several giant hell dogs. In just a few minutes, the streets of the ruins of the city were already filled with hell dogs. At the same time, more H, L dogs continued to gather from all directions. And these H, L dogs began to search the ruins of the city like crazy. The ghost monkeys who were originally thought to be hidden were once again found from the ruins by the vicious dogs of H, L, and were chased furiously. The three H, L dogs were like kings, leaping onto the highest pile of bones, raising their three heads and roaring into the air. There were only two succubi left on the execution ground. The black magician turned around and looked at the two succubi coldly, his eyes full of dissatisfaction and warning. The two succubi looked at each other and put their hands on their hands. He shrugged his chest, bowed to the black magician, and asked in a low voice, Sir, what do you need us to do as a succubus clan? The black magician snorted softly from his nose and warned the two succubi in a very dissatisfied tone. I hope you will not protect Aphrodite. Otherwise this matter will be brought to King Amazdan. It won't be so easy. One of the taller succubus quickly stepped forward and said in a sweet voice, we will never protect Aphrodite. She is responsible for all this. I will truthfully report this matter to the leader. The black magician's face softened slightly and said, That's good. The two succubi looked at each other again, and then said, Sir Envoy, if there is nothing else, let's go and rest first. The black magician raised his head again and asked the two succubi, By the way, how are you finding the materials to reinforce the H, L passage? The two succubi quickly lowered their heads and said to the black magician, Recently, the scope of activities of the outside magician investigation team has become larger and larger. Every time we go out, 
we have to take advantage of the night. So we don't gain much. The black magician obviously did not have high expectations for the succubi. He only said, Speed up the translation process of the grimoire. Maybe in the near future, we will be able to obtain the coordinate points of the Maka plane. Maybe King Amazdan will there is a way to reversely reinforce the H, L passage. As long as the demon warriors can enter the Maka plane through this passage. Even if the main force of the Bena Legion arrives by then, they will not be able to defeat the demon army. When the succubus saw what the black magician said, she quickly said, Yes, follow your arrangements. When the three leaders of the H, L dogs summoned all the H, L dogs in the city ruins. Serdak was moving to the edge of the city ruins. Waves of roars of H, L dogs were heard. The giant H, lounged all over the city also took the opportunity to respond. They also stood on the heights of the ruins of the city and roared. The city is filled with the howls of H, lounds. A large number of H, L dogs poured into the city center through various roads. So the Serdak team could only hide in the rubble of a ruins to avoid the large number of H, L dogs. The succubus had been silently following Serdak. The half-elf archer Samira looked up at the street. The originally empty street was crowded with passing H, L dogs. And occasionally a few ghost monkeys walked by. He emerged from the hidden city ruins, spit out a few poisonous needles at the hell dog, and then shook his big head and launched a suicide attack at the hell dog. The H, L dogs bit the ghost monkeys to death, and then continued to move forward with the corpses of the ghost monkeys in their mouths. Samira carefully put down the disguise on her head. She squeezed next to Soldak. Her fine hair was covered with sand. She asked Soldak in a low voice. Now that the ruins of the city are full of patrolling H, Lounds, what are we going to do next? Serdak knew that he could not hide in the crevices of the ruins all the time. The hell dogs would soon search here. So he said, we must first find a safe place to hide to avoid the hell dogs' big attack. Searching, and then looking for an opportunity to leave the ruins of the city. It is not safe here. There are so many H, L dogs searching everywhere outside. Where can we go? Andrew, an indigenous warrior, huddled in the ruins and had difficulty breathing. Serdak and Samira had no idea what to do. And they didn't know where the team would hide for a while. If you ask me, let's just choose a direction and go straight out. I don't think those H, L dogs can stop us. Andrew touched the axe in his arms quite confidently and said, while the three members of the team were struggling, the succubus Aphrodite hid next to her and said weakly, I know a very secret place. It's very safe. And the H, L dogs don't dare to search it yet. In this hiding place where it was difficult to even turn around, the succubus Aphrodite crawled over Serdak, crossed over Samira, and peeled away the sand under the uncollapsed wall behind Andrew. And the bottom was exposed a stone slab came. And the succubus Aphrodite said to Andrew, Help me move this stone slab. Although she spoke Green Empire language, her tone always seemed so weird. Although Andrew remained silent, he followed the succubus words and lifted up the stone slab below with one hand. A dark hole appeared under the stone slab, and some sand slid down along the edge of the hole. Succubus Aphrodite jumped down first. The hole was not deep. Succubus Aphrodite stood in the hole with her upper body exposed. She smiled, but it looked a little forced, as if she was remembering something unhappy. She told the team, Originally, this was an abandoned drainage culvert I discovered after consulting many urban construction drawings in the library. Now this culvert has been dry for who knows how many years but the rock slabs inside have not weathered away. A culvert can lead directly to the outside of the city, which was part of my escape plan. But unfortunately Gilmore was caught before it was used. As she spoke, she lowered her body and got into the culvert. When Andrew hesitated, Samira had already passed Andrew, and her body turned lightly into the dark channel. Andrew gritted his teeth and jumped down from the hole. He was so tall that he had to kneel in the culvert to crawl forward. When Serdak jumped down, he did not forget to restore the stone slabs at the entrance of the cave to their original state. The succubus Aphrodite climbed at the front. It was very dark inside the culvert, and the succubus Aphrodite didn't know what to say. Using magic, her eyes released two beams of light, illuminating the path ahead of the culvert. I don't know how long this culvert has been dry. The ditch has been trampled to be very smooth, and there is no messy debris. Soldak was just thinking about who had cleaned the culvert here so cleanly when he saw a shadow flashing in front of him. Samira quickly put the feather arrow on the forest bow and shot an arrow directly through the shadow. The forest bow in her hand is a type of short bow that can be used even in narrow culverts. 
The succubus Aphrodite crawled faster. In the culvert in front, a ghost monkey's head was shot through by an arrow and fell straight to the ground. The other ghost monkeys in the culvert ran away in fear. It turns out that this is their hiding place. Andrew said with a sigh as he looked at the ghost monkey that had been shot through the head. The succubus Aphrodite looked at the ghost monkey with complicated eyes, not knowing what unhappy thing she thought of. She collected herself and continued to lead the way. After Samira shot and killed seven ghost monkeys in a row, the ghost monkeys hiding in the culvert finally did not dare to appear in the public eye again. The succubus Aphrodite crawled in front of her for a long time and finally got together. We stopped in front of the shaft, which was a bit more spacious. At least everyone can take turns to stand up and stretch their muscles. And the bottom of the culvert is covered with some fine river sand. Even if you lie down when you are tired, you can still sleep. This is indeed a very good hiding place. Everyone thought this was the hiding place chosen by the succubus Aphrodite. Serdak even wondered whether the secret passage formed by this culvert could lead to the outside of the city. But at this moment, the succubus Aphrodite climbed up quietly along the ladder of the shaft. She pushed open the manhole cover and got out. Samira was afraid that she would run away alone. So she also got out after him. Soldak and Andrew hurriedly followed. The shaft was connected to a long and narrow corridor, which was almost like a long and narrow gap in a building. The succubus Aphrodite pried open a ventilation duct, which was even narrower, and Andrew could only crawl inside. Passing through the thick wall, the four members of the team walked into a slightly brighter room. What entered Serdak's sight was a room with walls lined with books. The moonstone on the roof of the room released soft light. There was a tilted desk in the center of the room. Serdak stood behind Aphrodite, looking at this very private room. Asked the succubus, Where is this? The succubus Aphrodite sat down next to the desk. She glanced at the bookshelves on the surrounding walls and replied, A room in the library. You took us to the library? Serdak didn't expect Aphrodite to be so bold, and couldn't help but feel a little confused. Without the special envoy's order, no H, L dog will come close to here. We can hide here for a while, and they will never think that we will be here. After saying that, she walked to the wall, pointing to the books on the wall bookshelf. He added, Here are records of all the civilizations that once existed in this ancient city. It may be helpful for you to understand the ruins of this city. Oh, by the way, I have heard the special envoy use the Grim Empire describes this period of history, calling it the Hexian Civilization of the Goblin Era. Chapter 468, She is a Succubus. This is one of the many rooms in the library. Dozens of moonstones are inlaid on the roof and ceiling, emitting a faint glow. Perhaps because of the confined space, the books on the bookshelves have not decayed over the years. These the color of the book cover is still so bright. Serdak planned to look through the books on the bookshelf only to find that the text recorded on the side of the books belonged to ancient goblin script. He couldn't understand it at all. Of course, he couldn't start for a while. Serdak had never heard about it, the era of Hex or any history related to goblin civilization. As for Samira and Andrew, the former grew up in an orphanage and the latter was born in a Maka aboriginal family. Their education was quite limited. So for goblins, no one can tell exactly what species it is. The wooden ladder next to the bookshelf also has guide rollers. These bookshelves are nearly four or five meters high. No matter where you want to pick up the books, you can push this wooden ladder over. This wooden ladder is coated with a layer of Soldak put his hand over the thick oil paint and found that the wood inside the paint had become fibrous, like cotton wool wrapped in the paint. Serdak felt that if he exerted just a little more force, the seemingly well-preserved ladder might collapse right before his eyes. After the succubus Aphrodite introduced the books here, she sat in front of the long table. She looked a little cute and sat there awkwardly. After she calmed down, she spoke seriously to Serdak. Said, Thank you for saving me. The girl's delicate and fair face was like a ripe red apple. The Green Empire language has a weird accent. And her voice is very special. Although it sounds a little hoarse. It makes people feel very comfortable. As if it has some kind of magnetism. She was wearing a tight leather jacket that outlined an exaggeratedly perfect figure with a slender waist and plump hips. When she crawled into the ditch just now, her body was covered in dust, and she looked a little embarrassed, especially after a pair of wings on her back were chopped off. There were still two slightly raised scars. The blood from the wounds had completely scabbed, but it seemed that Aphrodite was still enduring the pain there, and she had not recovered from it yet. After losing his wings, he was completely freed from the sense of imbalance, and he still stumbled a bit when walking. She wanted to see the condition of her back. But unfortunately, she couldn't see it even though her body was very soft. 
Zerdak handed over a roll of hemostatic bandage. But Aphrodite didn't reach out to take it, looking at him with confusion. You also saved us just now. So we are even, Zerdak said, and then said to the succubus, Aphrodite, can I tell you something about the situation here? Samira took the roll of hemostatic bandage and asked Aphrodite if she could help, probably knowing that losing her wings had become an irreversible fact. Aphrodite shook her head at Samira. Then, she seemed to have figured out something, and her face turned a little pale. She looked at Suldak and said, You are not Gilmore's knights, and you are not here to save him. Until now, you have not asked about his situation. You don't care about his life or death at all. Aphrodite stared into Serdak's eyes very seriously. Serdak spread his hands and said, We are the reconnaissance team of the Bena army and are on a mission. It was a complete accident that we came here. However, if conditions permit, I am willing to rescue them from prison. Aphrodite seemed to want to find the real answer in Serdak's eyes and said to Serdak, He said he was Baron Gilmore, a noble of high status in your place. As long as anyone knows that he is if he is locked up here, we will definitely find a way to rescue him. Soldek tried his best to sound sincere, although he had never heard the name Baron Gilmore. He still said, Of course, compared to common people, the status of all nobles is very high, Aphrodite said. If you need someone to lead the way, I can help you. I know where he is being held. We just need to sneak over and rescue him from there. There are only some H, L dogs guarding him. Serdak looked at Aphrodite and asked with some confusion, Why are you willing to help us? Aren't demons and humans supposed to be mortal enemies? Aphrodite shook her shoulders again, seeing that she was a little uncomfortable. Samira walked behind her and wanted to use a bandage to bandage the place where her wings were cut off. The succubus felt Samira as he gave her a kind, grateful look. Then he answered Serdak's question. The great demon lords and the angels in the high-level temple are the mortal enemies, and this time we are considered the invaders. Although this is not my intention, it will happen in real time. So, and I just want to see the sunshine, beach, see breeze and grass in this world. I want to lie on the beach and bask in the sun. I don't need to completely occupy this place to do these things. I hope that the demons can interact with other people. Races coexist in a certain plane. And I also know that my idea is a bit naive. The girl in front of Soldak may be an alien among succubi. After all, there are big differences between succubus and succubus. Just like there are some magical heretics in the Green Empire. They want to welcome the darkness all the time. Serdak asked her curiously, Who did you learn the Grim Empire language from? Aphrodite replied, Envoy Jesse Houseman. He has the highest say here. And he has very powerful power. Speaking of the special envoy, Aphrodite seemed very afraid and even spoke in a slightly lower voice. Serdak asked her, Is he a succubus? Or a three-headed H, L dog? Or a son of the devil? Aphrodite shook her head and said, No. In fact, we don't know his identity. But we guess he may be a human magician with demon blood. Hearing what Aphrodite said, Serdak thought that someone had opened the passage to H, L. And that person now seemed to be the special envoy. He tried to ask. The special envoy is the black man who opened the passage to H, L. The magician? He's right here? By the way, where is the devil's door? Serdak suddenly thought of the purpose of the combat team's mission but he didn't expect to hear news about the H, L passage here. Aphrodite thought for a moment and then said, The passage to H, L is not here. It should be far away from here. When we came here, we walked out of the darkness for a long time. I am not sure where it is. We are here to find some magic information from the Hex era and to find ways to crack the plain laws and strengthen the H, L passages. But there is no progress yet. Andrew waved the axe in his hand with some excitement and said, It doesn't matter. As long as we catch the Black Magician, we can ask him about the location of the H, L passage. Aphrodite looked at the three members of Serdak's team, but shook her head slightly and said, He has many guards around him. Among all the members of our succubus family who entered this plane, the two strongest guards will never leave. Beside him, in addition, there are four three-headed H, L dog leaders taking turns to guard him. If we cannot catch him at the first time, we may be surrounded by a large group of H, L dogs. Serdak touched his chin and said, I think our strength alone may be a little insufficient. Maybe we need some partners, Aphrodite. How should we go to rescue our companions? Aphrodite did not expect that the thoughts of the members of the Serdak team would change so quickly. Just now, they had no interest in rescuing their companions. But now, they were eager to take action. However, 
She thought about it and came to this library. When he came to the vent, he said, follow me. He led the Serdak team into the culvert again. There were almost no ghost monkeys in this culvert. As the H, L dogs launched a comprehensive manhunt in the ruins of the city. There were fewer guard dogs on the Coliseum side. There were several sturdy round spire iron cages in a row of animal pens on the east side of the Coliseum. These cages are surrounded by magic circles. The prisoners are squatting inside the cages. And a faint magic halo flashes from time to time on the ground. Several giant H, L dogs were lingering next to the cage. Looking at the cage with eager eyes. As if if the prisoners in the cage made the slightest movement. They would rush into the cage and tear these humans into pieces. There are six cages in total. Among them. The cage where the succubus Aphrodite was imprisoned is now empty. The other five cages are almost full of prisoners. But one iron cage cannot hold many people. The total number of these prisoners is there were less than 50 people. The armors, weapons, and coats of the prisoners inside had been stripped off. Many knights were injured. There were also some merchants and nobles inside. They huddled together with dejected expressions, trembling for their upcoming fate. Trembling. They dare not move. The iron bars of this kind of cage are covered with sharp thorns. Only by standing in the center of the cage can you avoid being pricked by the thorns. Prisoners at the edge may be hit by them even if they twist their bodies. The iron thorns stab people. So everyone could only huddle in the middle. This will not only avoid being punctured by thorns, but also avoid being bitten by the H, L dogs patrolling outside the cage. A giant H, Loun had just turned around the inner corridor of the Colosseum when it saw a big axe coming towards it. It had no time to dodge. And its skull was smashed by the big axe. Serdak rushed out from the corner and held him up immediately. Letting the giant H, L dog's body lean against the wall silently. Samira drew her bow and shot two arrows. Killing the two ordinary H, L dogs guarding the door. Serdak's team unexpectedly rushed to the second cage so easily. Before the other H, L dogs could when he reacted. Serdak waved the craftsman's sword in his hand and hit the big iron door bolt of the cage hard. With a dang sound, the big iron door bolt fell to the ground. Serdak kicked open the large iron door of the cage, leaned half of his body into the cage, and used the craftsman's sword to cut off the tree vines tied to a knight. The knight regained his freedom, and immediately helped his companion untie the ropes tied to his body. The knight's spirit was a little sluggish, and he didn't seem to be in a good condition. But at this time, he still asked Serdak, Which team are you in? Of? Serdak replied, Alanza guard camp. As he spoke, he blocked the H, L dogs from jumping towards the cage. The knight thought carefully for a moment, and it seemed that the Bena army in his memory really didn't have this number. Then he realized that the other party was actually the local army, and asked, How many armies have come to the Legion this time? Serdak was slightly startled. He stood at the door of the cage and looked back at the knight. He smiled at him and said, Everyone is in front of you the so-called everyone except himself. There is also the Nanai warrior Andrew, who is blocking the entrance to the animal pen on the east side, and standing on the second floor of the stands, avoiding the bites of the H, L dogs around him, while constantly shooting in this direction. Samira of Arrows. This is the H, L dog in the Colosseum. All the H, L dogs have gathered here, and the howls of the H, L dogs can be heard everywhere, as if calling the H, L dogs in other areas. Suddenly, in the Colosseum. It's like opening a pot. Serdak threw the craftsman's sword in his hand to the knight, and took out the blood-red crescent moon from his waist. The two of them stood at the door of the cage, one on the left and one on the right, helping other prisoners in the cage to escape. Regardless of their injuries, the prisoners rushed out of the cage one after another, and fought with the H, L dogs that were coming one after another. The knight held the craftsman's sword in his hand, and did not dare to delay. He quickly walked towards the second cage, and wanted to cut off the iron door bolt like Serdak. But he used all his strength to cut it three times in a row. Shocking his arm was numb before he cut off the iron door bolt. He looked at his hand, and felt that maybe it was because his condition was not at its peak. At this time, Soldak was already standing at the fourth door, assisting the prisoners inside to come out. And this cage was obviously filled with nobles and businessmen. They must have been tortured a lot. And everyone walked out of the cage with injuries. They did not dare to face the H. L dogs that rushed towards them and hid behind Soldek. At this time, the succubus Aphrodite staggered over from Andrew. She ran to Serdak, hugged the arm of a pale noble, and asked him excitedly, Guremo, it's great that you are still alive. I thought those guys had eaten you. 
the noble's eye sockets were sunken and there were bruises on his face. He was slightly startled when he saw the succubus Aphrodite. Several nobles behind him saw the curved horns hidden in Aphrodite's hair, and they all looked at the noble named Gilmore with expressions of astonishment and disbelief. Gilmore, what are you doing? Do you still want to have an affair with the demons? Baron Gilmore was so frightened that he could hardly stand. He looked around helplessly, and his eyes fell on Serdek, who was wearing a bloody shirt. He broke free from Aphrodite's hands, ran quickly to Serdek, and pointed at Aphrodite. Frodi shouted loudly, Catch her quickly! Knight! She is not a human being! She is a succubus! I have nothing to do with her! A disgusting and cunning succubus! I am a succubus! How could the Imperial Baron be related to a demon succubus? Chapter 469 Sword Dancer Haynes The knights, nobles, and merchants who rushed out of the cage all around looked at Aphrodite with vigilance. For them who had just escaped from the trap, the gaze seemed to tear everything apart. They stared at the lost person with hatred. A succubus girl with wings. Gilmore's voice spread far away. And even Andrew in the distance put down the axe in his hand and turned his head to look this way. Aphrodite stared blankly at the noble with pale face and sunken eye sockets. Only then did she finally wake up. What the noble in front of her said before was all lies. No one is more powerful than the succubus. She is good at weaving lies. But at this moment, she is more of a fool than anyone else. It was as if a bucket of ice water was poured down on her head on a hot summer day, chilling her body from the inside out. She stared at Baron Gilmore, her lips trembling slightly and unable to say anything. She looked around at the people who were looking at her. The prisoners stared angrily, and some even wanted to rush up and kill them with a sword. Several nobles stood beside Gilmore and shouted sternly at the surrounding knights fighting against the H. L. Dogs. Why are you still standing there? Why don't you kill this succubus quickly? Don't forget. We were caught here thanks to someone. Compared to the angry nobles, the knights who escaped from prison were much calmer. They would stand side by side and jointly resist the H. L. Dogs rushing up from the side of the Colosseum. They had basically none of them had any decent weapons. They basically picked up whatever they could pick up from the ground. A few knights held chopped iron door bolts in their hands, while the rest of the knights picked up some gravel from the ground and were fighting. Fight hand to hand with the rushing age, L. Dogs. Serdak walked non-stop towards the last two cage doors. The prisoners in the cages had already crowded to the door, waiting for the iron door to be opened, so that they could rush out immediately. At this time, no one was afraid of the iron bars anymore. With those iron thorns, they were only worried that they would be left behind if they fell behind. He didn't want to delay for a moment. If he stayed here for a second longer, the danger would increase. He shouted at the succubus Aphrodite, who was almost falling into the abyss at this moment. Aphrodite, this side. Serdak's words suddenly interrupted the nobles, and they glanced at Serdak before retracting their resentful gazes. The succubus Aphrodite came back to her senses and did not want to look at Baron Gilmore. She turned around and ran towards Soldak without hesitation. Her eyes filled with moisture that was somewhat disappointing. Seeing the nobles who had just escaped from trouble standing there in a daze, Serdak shouted to them unceremoniously, Come and break the iron door bolt of the cage. We don't have time to be dazed here. Forgetful guys, did you forget who rescued you just after you escaped from that cage? The shame of the nobles only flashed across their faces, but they did not continue to be in a daze and quickly followed everyone's footsteps. They did not want to rush to the front, nor did they want to fall behind. A group of people crowded in a mess. Together, the scene becomes extremely chaotic. Serdak stood in front of the cage and cut off the iron door bolt with a sharp blood-red crescent scimitar. Several knights with chains all over their bodies rushed out of the cage. Serdak completely ignored the blade of the blood-red crescent. Will it break? Use all your strength to cut off the chains on their bodies. And these chains will become weapons in their hands. Almost everyone in this cage is injured. But they are a group of knights with the best quality. After rushing out of the cage, he quickly rushed to where Andrew was, helping Andrew share the pressure of the H. L. Dogs. A lame but quite imposing swordsman dragged his upper leg up to Serdek squinted his eyes and looked at the chaotic Colosseum and said, while the large group of H. L. Dogs are still there, if we don't arrive, we have to unite and find a way to rush out. Another knight holding the craftsman's sword opened the iron door of the last cage and released the last batch of prisoners from the cage. All the prisoners rushed towards the exit along the inner corridor of the Colosseum. Andrew was wearing a full suit. He was wearing armor and rushed to the front with a sharp axe in his hand. He was flanked by two knights holding long chains in their hands. The H. 
elf dogs that rushed towards him fell under the giant axe. The half-elf archer and the succubus Aphrodite followed Serdic, wrapped in the group of prisoners, rushing along the broken corridors, through the collapsed gap of the Colosseum, and rushed to the streets of the ruined city. The H, L dogs around the animal farm are rushing towards this side. A halo of power lit up under Serdek's feet. And people standing around Serdek surged with inexplicable power from under their feet. Everyone saw that Serdek had a knight's halo. And their confidence and courage surged. At the same time, the swordsman who was lame with one leg clasped his hands on his chest. Different from the knight's halo, there was a black sword full of bloody aura suspended above his head. And waves of halo radiated from the black sword. After going out, everyone's vision became much clearer. This was within the scope of power controlled by the sword dancer. The H, L dogs that came one after another did not form a large scale. So they fell at the feet of these prisoners one after another. During this period, people were injured one after another. But everyone was trying their best to escape from this place. And they did not let these H, L dogs form a siege. Serdak and Andrew stood side by side. And not even the giant H, Laon could stop the two from moving forward. At this time, no one fell behind. Because everyone knew that falling behind meant death. They almost walked and killed all the way. These people dragged their scarred bodies. But they burst out with unprecedented powerful fighting power. The nobles were surrounded in the middle of the team. They seemed to take it for granted. And the businessmen followed at the end of the team. When the team approached the library, a large group of H, L dogs had gathered around the library. But no H, L dogs rushed up from there. The nobles in the team found that there were a large number of H, Lounds gathered at the library. They seemed to have no intention of participating in the battle. These nobles began to yell at Serdak and Andrew, who were at the front to change their breakout route. They did not want to run into them head on. Get on the iron plate. Listen. Knight! We shouldn't go that way. It's a dead end. If we hit it, we will be shattered to pieces. The nobles and the team shouted at Soldak. Because of the dispute, the team slowed down its progress. Seeing many nobles staring at him with questioning eyes. Serdak knew that he could not unite these people at all. So he jumped onto a stone step by the roadside, stood on a high place, and Serdak used pointing to the library not far away, which was as silent as the mouth of an abyss. He said loudly to everyone, Hey, everyone, I know there is a very powerful black magician here. He opened the passage between H, L, and the Maka plane. Is anyone willing to go with me to arrest the black magician? I, we need helpers. And maybe many of us will die. But the reward for us is also great. Once we catch him, we can learn the news about the H, L passage from his mouth. The enthusiastic team instantly cooled down. And the nobles and the team said one after another, detecting the passage to H, L is what the Bena army has to do. We are just a group of nobles without any fighting ability. The road home is blocked by H, L dogs. If we if we delay here any longer, what awaits us will be torn apart by those mad dogs. We must leave here as soon as possible and escape from here before those H, L dogs have time to assemble. Gilmore stood among the nobles and shouted to everyone, As long as we can break out of the ruins of this city, we are surrounded by underground caves as dense as spider webs. As long as I get into these caves, I have a chance to escape from here. Obviously they were not willing to take risks with Serdak. And the few businessmen chasing at the end of the team also dragged their exhausted bodies to the front of Serdak and said in an almost pleading voice, Master Knight, Please, please let us businessmen go. We have no fighting ability, and following you will only become a drag on you. We want to leave together with the nobles. Serdak looked past the nobles and businessmen with flashing eyes, and looked at the knights, who were fighting bravely in the team just now. When his eyes touched these knights, most of them almost wanted to retreat into the crowd or lower their heads. Avoiding Serdak's gaze, Serdak raised the blood red crescent in his hand and asked loudly to the group of people in front of him, Who wants to stay with me? Andrew and Samira took the lead to walk out from the front of the crowd. The succubus Aphrodite also knew that she could not stay among this group of people. After thinking for a moment, she followed the steps of the half-elf girl and walked out. The three of them stood alone. Together, we'd love to join in. The five knights with outstanding combat prowess stood up. And it was obvious that they were probably together. If one person made a decision, the others would follow without hesitation. Count me in. The lame swordsman stepped out of the crowd. Even so, there were only 11 people left. The remaining group of people did not delay any longer. They focused their attention on the increasing number of H, L dogs gathering on the street. 
This fighting group composed of prisoners was heading towards the edge of the city's ruins. Cernak's team parted ways with the main force, and the team headed towards the library. Without many burdens, the group became much more flexible. The H, Lounge would be quickly eliminated as soon as they got close. Moreover, Serdak did not rush directly to the library, but rushed into a ruins with complex terrain. Those H, L dogs that rushed up were quickly killed by Soldak. And for a moment, he actually got rid of the tracking of the H, L dogs behind him. All of these new knights were injured. Serdak took everyone to hide in a wall with a collapsed roof in the ruins. He took out some hemostatic bandages from his magic pocket and distributed them to Andrew and Samira and then quickly used holy light to treat these knights and bandage their wounds, and also took out some marching rations and water bags and handed them to them. They were locked in a cage, and they didn't know what they had eaten these days. A few people were not polite, and poured the marching rations in their hands directly into their mouths, and then drank a lot of water, and their complexions improved a lot. Seeing that Serdak actually possessed divine power, these knights showed a look of respect in their eyes. Serdak checked the swordsman's leg injury. The swordsman's calf was almost bitten by the age, L. Dog. I don't know how he survived such a serious injury. Not only did he not hear his cry of pain, but walking with just a limp, Serdak scraped the rotten flesh off the swordsman's calf and used holy light several times before bandaging the wound again. It's a pity that he doesn't have any more weapons in his hand. The supplies in Serdak's magic waste bag have been almost emptied out in the past few days. There are only some useless H. L. Dog heads left in it. He hesitated for a moment. Although he was a little reluctant to part with it, he still gave the swordsman the blood red crescent in his hand. The swordsman was stunned. He thought that even if Serdak had a spare weapon, he would not lend him the most convenient weapon in his hand. And the scimitar of the blood red crescent was also a magical weapon with attributes. Seeing the swordsman's hesitation, Soldak took out the holy light torch from the magic belt bag and said, I rarely use this. I'm usually afraid of breaking it. You used to be the battle priest of the temple? The swordsman asked curiously. Soldak shook his head. The swordsman clearly saw Serdak lighting the incandescent flame on the top of the torch. But Serdak said that he was not a battle priest. And he did not struggle with this matter. He just sighed and said, Like you, as a knight with the power of the holy light, why did the headquarters let you join the reconnaissance team? Don't they know that you will be more useful in team battles? I need some military merit to exchange for a pass and voluntarily sign up to join the reconnaissance team, Serdak explained. But he immediately realized that the rest time was precious. So he began to say, Reintroduction. We are from the Helensa Guard Camp. Captain Serdak accidentally entered the ruins of this city and found that a black magician knew the secret of the passage to H. L. He wanted to sneak into the library to capture the black magician. But we need help. This is also the purpose of our attack on the Colosseum prison. The other group of knights sitting against the wall said, I thought you were captured by the succubus too. After speaking, these knights once again glanced at the succubus Aphrodite huddled in the corner with hostility. At this time, Samira was treating the wound on Aphrodite's back. Were you captured here by the succubus? Serdak asked in surprise. He had been guessing how these prisoners got here. The H, L dogs would not leave anyone alive. Seeing those few the knight nodded, and even the swordsman in front of him showed embarrassment before he finally got the answer. Why did they arrest you? Soldak asked again. At this time, the swordsman said with a somewhat solemn expression, Those demons caught us and locked us up here, probably so that the succubi could transform into us and sneak into Wazamala city to gather information. Serdak looked at the succubus Aphrodite, who nodded nervously. The swordsman looked at Soldak and said, Cain's constructed swordsman group. Thank you for coming to the rescue this time. Chapter 470 Empty Room After Soldak entered Wazamala city with the guards of Alinsa, he cooperated with the city defense troops to carry out a defense battle of Wazmara city. As reinforcements from all walks of life continued to enter Wazmara city, city, the Hell Dog Legion outside the city did not continue to launch large-scale sieges. But the fighting outside the city gate continued every day, and a large number of Hell Dogs were wiped out by the knights. The Hell Dog army cannot stop the heavy cavalry of the Bena army and the most elite constructed swordsman group of the Bena army has begun to point its swords backward, allowing the Hell Dog army to continuously appear in the Maka plane. Hell Passage The top leadership of the Hell Legion are also aware of this problem. At the same time, the plan to reinforce the H, L Passage is also in full swing. Once the reinforcement of the H, L Passage is completed, 
the main force of the Hell Legion will enter the Maka Plane. The combat effectiveness of the Demon Warriors is far beyond imagination. Today, the Bell Legion is far away in the Warsaw Plane. During the war, it was impossible to withdraw from the Warsaw Plane in time, and the existing military strength of Vatsmra's city could not stop the Demon Army. The focus on the battlefield has also shifted from the siege of Wazimra city to the destruction of the H. L. Passage on the Maka Plain. For this reason, Marquis Luther sent a large number of reconnaissance teams into the wild jungle. In order to avoid exposing the Devil's Gate prematurely, in addition to sending a large number of H. L. dogs into the battlefield, the Hell Legion's top brass also dispatched succubi to conduct large-scale infiltration operations. Swordsman Haynes leaned against the sand wall and said to Serdek, this time, the succubus has penetrated the legion very extensively. In addition to the various departments of the Bena army, it also includes some nobles and businessmen in Vazmla city. In addition to controlling the movements of the legion, they are also preparing to cause some riots and chaos within the legion to support the army's progress and by time to reinforce the H. L. Passage. There was a sound of H. L. dogs running past outside, and everyone held their breath. The H. L dogs did not notice the small group of people who were only separated by a wall. Swordsman Haynes paused for a moment and waited until all the hell hounds had gone away before continuing. I think even if this operation fails, one of us must leave here alive and take out the information here. After speaking, he looked at Suldek seriously. Serdak nodded and introduced to Swordsman Haynes. She is Aphrodite. To be honest, you should thank her. It was she who brought us to the Colosseum prison. I think she is worthy of trust. These he is a member of the security team in the deserted land outside the mountain pass of the Helensa Guard Battalion's response squadron. He spoke a long list of names. And he didn't know how many of them Swordsman Haynes could remember. In fact, it was enough to remember the Helensa Guard camp. I know. The smile on Haynes's face was somewhat intriguing. And then he explained, I saw her when we were in the cage. Her behavior is indeed a bit special and she is not as full of enthusiasm for us as other succubi. Hostile, and also full of curiosity about the human world. Baron Gilmore wanted to take the opportunity to get close to her to escape from here, but that idiot did not keep the secret. His conspiracy was discovered by another succubus. After the matter was exposed, this afu Miss Luo de Succubus had her wings cut off and was locked in a cage. I didn't expect that you would actually save her. Serdak did not expect that this succubus lady who came to H. L would meet a scumbag, lose her wings and almost die. But she would actually convince his team to go to the prison to rescue them. And after the rescue was successful, he was that Gilmore kicked away and was completely sold twice. No wonder she looked frustrated. She definitely couldn't go back home now. Maybe experiencing these things would make her more mature. Soldak told Haynes. I didn't see her clearly at the execution ground. I thought she was a human being about to be executed. It was only after I rescued her that I discovered she was a succubus. But she seemed different from other succubi. Aphrodite smiled at Haynes. The smile was a little forced. After taking a short rest, Serdak stood up from the ruins and said to the group, Let's go! Hoping to find clues about the transmission channel. He did not lead everyone out of the ruins, but asked Aphrodite to find the context of the culvert. Enter the culvert again, and sneak into the library quietly. Haynes then discovered that Serdak's team was not completely unprepared. These plans seemed to have been planned long ago. There must be someone who was unwilling to participate in this mission. Serdak did not force them to leave. It has also become part of the plan. Those nights, nobles and merchants will never know until their death how many H. L. dogs they have lured for the Serdak team. Even if someone is lucky enough to leave here alive, they will not be willing to stay in Serda if you appear in front of everyone in the Kutim. You may stay away from them when you see them. So you have already made a battle plan. Towardsman Hain said with a look of surprise. Soldak held the holy light torch and followed Samira. He turned back and said to Swordsman Haynes, Of course, although we are willing to take risks, it does not mean that we have to bite the bullet and die. I hope that in the future under the protection of those knights, this group of nobles and businessmen can go further. Swordsman Haynes followed everyone and crawled out of the vent. Entering the library, he was stunned when he saw the tall bookshelves and the various books neatly arranged on the bookshelves. He didn't expect that there was such a place among the ruins. He raised his head and saw the bright lights on the ceiling. The moonstone looked like stars. And he swallowed lightly. Moonstone, a non-renewable mining resource, was definitely not cheap in the Green Empire. Who would have thought that the roof of this library was actually embedded with moonstones? He raised his head 
and walked around in the middle of the room. Feeling dizzy, he quickly closed his eyes and stopped looking at the moonstones before he felt better. He said, All the ruins outside have almost turned into sand. But here can actually, if they are so well preserved, can these books on magic parchment really remain incorruptible for thousands of years? Perhaps there is a magic circle of this type in the library to prevent books from decaying due to the passage of time. Soldak had also thought about these issues before. He was the magician Celia Cooper hidden in the magic notebook, secretly telling him a possibility. He continued, Not only the books here, but also the bookshelves, tables, and chairs in the library have not changed in any way due to the changes of time. You mean the entire library is engraved with that kind of magic pattern? Swordsman Haynes took a breath of air. How could Serdak know so much? Time was tight, so he did not continue to talk in depth. Samira pushed open the carved door of the room, made some slight noises, and attracted the three patrolling H, L dogs back in the corridor. With the cooperation of the knights, they easily made these H, L dogs disappear quietly. The sound of killing. Then the body of the H, L dog was hidden in this room. Serdak stood at the door, glanced at the empty corridor outside, shook his head to the team and said, Let's go. Let's go see that person. Black magician. There is a wall lamp with soft light every ten meters in the corridor. There are two brightly colored oil paintings between every two wall lamps. The wall lamps on the opposite side of the corridor are staggered. This sense of asymmetry just makes everyone in the corridor more comfortable. Each oil painting has special lighting. In addition to drawing some sky battles and dragon slaying battles, Many of the oil paintings depict the prosperous scenery of the Hex era. Those ghost monkeys dressed like humans and dogs stand in front of him. Atop the giant airship. Standing on the pedestal behind the giant magic cannon. Sitting on the shoulders of the magic puppet. They controlled metal giants hundreds of meters high to fight giant dragons in the wilderness. And the sky was filled with giant magic airships. Unexpectedly, the Hex era was actually more powerful than the Grim Empire in its heyday. The magic notes in Serdak's arms kept sending out reminders asking him to take away some of these oil paintings. This kind of Hex-era oil paintings have always been highly sought after at auctions in the Bina province, with prices remaining high. Although Serdak was anxious to find the Black Magician, it did not affect him from taking away these oil paintings in the corridor, because he knew that Serdak had a large magic pocket, and Andrew and Samira almost exclusively selected it. Those large oil paintings, walking all the way, the oil paintings in the corridor of the library were almost emptied by two people. The eyelids of the several knights and swordsman Haynes, who were traveling with him, were trembling. Unfortunately, they did not have magic pockets and could not take away these oil paintings. But just at the end of the corridor, on the left and right sides of the round arched door, there is a circular high platform. Two reliefs of goblin warriors stand there. Although they are stone sculptures, the weapons in their hands are emitting a cold light. Although it was covered with dust, you could still see the texture of the metal on it and the two goblin warriors were carrying round shields in addition to two scimitars. Several knights were overjoyed when they saw the weapons. After confirming that there was no danger in the corridor, they removed the weapons and shields from the hands of the two statues. However, the weapons that looked long and heavy in the hands of the goblins looked like for a long dagger. The two shields don't need to be much larger than the armed guards. Following the prompts of magician Celia Cooper, Soldek walked at the end, unhooked the musket hanging from the statue's waist, and put it into the magic waste bag. The library was far larger than Serdek had imagined. It felt like a football field. The combat team defeated several waves of H, L dog patrols along the way, and finally arrived under the leadership of Aphrodite. On a wide corridor, a group of people hid at the corner, with only two giant H, L dogs at the door. According to Aphrodite's description, in addition to a team of giant H, L dog guards, the black magician was also accompanied by two succubi. The two succubi were the two strongest among the succubi who entered the Maka plane, and no succubi were seen. The team rushed forward, with Serdak and Andrew at the front. Now they were familiar with the fighting methods of these giant H, L dogs. Although each of them was as strong as a bison, they were affected by the influence of the Maka plane. Suppressed by the power of law, his power is greatly restricted. He is no match for Serdak and Andrew, who are staring at the aura of power and protected by the blessed body. Serdak wanted to fight quickly and risk being injured. At the moment when the giant H, L dog pounced on him, he used the holy light torch in his hand to hit the giant H, L dog's forehead. Unexpectedly, under the holy flame, H, L, the vicious dog actually let out a mournful cry, and the holy light torch with full strength instantly smashed the giant H, 
L dog's skull into pieces. The group of people rushed directly into the library room. But the room was actually empty. The books on the bookshelves in the room were messily turned over. The thick magic books were spread out on a reading table. And there was a magnifying glass next to it. And the magic notes? It looks like someone is translating this book sentence by sentence. And the magic notes were only half written before they were hastily thrown away. A set of magic experiment utensils are still placed on an experimental table. With a black magic crucible next to it. The flame of the fire magic scroll under the crucible has not been extinguished. And the green concoction inside is constantly making disgusting bubbles. On this test bench is a very exquisite looking magic model. The model has a very delicate six-pointed star base. With very complicated magic decorations engraved on it. And the four corners are even extravagantly inlaid with six magic crystals. A ring-shaped model hangs on the base. This metal ring is oval-shaped. And the golden surface is covered with runes representing the mysteries of magic. Several faint magic lines connected the palm-sized ring from the chassis. And black mist was constantly flowing in the ring. What is this? Soldak secretly asked Celia Cooper in his arms. Celia Cooper was silent for a while before saying, This is the model of Devil's Gate. Serdak didn't think much and said, He is indeed studying how to strengthen the passage to H. L. Can I take this model with me? Yes. But you must first close the magic circle and remove the six magic crystals on the base. However, be careful when removing the magic crystals. Once a magic abnormality occurs, space cracks may appear. Celia. Cooper said to Soldak in a small voice that only the two of them could hear. And at the end there was another sigh. He finally walked in front of me. Soldak was only focused on dismantling the Devil's Gate model. And did not hear clearly what Celia Cooper was saying in the last sentence. There was no one in the room. So the two knights at the door dragged the corpses of two giant H. L. dogs into the room. What should we do? Andrew led a few knights to search the room. But did not find any dark room. Serdak looked at the corpses of the two giant H. L. dogs lying on the ground. Thinking that even if he was ambushing the room. The H. L. dogs at the door had been killed. And the black magician would definitely find this place when he came back. Abnormal. Now that he has found the model of the gate of hell as well as several books with Jin writing and magic notes on the table. He could only hope to find some clues in the magic notes. So he did not hesitate and said decisively, Let's go! Get out of here! Chapter 471 Evacuation Before leaving the room, Samira walked around the room several times. She walked slowly along the edge of the bookshelf and the desk. But her eyes fell on the books piled on the bookshelf. The five knights left the room first, followed closely by swordsman Haynes. Andrew, a Nanai warrior, stood at the door holding a big axe and guarding Serdak. At this time, Serdak heard the magic note. Celia Cooper inside whispered in a small voice. Toldak, wait, help me take away these books. They are just in front of you on the right. The third row of bookshelves is the third and third books from the left. The sixth and seventh books. Soldak was about to leave the room. He had just put the magic notebook and several books on the table into his magic belt bag. At this time, he heard that Celia Cooper was about to take away the other books in the room. But she didn't. Go and count the specific books in the third row of bookshelves. And directly put all the books in the three rows of bookshelves into the magic waste bag. Okay. It's you who can do it. Celia Cooper complained to Soldak while hiding in her magic notebook. If the belt bag he carries is enough. Soldak even wants to take away all the books in this room. Since the black magician specializes in translating books in this room. It means that the books here must be related to the fixed H, L passage. This H, L connecting passage is like a rift in time and space and belongs to the category of space magic. So it is this means that some of the books in this room belong to space magic works. Although Serdak cannot read ancient goblin texts, he can guess them. Celia Cooper was a space magician during her lifetime. And the books she chose should be related to this. Serdak finally walked out of the library room. The door of the room was covered with the purple blood of H. L. Dogs. And the leather boots were a little sticky when he stepped on them. Samira kept watching Aphrodite carefully. She was very interested in this succubus. Still a little distrustful. But at the moment Soldak walked out of the room. Celia Cooper said to Soldak in an even more inaudible voice. I feel like there is someone in the room. But I can't be sure. It's purely a person. A spiritual sense. Soldak walked out of the room calmly. And the half-elf archer Samira leaned into Serdak's ear and whispered, I feel something is wrong in the room. At the same time, two people reminded Serdak about the same thing. And one of them was a half-ghost soul. 
Sernak knew that they must have made some unusual discoveries in the room. He casually closed the carved door of the room. This hardwood door was more than three meters high. After the door was closed, Sernak did not leave in a hurry, but deliberately cleaned up the blood stains left by the H. L. dogs at the door. Soldak asked Andrew to guard the door. He said to Swordsman Haynes, The most precious books in the library are, of course. I am going to take a few more books away. Which ones do you like? Don't hesitate to read the books. Wrap them all up and take them away. They're here. There's always something to gain. After saying that, he took Samira and walked quickly to the next room. As if he was rushing to get some books from that room. Swordsman Haynes looked at Soldak's back in astonishment. He didn't know what to say for a moment. Facing his newly established goodwill in his heart. He was suddenly disturbed by such a Philistine face. He was born in Swordsman Haynes, a well-known noble family in the city of Bolanla in Bena province. Despises Soldak's behavior. It's not that he stole things from the library, but that in such a critical situation, he's still taking risks to gain wealth puts the entire team at risk. Before he could express his opinion, Soldak had already opened the door and rushed in. The wooden door closed with a bang. Swordsman Haynes glanced at the Nanai warrior Andrew, who was guarding the door of this room, and said nothing. Soldak took Samira to the next room. After closing the wooden door, Samuelin nervously said to Sardak, Captain, just now in that room, I saw a book that was originally on the bookshelf. Half of it was exposed. But when I turned around and looked over there, the book was actually pushed back into the bookshelf. There was no one in that place at that time. Captain, do you think we met a ghost? It shouldn't be a ghost. I've seen the high-level ghosts of the undead. And they also have forms. When Soldak said this, he thought of Count Fonak and his young son. And also thought of Lao Fu, the finger bone that Count Nak left for himself. He asked Samira to guard the door. And then started the sacrificial ceremony in the room. As the faint blue flames ignited in the four pottery bowls. And in the sound of Serdak's prayers, the demon statue slowly descended into the room of the library. And Serdak presented a H. L. Dog. The head of the dog gave him, and Samira the Eye of Truth. After thinking about it, he felt it was not safe. So he dedicated the head of A.H. L. Dog to the devil face, allowing himself to obtain death and decay and death. Whispering two dark blessings, the sacrificial ceremony ended in a hurry. Under the visual effect of the Eye of Truth, there is nothing unusual in this room. The two did not take the books in this room and returned directly to the door of the room where Andrew was guarding. Swordsman Haynes, Five Knights, Andrew, and Aphrodite were all waiting here. Swordsman Haynes saw Serdak hurriedly came over and wanted to remind him whether to leave and evacuate the library. After all, the longer he delayed here, the more dangerous he would be. Serdak winked at Andrew, and Andrew quickly stepped aside. Serdak walked straight to the door. Samira, who was following Serdak, directly took the forest bow in his hand and took it from the quiver. She took out a green branch which didn't even have the most basic arrow cluster. She followed Serdak with a solemn expression and stood on the other side of the door. At this time, no matter how slow Swordsman Haynes was, he finally understood what the Serdak team must have discovered in this room. Soldak pushed open the wooden door of the room, walked into the room with Andrew, and pretended to say, Why do you even want to take that pot away? Andrew looked at Soldak in astonishment. In the field of vision of the Eye of Truth, a magician wearing a black robe stood quietly in the corner of the room. He stood almost completely against the bookshelf, looking at the door with a wary expression. Here, there is actually an invisible magician in the room. Soldak found an excuse to approach the smoking crucible on the test stand. The invisible magician's face was very ugly, even a little distorted. He was holding a wand in one hand and holding a wand in the other. He was holding a magic scroll in his hand looking like he was about to throw the magic out of his hand at any moment. Samira, who was standing at the door, leaned halfway in and drew the forest bow to full capacity without hesitation. She turned her body almost instantly, and while the magician's eyes were fixed on Serdek, he said to her without any precautions, he shot out the green branch in his hand. The branch turned into a green light and flew towards the black magician. When the black magician noticed, the green branch had already flown in front of the magician. The green branches seemed to have propped up a huge network of tree vines in front of the black magician's body, trapping the black magician tightly on the bookshelf with a whoosh. The black magician was attacked, and his body gradually emerged from the invisible state. At the same time, Serdak raised his fist without hesitation and flew forward. Although the black magician was tied up by Samira's tree vines, 
He still had time to flick the wand lightly, uttered a short spell in his mouth, and a huge wave of air fell on Soldek. On his body, he was instantly knocked back. Serdak's body hit the bookshelf behind him uncontrollably. The wooden bookshelf was knocked apart by Serdak. With a crash, the books on the bookshelf collapsed, falling all over the floor. Andrew reacted very quickly. When he saw the black magician appear, he picked up the axe in his hand and struck the black magician on the shoulder without hesitation. The magic scroll in the black magician's other hand was unfolded with one hand, and he chanted the spell again. A light shield appeared in front of the magician. Andrew's big axe struck the light shield, and the magic light shield actually the big axe flew away, and Andrew's steps were also distorted. At this time, a stern look appeared in the black magician's eyes, and he did not see him draw a magic pattern array, but a six-pointed star array suddenly appeared under his feet, and a dark space crack appeared behind him. The bookshelf was twisted into countless scraps of paper and sawdust by this space crack. The magician was trapped in the tree vines, and one arm and the tree vines were also torn apart by the space. Then he stepped into the black space crack without hesitation. Swordsman Haynes rushed over, but was a step too late, watching as the black magician was about to disappear in the crack. At this time, the succubus Aphrodite was surrounded by countless black demonic auras, and a scarlet magic circle appeared under her feet. She recited the curse that would make people feel drowsy, and a huge eyeball appeared in front of her. Above his head, the eyeball shot out a black light, hitting the black magician's body right in the middle. Half of the black mage's body had already slipped into the time rift. But when hit by this black light, his movements became extremely stiff, as if he was restrained by some force. Swordsman Haynes grabbed the magician's arm and pulled him out of the space-time rift unreasonably, worried that the magician would resist. The blood-red crescent scimitar in his hand was placed on the black magician's neck. The black magician showed hatred in his eyes and roared at Aphrodite. Aphrodite, how dare you go against the will of King Amazdan? When the succubus Aphrodite heard what the black magician said, her body trembled involuntarily. Serdak and Andrew rushed up from both sides, without giving the black magician a chance to intimidate Aphrodite. Serdak punched the black magician in the face, instantly hitting him with stars in his eyes. Andrew dropping the axe in his hand. He stepped behind the black magician and tightly hugged the black magician with his bulging arms. At this time, five knights from outside the room ran in. They held the severed chains and trapped the thin-faced black magician with all their hands. They were worried that the black magician would continue to recite terrible spells and tied his mouth tightly with a bandage, leaving only his nostrils to breathe. Swordsman Haynes saw the precious robe embroidered with magic patterns on the black magician's body and said to Serdak with excitement, Finally caught a big fish. Night, Serdak. Well done. Withdraw. 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 Soldak asked Andrew to carry the black magician on his shoulders and rushed out of the room without stopping. When the team walked through the corridor, a steady stream of roars could be heard in the library. The patrolling H. L. Dogs discovered that someone had sneaked into the library and began to issue warnings to other H. L. Dogs. The eleven members of the team took the black the magician got into the underground culvert. When the group of people walked out of the library along the culvert, they felt a large group of H. L. Dogs rushing past on the ground causing the ground to shake continuously. The Serdak team crawled underground for a long time in the culvert. Aphrodite led the way, and Samira followed behind her. They shot and killed countless ghost monkeys hiding in the culvert. After walking and walking, they finally arrived at the edge of the city ruins, which was also the edge of this huge cave. The group of people emerged from the exit of an underground culvert, avoiding the H, L dogs that were searching for their traces, and circled around the rocks and stalactites. Columns travel along the edge of the cave. This cave is enough to accommodate a city. And the area on the edge of the city is very vast. The Serdak team wanted to get out of the complicated underground cave. If they didn't want to hit the wall everywhere, they had to go back the same way. They could only find the vent suspended on the cave wall in the dim underground cave. And the food on the vent. Only when humans and demons meet can we follow the road signs and leave here. As a guide, Samira walked at the front without hesitation. The team emerged from the ruins of the city and almost completely lost their direction. Samira climbed up to a high place to determine the direction and walked for nearly a full day. The vent hanging on the top of the stone wall finally appeared in Serdak's field of vision. During this period, a large number of H. L. dogs poured into the ruins of the city. Unfortunately, the ruins of the city were too big. No matter how many H. L. dogs were filled in, there was no way to search all places. Occasionally, 
the top of the cave where there were succubi flying by. But these succubi just flew around randomly. Aphrodite stood in the shadow behind the stalactites, holding the stone pillar with one hand, looking up at the succubus flying on the cave dome, with a hint of complicated emotions on her face. During a break, I don't know what my future will be like, Aphrodite whispered to Samira. In fact, every succubus who enters that passage is prepared to die. But since I can come out of the passage alive, I want to live a new life that I have never experienced before. The one I long for in my dream. This kind of life. But now in this war, it is destined that the people of the Empire in this plane will not be willing to accept a demon like me. And I don't know where else I can go. Serdak sat down next to Samira and said to the melancholy succubus, Otherwise, come with me. Chapter 472 Return The team avoided being hunted by H. L. Dogs. Under the leadership of the half-elf archer Samira, they passed through the stalactite pillar rock area with complex terrain and came to the bottom of the vent stone wall. According to the previously agreed contact information, Andrew will a large piece of bacon was thrown onto the vent. It didn't take long for the ogre Gulitum to stick his head out from the stone platform of the vent and keep looking at the dark rocky ground below. In the pitch black cave, Serdak lit the holy light torch in his hand. The white flames illuminated the faces of the team. On the stone platform of the cave wall dozens of meters high, the ogre Gulitum could see the team clearly. Everyone's face was busy pulling down the rope from the stone platform. Gulitum seemed very excited. He stood on the stone platform and waved his fist vigorously several times. A rope hung down from the stone wall. Andrew of the Nanai tribe took the lead in climbing up the rope with five knights. This kind of rock climbing with the help of ropes was not difficult for these knights. Then Serdak hung the black magician on the rope. He went up, pulled the rope, and signaled the people above the vent to drag the black magician up, and then hoisted the swordsman Haynes, who was lame on one leg, up to the stone platform in this way. Several low roars of H. L. Dogs were heard in the distance. Serdak ignored those H. L. Dogs and asked Samira to lead the succubus Aphrodite up the rock wall first, waiting until the H. L. Dogs found Serda. When he found the trace, Serdak had already pulled the rope and slowly climbed up to the stone wall. Those H. L. Dogs could only surround the bottom of the stone wall and kept attacking the stone wall. The sharp claws of the H. L. Dogs inserted into the cracks in the rock, rushing upwards desperately. Samira, who was squatting on the stone platform, fully drew the forest bow in her hand, and the arrows penetrated directly through the heads of the H. L. Dogs, killing them at the foot of the stone wall. The ogre held a dried salted fish in his mouth, pulled the rope with both hands, and pulled Serdak up. When he saw Serdak appeared intact on the stone platform, he hurriedly walked over to give Serdak a big hug. But when the tall ogre hugged Serdak, it was like hugging a child. The succubus patrolling back and forth in the sky heard the movement here, and quickly spread their wings and flew towards the vent. However, they were a step slower after all. When they flew to the vent on the stone platform, the Serdak team and his party people have walked into the dark and deep caves. The caves here are distributed in the underground world like spider webs. Even these succubi dare not break into them easily. Speaking of which, the greatest physical advantage of succubi is flying, and their abilities are only related to charm and hypnosis black magic. In the extremely dark cave, the combat power of succubi is not even as good as that of a giant H. L. Evil. Dogs. As a large number of H. L. Dogs gathered under the stone wall. Countless H. L. Dogs began to try to climb the stone wall. Some H. L. Dogs fell from the stone wall during the climb. And some H. L. Dogs successfully climbed. Go up to the stone platform. After the six giant H. L. Dogs climbed up the stone platform one after another. Accompanied by waves of low roars. A large group of H. L. Dogs rushed into the dark cave. The Serdak team had already entered the depths of the cave. And Samira returned along the original path marked previously. Until the team walked out of the cave. They did not encounter the H. L. Dogs chasing after them. Apparently those H. L. Dogs rushed into the intricate cave network. And most of them were lost in the darkness. After the team walked in the cave for a long time. They finally saw a dazzling light coming from the entrance of the cave in front. The team let out a burst of cheers. Everyone had stayed in the dark cave for too long. And their bodies were about to grow wet. The moss came, and he couldn't wait to stride to the entrance of the cave. Especially when the five knights were able to regain their freedom. They hugged each other tightly, and celebrated each other's rebirth. Serdak came up from behind carrying the holy light torch, and whispered to the team. Everyone, be careful. There are a large number of piranha flowers growing outside. 
We'd better not disturb them. We were mistaken in the beginning. He entered the territory of the piranha and escaped into this cave. Swordsman Haynes limped to the entrance of the cave and looked out. After staying in the dark for a long time, everyone walked to the edge of the cave and could hardly see anything due to the dazzling sunlight. Cernak also stayed at the entrance of the cave for a while before adapting to the brightness outside the cave. The piranha vines guarding the entrance of the cave had retreated, and the entrance of the cave had returned to its original appearance. Except for the overpowered weeds, only some flower vines that were cut off by the members of Serdak's team were left on the rocky ground. Now these flower vines have completely withered. But the flower vines with thorns still look very scary, leaving the team with lingering fears. The knights and swordsman Haynes had never seen the horror of the piranha tree, and they looked at the quiet woods in front of them without any awareness. Samira squatted down at the entrance of the cave. Exploring the cave made the injury on her right arm more serious. She used a dagger to cut open the cannibal calyx on the ground and found a few black seeds inside. Each seed was about the size of an onyx grape. The big half-elf archer happily took these seeds into his arms and then trampled the dry piranha vines to pieces. The succubus Aphrodite stood in the green grass at the entrance of the cave, staring blankly at the outside world. Through the gap between the piranha trees, in the distance was a stretch of rolling green mountains. With a few wisps of blue sky above her head, the clouds were like cotton wool. This was a beautiful new world that was completely different from the flaming age. L, looking at the beautiful scenery in front of her. Her eyes were covered with a layer of wet moisture. The entrance to the cave was a bit too low for the ogre. And he was the one carrying the black magician all the way. At the entrance of the cave, the ogre had no choice but to hand over the black magician to Andrew. And he bent down and walked out of the cave. Outside the cave was the territory of the piranha. The entire team gathered outside the cave, and no one dared to pass through. The territory of the piranha tree runs along the edge of the cave. Soldak took out a map of the outskirts of Wazamala City and pointed out the team's current location to Swordsman Haynes. Swordsman Haynes knew that this place was at least 30 years away from the main battlefield of the constructed Swordsman Regiment. Kilometers? He wanted to trek on foot, but it was impossible to cross these mountains to join the constructed Swordsman group. So he followed Cernak's suggestion and followed Cernak's team to the agreed-upon point, taking the magic airship return to Wazimra City to make plans. The Cernak team headed south along the ridge they came from, but did not encounter those ghostly monkeys along the way. The team walked to the connection point of the magic airship. It was a large piece of grassland on a hillside. There were huge pits all over the hillside. There were also some ironwood saplings as thick as a finger mixed in the grass. It was said that these ironwoods would grow at least twice as long. It takes hundreds of years to grow into a big tree. And this grassland has become a paradise for hares and pheasants. As the team climbed up the hillside, a group of colorful tail pheasants suddenly flew up from the grass, flew out against the grass, and soon landed at the bottom of the hillside. Samira picked up the forest bough and was about to chase after her when she was caught by Serdak. Serdak took out a few bags of marching rations from his arms and said to her, The rations are enough for the time being. Everyone wants to eat game. If so, Andrew's archery skills are also pretty good. After saying that, Serta took out the alloy bow from the magic waste bag and threw it to Andrew who looked stunned. The team waited on this hillside for a day and a night. At dusk the next day, I finally saw a magic airship passing through the clouds silently and flying to the hillside. The magic airship retracted its sails, continuously slowed down, and dropped a huge anchor on the top of the hillside. The cast iron anchor hung down with a chain that was thicker than Andrew's legs, with a huge inertia. The big anchor, the anchor dug deep into the soil of the ridge. As the airship continued to glide forward, the iron cable was gradually straightened, and the large iron anchor plowed a deep trench nearly a hundred meters long in the soil of the ridge, and finally stopped at the end of the grassland on the ridge, the crew on the airship standing on the stern deck, waving the green empire flag in their hands. The Serdak team quickly chased the airship and ran up. Sixteen flotation devices made buzzing sounds on the left and right sides of the airship. A ladder hung from the side of the airship. The middle-aged captain held the ship's railing with his hand, holding a bottle of wine in his hand, and kept moving towards Soldak. He waved his hands with a long-lost smile on his face. Serdak was the first to climb onto the magic airship. The middle-aged captain came up and hugged Serdak, and said with a smile, Young knight, I'm glad you can come back alive. Bazimra welcomes you. After saying that, the middle-aged captain looked down again and saw that there were many people behind him. The middle-aged captain exclaimed, 
It seems that your team has gained something. Let me guess. Did you meet someone who got lost in the forest? Other reconnaissance teams? My gains are far more than that. We also captured an important person this time. Serdak whispered into the middle-aged captain's ear. Then he lowered a rope to the side of the ship. And the middle-aged captain quickly waved to the crew on both sides to come up and help. With the help of the crew, Serdak pulled the black magician up from below. The black magician had been tortured so much in the past two days that the team members did not give him a chance to speak. Except when feeding him water. Apart from untying the bandage covering his mouth. He did almost nothing else. The black magician's eye sockets were sunken deeply. His face was gray and weak from hunger. And the area where the rope was tied to his body was even stretched out. There are black and purple traces. The middle-aged captain is also a man who has seen the world. When he sees the black magician's attire, he knows that he has an unusual identity. After sending the black magician to the magic airship, Serdak finally breathed a sigh of relief. The magic airship carried many other combat teams that were performing reconnaissance missions together. Seeing the teams boarding the airship, everyone stopped and watched. When everyone saw that the Serdak team captured a black magician, many knights came to them one after another. Come around here. It's a black magician. Someone shouted, and the whole airship shook. The middle-aged captain made a prompt decision and immediately suspended the subsequent response work. He personally stood in front of the steering wheel and made the airship complete a U-turn after making a large circle. Then it flew towards Wazimra City at full speed. In order to avoid the possible pursuit of the H.L. demons, the airship continued to increase its flight altitude until it got above the clouds and then headed towards Wazimala City. The sea of clouds under her feet was dyed with a layer of pale gold and the afterglow of the setting sun reflected in the magnificent purple eyes of the succubus girl. Aphrodite was wearing a cloak, a hood on her head, and a veil, which made her look. It's a bit mysterious, but since she follows the Zernak team, no one questions her identity. In the Green Empire, many magicians like Aphrodite's outfit. Samira is almost the same as Aphrodite. She also doesn't want to show her face. The only difference is that she carries a forest behind her back. Bow wearing red salamander leather boots. Many people in the empire do not respect half-elf women that much. Not even as much as those dark-skinned female orcs. Serdak pressed his forehead with his hand. Only then did he start to feel a headache. Carl had officially stated that he would no longer help him in order to get a pass for the ogre Gretum. The team ventured into the jungle to investigate hell. With the clues of the passage, the teleportation ticket of the ogre Gulitum was finally found. But another succubus appeared. Serdak really wanted to put a seal on his mouth. But why couldn't he hold back at that time and send an invitation to the succubus girl? Serdak took a sip of water, trying to calm down. He held the side of the ship with one hand and stood on the edge. After hesitating for a while, he confessed to the succubus girl, I'll try to get a pass and a teleportation ticket. Well, it seems that even if I have a teleportation ticket, I can't take you there. So I have to find another way to get a pass. The succubus girl glanced at Serdak and nodded obediently. Now she had nowhere to go. Half-elf archer Samira stood next to Aphrodite and said to Soldak, I know a few people who specialize in the smuggling business. Do you want to ask them? Serdak immediately raised his head and asked in surprise. Those stowaways can allow Aphrodite to sneak through the portal. The half-elf archer curled his lips and said, As long as you have money, there is nothing you can't do in Wazamala. Besides, if you don't go through the portal, there will be no one to stop you wherever you go in the Maka Plain. It's not about smuggling. But Captain, you must prepare enough money. And they only know the Shining Empire gold coins. Okay, I want to meet them when I get back to Wazamala City. Soldak took a deep breath and decided. After flying for most of the night, the airship finally arrived at the bustling Wazamala City at midnight. When approaching Wazimra City, the magic airship met a magician patrol patrolling the sky and informed these magicians of the capture of a black magician. The news was then quickly transmitted back to Wazmara City. Plane War Command. When the airship arrived at the airport pier, a team of constructed swordsmen were already waiting on the pier. The leader of the constructed swordsmen raised his head and looked at the airship slowly approaching the port, without waiting for magic. When the airship stopped, he stepped onto the airship in one step. Chapter 473 The Black Magician's Request The towers of the airport terminal are brightly lit. The deck of the airship was filled with knights from the reconnaissance team waiting to disembark. The faces of these knights who returned to Wazamala safely finally showed a hint of joy. But there were also some knights with solemn expressions. Most of these knights were injured. 
and some of their companions had accidents during the mission. And their moods did not seem so high. After the airship docked at the terminal, the crew took the opportunity to throw the cables out. The people on the platform used long hooks to catch the cables and hung these cables on the winches on the terminal. The four winches rotated at the same time, rolling up the ropes little by little, forcing the airship that was about to slip away to dock in front of the high tower platform. When the side of the ship rested firmly on the anti-collision frame extended from the platform, the crew on the airship opened the wooden door on the ship's side and set up the high tower platform and temporary suspended passages between airships. The bow passage is specially used for passengers on the airship to disembark. The bridge deck here is not only wider, but also the fence columns on both sides are denser. In comparison, the passage at the stern is used for the airship crew to disembark, and the bridge is slightly narrow. However, because some of the supplies on the ship will be transported to the airship through this passage, the bridge of this passage is very strong. Aphrodite's identity was somewhat special. So Samira took her and quietly slipped off the airship through the crew passage. As a local guide in Wazimra City, the half-elf archer was also very familiar with the airport terminal. The two of them squeezed in between the crew members and actually disappeared after shaking for a few times. After the airship reached the platform, the constructed swordsmen waiting on the tower did not wait for the knights on the airship to come down. They boarded the airship first and immediately controlled the magic airship. The constructed swordsman captain saw the black magician tied to the mast of the airship immediately waved his hand behind him. And a team of constructed swordsmen immediately surrounded the mast. At this time, the black magician was wrapped with chains all over his body and a bandage on his mouth. He was tied to the mast of the airship. His face looked very haggard. He seemed to have just woken up from a drowsy sleep. Under the dazzling light, the constructed swordsman looked at the magic airship with squinted eyes. The hatred in his eyes clearly revealed. The constructed swordsman captain walked towards the middle-aged captain, who took the initiative to give up his position to Serdak. Serdak led Andrew, Gulitam, Swordsman Haynes, and five knights towards the captain of the constructed swordsman team. Lancelot Ferguson of the 17th Constructed Swordsman Regiment of Bena was ordered to take over the prisoner. The constructed swordsman captain stood up straight. He saw Swordsman Haynes among Soldak's group. It seems that the two of them are old acquaintances. They smiled at each other in a tacit understanding and then introduced themselves to Soldak seriously. Okay. Soldak, the captain of the Helensa Guard Battalion, has met with you. Sir, Soldak said in a neither humble nor condescending manner. There is no doubt that the constructed swordsman who can stand on the high tower platform of the airport terminal at this time must be the most trusted subordinate of Marquis Luther. And the powerful aura exuding from this constructed swordsman. Soldak could feel an invisible pressure. The swordsman opposite him was probably a second-level warrior. Well done. Night, Serdak. Swordsman Ferguson smiled at Serdak and reached out to pat him on the shoulder. Swordsman Ferguson turned to look at Swordsman Haynes and the team, with a sincere smile on his face. He took the initiative to stretch out his arms and hug Swordsman Haynes in the crowd, and said to him, Haynes, I'm so glad to see you here. Welcome back safely. Lord Ferguson. Swordsman Haynes was a little excited. Then Serdak handed over the black magician to this group of constructed swordsmen and handed over the magic notes from the library and several suspected related books. Several magicians walked out of the tower terminal. Swordsman Ferguson handed these magic notes to the leading magician. The group briefly exchanged a few words with Soldak and learned that this black magician was probably one of the main builders of the age, El Passage. So they hurriedly took them with them. Gone is the black magician. At this time, the other knights on the magic airship began to step off the airship one after another. Sirdak, along with the Nanai indigenous warriors and ogres, planned to leave from the airport terminal. Several constructed swordsmen surrounded the Hain swordsman. I asked him privately what he had been through these days. Knight Serdak, please wait. The shout of swordsman Haynes came from behind. Soldak stopped. Swordsman Haynes limped after him, handed the blood red crescent in his hand back to Serdak, spread his pale golden eyebrows, looked at Serdak with bright eyes, smiled at him and said, Serdak, your scimitar. Thank you. Serdak took the blood red crescent and nodded to Swordsman Haynes. The other five knights separated from Soldak outside the gate of the airport terminal. They will go to the military inspection office to report their work tomorrow. Soldak returned to the square station of the Haranza guard camp. The square station seemed very lively. The knights from Plex City and Constantinople had just finished their dinner. They should have just participated in the battle outside the city. And the square was close to the army. The tent was filled with the heads of hunted H. L. dogs. 
and several clerks from the military quarters department were counting the military merits of the knights in the guard camp. The Helenza guard camp seemed much quieter, and it looked as if they had not participated in the daytime war. Several knights on night duty stood outside the military camp, admiringly watching the knights of the Per City guard camp queuing up to record their military merits. Scene. Serdak returned to the guard camp. The knights who were on duty in the camp saw Serdak and others returning and quickly greeted him. The fact that Serdak possessed the holy light technique was no longer a secret in the guard camp. But no knight would turn against the healer in the team without turning a blind eye. Soldak asked the night knight about the location of the support squadron's camp, and then walked over with Andrew and the ogre. The ogre passed through the middle of the camp. His footsteps were like an elephant passing by. Every step made the ground tremble slightly, causing the knights who had just fallen asleep in the tent to poke their heads out of the tent with sleepy eyes, looking at the situation outside. At this time, Carl was not sleeping in the tent. He heard someone coming in to report that Serdak had returned safely. So he walked out of the tent and happened to see the windy and dusty Serdak setting up a marching tent next to the support squadron station. Several knights from the support squadron took the initiative to help. While the ogre sat on the stone floor, munching on a baked wheat cake, Carl walked up to Soldak and saw that his body was covered with purple blood scabs but had no injuries. So he asked him, Hey, have you gained anything from your reconnaissance mission this time? Serdak stood up, stretched out his fist and bumped with Carl, looked at the ogre who was eating wheat cakes and said, I guess it will be no problem to get a teleportation pass for this big man this time. Good luck. Carl patted Soldak on the shoulder, smiled at him and said, Welcome back. While untying the heavy wristband, Soldak asked Carl, How is the guard camp doing? Carl spread his hands and said, It's okay. I participated in two battles outside the city in the past few days, and I've gained some gains. However, the three H, L dogs on the opposite side also caused a little trouble for the guard camp. It's great to have you back. Serdak casually threw the wrist guards from the constructed armor into the tent. As long as it's not a matter of life and death. If you come to me tomorrow, I want to have a good sleep. After saying that, Serdak waved to Carl, dragged his tired body into the tent, took off the breastplate that constructed the armor and threw it aside. He laid down in the tent and fell asleep soon after. I don't know when the half-elf archer returned to the camp. When Serdak woke up, he saw the dazzling sunlight coming in from outside the tent. The half-elf archer leaned against the entrance of the tent holding the forest bow and took a nap with his eyes squinted, stretching. Her long legs just blocked the entrance of the tent. Her body was more slender than that of the elf, and her hood covered her delicate face. Serdak sat up from the felt, and Samira opened her eyes alertly. I only felt a little soreness in my muscles all over my body. It was probably because the blessing effect of the blessed body had disappeared. It was a side effect caused by excessive physical exertion in the past few days. As he rubbed his sore shoulders with his hands, Serdak thought of Samira's injury. Arm? Ask her. Your arm. Samira touched it with her hands out of habit and just said, I'm used to it. Aphrodite has settled down? Serdak asked. Samira sat quietly at the door and said, Well, she lives in the orphanage temporarily. And no one usually comes there. Serdak didn't speak anymore. And directly lowered the tent curtain started the sacrificial ceremony in the tent, and re-blessed Samira with the blessed body. The blessed body itself has strong recovery power, can speed up the healing of the hidden wounds on her arms, and also slightly alleviate the pain caused by the hidden wounds on her arms. Samira crossed her arms, closed her eyes, and bathed in the divine light. She exhaled slightly, and her face became rosier. Knowing that he would inevitably have to treat the injuries of other knights in the guard camp today, he blessed himself with the blessed body, and I have truth. Serdak walked out of the tent and found that there were already people outside the tent. There was a queue full of knights waiting for treatment. But everyone was worried about disturbing him. And the queue was some distance away from the tent. There was a large iron pot in front of the ogre. Filled with a large pot of stew. He was sitting in the pergola holding a wooden spoon and ladling the broth into his mouth. When he saw Serdak coming from walking out of the tent, he quickly said to Andrew, A Nanai warrior next to him. The captain is awake. The indigenous warriors quickly brought over the prepared breakfast. Soldak took the oatmeal and poured it into his stomach in one gulp. He told Andrew, I guess nothing will happen today. You can find time to go home to visit. But in the end it's best to return to the team before night. Yes, Captain! Andrew performed a military salute to Soldak. Since Andrew awakened the berserker soul, his strength has improved by leaps and bounds in recent times. 
and his momentum has become very different from before without realizing it. After Serdak finished speaking, he moved a wooden box and a chair outside the tent, sat there calmly, and waved to the injured knights who were already waiting there, indicating that they could come over. Sir Battle Priest Dak officially began to use the Holy Light technique to carry out treatment work. Carl led an officer from the headquarters into the station and came to the tent. He introduced Soldak, who was treating the knights. Dak, this is Captain Cody. He wants to tell you about your mission. Go through. The lieutenant sat down directly next to Serdak, without disturbing him to treat other knights in the guard camp, and said to him like a casual chat, Knight Serdak, there are some things that the headquarters needs to know from you. Serdak nodded to Captain Cody. Even Carl was a little confused. In this situation, the captain who had completed the reconnaissance mission should have reported the completion of the mission to the military intelligence office of the headquarters. Unexpectedly, the military intelligence office could not wait and sent a clerk directly. Lieutenant, learn about Soldak's situation at the scene. Serdak did not hide anything and directly told the mission process. However, when Serdak talked about discovering the ruins of the underground city, Captain Cody kept silent. He said to Serdak, that the magician wants to meet you. The place where the black magician is imprisoned is not at the temporary plane war headquarters in Wazimra City, but in the Magic Tower underground prison in Wazimra City, which houses the most powerful forbidden magic circle in Wazimra City. Among the magician prisoners in the underground prison of the Magic Tower, in addition to some magicians who perform forbidden magic, there are also defectors from the Magic Union and black magicians who study black magic. When he walked into the underground level of the magic tower and passed through the first large iron door engraved with magic patterns, Soldak couldn't help but shiver all over. It felt like there was a huge control circle floating around. As the circle moved, Serdak felt that the sacred breath in his body was actually coming out of his body. He was constantly being absorbed by this powerful circle. Along with himself, all of his magic perceptions were merged into the powerful torrent of mana in the magic tower. The magic circle under the magic tower could actually forcibly absorb its own mana, allowing Serdak to quickly extinguish the lighted nodes in his body to prevent the rapid loss of the sacred breath. Captain Cody chatted with a magician waiting there at the entrance to the underground level of the magic tower, and the two of them led Soldak into the cold underground corridor. You have to go through five large iron gates in a row before entering the underground prison. Captain Cody seemed not to be affected by the forbidden magic circle at all. The magician took Captain Cody and Soldak directly to the innermost room of the prison. The young magician stood outside, and Marquis Luther's eyes lit up when he saw Soldak walking over with Captain Cody. Soldak has met your excellency. Soldak stood up straight in front of Marquis Luther and said, okay, with a standard military salute. Marquis Luther was in a good mood. He nodded to Soldak and said, your investigation team did a good job this time. This black magician is one of the builders of the H. L. Passage. We are currently planning to ask him the specific location of the H. L. Passage. But he wants to see you and know what kind of night captured him. Chapter 474 The Prison Under the Magic Tower The leader of the Constructed Swordsman group stood behind Marquis Luther. Their eyes met, and he nodded slightly to Soldak. The magician who brought Soldak and Captain Cody and walked to the door of the prison and placed his hand on the center of the magic circle carved on the stone door. After inputting a trace of mana, the magic pattern magic circle lit up one after another, and the heavy the stone door opened, and countless gears interlocked, making a sharp and squeaking sound. The magician turned to Soldak and said, Black magicians are good at dark spells, such as charm, hypnosis and some magic that exerts negative emotions. Although there is a forbidden magic circle in the prison, how much restraint can be put on him? The effect is not known yet. Don't get too close to him to avoid him using some special means to affect you. If there is an emergency, quickly retreat to the door. We will be outside. Serdak nodded and stepped into the stone door. Outside the prison, the supreme commander of the Maka Plain, Marquis Luther, was still talking to the middle-aged magician beside him. This time, the succubi had a great impact on the infiltration of the Bena army. If this information had not been brought back in time, the Bena army would have I don't know how much loss we will have to bear. What progress have you made over there? The middle-aged magician said calmly. Although the specific location of the H, L passage is not marked in the magic notebook. A lot of important information is recorded in the magic notebook. Building a H, L passage has very strict requirements on the surrounding environment. According to our understanding of the Maka plane, the areas that can meet that special environment can be roughly locked into two areas. The magic guild has started to deduce based on the specific data. 
and the results will be obtained soon. The stone door behind Serdak closed slowly. And finally there was a bang. And all sound stopped abruptly. Serdak stood in the prison and closed his eyes. He opened them again before adapting to the light in the room. The cold prison seemed to be cut off from everything. And all sounds seemed to be magnified countless times. This prison was much bigger than Sir's. Dark's imagination was larger. The blue stone floor was covered with magic runes. These runes were connected together to form a complex array. Bundles of magic glow flowed through the runes. This was also the only light source in the prison. Entering the prison. The black magician was tied to the cross and looked a little depressed. Hearing a sound at the door, he tried hard to raise his lowered head and saw Soldak with a mocking smile on his face. They thought I would tell the location of the H, L passage under the threat of death. But they thought wrong. Well, death is not the end of life for us. Maybe you can't understand what I'm saying now. But you will understand these truths sooner or later. Compared with the eternity of life, we are like those floating around who live and die. Only if you come into contact with black magic and truly feel its infinite charm will you understand how I feel now. His breath was weak, and he seemed weak when he spoke. But Serdak could hear it very clearly. I want to meet you because I don't know your name yet. Knight Serdak of the Halanza Guard Camp, Serdak said. The black magician lowered his head feebly. He looked a little in pain. His arms were hung in the air and seemed to have been dislocated. After the magic robe was taken off, the linen shirt inside was also covered with various magic runes. The black magician said to Soldak, If you want to hear any news from me, I advise you to give up this idea. After learning black magic, you are destined to stand on the opposite side of the Green Empire Magic Union. I know one day I will be sent to the stake, but I didn't expect this day to come so quickly. I built A.H. L. Passage in the Maka Plain. My only regret is that I failed to strengthen this passage with my own hands. There was a flash of fanaticism in his eyes, a strange smile on his face, and a short spell came out of his mouth. Soldak had a very bad idea, and he quickly took two steps back. A black flame the size of a fingernail flew out against his body and landed on the stone wall behind Soldak. The black flame spattered a dim spark and then disappeared on the wall. The black magician seemed to know that Serdak could avoid it. He smiled contemptuously at Serdak, and a black flame rose under his feet. The flame quickly ignited the linen shirt on his body. In a few seconds, the black flames completely engulfed the black magician. The black magician's face looked a little ferocious under the black flames. Serdak quickly ran to the door of the prison and called for someone. The black magician became a little crazy under the black flames. He shouted in a sharp voice. Soldak, listen. The Hell Passage will eventually connect to Roland Continent again. And the Demon Gate will be reopened. The day the Demon Army comes, it will be the end of you people. When Marquis Luther and the middle-aged magician rushed in with his assistants outside, the black magician was already surrounded by black flames. Under the blazing flames, the flesh and blood melted rapidly at a speed visible to the naked eye. The bones on the black magician's body showed clear outlines in the flames. Soon, only the skeleton tied by chains was left on the cross. Soldak looked at Marquis Luther with an apologetic look and said, He didn't say anything. This has nothing to do with you. Marquis Luther looked at the middle-aged magician, who was checking the magic pattern array on the ground. He frowned and said, The forbidden magic circle here is not very effective against a black magician like him, and the hellfire runes should be drawn on him. He only needs to recite a short spell to trigger the incineration magic. Marquis Luther glanced at the skeleton hanging on the cross with traces of sparks and said, I just didn't expect him to be so decisive. The clues on the black magician's side are broken. I hope his magic notebook can provide more clues. At this moment, there was a rush of footsteps in the prison corridor. Captain Cody ran to the prison door panting and reported to Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther. The Constructed Swordsman group discovered a large number of Hell Dog legions on the northern outskirts of the city. They seem to have emerged from an earth vein. Marquis Luther regained his energy, straightened his body immediately, and ordered Captain Cody. I got it. Immediately inform the top commanders of each battalion and hold a temporary meeting at the headquarters. Yes, sir. Captain Cody gave a military salute, turned around, and left the prison quickly. Hearing that there is a large-scale operation on the side of the Cerberus army, and the location of the outbreak is in a ground line. These Cerberus hiding in the dark are probably the guards of the H, L Passage. The Bena army must take corresponding actions immediately. Marquis Luther and the leader of the constructed swordsman group left in a hurry. Now the battlefield outside the city has extended into the jungle. 
as early as three days ago, the Cerberus Legion was unable to form a siege on Wazamala City. Now a big H, L Dog appears in the mountains on the northern outskirts of the city. It is obviously a new round of action by the H, L Dog Army. Serdak also wanted to rush back to the Hellanza guard camp as soon as possible. Maybe the guard camp would receive an order from the headquarters soon. Just as Soldak followed Marquis Luther outside the prison, he heard the middle-aged magician behind him shouting to him, Knight Serdak, please wait! Serdak stopped and turned to look at the middle-aged magician with a calm face. Master magician, what can I do for you? The middle-aged magician took a few steps to catch up with Serdak and raised his hand to signal Serdak to continue walking outside. His voice was neither urgent nor slow, and his eyes looked very lively. He twitched the corners of his mouth, but the smile on his face was a bit stiff. Just listen to him say, You can call me Magician Miller. If there is no urgent military matter if you want, you can sit in my laboratory upstairs. Uh, okay. Soldak followed Magician Miller out of the underground prison and walked along the spiral staircase of the Magic Tower to the top of the tower. After passing the first and second floors of the Magic Tower, the space on the third floor of the magic tower became significantly smaller. Round. The hall was divided into two areas, with only a few rooms around it. A female magician assistant saw Magician Miller coming up from below and hurriedly came up to greet him. Magician Miller said to the female magician assistant, Open the door of showroom 3. This showroom is not big. When Soldak walked into the showroom, he discovered that there were some magic models on several exhibition tables inside. Some of them were magic items for daily life such as the power shaft of the magic caravan and the magic airship. There are extremely simple floating devices, magic guns, etc. But a model of the portal captured by Serdak is displayed on a new display stand. Magician Miller walked to the portal model, looked at the ring with countless magic patterns engraved on it with burning eyes as it continued to rotate in the swirling black air, and said, This portal model almost perfectly replicates the structure of the H.L. Passage. It plays an important role in the research of space magic for the Magic Guild. Thank you for bringing it back. The Magic Guild will have some additional rewards for it. Serdak did not expect that the rewards would come so quickly. There should also be corresponding military merit rewards from the Bina Military Department. And he was vaguely looking forward to it. Magician Miller continued. The reward can be some magic crystals or precious magic potions, including powerful healing potion, lion strength potion, swiftness potion, powerful troll potion. Or you can go to our Magic Guild's enchantment weapon library to pick two useful weapons. We can also help you make an appointment with an inscription master to design a magic pattern structure for you. I mean the kind that is engraved on the body. I heard that you can sense sacred elements. So you don't have to wait until the second turn. You can do it now. You can draw the magic pattern construct on your body. But you need to pay half of the cost of the magic pattern construct. Serdak knew that among these choices, the least valuable one was precisely the magic crystal that best reflected the value. The most precious thing was to make an appointment with an inscription master to personally design a magic pattern structure. Since he was physically unable to draw a magic pattern structure, he did not hesitate to eliminate these two options first. As for whether you want magic weapons or magic potions, since the huge area rich in magic herbs is occupied by the forces of the Dark Legion of Hell, the price of magic herbs in the Green Empire has been rising steadily. There is no doubt that magic potions have a long way to go in terms of rarity and room for appreciation, far superior to magic weapons. In other words, a magic potion dealer can easily exchange magic potions for magic weapons from any magic weapons dealer in any city in the Green Empire, but not vice versa. However, for Serdak, the healing potion and the lion's power potion were not very effective on him, and he couldn't keep it and wait for the potion to increase in value it would be more practical to choose a magic weapon. In particular, both Andrew and Greedom lacked a handy magic weapon. Serdak suddenly remembered that he had promised Amira that he would help her heal her injured arm when he returned to Wazamala City. The biggest problem facing Samira now was that the explosive power of her bloodline power exceeded the limit of her arm. The carrying capacity may have been exceeded only a little bit before, but as her injured arm burst more and more times, the condition of her arm became worse and worse. Now she can only try the magic pattern clothes. He thought about it for a moment and then said, Mage Miller, I just have something to ask you to help me with. The middle-aged magician stared at Soldak in confusion and said, You might as well tell me anything. Serdak quickly dug out the magic pattern spirit bone obtained from the demon ape from his magic pocket, took out a magic sealing box, took out the spirit bone wrapped in oil paper from the box, 
and carefully open the package. The oil paper on the spiritual bones revealed the spiritual bones with gorgeous magic patterns flowing inside. And then said to Magician Miller, I would like to ask the magicians in the Magic Guild to help me identify the attributes and required carrying capacity of this magic pattern spirit bone. Magician Miller thought it was such an embarrassing thing. But he didn't expect that just identifying the magic mark spirit bones was not a difficult task in the Magic Union. So he readily agreed. This is not too difficult. And it doesn't mean that you have to copy the magic circle on the magic pattern spirit bone. You can leave the magic pattern spirit bone here with me. And someone will notify you when it is taken over. Serdak was overjoyed. Thank you, Master Magician Miller. Magician Miller took Serdak out of the showroom and walked along the spiral staircase to the second floor of the magic tower. After waiting for a while, seeing that Serdak did not continue to speak, he said, Then let's get back to the topic. Tell me your choices about those rewards. Serdak did not expect that Magician Miller was so generous. The identification of the magic marked spirit bone was only included. So he said, I choose to choose a magic weapon. Although Magician Miller was a little surprised, he didn't say much. He led Serdak to a room, opened the door, took a look inside the room, and casually said to Serdak, Then what happens next? I will ask my assistant to pick two magic weapons. After saying that, he paused and then told the magician in the room, who was immersed in magic experiments, Guy, please take this Knight of Serdak to the number three magic weapons depot and pick out two items he likes. Magic Weapon Chapter 475 There is a humane society wherever you go. A familiar figure walked out of the laboratory. He was wearing a Missouri magic robe, holding a slightly curly rhizome wand in his hand, and walked quickly to Magician Miller. Magician Miller asked Soldak to follow Magician Guy downstairs and go to warehouse number 3 to collect two magic weapons. While he turned and walked into the magic laboratory, before the door of the laboratory was closed, he was heard asking several magicians in the room. Have you made any new discoveries? The wooden door closed heavily with a dull sound. And the pattern of dark red vines and magic patterns on the door appeared so clear in front of Serdak's eyes. Serdak didn't expect to see Magician Guy here. He seemed to be in good spirits. Hello, Magician Guy. Serdak smiled at him and said, Hi, Night Serdak. We meet again. Nice to see you here. Guy pushed up the thick glasses on the bridge of his nose, raised his head, and put the wand into his arms then pointed to the left side corridor, motioning for Serdak and him to go that way. The outer corridor of the magic tower is a complete circle. After walking through a corridor of tens of meters, Magician Guy brought Soldak to a guarded gate. He showed the guard at the door with his magic badge. He successfully led Serdak into the door. The two walked into the straight corridor. Magician Guy said to Soldak, This is the warehouse of the magic guild. This room stores some wands and magic pots. This room contains some rare magic metal materials and blank rune board. Inside this room are some magic potions and a small amount of magic herbs. Now there is an extremely shortage of magic herbs throughout the empire. And I don't know how long this situation will last. Magician Guy's words were full of helplessness. And he then said, There are currently three epic level magic weapons in weapon depot number one. And eleven excellent level magic weapons in weapon depot number two. Generally speaking, these magic weapons can only be used by second level experts to exert their true power. If you're when your strength reaches level 2, I guess President Miller might reward you with an excellent magic weapon. But the quality of the sophisticated magic weapons we have here is also very good. And the range of choices will be much wider. While they were talking, the two of them came to the end of the corridor. This straight passage was not long. The corridor was a little dim, and the surroundings were quiet. You could even hear some echoes while talking. But Saldek always felt that in this corridor. There seemed to be a pair of eyes always staring at him. He couldn't be sure where those eyes were. And after just scanning his body, the dangerous aura disappeared again. Magician Guy did not ask why Serdak obtained two magic weapons. He walked to a door with a three symbol engraved in the middle and took out a string of long copper weapons from his arms. He made a key, selected a key and inserted it into the keyhole of the door, then took off the magic badge and put it into the depression of a magic pattern array on the door. The magic pattern array on the door then slowly emitted magic light. Magician Guy turned the key hard and heard a few soft sounds from the keyhole before the door slowly opened inside. There was a smell of decay in the room. When the door was opened, the magic wall lamps in the room lit up one by one. From the door, you can see a row of metal shelves in the room. The shelves are covered with a layer of thick linen. Various styles of sophisticated magic weapons are placed on the shelves. 
Some weapons are placed directly on the shelves. And some of the magic weapons are packed in elegant wooden boxes and look very high-end. Weapons are divided into ordinary weapons and magic weapons. The Green Empire has a clear classification of magic weapons into five categories. Excellent. Sophisticated. Outstanding. Epic. And Legendary. Excellent level magic weapons are very common in the market. Like the Shining Saber that Serdak once owned and the Blood Red Crescent he currently carries with him. But excellent level magic weapons are rare in the market. It's not that it's very rare, but that this type of weapon is very popular with nobles and construct knights. Basically, once this kind of weapon is born in the hands of an enchanter, it will be bought quickly. As for the excellent magical weapons, as Magician Guy said, not only are the base materials of the weapons extremely high quality, but one must be a second level expert to exert the true magical power of the weapons. Of course, such weapons are also extremely expensive in terms of cost. It is said that Duke Newman owns an epic weapon. This kind of weapon cannot be bought with money. But it is a status symbol. Magician Guy stepped into the room and introduced Soldak in detail. The number 3 magic weapons library currently stores nearly 50 sophisticated level magic weapons. Most of these magic weapons are intermediate level enchanted magic weapons. President Miller is really generous this time. He is actually willing to let you pick two of them at will. Have you thought about the type of weapon? Only when you clearly know what kind of magic weapon you want can you make a better choice. In fact, Serdek already owned the Holy Light Torch and Blood Red Crescent. He did not need new magic weapons. So he wanted to choose a magic weapon that was handy for Andrew and Greedom. Soldak took a few steps into the room and saw a large wooden stick standing on the wall next to the shelf. This large wooden stick was nearly three meters high. It was painted with a thick layer of varnish. And the stick was an iron hoop holding seven sections of magic metal. Each hoop is inlaid with four-edged thorns that are sharper than arrow clusters. The middle part of the oak stick is wrapped with a layer of red copper, which is covered with inscriptions. The magic pattern array has these four magic crystal fragments inlaid on the gemstone base of the copper plate. Seeing the word fierce oak engraved on the copper nameplate on the side, Soldak thought that this was probably its name. Magician Guy noticed that Serdak had stopped. He turned around. His eyes fell on the big wooden stick and asked with surprise, Soldak, you want a giant wooden stick? This type of weapon is an extremely cumbersome force-oriented weapon. Serdak smiled slightly and said to Magician Guy, a friend of mine needs a stronger stick. He usually uses a hardwood trunk as a weapon. I think this stick is pretty good. Magician Guy's eyes lit up. He suddenly thought of something and couldn't help but ask. Are you going to choose a weapon for ghoul item? When Magician Guy fell into the jungle riding a magic pot, he happened to be saved by the Ogre Gulatum. He lived in the cave of the Ogre Gulatum for a while. He just asked casually. But Serdak actually nodded. There are more options for this type of weapon. You might as well take another look. Magician Guy winked at Soldak, his rich body language failing to directly say that there was a better one ahead. Then Magic Guy quickened his pace and took Serdak a while further. The two stopped in front of a large dark wooden stick. The short Magic Guy had to raise his head to see. Know the whole picture of this stick. This one? Serdak asked the Magician Guy in a cryptic manner. He couldn't see anything strange about this big wooden stick. From the appearance, the ferocious oak seemed to be stronger. And in addition to the iron hoop, the end was also full of thorns. Magician Guy quickly stood up and introduced. This big stick is named Broken Bone. It is made of a precious ironwood body. Although it does not have the thorns on the fierce oak tree, the top of the stick is covered with the skull of the skeleton general. This skull can be it is harder than magic black iron. And you can see the magic pattern array attached to the top of it. We call this magic pattern array Crushing Strike, which is also the origin of the name of this big stick and the bone-crushing grip is it is also engraved with the forever magic pattern array on the side. Its only drawback is that it is huge and bulky, which is the main reason why it has not been selected. He saw that Serdak's eyes had been attracted by the big wooden stick, and whispered, In fact, in terms of certain attributes, it has infinitely overcome the superior weapons. Soldak didn't hesitate anymore and said directly, Then I will choose this one. Magician Guy directly took the broken bone sign off the shelf, handed it to Soldak, and asked him, according to President Miller's instructions, you can also choose a magic weapon. What else do you need next? Serdak focused his attention on the few axes in the arsenal. Magician Guy immediately understood that Serdak wanted to choose an axe. He rubbed his forehead and said, The magic weapons you choose are basically weapons that few people notice in the arsenal. Do you have a friend who is an axe warrior? In fact, 
That's exactly what it is. Soldak answered in the affirmative with a smile. This time, Magician Guy was more direct. He led Serdak to a single-edged axe. The axe blade had an exaggerated arc. It was a one-handed axe. And it exuded a faint smell of blood. The axe blade was even covered with a layer of light green patina. And the handle was polished to a shiny black finish. Magician Guy introduced Soldak. This butcher was struck hard on one side and torn on one side. It is made of a whole piece of magic black iron. Only the handle is inlaid with softer red copper. The blade adopts dwarf metallurgical technology. It is said that the blade edge is very wear resistant. Close to the never wear effect. Magician Guy said enthusiastically. Its shortcoming is that it is old. The rust covers up all its advantages. And everyone often ignores its most important attribute. Which is never wears out dot. After saying that, Magician Guy found a brush from the nearby shelf, dipped it in translucent ointment, and rubbed it hard on the rusted area of the axe twice. Suddenly a lot of the layer of patina was rubbed away, revealing the hidden part of the axe. The magic pattern under the patina comes. Serdak didn't expect that the process of selecting magic weapons would be so smooth. Not long after, Soldak was sent out of the magic tower of Vatsamala City by Magician Guy, and the two said goodbye in the square outside the magic tower. After telling the Secretary of the Military Intelligence Department about the team's investigation experience over the past week, it was already afternoon when I walked out of the Military Intelligence Department of the headquarters. This time the command was very generous, and the military merits awarded to Serdak were very generous. Even the clerk, who was responsible for recording the military merits, made a tisk tisk sound of admiration with envy, and said to him in a sour and somewhat disdainful tone, Soldak said that if these military merits fell on a baron, they would be enough to be promoted to the first level of title. Since Serdak was only a knight, he could no longer improve his social status until he became a noble. These military merits can only be promoted to military positions. But the Haransa Guard Camp is affiliated to the city of Haransa. The Wazamala War Command does not directly have jurisdiction over the Haransa Guard Camp. Therefore, even if Serdak wants to be promoted, these military merits cannot be for reference only. Serdak then came to the Wazamala military supplies office. And he wanted to exchange these military merits for a teleportation pass. The person responsible for issuing the teleportation pass was a young magic apprentice. He casually chatted with Soldak and knew that he was a knight. So he readily issued a teleportation pass. But just before he handed the teleportation pass to Soldak, he casually asked, Is this teleportation pass for your own use? Serdak was stunned for a moment and said casually, it's for a newly recruited member of our team. The magic apprentice retracted his hand holding the teleportation pass. He raised his head and asked, When you just applied, you didn't say that this teleportation pass was for others to use. In this case, you still have to fill in the user's information. Serdak then filled in the name of the Ogre Gulinum on a parchment form. And the race column also clearly stated, Ogre Clan. The young magic apprentice fell silent when he saw this form. He frowned and said to Soldak with dissatisfaction. I know you want to take Mr. Ogre to Roland Continent, but this violates the relevant provisions of the Green Empire Alien Invasion Security Act and does not meet the requirements. So I cannot apply for your teleportation pass. He stood up and reached out to Serdak and said, Sorry, Knight Serdak. Serdak looked at the magic apprentice in astonishment. He thought that if he had just filled in the information of Andrew, an indigenous warrior of the Nanai tribe, he would have left the military supply office with the teleportation pass. Responsible for watching the portal magician check the teleportation pass, but never care about the useless information form. The magic apprentice leaned on the chair, repaired his nails with a small file, and waited for Serdak to leave on his own. These actions made Serdak a little angry. He put his hands on the desk and stubbornly said to the young magic apprentice, Cool item is not an alien. He is a soldier from our guard camp. He is an ogre warrior, who made a small contribution to the Battle of Wazimra City. We traveled thousands of miles to come to Wazimra. The city will help you drive away these Cerberus legions. Do you want to keep these military achievements for me? But I don't need to redeem the teleportation pass at all. When the war here is over, I hope to return to Halanza with Greedom. Chapter 476 Birds Inside and Outside the Cage The Hall of the Munitions Department of Wazimala City Hall was filled with people exchanging merit. Nobles. Knights merchants, etc. There was an exquisite afternoon tea set on the magic apprentice's table, with a few puff pastries and a cup of milk tea. There was a stack of thick files on the table, although the young magic apprentice had a faint smile on his face. There was a hint of disdain in his eyes. 
He picked up the teacup on the desk and took a sip of milk tea. Then slowly raised his head and said to Soldak, Well, Knight Sirdak, I have recorded your request, but this has exceeded my functional authority. I need to ask the commander for instructions on this matter. So all you need to do now is to wait patiently. If there is news, I will, we will notify you as soon as possible. Sirdak stared at the sneer-looking magic apprentice and couldn't help but ask, Are you trying to push me off? How could it be? I just follow the rules. The magic apprentice looked like he wanted to be beaten. And it said I'm just trying to push the envelope written on his face. Serdak put his hand on the blood-red crescent moon on his waist. And a cold murderous aura emanated from him. Frightening the magic apprentice's face to pale. He wanted to shout excitedly. But as Soldak turned and left. The murderous aura disappeared without a trace. The magic apprentice was like a deflated rubber ball. He leaned back in his chair. And wiped the cold sweat from his forehead with a handkerchief. He made up his mind to let Serdak's appeal sink into the bottom of the thick file. At this moment, three magicians in black robes walked in from the door of the city hall hall. The three of them were surrounded by several magic apprentices and walked quickly to the second floor of the city hall. The crowd moved to both sides to avoid them. The magic apprentice sitting in the office area saw the profiles of the three magicians and immediately stood up with a humble and flattering expression on his face, saying H, low loudly, Teacher Boris, Teacher Enoch, Lance teacher. The sound passed through the crowd and reached Lance's ears. Lance heard someone calling him. Turned around and saw a magic apprentice standing up to salute him in the office area of the hall. And nodded slightly. Then, Lance suddenly saw a familiar figure walking through the crowd. He paused, chased the figure with his eyes, and shouted, Soldak, as if someone was calling his name. Serdak stopped. He identified the direction and turned his head just in time to see Lance's handsome face. Lance was wearing a brand new black robe and holding a copper-covered magic book in his hand. He was walking quickly towards him apart from the crowd. Dak, why are you here? Lance walked a few steps happily and said to Soldak, Hi, Lance. Serdak stepped forward, gave his young magician friend a warm hug, and then said, The last time we met was in Bina City. Lance put his hands on Soldak's shoulders and said with a high-spirited expression, I heard that your reconnaissance team helped the intelligence department of the headquarters a lot this time. It really brings honor to our city of Valenza. I'm pretty lucky. Soldak felt that he should be more modest. The two magicians who came up behind Lance all looked at Soldak. One of them curiously asked Lance. Lance, do you know each other? Lance nodded happily, hugged Soldak and said, We all came to the city of Valenza. Speaking of which, the mountain city is not very big. Not only do we know each other, we are also very good friends. These two are me, our current teammates. This is Magician Boris. He is Magician Enoch. And this is Knight Serdak. Magician Boris, with a beard on his face, stood next to Lance and asked Soldak in surprise. Are you the knight of the reconnaissance team who caught the black magician Jesse Houseman? Yes, it's me. Serdak nodded slightly. Hello, Knight Serdak. Let me meet you. I am Enoch. I heard Guy talk about you. I just met Magic Guy this morning. The circle of magicians is not that big. Seeing Soldak standing in the hall, chatting familiarly with three official magicians, the Magic Apprentice standing in front of the desk was in an extremely complicated mood. With a look on his face, smiling awkwardly, he felt that he had to make up for the mistake he had just made immediately. So he walked around the desk and ran towards this side quickly, with a friendly and implicit smile on his face. Um, Sue Erdak Knight. Serdak walked out of the city hall and stood on the steps, holding the teleportation pass of the Ogre Gretum in his hand. I couldn't help but sigh in my heart, no matter where you go. You need human connections. At this time, the benefits of noble status can be highlighted. If it is a noble, I am afraid that the magic apprentice will have a different attitude. A group of colorful parrots flew over Wazimra City, flapping their wings and passing through the golden sunlight. The sky is covered with red clouds. The setting sun will shine through a few beams of light from the clouds, and the afterglow of the setting sun fills the rows of rooftops. Dinner time in the orphanage is always just before dark. There is sticky oatmeal on the dining table. The dining table in the yard is surrounded by excited children. The little girl is holding a bowl of oatmeal that exudes the milky fragrance. With a pair of smart eyes, the big eyes of the little girl became bright. The old woman put half a crisp and tender pickle into the plate in front of her. The little girl's big eyes immediately turned into crescents full of smiles. Breathing the familiar air, the morning glories on the courtyard wall carried a strange fragrance. 
Samira sat on the roof of the shelter house. This was the first time she felt that she could change the life here with her own power. Let the children in the yard have satisfied smiles on their faces. And let the old ladies in the shelter go to those ridiculous charities every week to beg for money under those oily and ugly faces. She was even secretly glad in her heart. If it hadn't been for the siege of the city by the Cerberus Legion, she might still not be able to get rid of the predicament she was in before. Her reputation has been completely ruined among the guides in Wazamala City. The number of adventure groups that dare to hire her as a guide is actually very limited. It is not every day that a new adventure group finds her head. There is no union behind her. Support. Samala's life in Wazamala City is usually very tight. In order to survive, while acting as a guide, she is also an excellent thief. She knows when to attack so that she will not be discovered. What kind of person no one will complain if money is stolen? She is also an excellent hunter and knows exactly where to hunt delicious prey in the jungle outside. Samira never even thought about right and wrong. She tried her best every day to survive. The old grandma finally made dinner for all the children. The appetite of these half-year-old children is not much worse than that of adults, especially when they are still growing. The nutrition cannot keep up and may even affect their growth. She straightened up and looked at the two figures on the roof. With a gentlest smile in her eyes, she banged the wooden spoon against the bucket hard, making a clanging sound, and shouted in a loud voice, Samira, hurry up and bring Aphrodite down from the roof and teach these children how to deal with you. The milk cereal tonight tastes really good. Do you want some? Seeing the wide smile on the old grandma's face, Samira waved her hands disdainfully and said casually, I'll forget it. The guard camp provides free dinner, meat porridge and wheat cakes. It doesn't matter if we go back later. As long as we name our captain, those in charge of the dinner will always find a way to make something. The children around the dining table let out countless sighs of Indy. The figure of the eldest sister, Samira, was extremely tall and supreme in their hearts. The dark hood covered that charming face, bathed in the golden sunshine. The succubus Aphrodite lay on the ridge of the red tile roof, so comfortable that she wanted to sing. This place is countless times better than the sinful realm of the fiery hell. There are no extreme bad weather, no ground fires that appear for no reason, no sandstorms that cover the sky, and no burning stones falling from the sky. This world is originally as such that, although her back still hurt, she still insisted on lying on the ridge like this. She even felt that it was good without her wings. At least she looked more like a human like this. As long as she carefully hid the corners of her head in her hair, she would I feel like there is no difference between myself and the people around me. Samira touched her right arm, which was in bone marrow pain, and felt secretly annoyed. Ever since she had the blessing power of the blessed body, she seemed to be becoming more and more unable to bear the pain. Every time she was blessed by God after her body disappeared, it was the most difficult time for her. In the past, she could even hold her injured arm like this, lean on the back of the wall at the top of the city, and take just a quarter of an hour to sleep. The half-elf archer glanced at Aphrodite. She knew that the succubus' backwing bones had been cut off completely. She was a little envious that Aphrodite could enjoy the sunshine so peacefully under such circumstances. That was a picture, with a beautiful face full of coquettishness and temptation. Samira felt that Aphrodite had the sexiest lips and a pair of enchanting eyes in the world. Looking at her plump breasts wrapped in a black cloak, Samira looked down. With a somewhat flat chest, there was an indescribable feeling of frustration in my heart. Samira has a quarter of the elven blood, and her elf figure is the most perfect among all races. Samira wears a hood every day and covers her face because people who see her for the first time tend to pay attention to her. The magnificent beauty of the mixed blood elf ignored her outstanding abilities. At first, she stole things to teach these LSPs some lessons, but later it slowly evolved into a habit. Her fingers were slender, and she would become inexplicably excited every time she touched something heavy, round, and hard. Samira, Andrew's rough voice came from the door. The Nanai warrior now carries two axes on his back. One of the axes with a copper handle was wrapped in linen by Andrew, and the specific appearance could not be seen clearly. Samira stared at the axe handle with envy. She knew how sharp that axe was, and she felt a little regretful. If she had known that Serdak would give everyone magic weapons, she would have given Sue the forest bow earlier. Erdak took a look and saw that it was an extremely ordinary forest bow. Serdak also appeared at the door of the shelter. He stood at the door and looked inside. The Ogre Gretum will never leave the Hellanza guard camp at this time. He will guard the free dinner in the guard camp. After all the knights have finished eating, it will be the Ogre's lonely mealtime. 
The ogre's motto, enjoy lonely food and get spiritual self-healing from feasting. The half-elf archer jumped up. She jumped lightly from the roof into the courtyard. She ran over and opened the courtyard door herself. With a faint smile on her fair face, she stepped forward and asked Soldak, Captain, why are you here? I am get ready to return to the guard camp. The succubus Aphrodite seemed to have not woken up, lying lazily on the roof enjoying the last moment of the sunset. Serdak waved to Aphrodite, shook the magic sealing box in his hand, and said to Samira, I just went to the magic guild to retrieve this magic marked spirit bone. The battle is about to begin. I want to try to turn this magic pattern spirit bone into a magic pattern clothing and put it on your right arm. Do you dare to try it? Samira said without hesitation. Then why not? Even if it can't get better, it can't be worse than it is now. The appraiser in the magic tower tested the attributes of the magic spirit bone. And President Miller made the final appraisal himself. The life magic pattern on this magic spirit bone was not only power oriented, but also the life magic pattern. It is a hybrid type of magic pattern. Once the magic pattern on the spiritual bone is activated, it will instantly release powerful explosive power and quickly perform repeated actions. For example, if the magic ape activates the magic pattern on its spiritual bones and punches Serdak, Serdak will actually receive two punches. When Soldak retrieved the spirit bone from the magic guild, he decisively rejected President Miller's proposal to exchange a pair of magic pattern wristbands for the magic pattern spirit bone. But the only thing I'm worried about now is whether Samira has enough carrying capacity to withstand the power load of the spirit bone magic pattern itself. If a magic outfit is implanted when it exceeds its own carrying capacity, in addition to enduring the irrepressible pain caused by the magic lines, the magic lines will continue to absorb the power of the transplanter, making his body continue to become weak until he is unable to bear the burden. The magic pattern transmits power, and eventually the power is exhausted and he dies. In fact, the bearing capacity can be tested. But Samira's situation is special. Her right arm is always on the verge of collapse. And the bearing capacity cannot be tested at all. Serdak came to the shelter because the conditions of the marching tents in the guard camp were not good. In order to ensure a greater success rate in this attempt to carry out magic pattern breeding, Serdak made a special trip to ask for leave from Carl and booked a luxurious room in the best hotel in Wazimra City. The old grandma stood in the yard of the shelter watching the three people leaving against the sunset, and placed her wrinkled hands on the little girl's head. Mommy, eldest sister and the others haven't had dinner yet. Where are they going? The little girl looked up at the old mama and asked in a low voice. Some birds are not destined to be kept in cages, the old lady said, looking into the distance. Chapter 477 First Attempt The Gina Hotel is the largest hotel in Bosmala. This four-story building is located on the west side of Jim Ask Square, in the center of the city. It is a gray-white building, and the main body is made of gray and white granite. The entire building is surrounded by a total of 136 25-meter high stone pillars. The four-story terrace is supported by these stone pillars. The outer wall of the main body of the building is carved with complex relief patterns. At night, the four-story building of the Gina Hotel is brightly lit, and the Gina High-End Restaurant on the first floor is almost full. The people who dine here are basically nobles, and this restaurant only accepts reservations. Now Wasmala has gathered reinforcements from various cities in Benis City. In just half a month, the entire city has probably crammed in a population of nearly 100,000 people. All the major squares in the city have turned into military at the same time. The war also brought huge business opportunities, attracting many warmongers in Benis province. Viscount Emmett, Earl Collins and Viscount Owen had just walked out of the restaurant on the first floor of the Gurney Hotel when three familiar figures passed by his sight. Walking briskly through the hall, their leather boots stepping on the smooth and recognizable marble. There was a crisp sound of Tata on the floor. This Count Emmett was slightly startled. The long legs of the half-elf archer impressed him deeply. The most talked about in the Halanza guard camp was the appearance of the half-elf archer. Although having elven blood is destined to not be ugly, he will always use his the face is hidden in the hood. But it is particularly noticeable. This half-elf archer is a newly recruited member of Carl's rescue squadron. This time he followed Serdak into the jungle north of the city and captured a black magician from a lair of the Cerberus Legion. This has become the most talked about story in Wazamala City. This Count Emmett's eyes fell on the first two figures. The tall and strong indigenous warrior followed Soldak to the front desk of the lobby on the first floor of the hotel. Soldak stood in front of the waitress, almost revealing his identity. Afterwards, a waiter led the three of them up the red carpeted stairs of the hotel. 
This Count Emmett stopped in his tracks. No knights in the Hellanza guard camp had left the camp casually and checked into this high-end hotel that cost no less than 50 silver coins per day. Unexpectedly, he saw Sewer here. Duck and his crew. A certain army commander and his half-elf subordinates found a hotel for in-death communication in private. This did not make this Count Emmett feel very strange. He had seen more exaggerated things in this noble circle. But at this time, he why do you need to bring in an eye warrior? Is it because you feel that a place like the Gina Hotel is still not safe enough and you need to bring a bodyguard to guard the door? The three of them passed by in the hall. Earl Collins saw Viscount Emmett stop in his footsteps. He also stopped in his footsteps and looked at Viscount Emmett in confusion. I saw a few acquaintances. Let's go! We have to complete this battle plan tonight. Viscount Emmett smiled at the two commanders of the Per Guard Battalion and the Constantinople Guard Battalion beside him. Said, these three guard battalions have now been divided into a combat team. The order passed from the Plain War Command also made the three guard battalions responsible for cleaning up a small town occupied by H. L. Dogs outside Wazimra City. Because with the experience of the previous battle, this time Viscount Emmett, Earl Collins and Viscount Owen believed that a detailed and thorough battle plan should be made before taking action. The investigation team had already set off in the morning and headed to the small town of Dixon to investigate the distribution of H. Lounge there. This Count Emmett ordered Carl's support squadron to be responsible for this reconnaissance mission. He thought that Carl would send the Serdak Knights combat team out to perform the mission. Now it seems that Carl has not done so. Soldak didn't know that the whereabouts of his group had already fallen into the eyes of this Count Emmett. He booked a room at the Gina Hotel. But as a knight, he was barely qualified to live on the second floor. As for the four rooms on the third floor, that building is a place where only nobles are qualified to live not just those with money. There are long and narrow crystal chandeliers in the corridor of this hotel, stepping on soft carpets, and the surrounding walls are covered with golden patterns, making the interior of this hotel look magnificent. Samira followed Serdak through the corridor. She his eyes were a little dizzy, and his hands were a little uncontrollable. He couldn't help but want to pull off the gold foil in the corridor from the wall. The local aborigines were not qualified to enter the Gina Hotel. It was the first time that Andrew saw someone actually decorating their house with gold. He touched the ball handrail that reflected his own figure and looked up at the strings above his head. Crystal lampposts. Several floating island models made of water-gathering rune boards were floating in the pool for class. And waterfall-like water flows slowly down from the floating islands. Andrew stood in the corridor on the second floor, looking down at the luxurious hotel lobby from the semicircular terrace of the corridor and had a completely different feeling than when he first entered the hotel. The waiter walked to a guest room and opened the door. Soldak looked inside the room. There was only a small living room connected to a terrace in the 50 silver coin room. The bedroom was slightly more spacious, but also extremely small. Limited. The decoration in the room is very gorgeous. The teapots and cups on the table are all sterling silver, and the chandeliers on the roof emit soft light. Soldak gave the waiter 10 coins as usual. The waiter took it with a smile and then said a compliment. But Soldak felt from the look in his eyes when he turned around. The tip may be too small. After closing the door, Samira lifted the hood on her head, revealing a face that perfectly blended wildness and innocence. She leaned down and gently touched the soft leather sofa with her hands, and then tried to move on the sofa, sitting down on the sofa, when her whole body was almost embedded in the sofa and wrapped in soft leather. Her light red eyes widened, and a strange light flashed in them. Andrew looked at the plate filled with milky cream sandwich cake on the silver shelf at the door. He couldn't help but pinch a piece and threw it into his mouth. There was a little too much honey. Nanai warriors don't like sweets. But the pure milky fragrance still made him couldn't help but lick his lips. Serdak picked up a guava from the coffee table tray, threw it to Samira, who was sitting on the sofa and looking around, and said to the two of them, You two just sit there for a while. I'll go to the bedroom and try to extract the magic patterns from the spirit bones. It may take a while. With that said, Serdak pushed open the bedroom door and walked in. With a bang sound, the wooden door was closed by Serdak from the inside. The wooden door of indigo would have a little blue cloud pattern, and the relief on it happened to be a forest with lush vegetation. Several elves sat on the grass and lowered their heads. They whispered in a whisper. The wooden reliefs were carved with meticulous detail, and the expressions of the elves were so meticulous that it seemed that even what they were saying at the moment could be guessed from the expressions on their faces. Seeing Soldak walk into the bedroom, Samira crossed her long legs and lay on the sofa in the most comfortable position. 
she raised the light red guava with both hands and kept turning it over her head. With. Andrew held a plate of sandwich cookies and sat across from Samira. He was worried that the weapons and armor he was wearing would scratch the leather furniture in the room. So he took off his full armor and hung the wooden dummy frame at the door. Superior. Andrew and Samira waited quietly in the living room without any communication. There is a delicate balance floating in the night air. Samira and Andrew heard Soldak say that it had been a while. And they didn't pay much attention at first. However, looking at the stars in the night sky outside the window, Andrew had already finished the sandwich cookies on the silver plate and held the empty plate in his arms. I don't know how long it took. He felt that his mouth was a little dry. So he picked up the water bottle on the coffee table and poured the water in the bottle into his stomach. After drinking it dry, he realized that the water in the bottle had a faint lemon smell. He looked at it, looking across from Samira, who was sleeping with her eyes closed. He could feel that the half-elf was not asleep. But the two of them had nothing to talk about to avoid embarrassment. Andrew even wondered if Suldak was asleep in the bedroom, waiting for him. He leaned on the sofa and fell asleep. When he heard the bedroom door being pushed open, Andrew opened his eyes suddenly. He had just woken up from his dream. His eyes were like a furious lion. His eyes fell on the door. And he discovered Soldak, standing there with a tired face, holding a white translucent film in his hand. The magic lines on it were flowing with a halo that made him feel dizzy. Andrew couldn't figure out how Serdak could change from a a layer of fascia with magic patterns was peeled off from the arm bone of the great demon ape. Moreover, the arm bone was originally so thick, but now only a palm-sized piece was left in Soldak's hands. He quickly stood up from the sofa and wiped his face randomly, feeling a little annoyed that he fell asleep for some reason. Samira also stood up with Andrew. Her light red eyes fell on Soldak's hand. She pursed her lips slightly. She was a little nervous. A streak of fish belly white has already lit up on the horizon outside the window. The stars in the night sky have receded. The sky is gradually getting brighter. And the city is bursting with vitality. Serdak's eyes fell on the face of the half-elf archer and asked Samira. Are you ready? It's not too late to regret now. At dawn, Serdak finally completed the extraction of the magic patterns from the magic pattern spirit bones of the great demon ape. Although he was not very satisfied with his first work, it was already the result of his best efforts. In order to do the best preparation work, he had used the most meticulous methods to peel off the magic patterns on the spiritual bones. After coming down, and the sacrificial ceremony was started throughout the process, Serdak seemed to have some kind of divine power in his body. With the help of the Eye of Truth, he almost perfectly peeled off the magic pattern of life. Then comes the process of extracting the magic pattern. Extracting the magic pattern from a newspaper as big as a palm to the size of a palm. This is the most time-consuming task. This requires Serdak to continue to obtain divine power from the demon god in order to make the magic pattern matrix a little bit of slow change happens. The great wizard in Oyatila did not try this method at first. She only told Serdak about the inheritance in the tribe. Due to the lack of sufficient sacrifices in the tribe, the great wizard did not think there was anything wrong with a large magic pattern during the sacrifice ceremony. She would directly cover the entire magic skin on the tribal warriors. But this kind of colonization the process of influx also caused the greatest damage to the bodies of tribal warriors. Andrew walked out of the guest room before Samira was ready to dress up. He stood in the corridor outside the room with his full armor in his arms. When no one was passing by in the corridor, he hurriedly put the armor on his body and then carried two handfuls of linen-wrapped armor on his back. Boo's axe was guarding the door of this guest room and he instantly became a dedicated guard. Samira was lying on the soft sofa. She took off the cloak that never left her body and unbuckled the salamander leather armor, revealing her well-proportioned body wrapped in leather armor. She blushed slightly, as delicate as milk. Her skin was slightly cooled by the morning breeze, and she pulled the cloak covering her upper body towards her collarbone. Serdak sat on a chair next to Samira and helped her untie the bandages on her right arm. Her right arm had been broken several times, and her fair skin was covered with fine hairs. Blood vessels, these blood vessels are like extremely complex light red lines wrapped around Samira's slightly thick right arm. Overloading and using the power of the blood in the body. The arm is always on the verge of flesh and blood collapse. Serdak can't help but it was clear how much pain Samira had to endure when she shot that arrow. But the scars on her arm seemed a bit shocking. Seeing the four dimly lit blue flames. After Serdak once again sacrificed a H. L. Dog Skull. The two-faced and four-armed demon appeared in the living room. But this time the demon appeared more solid. Without any recalling the feeling of divine blessing 
when peeling off the demon-marked spiritual bones of the great demon ape. Serdak guessed that the sacrifice might not be enough. He gritted his teeth and took out the head of the great devil ape from his magic pocket. Before the devil core in the skull could be taken out, Serdak decisively sacrificed it to the devil. The moment the demon ape's head disappeared, a spiritual rain filled with divine aura seemed to fall in the living room. He couldn't even open his eyes. But then he saw that the two-faced and four-armed demon statue behind him actually moved. The four golden arms actually covered Serdak's head. And the god's face faced the person in the living room. Between the two of them, two golden beams of light shot out from the holes in their eyes and fell on them. Dozens of golden spiritual threads slowly hung down from the demon god's fingers, quietly passing through every joint of Serdak's arms. At this moment, Serdak was like a marionette. He also has autonomous consciousness. And every action is done by Serdak. And it is like he is born with the magic pattern implantation skills. Serdak didn't hesitate at this time. He quickly took out the skinning knife from the scabbard and cut a wound on the shoulder of Samira's right arm. At the same time, a thread woven by spiritual power was woven around Samira. After pulling the wound to form a net, her arm was cut open. But no blood even flowed. As the skinning knife in Serdak's hand peeled off a palm-sized layer of skin on her shoulder, that the translucent magic pattern clothing was covered by Serdak on the wound on the outside of Samira's shoulder. A sacred breath quickly healed Samira's arm. And this magic pattern clothing also connected with the arm extremely quickly. The skin grows together. Chapter 478 The Edge of Power Serdak pulled out countless hairsprings from his spiritual power to weave a fine network of light. And a holy light spell fell, quickly merging the magic pattern clothing and the round shoulders of the half-elf archer. The translucent layer was in the holy light. A faint magic flowed in the light. And each magic pattern exuded a magnificent light. Samira's bright red blood flowed into the magic patterns of the magic pattern clothing. Connecting this translucent fascia with her skin. Samira frowned slightly. And the light of mana emitted from the magic pattern clothing quickly filled her right arm. Forming a series of light golden patterns. The whole process was a long one. And it wasn't until the sky outside the hotel was completely bright that the entire magic pattern clothing was completely implanted and the demon statue on the sacrificial altar slowly disappeared in a beam of holy light. Serdak rebandaged Samira's right arm and looked at the half-elf girl's arm, feeling both hopeful and uneasy in his heart, although the implantation process went very smoothly. Since it was his first time doing this kind of thing, he was worried that he had made some omissions in some places, which would worsen the injury of Samira's right arm. Serdak sat up straight and said to Samira, who was sitting on the sofa, You should take a good rest for the next three days, and try not to exert any force on your arms. After the clothing is completely integrated with your skin, you can recover. Sexual training. Only then will we know whether this magic pattern breeding costume is successful. Samira nodded. A hint of cunning flashed in her eyes. In fact, her right arm already has some very special feelings. She knows that her body is sensing the magic pattern clothing. And she can also feel that the magic pattern clothing has been integrated into her body and has become a part of her body. She can even feel the mana fluctuations contained in the magic patterns on the clothing. Just like she can control the power of blood in her body. As long as she is willing, she can activate the power of the magic patterns on the clothing at any time. The tattooed clothing spread a faint magic power into her body. And she was a little curious about what kind of power this magic pattern clothing would bring to her. For Samira, it was a very subtle feeling. She nodded slightly and turned her head. Her eyes fell on the magic pattern clothing on her shoulders. She put on the salamander leather armor again. The half-elf archer stood up from the soft leather sofa. Getting up, she pushed open the glass door on the terrace, walked to the terrace, and took a deep breath facing the rising sun. The feeling of regaining control of her body made her want to shout. And there was an excitement building up in her heart. Afterwards, Soldak took Samira and Andrew to leave the Gina Hotel, and the group returned to the square guard camp. Carl's eyes were red and it seemed that he had not slept much last night. The entire guard camp began to do in preparation for the expedition. Marching rations were being distributed in the guard camp, and most of the knights were sorting out the marching tents, and a lot of the remaining domestic garbage in the station was being cleaned out. The square became chaotic at this time, and almost all squadron leaders had already taken action. Seeing Soldak return from outside, Carl quietly leaned forward and asked in a low voice, Where did you go last night? Why did Emmett ask me about you just after he came back from outside? I went to treat her arm injury. It's not convenient in the camp. Serdak glanced at Samira behind him. Carl patted Soldak on the shoulder. 
nodded slightly, and said in a low voice, I said the same to Viscount Emmett. If he comes to you and asks about this matter, remember not to tell the truth. Seeing the knights around him packing up their tents, Soldak waved to Andrew and Samira, gesturing for them to pack up their tents as well. Everything I said is true, Serdak said casually. Carl may not have taken care of himself in the past few days, and the green stubble makes him look a little haggard. He yawned, rubbed his dry face with his hands, and echoed very perfunctorily. Okay, I believe you. Hurry up and pack up your tent. The guard camp will leave the city soon to perform a new mission. This time our goal is to clean up the Cerberus in Dixon Town, southwest of the city, and we will set off before noon. Hearing Carl's information, Soldak asked with a look of astonishment, why was this not notified in advance? If he hadn't dared to come back in time, he would probably have been abandoned by the guard camp in Wazimra City. Carl said helplessly, the order was conveyed last night, and you were no longer in the camp at that time. Carl pointed to the neatly arranged heavy armored infantry regiments on the street across the square and said to Soldak, Almost all the guard battalions have received new tasks this time, and we are not the first ones to leave the city. It seems that the command headquarters has mastered the specific location of the Hell Dog Legion's H, L Passage. Almost all the heavy armored infantry regiments in the city have we have all received the transfer order, and now there is a heavy cavalry regiment blocking the city gate. It will probably be our guard battalion's turn until all these heavy armored infantry regiments leave the city. Carl had just said a few words to Soldak before he was called away by the Herald. When the surrounding guard camp knights saw Serdak, they all came over to greet him. From the mouths of these knights, Serdak learned about Marquis Luther's two regiments of constructed swordsmen and five groups of heavy cavalry. The regiment has left Wazimra City. Marquis Luther's sword point this time is the northern suburbs of Wazimra City. Five heavy armored infantry regiments. Two long archer regiments and a crossbow and baggage regiment are following closely behind. We'll also leave Wazamala City one after another in the morning. And these infantry regiments will also enter the northern suburbs battlefield one after another. The defense task of Wazamala City has been officially taken over by the City Defense Department. The new troops recruited by the City Defense Department of Wazamala City have also climbed onto the city wall in the past few days. In order to ensure that the city of Wazimra will not be besieged by the H. L. Dog Army again. Cities in Bena province rushed to the city of Wazmara. The guard battalion served as the second echelon and rushed to the towns and villages around the city of Wazmara to clear out the H. L. S. there. Evil dogs. In order to prevent these H. L. dogs that are entrenched around small towns and villages from escaping into the vast jungles of the Maka Plain when the Cerberus Legion is defeated. It may take a lot of money to wipe out the remaining power of these H. L. dogs greater manpower and material resources. At present, most of the villages and small towns around Wazimra City are occupied by the Cerberus Legion. But some local residents have formed a resistance organization and are engaged in small-scale jungle battles with the Cerberus Legion. The task of the Guard Battalion is to unite as much as possible the remaining forces of these villages and towns were effectively organized to help them regain their homes. In addition to a large number of troops about to go to the battlefield, Many business groups waiting in the city will also set off with the armies. These business groups are responsible for almost half of the logistic supplies of the Bena army. They will also solve the problem of storing and carrying the trophies for these armies. The problem is that soldiers can exchange their trophies for weapons, armor, gold coins, etc. Or they can directly mail the property they acquired to their families. The business group only charges a small amount of postage. In addition, the adventure groups who were once forced to stay in Wazimala City, after hiding in the city for nearly a month, will certainly not give up this good opportunity to make money this time. God knows where they are. After all, some people thought that the War Command would recruit adventure groups and mercenary organizations on the spot to participate in this plain war. Unexpectedly, this time the Bena army directly repelled the Cerberus Legion from the front. By the time the Hellenza Guard camp left the city, it was already three o'clock in the afternoon. Serdak took the opportunity to take a nap in the square station. The most excited person at this time was the Ogre Gretum. He had been nesting in the square station for four days. In this city filled with people everywhere. He I couldn't even get out of the guard camp. If I didn't go out for some exercise, I felt like all the joints in my body were going to be rusty. In the past few days, the knights in the Helensa guard camp actually pieced together a set of simple leather armor for the Ogre Gulitum. The biggest effect of this temporary set of leather armor is to make the ogre mogul item carry the bone-crushing stick on his back. 
This incident also made the ogre fully feel the enthusiasm of the people of Helanza. Gulida mingled with the ranks of the Helanza guard camp and looked at the crowds of farewells on both sides of the street with great curiosity. Among the flowers and applause, the ogre finally felt something completely different from the previous hunting. When the citizens of Wazamala City saw the big ogre, there were exclamations from time to time in the crowd. The ogre was even hit in the face by a piece of bacon flying towards it. Just when the citizens thought it would when he was angry, he picked up the bacon that fell on the ground and threw it directly into his mouth. He swallowed the bacon directly into his stomach like chewing dried meat. After passing the moat, most of the H. L. Dog corpses piled up outside the city have been reduced to ashes. There is still the stench left by the H. L. Dogs at the city gate. A large area of land outside the city is stained with purple blood. The battlefield is in a mess. The team followed different directions from the city gate and disappeared into the jungle. The knights of the three guard battalions of Aranza City, Plex City, and Constantinople formed a battle group. The task they received from the military department was to recover the town of Dixon. According to the information provided by Samira, the small town of Dixon is only a day and a half's walk from Wazamala City. However, the guard camp encountered several scattered attacks by groups of H. L. Dogs in the jungle. These H. L. Dogs slowed down the guard camp's attack. Pace. It was already two days before the guard battalion arrived outside the small town of Dixon. On the second day after the magic pattern implantation was implanted, Samira found that the pain in her right arm had actually eased. On the third day, the blessing effect of the blessed body on Samira's arm disappeared, and she still felt nothing. It was only when her arm ached that she realized that the magic pattern clothing was perfectly integrated with her arm. While camping at night, Samira tried to untie her leather armor and untie the straps wrapped around her arms. Only then did she discover that there was a delicate, palm-sized tattoo on her right arm. On the side of her upper arm, the magic pattern is made up of three patterns. The top line looks like three mountain peaks, while the middle line forms a tilted hourglass. The bottom pattern looks like an inverted umbrella. These three the magic patterns were connected by countless magic threads, as if they were tattooed on her arms, with no traces visible at all. She sat next to Serdak and asked curiously, Captain! What is the name of this magic pattern clothing? Serdak paused and said casually. This magic pattern clothing inherits the power of the magic ape. So it's called power. Then he helped Samira check the condition of her arm. Seeing that the magic pattern clothing did not repel Samira, Serdak breathed out softly. Judging from the current situation, this magic pattern clothing did not reject Samira. The costume has been well integrated into Samira's body. And the blessing effect of the blessed body has expired. Samira is not in any abnormal condition. And her body's carrying capacity is enough to bear this magic pattern cloak. No problem. The magic pattern clothing blends in very well. Soldak helped her retie the straps on her arms and said to Samira, although she was very aware of the condition of her arm in her heart. When she heard Serdak say this, Samira was completely relieved and asked Serdak, Then can I try shooting an arrow? In fact, Serdak also had expectations and wanted to know what kind of power this magic pattern clothing brought to Samira. Okay, but try not to use all your strength, so as not to injure your arm again, Serdak said. Samira stood up from Serdak, took the forest bow in her hand, and put an arrow on the bow's string. As soon as a thought came to her mind, the magic patterns on her arm lit up, and she saw several streams of light flashing from those magic patterns. Samira felt that the power in her right arm suddenly increased a lot. She drew the forest bow very easily, and shot the arrows in her hand uncontrollably. At the same time, she actually repeated the action of pulling out the bowstring in an instant, and the second arrow flew out immediately after. The two arrows passed by in the wind, turned into two white marks, and were nailed to the tree trunk with a bang. The arrowhead of the feather arrow dived deeply into the trunk, but the wooden shaft of the feather arrow was shattered into pieces. Behind it an arrow followed behind and penetrated the arrow hole in front again. The tail of the arrow kept trembling. In addition to the increase in strength that the Great Demon Ape's Magic Pattern Reproduction Equipment brings to Samira. After turning on the Magic Pattern Reproduction Equipment, it also has a very strong explosive power and double strike effect, allowing Samira to easily shoot double arrows. Samira looked at her right arm in surprise. She didn't expect that a piece of Magic Pattern clothing would improve her so much. The main problem Samira has always faced is that the power of her blood far exceeds the load of her arm. Every time she uses the power of her blood to draw the bow, her right arm will be overwhelmed, causing her flesh and blood to collapse. The biggest damage was to the blood vessels in her arm. 
Now her right arm suddenly became full of strength. And the problem that troubled her was finally completely solved. She stood there stupidly, looking at her arms, and nodded heavily to Serdek. What kind of effect was achieved? Serdek asked curiously, although he saw Samira successfully shooting two arrows. He didn't know the specific situation. He only saw the magic pattern on the armor light up, and the two arrows flew out. It has enhanced the strength and explosive power of the arm, and can shoot two arrows at the same time, Samira said excitedly. Chapter 479 Fierce Battle The small town of Dixon is located in the hilly area southwest of Wazimra City. The jungle here is not very dense. Only the southern slopes of many hilly areas are covered with large forests. While the northern slopes of these hills are covered with a kind of low shrubs. This shrub is called the tartar tree by the local indigenous people. This shrub is rich in a kind of tartar berry. Although tartar berries are seasonal berries, the jam made by mixing the berries with maple syrup is very famous. This shrub does not like sunlight. If it is exposed to the sun for too long, the tartar fruit will be very sour. This shrub can only grow well on the northern slopes of hills that are protected from sunlight. This kind of jam is grown in large quantities locally. So the hilly landscape here is very special. Looking from south to north, the mountains and plains are covered by jungle. But when Serdak turns around and looks from north to south, he will see countless bushes scattered all over the northern slope of the hilly land. And those bushes outline complete outlines on the hilly land. The town of Dixon is not that big. Standing high on the hilly land, the view can almost run through the entire town. The houses on the edge of the town are somewhat scattered. There are only two main streets in the entire town. And these two streets intersect. The crossroads is the center of the town. And only the buildings there appear denser. The clock tower in the center of the town is nearly twice as tall as the other buildings. Making it extremely abrupt in the center of the town. Now the town has become lifeless. There are some H. L. dogs scattered around the town. And there are a few black crows hovering in the sky. These H. L. dogs are hidden behind the buildings on the edge of the town. From a distance, they look dark. In a large area, on the roofs of many buildings stood Gog with fireballs burning in their palms. Fires and black smoke continued to appear in the town. Many buildings had been reduced to ashes. And only some stone buildings were still standing. Nearly a hundred giant H. L.S. guarding a three-headed H. L. dog stood directly in front of the town. Confronting the guard camp on the hills not far away. And from time to time, they let out an unsuppressed roar. One thousand and five hundred knights from the guard camp stood on the high hill. The whetstone rubbed against the edge of the long sword, emitting dark red sparks. Some of the knights sang war songs from the war. In the Green Empire, there was probably only one province in Benna. The tradition of singing war songs before the war is still preserved. Everyone believes that war songs can give soldiers courage and guide them to victory. Thousands of people sing a song at the same time. Everyone's voice is not very loud. But the singing is deafening. It was like waves of rolling thunder, extending in all directions. The knights stared at the town ahead, with surging fighting spirit erupting in their hearts. The three commanders, Viscount Emmett, Earl Collins and Viscount Owen, stood together. The captains of each group also gathered behind the three. They divided their respective areas of responsibility and hurriedly returned to their respective camps. All the knights lined up on the hilly ground. In a neat row, more than seventy construct knights were scattered everywhere. After experiencing more than a dozen battles with H. L. Dogs these days, everyone has a deep understanding of the tactics and weaknesses of these H. L. Dogs. Even if there is a three-headed H. L. Dog in the town, the knights still have high fighting spirit. This Count Emmett drew his sword and pointed it high into the sky. A halo of knights erupted from the knight team. Serdak was also one of the knights with a halo of power. The knights in the support squadron gathered towards him, silently feeling the power coming from under their feet. All knights attack! This Count Emmett issued the order. The knights from the guard camp rushed into the town of Dixon in three torrents. The overgulitum was extremely eye-catching among the crowd. He could stride seven or eight meters away in one step and carried the big weapon named Broken Bone on his shoulders. Stick. By charging down the hillside, like a giant rhinoceros into the camp of H. Lounds. Thousands of H. L. Dogs rushed out of the town like a black wave at this moment. And the two sides collided in the wilderness outside the town. The ogre warrior was like a huge stone smashed into the pond. The moment he crashed into the H. L. Dog camp, the bone-crushing stick in his hand was already rounded. And four or five H. L. Dogs suddenly appeared. The dog was hit in the waist with a bone-crushing stick. Its growling turned into whimpers and screams. 
and it flew into the sky after being hit with a bone-crushing stick. More H, L dogs pounced on the ogre. The ogre ignored the other H, L dogs around him, took another step forward, and swung a bone-crushing club at a giant H, L dog in a group of H, L dogs. The knights who rushed after him drew out their swords one after another, held up the knight's light shield in their hands, and collided with the black tide formed by the H, Lound. The shadow of, sure, kept flashing in the crowd of knights and a pair of eyes appeared behind Andrew, a native of the Nanai tribe. At the same time, Andrew's eyes instantly turned blood red, and he followed the ogre with two axes in hand. Like an ogre, the farmer rushed into the cabbage field and swung the axe in his hand to decapitate the two H, lounds that rushed towards him. He was wearing a full set of armor and did not care about the bites of the other H, lounds around him. He was a cannibal. The demon stopped the Cerberus that was rushing up from the right side of his body. The knights from behind came one after another, and for a moment, they raised their shields to stop the charging Cerberus. The guard camp knights used their shields to block the first wave of Cerberus with their bodies, and a group of Cerberus fell immediately under their swords. At this time, Serdak naturally followed Carl closely. The dwarf chain shield in his hand frequently burst out with silver light, stopping the age, lounge that rushed towards him one after another. Every combat action was a standard as a textbook. You can't tell how much strength he used, the blood-red crescent in his hand can always penetrate the Cerberus's heart accurately. Every movement is smooth and natural. From shield blocking to beheading. It is basically done in one go. In this kind of camp melee, Serdak finally showed his fighting power. This kind of battle is the best litmus test. And Serdak showed other knights what it means to be experienced in hundreds of battles. He never wastes a moment. With extra strength. Every movement is clean and neat. And the purpose is very simple and clear which is to kill the H, lound in front of him as quickly as possible, using Serdak to accompany Carl, sharing half of the burden for him, and the knight's sword in Carl's hand. Cerberus also gained many battle results. Samira walked at the back of the team. The forest bow in her hand frequently fired arrows, and rescued the knockdown knight from the kisses of some H, lounds. What really caused casualties to the knights was the group of Gog on the roof. When the knights of the guard camp pursued the defeated Cerberus and approached the town, a rain of fire flew out from the roofs of the buildings on the edge of the town. These small fire bombs fell in the crowd. It caused great trouble to the knights. Even if the knights raised their shields to block, these fireballs would adhere to the surface of the shield and continue to burn. If these fireballs cannot be extinguished in time, the flames will soon burn the shields in the knights' hands so hot that they will no longer be able to hold the shields. Some knights even took off the water bags from their waists, used their long swords to remove the flame stuck on their shields and poured clean water on the shields. The leaders of the three H, Lounds guarded the last line of defense. The three heads looked at the battlefield uncertainly. When they saw the knights from the guard camp rushing up in front of them, the three heads of the three H, Lounds roared at the same time. He jumped from a building. As he jumped down, nearly a hundred giant H, Lounds followed him, instantly turning into a rolling torrent and rushing directly towards Viscount Emmett's location. This new force came in and immediately stopped the guard battalion knights, who were charging all the way. The fur of the leader of the three age, Lounds was shiny, and there were dark red magic lines on his body. With the smell of lava, it was not at all afraid of ordinary swords. He resisted the long swords thrust by several knights. Three heads bit the three knights respectively. Serdak seemed to hear the cracking of their body bones from a distance. As soon as they made contact, more than a dozen knights were bitten by the giant age. L dogs that rushed up. These H. L dogs ran rampant in the rain of fire thrown by Gog. The fire rain fell on the H. L dogs. But they were the flow of lava became more vivid. The three H. Lound leaders shook off the three knights who knew whether they were alive or dead. And spit out three magic bullets from their mouths. The magic bullets exploded in the crowd one after another. The ice mist and flames exploded. And some knights were immediately frozen into ice sculptures and some knights were instantly transformed into pyromen. Of course, this Count Emmett and the other three great knights around him would not let the three H, Lound leader slaughter the guard camp knights here. They immediately took the construct knights behind them to meet the three H, Lound leaders. At this time, the giant H, Lound behind him also burst out with considerable combat power, blocking the front line of the guard camp this Count Emmett from outside the town. Earl Collins and this Count Owen led their construct knights to rush over. They were all ready to work together to fight against the three H, L dogs. The knights in the guard battalions in other areas also slowed down their rush into the town. 
There were nearly seven people in the three guard battalions. Almost half of the ten construct knights surrounded the three H, L dogs. If the leaders of the three H, L dogs were not surrounded by giant H, L dog guards, they would probably be directly rushed to death by these construct knights. The ogre Gulitum was also among the people who were rounding up the three H, Lounds. The bone crushing stick in his hand was stained with purple blood. With one hand, he pulled the giant H, Lound that jumped on his back and bit his shoulder. He came down and slammed it to the ground. He stepped on the waist of the giant Cerberus with a huge foot and hit the head of the giant Cerberus with a bone-crushing stick, smashing the head of the giant Cerberus into pieces. Serdak followed Carl, but fell one step behind. At this moment, countless fires suddenly appeared in Serdak's field of vision, and more gogs suddenly appeared on the roofs at the edge of the town. Fire bombs pierced the sky and were thrown towards the battlefield here. Coming over, it was like a rain of fire. The battlefield was already filled with thick smoke and there was a burnt smell in the air. Samira. Serdak saw that the half-elf archers were still wasting arrows to rescue the knights who were knocked down by Cerberus. So he pointed at the gog on the roof at the edge of the town and said, Shoot those fire monsters as much as possible. Samira rubbed her face with her hands, and avoided the bite of A.H., lound without saying a word. She squatted half-crouched. And a burst of light burst out from her right arm. Two arrows shot from Samira in no particular order. He shot it out from his hand. And suddenly there were two gogs on the roof with feather arrows on their foreheads. And they fell down from the roof. Before Serdak could take a step to catch up with Carl, he suddenly saw a gog covered in flame standing out from the highest place on the edge of the town. This gog was more than twice as tall as the other gog. Not only that, its upper body was almost entirely wrapped in a ball of flames. When it appeared, the gog throwing flames around it became even crazier. Obviously this gog is the king of all gog. Just when Serdak hesitated, the King of Gog condensed a huge fireball with his hands. The breath of flames flashed wildly on its body, and its upper body lit up with flame magic patterns. When it threw out the fireball in its hand, Serdak discovered that it actually threw three continuous fireballs in one breath. The three fireballs landed among the knights and exploded one after another. Several knights who were about to block with their shields were blasted into the sky by the King of Gog's continuous fireballs. The battlefield began to become extremely chaotic. The originally defeated Cerberus army showed signs of stabilizing its footing, and then continued from there. Rain of fire thrown from a distance. There were no age, lounge on the roof at this time. Serdak picked up the dwarf chain shield in his hand and ran forward in large strides. He passed Carl directly and ran to the ogre who was already red-eyed, pointing at the king of Gog who was standing on the roof sixty yards away. He shouted, Grind him! Throw me over! Carl, who was following Serdak widened his eyes. He thought he heard wrongly, but saw that the ogre had leaned down, picked up Serdak with both hands, and quickly stood beside the ogre Gully, in front of Temu. He shouted at Soldak. Soldak! You are crazy! Serdak raised the dwarf chain shield in his hand, and waved his hand at the ogre. Gulitum threw Serdak away without hesitation. Serdak only felt a wave of dizziness, and was thrown into the air like a cannonball. When he regained his vision, his body had already flown to the high point of the parabola. He hesitated for a moment. And then his body began to fall rapidly. Serdak didn't want to hit it directly. He estimated that if he fell on the stone wall of the building, even with the protection of the earth shield, he would probably be smashed into a meat pie. On the roof of the building where the king of God was, there was a flagpole that looked very strong. But there was no flag on it. Soldak found the right moment to throw the dwarf chain shield in his hand. The shield hit the flagpole in an arc and in everyone's astonished eyes. It accurately wrapped around the flagpole. Serdak's body fell rapidly at this time. Just when it reached the lowest point, Serdak's arm suddenly pulled hard. His whole body was like Tarzan. Relying on the chains of the dwarf chain shield to escape from countless, the Cerberus flew overhead and landed steadily on the roof of the tallest building on the opposite side, like a swing. He stood in front of the bewildered King of Gog, and the blood-red crescent moon drew a bloody arc as he crossed over. A two-faced, Four-armed demonic shadow appeared behind Serdek. One of the arms of the demonic shadow seemed to overlap with Serdek's arm. A sharp breath surged out from the sword. And before the king of God could react, the sword blade swiped across its throat. The next moment, all its movements stopped, and the six dark eyes in the flame stared at Soldek. It fell on its back in extreme reluctance. And then a flame shield suddenly appeared on its body. Chapter 480 After the War King God Covered in Flames fell on the roof, 
bursting into a huge fire. A group of god people around them made howling sounds. They stood on the edge of the building roof and threw small fireballs in their hands at Serdek. Serdek retracted his chain shield and blocked it in front of him. And countless small fireballs were thrown at him. On the dwarf chain shield. Blocked by blessed shield. Serdak held a blood red crescent and chased around. The frightened god stood on the edge of the roof. They did not dare to fight with Serdak in close combat. They jumped from the roof to the street. Several of them jumped to the street. Gog even broke his leg because of this. And only the god people standing on the roof next door threw small fireballs at Serdak desperately. Serdak avoided the bite of a giant H, lound and jumped from the roof against the rain of fire. His body rolled forward to release the momentum. The gods ran lifelessly down the long street. While the surrounding people however, the H, Lounds rushed forward desperately, trying to tear through Serdak's magic pattern structure, and used their fangs to tear off a piece of flesh from his body. Suddenly, Serdak was besieged by dozens of H, Lounds. He held up the dwarf chain shield and tried to block it. A dark H, Lound fell on the dwarf chain shield, clawed at the edge of the chain shield with its claws, and opened. The mouth was about to hit Serdak's face. Serdak felt his arm sink. His body was dragged by several H, L dogs at the same time. A giant H, L dog sprang out from behind Serdak. He put his claws on Serdak's shoulders and roared at him. Serdak didn't dare to look back at all, and stabbed the blood red crescent moon down with his backhand. A halo of power flashed under his feet, and he hit the stone wall with the H, lounge in his body, with the explosive power generated by the armor constructed with magic patterns. So Serdak actually knocked a big hole out of the stone wall and fell into an abandoned yard. Serdak killed the H, L dogs hanging on his body. Cries of killing came from the streets, and the low roars of H, L dogs, and the sharp horns of Gog were also mixed in. The knights of the guard camp had already rushed into the town. Serdak kicked away the H, L dog that was biting his wrist guard, and stepped forward to add another blow. He saw a giant H, L dog trying to get in from outside the broken wall, before he could get into a fighting stance. The bone-crushing stick in the ogre's hand smashed down hard, not only knocking down the stone wall, but also smashing the back of the giant H, L dog to pieces on the spot. Half of the H, L dog's body was buried in the rubble of rubble. Andrew was covered in purple blood. He rushed in from the street outside with a pair of axes. When he saw that Soldak was safe and sound, he turned and rushed towards the most chaotic place on the street. He had obviously gone crazy and killed him. The full coverage armor on his body was also damaged in many places. Samira, who followed later was much calmer. She was holding a forest bow in her hand. She stepped into the yard and shot a gog on the roof diagonally opposite, who was about to throw a small fireball through the head. The roof flipped over and fell to the street, bursting into flames and turning into ashes. Carl followed closely with the knights from the support squadron, rushing into the town against the rain of fire falling from above. The three-headed H. L dog outside the town was also besieged by many construct knights, and its body was covered with various scars. A construct knight from Pulik City took the lead in cutting off the three-headed H, L dog with eyes attributes. Then the three H, L dogs tried to break through, but they were stopped by the construct knights together. After biting several construct knights, all three heads were finally chopped off. The H, Lounds who lost their leader were no match for the guard camp knights. After a whole day of fighting, the guard battalion finally succeeded in occupying the small town of Dixon. Some H, L dogs that escaped from the town got into the hills. The knights of the guard battalion were divided into several teams, following the H, L dogs to chase and kill them along the way. The mountains and fields the hills were dotted with skirmishes. The luck of those gogs was not so good, although their fireballs caused a lot of trouble to the knights of the guard camp, because most of the gogs were too weak. When the H, L dogs fled, a large number of gods were massacred by the knights of the guard camp. Since the Bena Legion does not need to exchange hostages with the Cerberus Legion, there are basically no prisoners during the battle. And defeat means death. Just as the knights of the guard camp were chasing the hell dogs, an unknown fighting group emerged from the jungle outside the town. Although this fighting group had uneven weapons and equipment, they were unusually brave during the battle. This group of people joined in the chase, which undoubtedly made it worse for the age. Hell dogs, who wanted to escape into the jungle. Hundreds of knights from the guard camp dispersed into the bushes on the northern slope of the hilly land. Countless H, L dogs hiding among them were driven out by the knights. The desperate H, L dogs once again fought with the knights of the guard regiment. The guards who had the advantage the battalion knights used the sophisticated weapons 
and equipment in their hands to annihilate a small group of H. L. dogs in the hilly areas. At first glance, it looks like there are guard camp knights chasing H. L. dogs all over the mountains and plains. Tinerano stood on a high hill with a spear on his back, turned around and said to his companions behind him, These knights are not the army of Wasmara City. Their equipment is better than the garrison of Wasmara City. It should be foreign reinforcements. On the hill stood a row of warriors with a bunch of spears stuck on their backs. These warriors held jagged weapons in their hands, and most of them wore leather armor. Chief, should we go over and join them? The young soldier beside him asked Tanrano. Tanrano frowned. He did not find an Anai warrior among these well-equipped knights. After much hesitation, he said to the young warrior beside him, Let's take a look first and try not to have contact with them as much as possible. If my guess is correct, they should be from Bina province. The army there doesn't understand the Maka plane or us. We should try to avoid conflicts. Oh! The young warrior nodded and made a gesture to his companion beside him. Let's go back into the jungle and kill the H. Lounge over there. After this unknown fighting group appeared, they stopped a large number of H. L dogs that were fleeing towards the southwest jungle. After repelling the group of H. L dogs, they turned and walked into the jungle. They did not come into contact with the knights from the guard camp, who caught up. The vanguard responsible for chasing this group of H. L dogs just rushed to the hillside when they encountered a large group of H. L dogs. These H. L dogs had no fighting spirit at this moment. They rushed towards the guard camp, and the knights of the vanguard waved their swords. They chopped off the heads of these vicious H. L dogs one after another, and in a blink of an eye there were dog corpses left on the hillside. The knights in the vanguard dragged their tired bodies, cut off the heads of the H. L dogs on the battlefield, and quickly evacuated the hilly land. After a day of fierce fighting, the physical strength of the knights in the guard camp was exhausted. They were so determined to pursue the victory and expand the fruits of victory. However, these knights in the guard camp were very rational and had no intention of chasing into the jungle. Dusk, Count Collins stood on the roof of a three-story building and watched pairs of guard camp knights return to the town of Dixon with their trophies before nightfall. He breathed a sigh of relief and walked off the roof with heavy armor. When he was fighting the 3-H, Lowndes, his right arm was injured by the fire bomb spewed by the 3-H, Lowndes. At that time, it was only roughly bandaged, and no special treatment was done after the battle. Now he can feel the whole shoulder. It's all on fire. It hurts. In this battle of Dixon Town, there were actually a large number of Gog among the Cerberus Legion. This was something the three guard battalion commanders did not expect at all. Nearly half of the injured knights in the guard camp were killed by Gog. Those who were hit by small fireballs were burned. But not many were bitten by H. L. Dogs. Earl Collins rubbed his sore shoulders with his hands and ordered Leslie, the captain of the 2nd Brigade of the Per City Guard Battalion behind him. Before it gets dark, quickly count the number of knights in the guard camp and notify them. Let the knights prepare to spend the night in the town. We, the knights of Plus City, will camp in the workshop block, leaving some space for the other two brother camps. Don't run around. And don't let the age, unless all over the streets there is a conflict between the canine heads. And as long as we successfully complete this mission to regain the town of Dixon, we will not lack military merit. Yes, Lord Earl. Captain Leslie stood up straight and said loudly, At this moment, the Helensa Guard Camp is located in the center of the busiest street in Dixon Town. Since Carl's rescue squadron rushed into the town first, the knights of the rescue squadron occupied the bell tower as the center, including the town council a bustling neighborhood with restaurants, hotels, trading houses, and other buildings. Although this town has been plundered by Cerberus, Cerberus only sees the town residents and the meat reserves. When they captured Dixon Town, the residents of Dixon Town, who hurriedly evacuated, did not have time to take them all away. The property of. Many times, this is what war is about. The Guard Battalion Knights provide their own ordnance and some logistical supplies. So the Plain War Command also relaxes its authority when it comes to collecting trophies. The support squadron did not participate in the mission of chasing the H. L. Dogs. As the most outstanding squadron in the Battle of Dixon Town, Carl and the support squadron were qualified to search for the remaining H. L. Dogs in the town. There is no doubt that the support squadron got its first bite of fat. Of course, most of the loot found must still be turned over to the guard camp, which will be responsible for overall planning and final distribution. The town was filled with smoke. Soldak originally planned to participate in the follow-up chase. 
but when he saw some casualties among the knights after the guard battalion captured the town. He responded to Viscount Emmett's dispatch and quickly went into rescue operations. A monk. Since Serdak has mastered the holy light technique, the knights will not use expensive healing potions immediately after being injured. Even if they are seriously injured, they will be carried to Serdak. Please ask Sue Erdek Knight came to the rescue. The rescue squadron took the lead in occupying the center of the town. And the knights in the squadron occupied the hotel immediately. Originally, it was intended to be used as a temporary base for the support squadron after cleaning up. After all, living in a hotel is much more comfortable than living in a tent. However, Soldak bought the small town hotel and used it as a temporary field hospital for the guard battalion. Three guard battalions all the injured knights have been placed in the hotel. Now, Serdak has done a series of things such as cleaning wounds, treating carrion, casting holy light spells, and bandaging wounds very skillfully. He does not even need to do the first two processes himself. Andrew and Samira would do just fine. Moreover, the two of them will also rank the injured knights sent over. Knights with serious injuries have priority for treatment. During the treatment process, although the knights in the Helensa guard camp will receive some preferential treatment, considering that the guard camps in the three cities are currently in a cooperation period, it will not be too obvious. Many knights come in and out of the town hotel. Serdak was busy until after two o'clock in the morning before he finished dealing with all the injured knights. During this period, Viscount Emmett, Earl Collins, and Viscount Owen also made a special trip to visit the injured knights in the guard camp. And at the same time, they also made the greatest possible allocation of resources. Before leaving the hotel, Viscount Emmett patted Soldak affectionately on the shoulder and said, Knight Soldak, for your outstanding performance in the Battle of Dixon this time, the guard camp has carefully considered it, decided to help you arrange for the teleportation qualification of the Ogre Gretum, but it can only be used as an external member of the guard camp. I cannot accept an Ogre becoming a formal member of the guard camp. Yes, Captain! Soldak stood up straight and, performed, the knight salute to Viscount Emmett, watching Carl leave in a hurry with Viscount Emmett. Soldak smiled bitterly in his heart. If he had known that the ogre's teleportation pass could be solved so easily, he would not have been in such a hurry to go to the Wazamala military supplies office and hit a wall. However, he is still very rational at the moment and has no intention of blaming Viscount Emmett for Aphrodite's matter. After all, this matter is fundamentally different. Letting a succubus from the Flaming H. L. enter the Roland continent. The risks that need to be taken are not as simple as those of aliens like ogres. Serdak made up his mind to smuggle Aphrodite back to Roland. But before that, you may need to sign a magical contract with the succubus. Just after Soldak withdrew the holy light spell, a knight standing at the door of the hotel room coughed twice and said, Soldak, according to the instructions of Viscount Emmett, this god leader has been sent to you. Serdak was a little stunned. He quickly looked out the window and sure enough, the body of the god king was carried into the hotel yard by several knights. At this time, the body of the king of Gog was still burning with blazing flames, which was very eye-catching at night. But the flame magic patterns on the upper body had become much dimmer. Demons with such exposed natural magic patterns were very valuable. Of course, the prerequisite is that the demon skin of King Gog must be completely peeled off. Unexpectedly, the three guard battalion commanders were so generous and actually considered this king of Gog as his trophy. Serdak quickly showed a grateful smile and spoke repeatedly to the squadron leader, wearing the magic pattern structure. Thank. Of course. Neither did the squadron leader. He took two steps forward and said to Soldak with a smile. When there is a chance in the future, let's sit down and have a drink together. Chapter 481 Return Under the vision of the Eye of Truth, the constantly burning upper body of King Gog looked like a complete magic pattern of life. The body of King Gog was laid flat in the courtyard of the hotel, and Serdak stood beside it. The heat waves emanating from it can be felt from meters away. Serdak took a bucket of water from the well in the yard and poured it on the burning King Gog, immediately extinguishing the flames on it. There was a trace of green smoke coming out of King Gog's body. Soldak quickly took out his skinning knife, squatted on the ground, and quickly peeled off a piece of reddish-brown leather from King Gog. The Eye of Truth allowed Serdak to see some slowly flowing magic aura on the leather. The magic slowly flowed and gathered in the dark lines of the peeled leather, and two blurry shapes appeared around the leather chest, similar to the patterns of magic runes. One of the magic patterns is like a snake curled up, symbolizing the life bred in the mother's body, and the other magic pattern is like a giant beast squatting up in the sky with its mouth open. Among the burning flames, it is these two magic patterns that make this leather full of hot flames. 
Zerdak folded the leather peeled off from King Gog and put it into the magic sealing box. Then I spent a long time picking through the King of Gog, but couldn't find anything more valuable. Andrew stayed busy beside Suldak until the end. Then he cleaned up the remains of King Gog in the yard, and then slept on a wooden bed built with door panels in the storage room on the first floor of the hotel. The attic window was pushed open. Samira leaned out of the hammock with a blanket and looked out twice. When she saw Suldak finished busy in the yard, she retracted into the sleeping bag of the hammock and closed it. Eyes. She usually likes to hang herself in a tree in the wild. Only in this position can she sleep peacefully. The ogre Gilladam roasted two half-cooked gog. This kind of gog is not afraid of fire at all. Even if it was skewered on bamboo sticks and roasted on the charcoal fire for a long time. The ogre could not roast the two gog. Although it was cooked, the meat of gog still tasted very strong. And the bones of the body were not hard at all. The ogre chewed it a few times. And it made a crunching sound like chewing brittle bones. After eating this string of midnight snacks, the food was the man demon got into the spacious stable, lay down on the warm hay, and fell asleep. The three guard battalion commanders discussed it and did not rush to lead the guard battalion knights to withdraw from Dixon Town. Instead, they planned to stay in Dixon Town for three days and send a team of knights to pursue the H. L. Dog scattered in the hills and mountains, continued to expand the results and search for survivors in the town. When attacking the town of Dixon yesterday, Several night squads reported to the three commanders that another fighting group was found outside the town. Earl Collins guessed that it was probably the remaining armed forces of the town of Dixon. As for what they saw, it is unknown why he did not return to the town after the town of Dixon was occupied by the knights of the guard battalion. After some discussion, the three commanders decided to send half of the knights from the guard battalion into the surrounding hills and mountains to pursue the hell dogs, while the remaining knights from the guard battalion stayed in the town of Dixon to garrison. The morning sun was particularly dazzling. People were coming and going on the street outside the hotel. The sound of footsteps made it impossible for Soldak to continue sleeping, lifting up the blanket covering his body. Serdak got up from the sofa in the hotel lobby and saw groups of guard camp knights passing by the hotel door one after another. Serdak took out the earth from his magic waste bag. The shield's magic pattern structure is put on the body piece by piece. Just after putting on the heavy iron boots, Samira brought a tray from the restaurant. On the tray was a glass of water and a piece of white bread with a thick layer of tartar jam. Serdak had already tasted it yesterday. This tartar jam has a slightly sour taste. Mixed with the yeasty taste of the white bread, it is not as delicious as rumored. It may be that the white bread is not dry or hard enough. Soldak drank the water in the cup, went out and pushed the hotel door wide open. He saw Carl hurried past the hotel with several team captains seeming to be walking back from the direction of the town council hall, preparing to return to the rescue squadron. At the station, as a member of the rescue squadron, Soldak hurried over to see what mission Carl had. Carl conveyed Viscount Emmett's order to Soldak. He planned to let the current knights of the first, second and third squadron of the relief squadron carry out the pursuit mission, while Soldak would stay in the town of Dixon to continue treating the wounded. The knights of the guard camp were resting in the town because they had to carry out follow-up treatment work. It was difficult for Soldak to be idle for a while. He had known this would be the result. After all, rescuing injured knights is more important than chasing down those H. L. dogs. After Carl arranged the tasks of each team leader, he waved to Carl and returned to the field hospital converted from a small town hotel to begin routine treatment for the injured knights. Light therapy accelerates wound healing. Samira sat at the front desk of the hotel lobby, polishing the arrow clusters in the quiver while the ogre Gulitum sat in the backyard of the hotel and brushed his teeth with a giant brush. Andrew seemed a little worried after returning to the hotel and followed Soldak but hesitated to speak. Serdak checked the wound of another injured knight, cast the holy light spell again, and then asked him, Andrew, what's wrong? I saw you were a little distracted early in the morning. Andrew scratched his head with his hand and said to Soldak with an embarrassed look on his face, Captain, there is something I want to tell you. I met an Anai brother this morning. He is a member of their tribe. They did not give up the jungle and enter the city. They still maintained their previous way of life and relied on hunting and gathering in the jungle. But this time, Nanai warrior Andrew expressed his troubles. In the morning, a Nanai compatriot sneaked into the guard camp in Dixon Town, told Andrew about the troubles their small Nanai tribe encountered, and asked to be with him Andrew from the army stepped in to help. After hearing Andrew tell the story in detail, Soldak asked Andrew again. 
So it is the warriors of your tribe who rescued some residents of Dixon Town and brought them back to the tribe? Only a few residents who escaped Dixon Town were rescued. Andrew nodded and then said, Although they now have the strength to fight against Cerberus. Once they encounter giant Cerberus, it is still difficult to defeat them. They want to ask our guard battalion to help them drive away those giant H. Lounds. Soldak thought for a while and felt that this matter should not be difficult to handle. So he said, I understand. You should tell me about this kind of thing earlier. I will talk to Carl and try to get the support squadron to go out this time. Execute the mission. Place the target area in your Nanai tribe. And clean up the H. Lounds around the tribe. You and Samira will also go on the mission with everyone this time. Yes. Captain. Andrew puffed up his chest and cheered up. The half-elf girl looked stunned. She didn't expect to be sent out like this. She quickly put the sharpened feather arrows on the table into the arrow pot again. Do you want to take Gulitem with you? Salmira asked Serdak. Soldak nodded. It's okay. It's quite boring to see him sitting in the yard. It's okay to let him go out for a walk. When Soldak found Carl, there were 20 knights in the rescue squadron ready to go. Serdak told Carl the request of Andrew. A Nanai compatriot. Carl's eyes lit up, and he patted Soldak on the shoulder. Said, I was still worried just now, not knowing which direction to lead the night team. Now that I have a dedicated guide, I don't have to worry about the failure of this mission. In the evening, when it was just getting dark, Carl returned with a full load of knights. Almost every knight has a string of Cerberus heads hanging on his waist. The knights in the rescue squadron are almost the team with the most harvest among these pursuit teams. Seeing the trophies on the knights, other knights in the guard camp can't help but inquire about them. Where on earth did you find so many H? Lounds. The ogre Gulitem also had a bunch of giant H, lound heads hanging on his bone crushing stick. He strode back from outside the town and lowered his head to talk to the half elf archer from time to time. He didn't know what the two were talking about. Soldak was sitting on a chair on the hotel terrace to rest. Carl was walking at the front of the team. He looked up and saw Soldak and waved to him. During the day, several more wounded were brought to the hotel one after another. Serdak was not as busy as last night but he was not idle all day. Moreover, the carrion on some injured knights had not been cleaned. And the wounds continued. It has deteriorated. And there are also signs of corrosion in minor wounds that were not noticed before. Serdak has to deal with the wounds again. At this time, he has only just taken a break. The fact that the support squadron had harvested a large amount of trophies from hunting Cerberus quickly reached Viscount Emmett. Viscount Emmett personally asked Carl about the situation. Carl did not hide it and directly told Viscount Emmett that this was because of the local indigenous people. As a guide, and in the Nanai tribe, the guard camp knight also met more than 20 residents of Dixon Town who were taking refuge there. They are currently living in good condition. Viscount Emmett hoped that Carl could find more Nanai indigenous guides to clear out the H, lounge in the area around the town of Dixon as soon as possible. The resistance force composed of the Nanai tribe and small town residents officially appeared as guides in each squadron of the guard camp. The three guard camp knights relied on local residents and indigenous people to pursue the H, L dogs that escaped into the hills and mountains. And these the pursuit team gradually expanded to some villages around the town. Samira and Andrew harvested a large number of H, L dog heads in the battle. And their military merits were accumulated very quickly. The courtyard of the town council hall was filled with large boxes containing H, L dog heads. These boxes were all to be transported back. Was Amala City in exchange for military merits from the War Command. During this period, Serdak met many brave Nanai warriors. They were optimistic and brave. They led the tribe in the jungle to deal with the vicious dogs of H, L in the face of adversity. Even in the most difficult situation, they never lost their ability. Fighting spirit. By the fourth day, the news that the town of Dixon had been captured had reached was Amala City. Some adventure groups and business groups came to the town one after another. These business groups brought a lot of supplies and also solved the problem for the guard camp of being unable to transport these trophies. However, the arrival of some adventure groups is not so pleasant. These adventure groups are more flexible. They enter Dixon Town not for charity, but to take the opportunity to hunt some H, Lounds. With these new competitions moreover, the harvest of the knights in the guard camp dropped step by step every day when they went out. Seeing that the Cerberus around the town of Dixon had almost been cleared away, the guard battalion had not received a new mission from the war headquarters. So it was preparing to evacuate the town of Dixon and return to Wazimra City. Just the night before the evacuation of Dixon Town, 
A caravan brought news from Wazimra city that the constructed swordsman group had successfully destroyed the Hell Passage. It was said that the scene at that time was also very thrilling. Guards at the Hell Passage the Black Magician in the Mouth uses his own magic as a medium to try to detonate this space channel. Once the channel formed by the space-time rift completely collapses, a space-time storm will be extremely destructive. It is said that once this kind of space-time storm cannot be contained in the early stage, it will easily cause the entire plane space to completely collapse. Many planes are due to over-exploitation and wars between the strong, leading to the final plane collapse. Those planes have now become extremely dangerous places. Facing ruins, even the most experienced adventure groups dare not go to those planes. On the way back to Wazamala City, we met several caravans and adventure groups along the way. So many small adventure groups have emerged from the city of Wazimra, which means that the war in the Maka Plain is gradually coming to an end. The adventure groups are more like the cleaners in the final stage of the war. Only such small groups can earn money in the long term. The way of bounty travels through the mountains and jungles of the Maka Plain. Counting the days, it has been more than two months since the guard camp left Alensa City. In these days, some knights around me have been killed in battle. These depressing news were covered by one victory after another. Now that I calmed down, I found that around me some of the knights left completely. Serdak noticed many abandoned buildings along the way. This time the Cerberus Legion invaded the Maka Plain and had a huge impact on the Bena province. The Bena people had been operating in this plain for nearly a hundred years before they opened up a vast territory. This time the Cerberus Legion besieged the city of Wazamala almost breaking the biggest cornerstone of Duke Newman's establishment in the Maka Plain. The journey back to Wazimra City seemed relatively easy, although we did not encounter any fighting along the way. But the knights all became silent instead. Perhaps because some people were homesick. The team sang a song that is widely circulated in Alinsa City. When the song starts, let's sing together. Sing of the sun, stars, moon, mist, rain and clouds. Sing the sunshine on the new buds, the dew on the feathers, the wind on the open hills, and the flowers on the smoked heather. Sing of the gold and silver berries in the oak forest, the water lilies in the mountain springs, just like the daughter of Prince Angelibald and the elf princess. Chapter 482 Smuggling the Succubus After the hell dogs were defeated by Benna's army, the people trapped in Wazimra city finally walked out of the city gate and stepped onto the messy land outside the city. Large areas of wheat fields outside the city were destroyed in the war and some battlefields were stained with the purple blood of Cerberus. No plants grew on these lands. The land was dark and lightly stained with oil. The piles of graveyards where Cerberus corpses were burning were reduced to ashes. A huge mass of black scorched earth. The war between the Bena army and the Cerberus army gradually came to an end. But the scars left by this war remained on the Maka Plain. There is a group of young city guards standing on the city wall. These guards are all young people from Wazamala City. Maybe their faces are still immature and green. But they are the new force of Wazamala City. Everywhere on the city wall there was a bed crossbow on the platform. And the crossbow arrows on the bed crossbow emitted a cold light in the sun. The knights of the guard camp lined up along the road outside the city to enter the city. Andrew stood under the city. Looking up more than 30 meters. The high city wall seems to be recalling the difficult battle at the top of the city. A group of craftsmen were hanging from the city wall with ropes tied around their waists. They were repairing the model city wall. From time to time, stones fell into the moat that had been dredged. The city of Wazamala has returned to its former prosperity. From time to time, groups of vehicles drive out of the city. It is these carriages that often cause congestion on the suspension bridge at the city gate, which temporarily strands the guard camp waiting to enter the city. The knights were parked on the road outside the city. The carriages were piled with various war supplies, and they seemed to be preparing to be sent to the front line. However, since the caravans were responsible for transporting these supplies. No one was willing to give way to these caravans. So everyone was stuck here. Andrew sat down on the roadside. He took off the water bag from his waist, took a big sip first, and then poured all the water from his head. Wazamala had already ushered in the hot summer. It is now noon. The scorching sun is shining down from above, and the moisture of the earth is steaming in the air. The knights of the guard camp parked on the road are almost scorched by the vicious scorching sun. A group of children who ran out of the city have a gun on their head. Baskets woven from wattle thorns were filled with sand fruits. Selling their fruits to the knights of the guard camp stranded on this road. This fruit tastes sour and sweet. But if you eat too much, you will feel a bit astringent in your mouth. However, it is a rare and delicious fruit for the knights of the guard camp who fight for days. 
A group of knights held helmets and asked the children to pour the sand fruits picked from outside into their hands. They generously stuffed copper plates into their hands. The ogre squatted on the side of the road, looking enviously at the knights around him eating this kind of sand fruit. Serdak called several children over, and after paying the money, he asked them to pour all the sand fruits in their hands into a big basket and handed it to the ogre. The ogre happily took the basket and poured the fruits in the basket into his mouth. After filling a large mouthful, he stopped and chewed carefully. He swallowed a large basket of sand fruits in four or five mouthfuls. And then, he was satisfied. He handed the basket to the older child, who was waiting with his mouth open. He told Serdak that he liked this delicious wild fruit very much. But the ogre could not pick such a small fruit at all. When he encountered this kind of fruit tree in the valley, he would usually break off the branches together and use his big hands to cut off the fruit. Pick up the leaves and fruits together and stuff them into your mouth. The taste will be much different if you eat them with the leaves. Andrew pointed to a large piece of burnt land in front of him and introduced to Soldek. This land used to be an orchard. The farmer here planted some cherry trees and pruned them into the walls of the orchard in order to prevent greedy thieves from destroying the fence and stealing fruits from the garden. A circle of sand fruit trees was planted outside the cherry tree fence. By this time, those trees were covered with fruits. Serdak looked at the scorched and barren land in front of him and replanted fruit trees. He didn't know how long it would take for it to return to its original appearance. Serdak is actually planning to plant some fruit trees around Wall Village. But the land there is barren and there is a dry season of nearly three to four months every spring. This period happens to be when the fruit trees sprout and bloom. And there are almost no trees. It can grow in barren land. If you want to plant fruit trees around the village, you must first solve the irrigation system. The security team of Wazamala City cleared the carriages jammed on the suspension bridge and the team finally started to move slowly again. After passing the suspension bridge, Serdak and his party followed the guard battalion into the city of Wazimra. The streets of the city were lined with various small vendors. These vendors sold almost everything, including food, entertainment, and some second-hand goods. And their main targets are these soldiers who have returned from the outside. All goods are sold at very low prices. These markets are even busier than the largest free market in Bena City. The victory in the war on the Maka Plain in recent days has brought a different kind of prosperity to the city of Wazamala. The various materials continuously transported from the Bena province have maintained this prosperity. News of the victory spread to Bena City. In the past week, a large number of caravans and adventure groups have poured in from Bena City. Now there is almost no place to stay in the city. The square where the guard camp was originally located has now become a free trading market. It is easy to drive away the small vendors in the market. But it is not so easy to get rid of some large business groups who have set up their tents. The Planar War Command was unable to accommodate the knights from the three guard battalions in the city. So they had to let these knights, who had been wandering around the city for a long time go out of the city, and set aside a large piece of land beside the moat outside the city as a temporary residence. Although they were stationed outside the city, they did not restrict the knights' freedom to enter the city. The guard camp stationed its tents by the river, except for the knights on duty at the station. The other guard camp knights were granted two days of leave. Some knights needed to go to the city to deal with some trophies. They were not prepared to take home. Serdak said H, low to Carl. And then took Samira and Andrew into Wazimra city again. In addition to visiting the succubus Aphrodite in the shelter this time. The most important thing is to meet a few slave traders. According to Samira. Only they have channels for smuggling Aphrodite. Brought into Roland Continent. When the three of them arrived at the shelter. The succubus Aphrodite was still lying on the roof basking in the sun. The old woman told Samira and Serdak that Aphrodite crawled almost at dawn every day. I went to the roof to bask in the sun and lay there all day long. I spent this week like this, seeing Serdak and others arriving at the shelter. The succubus Aphrodite also seemed very excited. She slipped down the ladder from the ridge of the roof, stood in front of Serdak and asked him expectantly, Soldak, are you coming here to pick me up this time? Chapter 483 Magic Contract Dozens of taverns, large and small, are dotted on North Edward Street in the slums of Azimra City. Countless imperial people flock to such cities after the victory in the Plain War. These adventure groups and business groups not only brought huge benefits to Vazimra City, the business opportunities have also made the pubs on this street extremely popular. On the street, drunkards carrying bottles of wine sit against the wall. Some vendors selling various snacks and fruits shuttle among the crowd with various products on their heads. Several young and beautiful street women lean on the cast iron poles of street lamps. 
looking at the pedestrians passing by, occasionally giving a wink, while those old and lustful street girls will hide in the dark corners, trying to expose the outstanding places to the light. Samira walked in front. She was wearing salamander leather armor and a hood on her head to cover her face. This kind of dress was not so unusual on this street. Serdak and Andrew were wearing metal armor and carrying weapons on their backs. They looked less irritable, especially Andrew wearing local aboriginal hair accessories. As a group of people walked on the street, everyone who came towards them started to shout. Instead of giving way, the succubus Aphrodite following behind kept looking around. No matter what he saw, his eyes were full of novelty. The succubus is wearing a black cloak. Her hot figure is covered in it, and her face is covered by a black silk scarf. The passers-by around her can't see her face at all. Even so, she actually exudes some unique charm, so that the surrounding pedestrians couldn't help but cast their eyes over. The plaque at the door of this tavern turned out to be a huge tower shield, with a rotten sword and a single-edged axe crossed and tied to it with wires. The wooden door of the tavern was covered with various marks. Samira was not there. Stopping at the door, he opened the door and walked in. The tavern seemed very noisy. The smell of wine, food, perfume, and sweat mixed together to form a disgusting smell. The bartender with a few pieces of cloth on her body was twisting her snake-like body back and forth in the tavern. The drinkers were shouting. And occasionally some drunkards would take advantage of the situation. But if they refused to buy alcohol, they would definitely be slapped. There were also some straight men sitting together. They drank in a more heroic way. Two strong men stood on both sides of the wine table and were wrestling with their arms under the shouts of a group of drinkers. It seemed that this was the only way to show off their arm muscles to others. Strength. Samira walked directly in front of the bartender. Her long legs wrapped in salamander leather armor sat easily on the high chair. She slightly lifted the hood on her head, revealing her delicate face, and her pale red eyes stared at the dull the bartender said coldly. Where is Dejinsi? There is business coming. The bartender glanced at the salamander leather armor on her with some envy, then came back to his senses and said, Inside, but he is in a bad mood today. Samira ignored the bartender's words and walked directly into the tavern along the curb bar. There were several separate private rooms in the tavern. Several burly men stood in the corridor, successfully blocking the private rooms from the tavern lobby. In two worlds, the half-elf archer didn't even raise his eyes to look at these people. He walked straight past several burly men and walked into a room with linen curtains. Serdak, Andrew, and the succubus Aphrodite followed Samira closely. The big men followed Andrew. When the four of them entered the room, they blocked the door. There were several men in the room playing a dart board while drinking, and two blondes were standing against the wall with trays full of wine in their hands. When some people saw Samira walking in, they turned to look at Samira with doubts. However, when they saw Soldak and Andrew walking in behind them, their eyes became more wary. And some even, he looked at Serdak with a hostile look. Andrew stared back unceremoniously at the gunpowder-filled atmosphere in the room. As a native of Wazamala, Andrew was not afraid of these people in the tavern at all. A strong man, with a scar on his face, walked out of the crowd. He stared at Samira coldly, put on an aggressive smile on his face, and asked, Samira, are you looking for me? Samira looked back at Serdak and said, Dejinsi, this is my captain. Knight Serdak, he needs your help with something. The scarred man stood in front of Soldak and said to him, I smell the smell of the black dogs in the city from you. Ferdinand Kinsey, the strong man with a scar. Big Kinsey, stretched out his hand toward Serdak and said, They like to call me Big Kinsey. Knight Serdak, what can I do for you? Serdak stood in the center of the room. Samira had introduced him to him before he came. On the surface, these people were an experienced adventure group. But in fact, they were a group of slave traders. I heard that you have a way to send back some things that are inconvenient to bring back to the Empire. So I came to you for help. After saying this, Serdak stepped aside and let Aphrodite behind him step forward. Come and lift up the black scarf on her head, revealing the beautiful face inside, with a pair of purple eyes revealing the breathtaking beauty. For a moment, everyone in the room became silent. Everyone was attracted by the appearance of the succubus Aphrodite. Serdak couldn't help but cough twice, which made Dejinsi wake up from his daze. He then poured the contents of the wine glass down his throat and ordered the blonde leaning against the wall. Baby, take them to sit next door and don't forget to get a few glasses of sweet wine. The blonde walked up to Aphrodite and Samira on catwalks and led them both to the next room. 
It wasn't until the succubus Aphrodite walked out of everyone's sight that the group of slave traders were freed from their calf. Dejinsi waved to the men around him, and a group of subordinates left the room one after another. Only Dejinsi was left in the room. After seeing she and his two subordinates, he looked at Soldak with gleaming eyes. Mixed blood succubus. You actually got such a treasure. Half succubi with demon blood are rare nowadays. The main reason is that demons are so rare. Her eyes are breathtakingly beautiful. She is really a natural beauty. Do you have any ideas to take action? I guarantee you can sell it for a big price. Many nobles in Bena City like this kind of hybrid demon. Serdak understood the meaning of Dejinsi's words and shook his head without hesitation. This is not negotiable. I just want to bring her back to Bena province. Dejinsi saw that Soldak was resolute and did not waste too much time on this matter. He said cheerfully, If you can find me, you should naturally know my identity. That's right. I do have a way to kill her. Send it to any city in the Green Empire. But I have to take a lot of risks in this matter. And I have to spend some time to clear up relationships. So the cost of passing through the portal may not be as low as you think. This is a hybrid succubus. Although she does not inherit the wings of the succubus clan, her other physical features are almost completely preserved. It turns out that Dejinsi was so sure that Aphrodite was a hybrid succubus because she had no wings. Serdak secretly begged in his heart. Serdak coughed dryly and nodded noncommittally, indicating that he was willing to bear the huge transmission fee. Where are you going to let me transport 50 imperial gold coins to? After speaking, Dejinsi asked casually, Did she sign a contract of equal symbiosis or a contract of servanthood? Halanza City. Does this require a magic contract? Serdak asked in surprise. You shouldn't have signed any form of contract. Right. Dejinsi also looked at Soldak as if he had seen a ghost. Seeing that Soldak didn't speak, he quickly asked tentatively, Am I right? Without waiting for Serdak to give any answer, he waved his hands and said to Serdak, No. 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 This won't work. You should have a magic contract. Although she is just a hybrid succubus. After all, she a large part of her body is the blood of the demons. We must first ensure that there is a way to prevent her from doing some extreme things, such as racial invasion and conveying information about Roland Continent to the demons. You must, it is necessary to put some restrictions on this. This kind of thing is very simple to say. It can be solved with a magic contract scroll, preferably a master servant contract. Of course, an equal and symbiotic contract is also possible. I insist on signing the magic contract. Otherwise, there is nothing to discuss. Although I am a stowaway. I have my principles. Dejinsi stood opposite Soldak, holding an empty wine glass and looking at it with an indifferent expression. He, Serdak rubbed his forehead with his hands and had no choice but to agree. Okay, I think I can convince her. After being sent out of the tavern by Dejinsi's men, Serdak and his four others walked out of the street. On the streets at night, the street girls looked more bold and unrestrained than during the day. A few bold street girls almost clung to Soldak's body teasing Soldak with wild eyes. But Sammy stopped him. Lop pushed away unceremoniously, and a short and cold scolding came from his throat. Get out. The Wazimara city gate is closed after dark. I missed the deadline to leave the city. If I didn't want to take the risk of climbing over the city wall or sleeping on the streets, I had no choice but to find a hotel to stay in. With a large number of caravans and adventure groups pouring into the city, the hotels in the city are almost full. Some caravans can only sleep on the streets. Many squares are still full of tents. In this city, there is currently no room for Sue Erdak's only feeling was that no matter where he went, there were people everywhere. Fortunately, Samala, as the guide of Wazamala City, was quite familiar with all the hotels in the city. The four of them wandered around in the complicated cobweb-like alleys for a long time, and finally found a hotel at the end of the dark alley. At the hotel, the hotel proprietress was sitting behind the bar. She looked up at Samira and saw that she was wearing a set of exquisite salamander leather armor. She couldn't help but taunt it. I thought you would die on the city wall. Look, are you having a good time recently? When she spoke, Serdak saw the two canine teeth exposed, and the pale golden pupils of her eyes were actually vertical. Only then did Serdak realize that the lady in front of him must be a bit of an orc. Bloodline. Samira didn't seem to want to talk to the landlady at all and said coldly, Stop talking nonsense and prepare two rooms. The landlady tapped the table with her sharp fingernails and said with a smile, Look at what the streets are most in need of. How can I still keep a room now? 
saw Mira unceremoniously slap the forest bow on the front desk, making a muffled sound. And the faces of the landlady and the landlady were almost touching. In the end, the landlady, who was still of work descent, snorted and took it back. He looked at me and said in a bad tone, The attic is yours. Don't get my sheets wet. Otherwise the deposit will not be refunded. Sernak looked at Samira speechlessly. The half-elf archer didn't even need the landlady to hold the keys. With her tall figure, she grabbed a bunch of keys hanging on the wall and walked up the stairs quickly without looking back. This hotel is divided into two floors, with the third floor being a more private attic. Just as the landlady said, the hotel is now full of tourists. When passing by the corridor, in addition to some snoring, there are also other weird sounds like cat's claws scratching the floor. After passing through the low corridor, Samira reached the roof of the shed at the end of the corridor, pulled down a wooden ladder hidden in the ceiling, and led the three of them up to the attic. This hotel is quite shabby, but the attic is very spacious and comfortably furnished. It is fully equipped with wardrobes, tables, and chairs. In addition, there are two wooden beds against the walls on the east and west sides, wearing clean wool sheets. Although the rooms are connected, there is a thin wooden board between the two beds. Samira opened a door and said to the three of them, The bathroom is over here. Among the four of them, only the half-elf archer seemed to love cleanliness. Seeing that no one offered to take a bath, he walked into the bathroom first with his long legs. Before long, the sound of running water could be heard. The succubus Aphrodite looked at the room curiously. She walked to the protruding window of the attic and pushed open the two glass windows to let in the night breeze from outside. Aphrodite then untied the black gauze covering her head, reached out and climbed up to the window sill quickly, and leaned on the attic window sill, looking up at the quiet moonlit night outside the window. It seemed that her injury should be healed. That's almost enough. At least it doesn't affect her normal actions. Zerdak took off his armor and sat at the desk by the window wearing a linen shirt. Looking at the furnishings on the table, Andrew sat on the floor. He only took off his chest armor, which was not easy to wear, and piled it in the corner. He did not have a magic belt like Serdek, so he could not use the equipment at any time. And now he took out a whetstone. Come! Carefully polish the axe blade, and wipe it with a grease-soaked rag. The succubus Aphrodite asked Serdek curiously. The discussion didn't go well? She knew the purpose of several people going to the tavern. But after leaving the tavern, Soldek never talked about it. She couldn't help but ask questions along the way. And she couldn't help but ask when they arrived at the hotel. Serdak shook his head, supported his chin with one hand, and said to Aphrodite, Tell me about where you live. Aphrodite's big purple grape eyes looked at Soldak with dazzling eyes. Chapter 484 Six Methods The open skylight of the hotel attic is close to the alley facing the street. The stone road below is not wide. And occasionally there are footsteps from people passing by. Aphrodite sat on the windowsill holding on to the rafters protruding from the attic window, raising her head to look at the moonlight in the night sky, seemingly lost in memories. There is no day or night in the fiery hell. The sky is always red, and the earth is divided by countless rivers of lava and is covered with charred rocks. She said, King of Mazdan rules the land of sin. The H, L realm is constantly collapsing every day. It is full of dangerous black flames and some powerful and unknown terrifying beasts. Every day, Many people from the demon clan die due to those dangerous environments. Die! I don't know what the other six realms of the flame hell are like. At least that's what the place of sin where I am is like. I also very much hope that one day I can leave that barren land. I always dream about one day being able to lie on the grass and bask in the sun. Her side face looked particularly soft. And she spoke standard green empire language. She turned her head with a smile on her face. And said to Serdak, who was sitting at the desk. I finally waited for such an opportunity. And I can't wait. Entering a new dimension. Then he sighed and said, But when I arrived at the Maka Plain, I discovered that many things were not as beautiful as I imagined. No matter where we went, it represented killing, racial invasion and endless war. In fact, these are not not what I want. Those eyes, as magnificent as purple grapes, were full of longing for the future life. She continued to say to Soldak, I want to live a different life but I don't want to disturb anyone, let alone hurt others. I don't like the smell of sulfur floating in the air when I don't want to walk. I have to always pay attention to whether the ground beneath my feet will spurt out. Fire. I don't want to experience those time and space storms and insect swarms. I just want to live the life I want quietly, 
those beautiful lives. When I open my eyes, I can see the blue sky, white clouds, sunshine, and grass. Soldak thought about the situation in Wall Village. It seemed that blue sky, white clouds, and masculinity could be easily satisfied, except for the grassland, which had to go to the tidal flats in the lower reaches of the river valley. Basically everything could be satisfied. He pondered for a moment. After a while, he said to the succubus Aphrodite, If you go to Roland Continent, you will be asked to give up some things, or you will be restricted to do certain things. Are you willing? The succubus Aphrodite suddenly asked, Will I lose my freedom? Uh, I can't do this. Serdak replied, Will the situation be worse than now? No way. Aphrodite asked in confusion, Are you asking me to betray King Amazdan? Serdak rubbed his forehead and said, We have no plans to attack the flame hell for the time being. What else can there be? Aphrodite blinked and asked. Serdak organized his language and said, I need to sign a magic agreement with you to prevent us from hurting each other and our relatives and friends around us. Of course, other people can't do it, and we can't find it through any means or channels, and leak any information about Roland Continent. Aphrodite finally understood. The smile on her face became much lighter, and there was even a trace of disappointment in her eyes. She said, Are you worried that I will hurt them? Well, that's okay. I never thought about it. Hurt anyone. So what do I do? Serdak took out a magic scroll from his magic pocket. This contract scroll was bought at the grocery store in Benna City. He placed the magic scroll on the table and said to Aphrodite bravely, This is a scroll of a contract of equal symbiosis. I'm afraid we have to sign a contract and promise not to harm each other. Aphrodite took the magic scroll in her hand, flipped through it casually, and asked doubtfully, We just signed this. Serdak didn't understand why Aphrodite asked, What's wrong? Aphrodite blinked her big innocent eyes. An intriguing arc appeared at the corner of her mouth and asked Soldak in a low voice, Shouldn't it be a master-servant contract? A slave contract? Or a magic pet contract? Facing Aphrodite's teasing, Serdak was speechless. When signing the contract, Aphrodite seemed very happy. She recited the magic spell of the magic contract scroll familiarly and drew a simple magic circle. When the scroll was broken, it was on the floor of the attic. Two overlapping hexagram arrays appeared. Aphrodite stood in the center of the array and asked Serdak to walk in. Aphrodite crossed her hands on her chest and finished reciting the last short sentence. Mantra. Serdak suddenly found a thin line that seemed to be nothing, connecting him and Aphrodite, like a faint breath. Serdak closed his eyes and could clearly feel the presence of the person standing there. Aphrodite not far away. That is a very subtle telepathy. The moment Serdak opened his eyes, Aphrodite looked towards him at the same time. It was not until this moment that Serdak discovered that Aphrodite was actually a black magician. Although her wings were cut off, her magical ability was not taken away. All she'd lost was the ability to fly. Hypnosis and charm are the instinctive blood talents of the succubus family. And Aphrodite is actually proficient in some black magic. Aphrodite's gray face turned slightly rosy as Serdak glimpsed her truest self. The bathroom door was pushed open by the half-elf archer Samira. She walked out wearing long linen clothes, and happened to see the six-pointed star circle slowly disappearing on the attic floor. The wound at the base of Aphrodite's wings had not healed completely. Serdak wanted to use the holy light to heal her, but he didn't expect that the holy light fell on Aphrodite, like hot water splashing on her body. Her skin sizzled, and a large chunk of her skin was burned away quickly, which scared Soldak to stop quickly. Soldak didn't sleep well that night, and Andrew lay on the floor snoring loudly. On the bed opposite him, which was only separated by a wall. A half-elf and a succubus were lying face to face on the same bed. The two of them didn't seem to be sleepy. It was not until dawn that Serdak fell asleep while tossing and turning. In the afternoon, Serdak and his party returned to the tavern where the shield and sword and axe were hung on the plaque. Dejinsi and his men were still hanging out in the tavern. When they saw a magic scroll pushed over by Serdak, Dejinsi nodded, took a bag of gold coins handed over by Soldak, and said to Serdak, Dak said, Okay, I will arrange this matter. Where should I go to find you after setting a time? Serdak said directly, The current headquarters of the Holanza guard camp is outside Wazimra city. Dejinsi nodded. His eyes fell on Aphrodite's face covered with black veil. And he asked with some envy, Are you going to take her back to the city of Holanza? Serdak said, Yes, I want to take her back to Holanza. Dejinsi approached Serdak and said to him, 
We have our magic airship at the Bena City Airport Terminal, which can provide you with more convenient services at any time. But I want to go with the guard camp. Serdak refused. Without comment, De Jinsi took out a small card with a signature from his arms and stuffed it into Soldak's hand, saying, Take this business card first. Maybe it can be useful. Good luck. Good luck. Soldak declined De Jinsi's invitation to have a drink with everyone and walked out of the noisy tavern without looking back. If it weren't for Samla who led the way, who would have known that the most powerful group of slave traders in Wazamala City had actually gathered here? This group of people specializes in slave trafficking, in addition to some aboriginal slaves from the Maka Plain. They also accept various slave traders, a shady slave trade, such as half-elf and half-orc slaves. Aphrodite still wanted to stay at the shelter temporarily, and Soldak asked Samira to stay with him. Serdak and Andrew followed a group of light cavalry and successfully walked out of Wazimra City and returned to the location of the Holanza guard camp. A group of knights were bathing by the moat. After they washed their armor, they dried it on the grass on the bank. The river bank seemed to be bustling with people. Some knights on the roadside greeted Serdak one after another. Some knights still had some impressions on him. And some knights still had some impressions. Simply a strange face. As the city's guard battalions completed their clearing missions outside the city, more than a dozen guard battalions were stationed in the open space outside the city. White tents formed a large area. Serdak tried to find the Hellanza guard camp. It wasn't until he saw the tall figure of the ogre that Serdak relaxed and walked over. Sure enough, he saw Carl standing in the support squadron station, listening to the reports of some team leaders. Carl felt someone walking over and turned around to see Serdak hurriedly wave to him and shouted loudly, Dak, you came back at the right time. Someone just happened to be looking for you. Question mark. Soldak gave him a questioning look. Carl smiled and said to him, Our old friend. Soldak followed Carl into the tent of the support squadron. This is where Carl usually rests. As the squadron leader of the support squadron, his tent looks much more spacious than other tents. In addition to being covered with felt, there is also a simple desk set up with wooden boxes. A magician wearing magic robes is sitting in the tent. With his back to the door, looking down at the map of Wazamala City on the table, hearing footsteps at the entrance of the tent. The magician turned back and glanced at the door. He found Carl and Soldek walking in, and quickly stood up from his seat, with a friendly smile on his handsome face. Serdak asked in surprise. Lance, how could it be you? Lance magician stepped forward and hugged Soldek, and then said, Dak, I'm glad to see you here. Serdak was not polite, and directly asked Lance the question that all the knights in the guard camp were most concerned about. Is there any news about when he can return to Alinsa? This war is going very smoothly. The return date of your guard battalion may be determined soon. Our mage group will also conduct a series of investigations here. The young magician Lance gave an affirmative answer. Although there was no there is no specific return date. But it is obvious that this matter has been on the agenda of the command. The three of them sat down in the tent. And Lance said to Soldek. Speaking of which, this matter has something to do with you. What's wrong? Serdak asked in confusion. It's not that your team secretly captured the black magician Jesse Hausman. It is estimated that the war here will not come to an end so soon. He is an amazing space magician. If he escapes this time, he can build another H, L passage in the Maka plane at any time. And that is what we are most worried about. The young magician Lance said to the two. Serdak didn't expect that a black magician he captured at random would turn out to be a crucial figure in the opposite Cerberus Legion. This time, the Helanza Guard Battalion shone brightly among many guard battalions and attracted much attention in the Bena army. This was not unrelated to Serdak's meritorious service. This Count Emmett has received invitations from various parties in recent days. Not only other security battalions in Bena province, but also some generals of the Bena garrison also want to make friends with this Count Emmett, the commander of the Helanza Guard camp. In just two months, the war in the Maka Plain was quelled. No matter how weak the opponent was, this was a highlight that could not be concealed in the Green Empire, where plain wars frequently broke out. Marquis Luther would be remembered as a glorious event in his life history. Moreover, the various forces that supported this war in the first place will receive even more generous rewards. There is no way. This is war. If you fail, all your investment may be lost. But once you win, the huge benefits that will follow will definitely be more exaggerated than that of a nouveau riche who gets rich overnight. Lance suddenly seemed to remember something and said to Soldak, By the way, Dak, do you remember Samoa? Soldak was slightly startled and said, Of course. 
How could I forget her? She almost killed me at Fox Manor. Lance Magician said to Soldak. Speaking of which, all the premeditations here have a close relationship with Samoa. And that Jesse Houseman is also one of the six magicians of the Hermitage of Black Magic. First, they once gathered in Helensa City to study the Devil's Gate. Unfortunately, the magicians Jesse House Manma and Gretel Hutt had different ideas during the academic research process and left Midway. To the city of Alinsa. Serdak did not expect that Jesse Houseman was actually the sixth magician. Lance smiled faintly and said to Soldak, This time the Black Magic Monastery in Alinsa City was exposed, and several magicians exposed their identities one after another. This Samoan magician left Alinsa. Taking a part of the core research results found Jesse Houseman hiding in Wazamala City. Speaking of which, Jesse Houseman, the magician, is quite amazing. He actually found the ruins of a city from the Hex era on the outskirts of Wazamala and borrowed some Hex technology and magic concepts to successfully recreate it. A H L passage similar to the summoning gate. Listening to Lance Magician talking about the hidden secrets here, Carl and Soldak couldn't help but look at each other. Serdak paused before asking, have you caught Samoa? Lance shook his head with fear on his face and whispered, Not only did she not be caught, but if Magician Miller hadn't taken action in time, maybe she would have used her own magic pool as a trigger to trigger a space storm, or really detonate the H, L passage, causing a space storm. I'm afraid we can't sit here and chat safely now. Six magicians of the Black Magic Monastery in Alanza City. Margaret. Hutt. Branch President. Cyrus. Hickok. Samoa. Celia Cooper, Jesse Houseman, Marion. Chapter 485 at the dinner. If Lance hadn't said these things, Soldak and Carl might not have known that such a dangerous battle had occurred when they destroyed the H, L passage, and even caused a storm in the plain space. The so-called space storm is the collapse of space rifts. Once such a storm occurs, it can even spread to the entire plane. Many planes lacking resources have been overexploited by humans, and destroyed the cornerstone of the world in a certain plane. This will cause this kind of storm. Space storm. The storm directly caused the entire plane to fall into countless space cracks. Therefore, in a sense, once a space storm breaks out, it will officially declare the end of this plane. Women really don't care about anything when they are crazy. Speaking of this, Lance couldn't help but sigh. Soldak remembered that the first time he saw Samoa was at the Helensa Opera House. At that time, she was still a dancer in the Opera House. Baron Grinfell's private meeting with Samoa happened to be revealed by Sue Erdek discovered that he met Samoa several times. But it seemed that every time, this woman's luck was not very good. Unexpectedly, when he heard her name again, news of her death came. Ha! Huh? Old friends are getting together today. And I actually said so many things. Finally, Lance Magic finally remembered the mission of his visit. He took out an invitation letter from his arms and handed it to Sue. Erdek said solemnly, I came to the guard camp this time specifically to deliver a notice to Dark in view of the outstanding performance of the Knights of Serdak on the battlefield. The Maka Plain War Command hereby notifies. Please attend the dinner hosted by Marquis Luther at the Wazimara City War Command tomorrow night. Serdak was stunned for a moment before taking the gold-plated invitation. Carl sat next to Soldak and asked Lance expectantly. Hey! Lance, has the Marquis invited me? Lance spread his hands and said that he only had this invitation. This is a banquet to honor the most outstanding warriors from each legion in this plain war. It is true that your name is not on it. It is estimated that among the knights of the guard battalions in all the cities in Beta province, there is probably only one spot. Lance told Carl explained, also indirectly explaining how precious this invitation was. Lance stretched out his hand, shook hands with Soldak formally, and congratulated him with a smile. Congratulations, Dak. You did a great job. Carl asked enthusiastically. Will there be many extra rewards for this kind of commendation dinner? He did not feel any frustration at all because he failed to receive the invitation. Lance's eyes conveyed a certain message. But his mouth said, Probably so. In fact, I have never participated in it. After all, recent plane wars rarely achieve complete victory. The three of them chatted until very late. Before Lance left the guard camp, Serdak and Carl will stand at the gate of the station waving goodbye to the Lance Magician in the distance. Another guard battalion team entered the station. It seemed that they had just returned from the battlefield. In addition to the trophies, many knights were also injured. They were dirty. And even their armors were broken. In fact, not all the missions of the guard battalions were successfully completed. 
some guard battalions encountered a violent counterattack by a large number of H.L. dogs under the leadership of the three H.L. dog leaders and in cooperation with the gogs who were good at controlling fire. These H.L. dogs it also has very strong combat power, especially once the knights in the guard camp are unable to deal with the three H. Lound leaders. The battle will be extremely difficult. The knights of this guard battalion dragged their tired bodies into the station. They had trophies hanging on their bodies. They seemed to have won the battle. But there was no joy of victory on their faces. It was probably a tragic victory at a high price. Some knights covered in blood squatted by the moat, washing their faces with river water. Knight Serdak, come here and take a look. Someone needs help. A call came from not far away. Serdak quickly agreed and walked quickly in the direction of the source of the sound. For a knight like him who is good at healing, he is usually the busiest after the war. As the commander-in-chief of the war in the Maka Plain, Marquis Luther has a lot of things to do every day. Although he is a direct army under his command, it is the best here in terms of combat effectiveness and execution ability. Several adjutants around him, he is also very experienced in handling military affairs. But there are still piles of documents that he needs to review personally every day. From the current trend of the battle to the mobilization of various armies, Marquis Luther needs to personally review it. In addition, as the war gradually moves toward victory, the shipment of war materials from Bena province begins to slow down. The victory of every war means that in order to obtain a large amount of trophies, part of these trophies flowed into the merchant groups, and some were turned over to the military headquarters. The rewards for each legion were like the most complicated mathematical formulas. In the past few days, Almost all the quartermasters in the logistics department of the war headquarters had to endure it. Eyes are red. Regarding the subsequent arrangements for evacuating the Maka Plain, Marquis Luther gently rubbed his forehead, picking up the lemon tea on the table. He put it to his mouth and took a sip. Marquis Luther stood up and walked to the window, seeing that there was some noise outside the military headquarters. He couldn't help but frown. He was about to ask the adjutant what was going on outside. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. The door was gently pushed open, and the adjutant appeared at the door and said to Marquis Luther, Your Majesty Marquis, all the outstanding soldiers from each legion have arrived. Do you want to go to the dinner? Marquis Luther nodded, then thought for a moment, and said to the adjutant, Go and invite Marquis Hiram and Marquis Mond, and come with me. After saying that, Marquis Luther hung the sword on the holder at his waist and walked out of the room. The war headquarters is currently requisitioning a trading house building in Wazimra City. The banquet hall was originally the restaurant of this trading house. This restaurant can accommodate 200 people dining at the same time. And the kitchen is fully equipped with cooking utensils. Serdak took out the invitation letter at the command post and was taken here. There are only three rows of tables and chairs in the middle area of the restaurant. Each row of tables has only 10 seats. And there are nameplates on each place. Soldak walked over and saw his name on the third row at a glance. The second to last person at the table walked straight over. At this time, many soldiers had come to the restaurant. Everyone was sitting in their seats honestly. Some were sitting upright on chairs, while others were whispering to each other. One end of the dining table was filled with buffet-style dishes, which were basically all the grilled meat is smeared with rich sauce, and has an attractive color. Serdak walked in, and a waiter placed new dishes on the table. The victory in the Battle of Wazamala City brought a large number of business groups to the city. These business groups brought abundant supplies from the Green Empire. Therefore, Wazamala City has been through the days of shortage of supplies. In recent days, oh my god, there is even a surplus of supplies in the city. If it were not for the magic airships that transport large amounts of supplies to other areas of the plain day and night, I am afraid that there would even be a large backlog of supplies in Wazimra City. Therefore, the dishes on the dinner table were also very rich. As Saldak sat down, a waiter came over and poured a large glass of juice into the cup in front of him. It seems that there is no choice for this one. Serdak complained in his heart. This is the fresh juice squeezed from the taro fruit. Everyone has a limited amount. If you don't like drinking it, you can give it to me. A bearded man dressed as an archer wearing sheepskin soft armor stared at the cup of light green juice. Said to Serdak, No, I like it very much. Serdak looked at the archer's gesture of wanting to reach out and grab it. He quickly picked up the glass and took a sip before saying. The bearded archer gave Soldak a friendly smile and said very humorously. I knew you would like it. The taro fruit has the effect of improving eyesight. So many people here are excellent archers. Serdak didn't speak. 
He looked around and saw that the restaurant was filled with soldiers from various legions. Although there were only 20 people, there were also various types of warriors. It was not difficult to see their occupations as long as you were careful. A soldier from the heavy armored infantry regiment actually sat on a chair wearing heavy trousers, with a tower shield standing behind the chair. When Serdak was in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, tower shields were considered a powerful defensive weapon for the infantry regiment. Dozens of heavy armored infantry soldiers could form a shield wall by erected tower shields in a row. The bearded man next to him should be an archer in the long archers group. But no matter how Soldak looked at it, he didn't look like a marksman. The heavy knight from the heavy cavalry regiment opposite was even more exaggerated. He actually placed a cast iron helmet next to the dinner plate. The black helmet even had a visor on it. In addition, there were some scouts from the light cavalry, scribes from the logistics supply regiment, etc. The invited people were all kinds of people. They chatted in low voices at the banquet and seemed to be unfamiliar with each other. Among these people, Su Erdak looked much more low-key. He did not wear the usual earth shield magic pattern armor, but only wore the uniform of the Hellanza guard camp, which made him look very different in the banquet hall. He mainly thought about attending the banquet. It would be inconvenient to wear the earth shield armor, but sometimes clothes also symbolize status. The long archer next to him looked at him casually, but the bearded man was not bad at all. Soldak sat on the chair and waited for a while, but Marquis Luther never showed up. After a while, three senior generals from the headquarters came outside the restaurant. The leading adjutant glanced at the officers beside him. The officer lowered his voice and whispered, Everyone is here! The adjutant stood up straight and said to the soldiers in the restaurant, The dinner has officially begun. You can eat first. The Marquis has some matters to deal with temporarily and will be here soon. After the adjutant finished speaking, he turned around and left the restaurant. The soldiers attending the dinner couldn't help but look at each other. No one expected that Marquis Luther did not show up when the dinner started. The slightly tense atmosphere relaxed, and the soldiers left their seats with their dinner plates to pick out some delicious food. Serdak followed the crowd to a row of dinner plates filled with delicacies. He forked a lot of delicacies he had never seen before from these plates, and specially selected some precious World of Warcraft ingredients that he had never eaten before, such as the grilled manticore tail. Many warriors seemed very reserved, but Serdak walked up to it generously and cut a long piece from the dinner plate. This is not bad. The eyes of the sand beast. The military department is really generous this time. They actually treat us to dishes cooked with such high-end Warcraft ingredients. These are enough for me to brag about to the regiment for half a year. The man behind him, the bearded archer, happily forked a round piece of sauce meat and strongly recommended it to Soldak. I heard that Marquis Luther paid for it himself. Serdak used tongs to add a piece. Unexpectedly, the piece of sauce meat looked very firm, but was actually cooked to a crisp and could not withstand the force of the tongs. Fortunately, Serdak reacted quickly and managed to catch the dinner plate. Inside, the bearded archer stood behind Soldak with a smile and asked, You rarely eat this? Soldak nodded and put another steak on the plate. The bearded archer laughed and said, Ah, oh, me too. I saw it before at the dining table of our group leader. That day I happened to follow the captain to send the hunted magic antelope to the group leader. I saw the group leader. There are several pieces on the adult's dinner plate. And I just want to know what this piece of meat tastes like. The bearded archer was very talkative and very interested in Serdak. After the two of them chose their food and returned to their seats, the bearded archer casually asked, Which war band are you from? Serdak chewed a piece of red sausage and said, Highlands a guard camp. The bearded archer's eyes were as big as a copper bell, his face full of surprise. And then he said proudly, Knights from the guard camp? Oh, oh, I heard that almost all the city's guard battalions have been mobilized this time. First batch of knights. I am from the 27th Longbow Archer Regiment of Benna. Hey, our regiment is the direct descendant of Marquis Luther. We were stationed in Nicosera in the Field Plain. And a war broke out in the Maka Plain. Then we pulled back from there. Have you never heard of the Field Plain? The bearded archer asked Soldak when he saw the confusion on his face. Of course, Serdak has never heard of the Field Plain. Nor Mikasera. But this does not affect the two people's chat and I heard that Serdak belongs to the local city guard battalion knight. This bearded archer he obviously had some sense of superiority. He held his chest high when he spoke. The sense of superiority in his words seemed to come from the fact that he belonged to Marquis Luther's direct troops. Serdak didn't think this was anything worth showing off, but he still listened very carefully. The bearded archer thought that Serdak was a good person, 
So he whispered to him, Be smart when Marquis Luther comes over later. Maybe Marquis Luther will like you and promote you to join our cavalry regiment. Serdak thought speechlessly, I have no plans to join your cavalry regiment. Chapter 486 After the Dinner The door of the restaurant was pushed open, and Marquis Luther and some senior generals walked in from the outside. The soldiers dining in the restaurant stopped the tableware in their hands in unison, and everyone's eyes fell on several senior generals on the stage. The middle-aged officer at the head was wearing a straight Bennett army uniform. It was Marquis Luther. With his chest dot there are three gold medals symbolizing status and glory hanging in front of it, including the Noble Marquis Medal, the Grand Knight Medal, and the Lord Medal. Each one is heavy and very weighty. The other generals next to him also had a bunch of medals hanging on their chests. But mostly gold and silver medals were mixed together, and they looked so dazzling, as if a senior general couldn't show his noble status without a bunch of medals on his chest. Same. The restaurant instantly fell silent. Soldak has recently heard a lot of rumors about Marquis Luther. It is said that he is one of the noble lords of the main war faction headed by Duke Newman. In addition to having two regiments of constructed swordsmen, he also has heavy cavalry. Regiment. A powerful main battle regiment including the heavy armored infantry regiment and the longbow archer regiment. It seems that this bearded archer should be the archer of the archer regiment under Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther stood on the stage with bright eyes. He looked around. His eyes fell on every soldier. And said to everyone seriously. In the past few decades in the Maka Plain. The Cerberus Legion has conquered the Maka Plain for the first time. This time the plane war broke out quickly, and the attack was fierce. And the Cerberus Legion was directed towards the Empire's central city of Wu in the Maka Plain. In Zamala City. In just half a month. The outskirts of Wazamala City were swept away by H. Lounds. Even the situation in Wazamala City was in danger. However, when the horn of war sounded, each legion was transferred from their respective defense areas to Wazimra City. Everyone cooperated sincerely to resist the Cerberus Legion. Not only did they contain the Cerberus Legion siege crisis, but they also defeated the Cerberus Legion in just over a month, creating a foundation for green. The victory of the Imperial Plain War drew a strong line. Just two days ago, I received a letter from Duke Newman. The Duke highly praised the performance of the legions in this Plain War. We were able to stabilize the situation in the Maka Plain so quickly, so that the main force of the Benno Legion in the Warsaw Plain had no worries. I invite you here to honor the outstanding contributors in each legion. He walked to the table in the first row and looked at the knight who placed the cast iron helmet on the table. The knight quickly stood up from his seat and looked straight ahead. Marquis Luther looked down at the dark black iron helmet, reached out and touched the scratches on the helmet, and then said to the knight, Alec Gardner, an outstanding lancer in the 79th Heavy Cavalry Regiment of the Bennett Army. His most glorious achievement was to lead his 15 heavy cavalrymen to penetrate the Cerberus Legion camp 17 times successfully defeating the Cerberus Legion. Sixteen guard battalions presented the Wazimra City Silver Cavalry Medal. While speaking, an adjutant next to him came up with a tray covered with red velvet. Marquis Luther reached out and took out a silver medal from the tray and put it on the knight's chest. Serdak felt that the air around him had become hotter. The soldiers who had just been discussing food looked at the heavy cavalry with eager eyes. However, Serdak had no feelings about this. For a veteran who left the military camp, this kind of metal had almost no use except to represent past glory. The soldiers in the restaurant stared at the footsteps of Marquis Luther. Everyone turned their attention to the heavily armored warrior leaning on a tower, shield behind the chair next to him. Marquis Luther also looked at him with a smile and said kindly, Captain David Lewis, your heavy armored infantry regiment was stationed at the Pass of Moria this time, preventing the remnants of the Cerberus Legion from penetrating into the Maka Plain and defending the vast land of the Maka Plain. This silver shield medal belongs to you, Jesse, quartermaster of the logistics department. You and your logistics material transportation group deliver materials to various war zones and encounter dozens of sneak attacks by Cerberus every day. The battle losses of the material transportation group in this battle are second only to what the Zamala City Defense Department hereby rewards you with a silver wheat ear medal, gold lake, silver cross, medal of courage, four-leaf clover medal, Every time Marquis Luther walked up to a soldier, he could accurately call out the soldier's name and his outstanding contributions without being reminded by the adjutant next to him. It seemed that he was well prepared for tonight's dinner. His name was written down by Marquis Luther, which was almost a big encouragement to the soldiers present. There were 20 warriors in total attending this dinner. And soon, he came to the bearded archer. The bearded archer seemed a little excited. 
He deliberately stood up early, took a deep breath, and retracted his bulging belly. His waist was straight, and the fat that had been piled on his belly seemed to be squeezed out all at once. When it reaches the chest, the whole person instantly becomes different. Daryl, the archer who shot three demon sons in succession. Each demon son is more dangerous than the three H, L dogs. For us, the first task is to kill them in their infancy. At present, nearly 2,000 rangers from the intelligence agency have gone deep into various parts of the Maka plain to detect the children of demons lurking in the plain. This eagle eye metal belongs to you, said Marquis Luther. The bearded archer turns out to be Daryl. Marquis Luther put the medal on Daryl's chest with his own hands. And Daryl performed a military salute to Marquis Luther with wet eyes. When Marquis Luther appeared in front of Soldek again, Soldek suddenly felt that his face seemed a bit familiar. His bright green eyes had an extremely firm will, which made Serdak quickly hold your breath. Soldak, Knight of the Guard Battalion, stayed in the defensive zone during the Wazamala City defense battle and insisted on treating the injured soldiers in the rear after the defense change. Do you know? Now it is possible for those veterans of the Wazamala City Defense Department to you don't know me. But there is definitely no one who doesn't know you. Unfortunately, you have retired and become a knight of the local guard battalion, which is not under the jurisdiction of the Bena Military Department. In view of your outstanding performance, you will receive the honorary title of a first-class knight of the Green Empire. Marky Luther said humorously. There was a burst of laughter in the restaurant. Soldak thought he would also receive a reward such as a Red Cross medal but he did not expect that Marquis Luther would actually be promoted to the rank of knight. After all the rewards were announced, before leaving, Marquis Luther walked up to Soldak again. Soldak? Yes. Lord Marquis, I heard that you can sense the elements of sacred magic and use the holy light spell. Yes. Lord Marquis, have you ever thought about taking the next step? What I mean is becoming a noble. Since you can sense magic elements, you are qualified to apply for promotion to the nobles based on your conditions. I can be your recommender. Bena province needs you to be so good. Young man. Marky Luther asked Soldak with a smile. There is a clear dividing line between civilians and nobles. And the identities of both parties cannot be changed at will. If a noble wants to become a commoner, he only needs to give up the glory he possesses. But if civilians want to be promoted to a noble, no matter how much military merit they accumulate, it is impossible to achieve it. In the Green Empire, there is currently only one way, which is to participate in the awakening ceremony at the age of 12. Only by becoming a magician can a civilian become a magician noble. Both parties' identity cannot be changed at will. Although Serdak did not awaken the magic pool, he sensed the magic element and became a paladin with both magic and martial arts. Marquis Luther is willing to become Soldak's recommender, which shows that the Marquis appreciates Soldak very much. The process of being promoted to the nobility is a bit troublesome. I have already written a letter of recommendation to the Imperial Council. I estimate that there will be a reply within three months. At that time, someone will investigate you. As long as your identity and resume are correct. It will be soon. You will become a third-class baron. And I hope you can continue to do so and maintain your original intention. In fact, Soldak really wanted to tell Marquis Luther that it would be good for him to be a canonized knight. In Wall Village, the difference between knights and barons was not big. He really couldn't bear the investigation. Seeing the envious looks cast by the soldiers around him, Soldak felt an unspeakable anguish in his heart. It was put on the agenda for the Helensa guard camp to leave Wazimra city. And Serdak waited in the camp for seven days. Guard battalions left the city one after another outside the city. The knights sold their trophies to the merchants. They exchanged some of their military merits for gold coins. And then went on a shopping spree in the city of Wazimala. Many local specialties especially some taro fruits. In Wazimra City, the price of this kind of fruit can be said to be very cheap. As long as these taro fruits are brought back to Bena City, the price will immediately increase by 30%. It was finally time to leave. And the Helensa Guard Battalion received an order from the military headquarters to return to Bena City through the city center portal at night. During the day, all the tents at the Helensa Guard camp had been packed away, and almost every night had prepared a huge luggage. The camp by the moat looked in a mess, with domestic garbage everywhere. The war horses promised by the military to each night were not fulfilled until the end of the war. Soldak gave Andrew a day off and asked him to say goodbye to his family and return to Aranza this time. He would not be able to return to Vatsmra for at least three years. And he slipped into the city to join Samira. And Serdak once again found Dejinsi. 
This slave trader with a scar on his face had already learned of Serdak's return tonight. De Jinsi had Aphrodite in an oak barrel and cleverly installed tartar jam layers at both ends of the oak barrel, making the oak barrel look like a whole barrel of jam. Entering the cargo box of a large caravan. Wazimura City's commercial trade has been extremely prosperous recently. During the day, almost all caravans are passing through the portal, and cargo carriages are lined up in a long row in the central square, extending several kilometers away. Arriving in front of the portal, several city defense guards inspected the carriages. The steward of the caravan put on a nonchalant expression and handed a hollow pipe to one of the city defense guards, asking him to pierce the oak barrels as he pleased. A city defense guard stabbed more than a dozen wooden barrels in succession, and the tartar jam contained in them gurgled out from a round hole as thick as a finger. The caravan man waiting nearby would quickly refill the hole with a cork. Almost every truck was randomly inspected before these carriages were allowed to pass through the portal. After witnessing Aphrodite, who was hiding in the barrel, safely pass through the portal, and deciding to pick up location in Bena City with Degency, Serdak and Samira hurried back to the Hellanza guard camp. When passing through the city gate, Andrew carried his luggage and waited at the city gate where people were constantly passing by. When he saw Soldak and Samira, he quickly followed them with his luggage. The knights of the Helensa guard camp were carrying several packages, large and small, and were getting ready at the station. Only the ogre looked like he had nothing to do. Gulidam didn't carry any luggage on him, and he didn't know who made the deal with the ogre. The ten large iron pots in the guard camp were carried behind the ogre like thick bucklers, but he looked happy. From the looks of it, these big iron pots should be enough for him to have a good meal. Carl saw Soldak returning to the team with Andrew and Samira, and quickly waved to them, indicating that they should quickly enter the team. Carl knew that the half-elf archer Samira had been living in the city, but he did not make any clear statement on this. This was mainly because a half-elf girl lived in the military camp. For the knights in the guard camp, many things were not very good. Convenient. Therefore, Serdak arranged for the half-elf archer to live in the city and Carl turned a blind eye and pretended not to know. The Helensa guard camp is lined up behind the Perth city guard camp. Before nightfall, they passed through the main city gate of Wazimra and walked directly along the central street to the central square. At night in Wazimra city, the portal enters the military control in this state. Groups of guard battalion knights lined up to walk into the door. Serdak looked at the teleportation door like a mirror and followed the knight in front as he stepped in. The warm water-like touch wrapped his body. For a moment, he seemed to be in a weightless void. When the warm water wrapped around his body receded, he was already standing in front of the portal of Bena City. Just listen to the guard at the teleportation door yelling in a hoarse voice. Keep going forward. Don't stop. Don't stop here. Go forward. Beep. The police whistle instantly sounded throughout the square. And all the guards within a hundred meters of the portal quickly moved closer. The ogre Gulitum stood at the portal exit with a confused look on his face. Facing the two bed crossbows on the high tower at the portal and raised his hand stupidly. What is going on with this ogre? Where did he come from? The portal guards fell into a semi-crazy state for a while. Each of their eyes were as wide as copper bells, and they shouted hysterically to the knights in the guard camp. Guaitam is our companion! A guard camp knight quickly explained. At this time, Serdak quickly pushed forward, took out the teleportation license of the ogre Guaitam, and handed it to the teleportation guard for inspection. This sudden unexpected incident has finally calmed down. Chapter 487 Did Jinsi's Troubles In the end, it was Viscount Emmett of the Hellanza Guard Camp who personally confirmed that the Ogre Gulatum was a non-staff member of the Hellanza Guard Camp. He had repeatedly won military exploits in the War of the War of Mara. The Ogre Gulatum of Temulai Hellanza also has a legal teleportation pass issued by the military department. After the portal guard confirmed Gulatum's identity, the tension at the portal was completely eliminated. Soldak took the Ogre Gulitum to express his gratitude to Viscount Emmett. If Viscount Emmett had not come forward in person, he would have had to spend a lot of time trying to get the portal guards to let him go. The Knights of the Helensa Guard Battalion did not stay in the central square for too long. Tonight, in addition to the Helensa Guard Battalion, there are three guard battalions that have also returned to Bena Province from the Maka Plain. Serdak followed the Knights of the Guard Battalion to the side of the square and started to line up. Before leaving the square, each the squadron leaders also need to count the members of their squadron. As the squadron leader of the support squadron, Carl was extremely busy at this time. He was holding a personnel list and counting the knights in the support squadron one by one. Although it had just fallen into the night in Wazimra City, it was past nine in the morning in Bena City. 
the hour hand of the nearly 100-meter-high clock tower on the left side of the square happened to point to the 9 position. The silver plated the clock face shines brightly in the sun. The weather in Benna City is pretty good. With blue sky, white clouds, and clear skies, the moist and warm southeast monsoon penetrates deep into the west coast of the rolling continent from the endless sea. In early spring, the earth was stained with a hint of fresh green. Young seedlings sprouted from the flower beds on the north side of the square. The air was filled with the fresh smell of vegetation. The sun shone on Soldek's face. And the breath of spring was everywhere. Unexpectedly, the war in the Maka Plain has just ended. And spring has quietly arrived in Bina Province. The portal in the square is piled with military supplies waiting to be transported to the Maka Plain. But more than these military supplies are the merchants who are swarming up. They are isolated from the square and see the knights of the guard camp carrying their bags. After walking out of the portal, they scramble to trade with the knights. Victory in war always comes with huge benefits hidden behind it. The price paid by merchants in Bena City to purchase trophies was a bit higher than that in Wazimra City. After all, they did not have to pay high taxes through the portal. The knights began to choose again among the many trophies they carried with them. Take out some unimportant items and sell them to the merchants waiting here. Viscount Emmett and Earl Collins, commander of the Per City Guard Battalion stood under a fragrant tree and watched the knights packing their luggage. The two commanders said a few words very politely. Viscount Emmett invited Earl Collins when he had time to visit the city of Alinsa. The knights from the two guard battalions were divided into two teams, and each left the portal square along the established route. The half-elf girl stood on the side of the road. In front of her was a group of buildings as far as the eye could see. This main street could accommodate ten carriages running parallel to each other, and the street was full of traffic. Black magic-covered carriages and tall scaly horses galloped on the street. As they passed by, the coachman waved his whip, seemingly not caring about the pedestrians on the roadside. Samira pulled the collar of her cloak. From midsummer to early spring, the cold wind suddenly penetrated Samira's collar, making her feel a chill. In contrast, Andrew is much more adaptable. The indigenous warrior is wearing a guard camp-style armor. He stands among the knights and looks around curiously while chatting with the knights around him. After spending more than a month together, this man who came to Wazima, the indigenous warriors in Lost City successfully gained recognition from the knights in the guard camp. At this time, everyone introduced Andrew to the shops on both sides of the street and talked about the most unique things in Bena City. This Count Emmett obtained the location of the temporary settlement of the Helensa guard camp from the head of the logistics department. The guard camp walked along the main street until noon, ate a marching ration in front of a cold drink stall on the street and crossed the bay. After visiting the largest neighborhood in Bena City, we stayed at a ring hotel in the northern district of Bena City. This is a large hotel that can accommodate a thousand people at the same time. The entire hotel is designed in a back shape, and the internal courtyard can accommodate large parking spaces. Magic Caravan Nowadays, most of the large hotels, like Bena City, are requisitioned by the military to receive knights returning from the Maka Plain. The knights of the Helensa Guard Camp will stay in this hotel for about a week waiting for the flight of the magic airship between Bena City and Helensa. Although this hotel is not eye-catching in Bena City, in the eyes of Samira and Andrew, this hotel is well-equipped and the architecture is very gorgeous, especially when walking into the inner courtyard, where a circle of nearly 15 square meters is erected in the inner corridor. Meter-high Roman columns decorated the hotel like a huge castle palace. Samira stood on the third-floor terrace and looked at the human statue in the fountain in the center of the courtyard. She was shocked beyond words. Serdak and Andrew put their luggage into the room. And when they came out, they saw Samuel S. Mira and Andrew leaning against the fence in a daze. They didn't carry much luggage with them. So there was nothing to pack. Serdak was going to pick up Aphrodite at the place agreed with Dejinsi. So Samira simply washed her face and waited outside the room. The hotel arranged sufficient rooms. And Samira, who was a woman, was assigned a separate room. The alien status of the Ogre Gulitum is still very inconvenient. He will be very conspicuous on the street. He might be targeted by the knights of the guard camp or the sheriff. So Serdak is not going to go to the streets with him and let him just stay in the hotel. By the time Serdak packed his luggage and was about to leave the hotel, the reward for taking the blame from the Ogre Gulitum had begun to be fulfilled. Two cooks from the guard camp set up a large iron pot in the inner courtyard of the hotel. The stove had been set up and several large pots of broth were boiling in the pot. When Soldak passed by the inner courtyard, the soup in the iron pot had already boiled. Several huge beef bones came out of the soup pot, 
and the soup was boiling. With oily flowers, the fragrance is overflowing. This pot of broth looks very appetizing. But it is quite high quality and cheap. It is a thick soup made from large beef bones. The two cooks put the beef offal cut into fine pieces into a large bowl. And then sprinkled it on top. I bought some green garlic and vanilla leaves. The residents of Benna City do not like to eat animal offal. So this beef offal is very cheap in the butcher shop. The cooks in the military camp cook this awful soup. This thick soup is served with hard scones. For the knights who eat marching rations all day long. It is also a rare delicacy. Ogres like to eat animal offal very much. Especially this delicious broth that can be swallowed into the stomach with almost no chewing. They are waiting next to the stove early. The ogre will never move before the other knights start eating. This is not because he is very polite. But because he often waits until the end. The soup base will be richer and he can get some. A big stick bone with the meat almost gone. Walking to the main street of Benna City, Serdak rented a magic caravan on the roadside. The magic caravan is the main means of transportation in Benna City. Unless you have enough time, you should consider renting a carriage or taking a public carriage when going out. However, for people who are not familiar with this city, the public carriage route is too complicated. Unless you have a local guide to show you the way, it's hard to figure out where these long carriages are headed. Andrew sat in this half-new magic caravan, watching the coachman raise his whip, and two ancient horses pulling the carriage into the traffic on the street. He carefully stroked the soft leather sofa in the carriage, and even he didn't dare to sit still, for fear that the standard armor he was wearing would scratch a hole in the leather of the carriage. He put the two axes on his knees and hugged them tightly with both hands, a little nervously. After sitting in the magic caravan, Samira lifted the hood on her head to reveal her delicate face. The half-elf girl opened the car window to let in the outside air. Soldak said to the coachman outside, Go to the Golden Perch Tavern at number 17 Bree Street. The coachman took off his hat as a sign of understanding. And the magic caravan turned from the next street without losing speed. On the sidewalks on both sides of the street, street trees flew past the car windows. Samira asked Soldak curiously, Is the city of Alensa as big as this? Serdak shook his head and laughed uncontrollably. This is the capital of Bina province. It is much larger and more prosperous than other cities. Haranza is only a small mountain town. Not as big as Vatsmara. Salmira looked at the pedestrians scattered on the street. Looked around again. And then asked Soldak with some confusion. There are no taro trees planted on the streets. With so many people in the city. How do everyone make a living? Serdak thought in his heart. This is probably the inherent thinking of the Wazimra people. The first thing they pay attention to when entering a strange city is the taro tree. It seems that the taro tree is the minimum livelihood guarantee in this city. He explained to Samira. Civilians can choose to work in workshops and businesses. The pressure of life here is not as great as imagined. As long as you are not lazy, you can always find a job that suits you. If you want to make money, you can buy something. Bread is not difficult. Then there was silence in the carriage, with only the sound of wheels rolling around. How is the integrity of Dijinsi? Soldek broke the silence and asked. The half-elf archer retracted his gaze from the window, turned his head and said, It's not bad. He has a big stall in Wazimra City. He used to be the most ruthless leader of the slave-catching group over there. But later he stopped going outside the city. He caught slaves in the mountains and swamps and turned into the largest slave trader in the city. He also had his own business in Wazimra. The business he was currently involved in was basically half black and half white. He would not give up the city unless necessary. The foundation here. The magic caravan stopped in front of the Golden Perch Tavern. Serdak didn't even need to look for the tavern's house number. From the gleaming base embossed on the plaque, he knew that the coachman had found the right place. Soldak paid the carriage driver a silver coin. And the three of them jumped out of the carriage, opened the door of the tavern and walked in. It happened to be afternoon at this time. And there were not many customers in the tavern. Most of the tables were empty. The wine girl was standing by the wall board seemingly uninterested in selling drinks in the tavern. Soldak walked to the bar, took out the note that Dejinsi gave him, waved it in his hand, and asked the bartender behind the bar, I'm looking for Dejinsi. The bartender took a serious look at Soldak and pointed behind him. The two strong men standing at the door immediately moved out of the way. Sardak led Samira and Andrew through the dark corridor and actually walked into a courtyard. Before Sardak could walk out of the corridor, he heard a burst of yelling coming from the yard. Although he couldn't see the people inside through the shrubbery wall, Serdak immediately recognized that it was Dejinsi's sound. 
What do you losers do? You have lived in the Aoife plane for more than half a year. And you only bring back this garbage from there? Then, there were some voices of defense. And it was obvious that his subordinates were a little dissatisfied. Da Jinsi said angrily. What I want is a female slave of the lizard tribe. Not these subraces who only know how to make shit. Don't leave these dogs and shit here with me. They will all be sent to the slaughterhouse tomorrow morning. What do you think in Benna City? Those noble gentlemen here are willing to buy slaves as long as they are slaves? One of them. A big man. Said angrily. Boss. What's wrong with kobolds? Look. My kobold female slave can breastfeed eight puppies at the same time. Dejinsi almost roared at his men. Throw him into the pool outside and wake him up. Who can tell me why Gadgetsan is so stupid after staying in the Aoife plane for a while? Serdak. Samira and Andrew stood beside the low bush wall with an embarrassed look on their faces. Watching Dejinsi lose his temper at his subordinates. Those subordinates were also very capable of execution. And soon there was a sound of, plop, falling into the water outside the hospital. Ahem. It seems we came at the wrong time. Soldak coughed twice and said H, low to the angry Dejinsi. Only then did Dejinsi see Serdak standing by the low bush wall. He tried to slow down his breathing and calm down. And then said, No. No. Night, Serdak. You came just in time. I estimate that you will arrive in Benna City at noon. Dejinsi ordered a female assistant behind him. The half succubus slave girl is basking in the sun on the roof. Carrie, go call Miss Aphrodite down and say that someone is coming to pick her up. Okay. Boss. The female assistant in tight leather armor turned and left. It didn't take long for the succubus Aphrodite to climb over the ridge. Jump down from the high roof. And look at Serdak. Samira. And Andrew with a happy face. How is it? Did the journey go well? Serdak asked Aphrodite. Aphrodite straightened her somewhat fluffy hair and nodded. Soldak turned to greet Dijinsi and said politely, Happy cooperation. After saying that, he turned around and passed through the low shrub wall without looking back. Walking back along the way he came. If it weren't for Aphrodite, he hoped that he would never have any interaction with this group of slave traders in his life. Dijinsi stood behind Soldak and shouted towards Soldak's back. I will stay in Benna City in the past few days. If you need anything, Please remember to come to me. We are here in all cities in Benna province. We all have business dealings. I will if necessary. Serdak replied. Chapter 488 The Ogre Who Likes Horses. Benna City. Night comes. The street lights on each street are like strings of bright pearl necklaces hanging on the chest of a beautiful woman in black gauze. Countless lights light up the city. And Benna City shows everyone the prosperity of the night. In early spring, the night breeze is slightly cold. Aphrodite stood in front of the railing on the third floor terrace of a restaurant in the center of Benna City, looking at the busy central street below her, holding Samira's arm with excitement. The news of the victory in the Maka Plain injected a bit of vitality into the city. The last time Soldak came to Benna City, the city was not so lively at night. I don't know how many business groups heard the news of victory and poured into Benna City from all over. Aphrodite sighed for no reason. Now I finally understand why King Amazdan always misses Roland Continent. This is really a paradise on earth. She had just drank a little ale. And there was a flush on her dark gray face. And her eyes were like autumn lake water. Hello. Serdak reluctantly wanted to remind Aphrodite that if she always talked about the flame hell and the demon king of sin, a Mazdan, something would happen sooner or later. Okay. I understand. Try not to say such things in the future. Aphrodite pursed her sexy lips and smiled. Although she was separated by a layer of black gauze. Soldak found that the smile on her face was even more attractive under the half-coverage. Serdak regretted a little. He was really a little too bold this time, and actually brought a succubus back to Alinsa. He didn't know what kind of trouble she would cause. He really wanted to bring a succubus to her. A mask that completely covers the face. Aphrodite's clear pupils reflected Serdak's troubled expression. For a succubus, she is not only capable of charm and hypnosis. She can also read Serdak's thoughts from his expression. Aphrodite glanced at the scenery outside the street indifferently and sighed. The night view here is so beautiful. The sexy lips under the black veil inadvertently raised slightly. He is really an upright knight. Several magicians walked through the corridor of the restaurant on the third floor and walked upstairs under the leadership of two waiters. Aphrodite quickly put away the smile on her face and stood next to the railing, turning her body away very naturally. She only gave a vague back view of those magicians. She was still deeply wary of human magicians. 
The two black magicians who had gained the trust of King Amazin left a deep impression on her. It's getting late. We should go back. Serdek said as he looked at the clock tower hidden in the night in the distance. There is a flame burning on the hands of each dial of the tall clock tower, allowing people to see the approximate time clearly even at night. Soldak was about to go down the stairs next to the terrace on the third floor of the restaurant when he suddenly saw an acquaintance standing at the door of the restaurant. Jean she stood at the door of the restaurant. He was wearing a white light leather armor and his leather shoes were polished. He tried his best to put a smile on his face to make himself look more humble. He stood on the steps of the restaurant and kept looking into the hall. A group of young nobles walked out of the hall. De Jinsi's eyes fell on the young man in the middle. The young man was surrounded by other young nobles. His face had a sophistication that was very inconsistent with his age. De Jinsi took out his handkerchief, wiped the sweat on his forehead. The early spring in Benna City was not as hot as was Amala City, but his forehead was still covered with sweat. Merlin, Viscount Newman, and a group of friends walked through the lobby and walked out of the restaurant. The waiter standing at the door of the restaurant opened the door early. The magic caravan waiting outside stopped at the door of the restaurant first. The coachman jumped down from his seat and grabbed open the carriage door in front of the waiter. Merlin was whispering softly to a friend next to him. He was standing next to the carriage and was not in a hurry to get on the carriage. As a direct member of the Newman family in Bena province, Merlin is the 17th heir. He has no magical talent and is unwilling to follow the path of a knight and rely on military exploits to exchange for a title. Unless the Newman family suffered an unprecedented disaster, the position of Duke Benet would not be his in any case. But in that case, the chance of him surviving is also quite slim. So he had already corrected himself very early, taking advantage of his position in the family, and started working for the family early after graduation. His intelligence and humility made him well received in the aristocratic circle in Benna City, and he was optimistic and positive. His work mentality also makes other heirs in the family jealous of him. Of course, the main reason is that the ranking is too low, and there is no threat to others at all. Other young nobles were at the door of the restaurant, waiting to buy to Merlin Newman one after another. They would not go home so early, and they stayed in twos and threes looking for more exciting shows at night. Merlin, are you going to Waldazer City tomorrow? The friend stood at the door of the magic caravan and asked Merlin. The young Viscount nodded and said to his friend, Well, I'm going to see Earl Angus Newman. He is a branch of the family. His great-grandfather is my great-great-great-grandfather. He is the 30th Earl of Bena Province. Seven Dukes. It seems that the relationship is a bit far away. What is it worth going to in person? The friend asked curiously. Merlin smiled faintly, knowing what his friend was thinking, and said, There is nothing too important. That is, the trade relations between some families need to be reestablished. And a series of concessions will be made here. If you want it's not easy to interfere in the Newman family's trade from Benna City. There are so many lords in the city, big and small, who are eyeing the cake and almost trying to steal it. It's better to think about it from Angus. Method. The friend's eyes lit up and he asked in a low voice. What is the reason that your family is willing to share a piece of cake with Earl Angus Newman? The city of Watts is a remote place in Benna province. Merlin did not hide anything from his friend and revealed some inside information. Of course Earl Angus Newman is not worthy of our investment. But his favorite daughter Shirley, my distant aunt, is a magician. The friend said with some incomprehension. I guess the magicians who serve the Newman family can almost form a magician group. Right? Merlin shook his head, looked at his friend meaningfully and said, Aunt Shirley is different. She is currently studying at the Imperial Academy of Magic. Although top students from the Royal Academy of Magic are rare, they are not uncommon in Bina province. Doesn't the Magic Guild have two places every year? The friend was even more confused. Merlin pressed his friend's shoulder and asked him to listen to what he had to say. Of course it's not just that. She met another young genius magician at the Royal Academy of Magic. And their relationship developed very quickly. They actually got engaged a few months ago. It is reported that the young magician noble is the second heir of the Minsa family. If nothing else happens. My Aunt Shirley will be a Marquise when she gets married. If once if something unexpected happens, she might become the mistress of Pales Tina province in the next few decades. This must be such good luck. The friend's eyes widened and he whispered. Merlin smiled proudly. Otherwise, Benna City has been so busy recently. How could I have been asked to make a special trip to Waldazer? The two of them stood at the door of the restaurant chatting and were not in a hurry to leave by car. Dajinsi, who had been waiting aside for a long time, lost his patience. 
when he saw that the restaurant waiter did not notice him. He walked up to Merlin in a few steps. He bent down and said to Viscount Merlin Newman, Lord Viscount, I am Ferdinand Kinsey, a businessman from Wazamala City in the Maka Plain. You? Merlin recognized De Jinsey at a glance. He was deeply impressed by this slave trader, but this time and place were not the right time to meet someone like him. Although Merlin ran some gray businesses, he was always cautious. After all, the Newman family cannot be tainted by this kind of thing. Merlin looked at De Jinsey in shock and anger and yelled at him. How did you businessmen find themselves here? There is a special affairs officer responsible for matters in the Maka Plain, and it is useless for you to find me. De Jinsey had been looking for an opportunity to meet Viscount Merlin. When he saw Viscount Merlin, he found the indifference in his eyes. De Jinsey was a little excited. After all, there were more than a thousand mouths in the warehouse, and they chewed a lot of food every day. It's all him who's digging into his pocket. De Jinsey thought that maybe Viscount Merlin Newman had forgotten about the small business and needed to remind him. So he quickly said, No, you booked 50 people from me before. Before Jinsey could finish speaking, Merlin rushed to interrupt Jinsey and ordered a night attendant beside him. Night, Leon. Go and have a good chat. I'm still in a hurry. Yes, Lord Viscount. The night's retinue said respectfully, and then used his own body to separate Merlin and De Jinsey. Viscount Merlin Newman hurriedly boarded the magic caravan and greeted the coachman. The magic caravan drove away from the door of the restaurant. Night Lion asked Jinsey with a cold face, Ferdinand Jinsey, you can tell me if you have anything, and I will tell it to the Viscount for you. Looking at the restaurant waiters hurriedly surrounding him, De Jinsey knew that if he didn't leave, he would probably be rudely driven away by the restaurant waiters. So he quickly said, there is nothing important. I just have a whim. He turned around and left the restaurant dejectedly. Soldak was standing on the third floor of the restaurant and happened to see De Jinsey in such a mess. De Jinsey seems to have encountered some trouble. Soldak said to Samira beside him. Samira curled her lips and said with great disdain, What trouble can a slave trader cause? I seem to have encountered a group of cobalt slaves who couldn't be sold. Aphrodite poked her head and looked at De Jinsey, who quickly walked across the long street and disappeared into a small alley. She spoke to Serta in standard imperial language. Kay said. Samira pressed the arrow pot on her waist behind her back and said casually, with the victory in the plain war, there will probably be bigger business waiting for him in Wazamala. So the business here is ready to be dealt with as soon as possible. The four of them walked out of the restaurant as they spoke. Serdak had some ideas of his own. He originally selected the night to be at a volcano at the southern end of the Paglos Mountains, mainly because there was a sulfur mine hidden halfway up the Pustule Volcano, and there was a rocky area at the foot of the mountain. The sulfur mine is mined by the villagers of Wall Village. The reserves of the sulfur mine itself are very limited and will be mined out in about two months. This will have no impact on the villagers of Wall Village. But if the villagers of Wall Village are allowed to develop sulfur mines, the poisonous gas and hot volcanic magma emanating from the sulfur mines will pose huge dangers. Just like a sharp sword hanging over the villagers' heads that may fall at any time. I heard that dog-head humans are the lowest in existence among the subhuman species. Their status in people's eyes is even lower than that of fishmen. So if they are bought back and used as miners, it doesn't seem to matter. The only problem is how to transport the purchased cobalt slaves back to Wall Village in Helensa City. But De Jinsey seems to have said that he has a magic airship of his own. Soldak did not choose the hotel where the Helensa Guard Camp is located as the residence of the Succubus Aphrodite. He found a small hotel for the Succubus Aphrodite right next to this hotel. Because the two had an equal magic contract and could feel each other's existence at the spiritual level. Serdak did not leave Samira here in the inn. After leaving the inn, they saw the succubus Aphrodite opening the window of the room, leaning out half of her body and waving to the three of them. Her voice was not loud, but Serdak could clearly hear her. Come early tomorrow. I want to stroll around Benna City. When they returned to the hotel, the ogre was already lying in the stable sleeping soundly. Half of the horses in the stable were crowded on the other side of the stable. Their legs were trembling with fear from the ogre snoring. He placed his hand on the manger and was completely unaware of it. Seeing the ogre sleeping in the stable, Soldak went directly to the hotel's groom and asked the hotel how to arrange the ogre into the stable. After all, the ogre was considered a non-staff member of the guard camp. During the day, Soldak remembered that Carl wanted to build a pergola next to the pool in the yard. When the groom in the hotel heard Serdak asking him this question, he also looked sad and said to Serdak very aggrievedly, It was the ogre warrior 
who walked into the stable by himself. He said that he liked to smell the smell. The smell of horse meat in the stable. Seeing that Soldak was speechless, and the angry look on his face turned into embarrassment. The groom took the opportunity to say, Master Knight, you see these horses under my care are too scared to eat. Can you please advise? Comrade, let him come out to sleep. It's so late today, and it's not good to bother everyone. I think we'll discuss this matter tomorrow. I'll ask Gilatum's opinion tomorrow morning. He's an ogre who talks very well. Don't be afraid of him. He usually doesn't eat people much. And he is willing to be reasonable. Soldak said to the trembling groom. Seeing that the groom was about to pee in fear, he quickly turned around and ran upstairs. Chapter 489 Shopping In front of the gate of Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy, Serdak looked at the relief on the stone wall at the gate. This relief was not there last time he came. It was a group of Bena swordsmen fighting bravely to kill a group of evil ghosts on the battlefield. A dozen masons tied ropes from the top of the wall and hung them in midair. They were using their chisels and hammers to stick to the stone wall to add to this war relief. With some modifications and patterns. It looks like it will be finished soon. So this is the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy. Andrew said to himself as he looked into the academy along the iron railings of the courtyard wall. This Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy has a history of at least 200 years. Or even longer. Countless powerful Bena Swordsmen emerged in that era. Which is why this Advanced Swordsman Academy has become the center of countless young swordsmen. The most desired holy place in my heart. The vacation has just ended. And a group of young swordsmen students returned to the academy one after another. They carried their luggage and rushed back to the academy in the dust. Each of them carried a long or short. Large or small sword on their backs. Everyone in the academy, the lawn has sprouted a new green. And further inside, you can see the swordsmen's practice ground. Some swordsmen holding wooden swords are competing on the practice ground. Which makes the whole academy glow with new vitality. Soldak stood at the gate of the academy. He asked the guards at the gate about Hathaway and Beatrice. The guards did not know these two female swordsmen. But this did not mean that they could not inquire. Just casually asking some of the swordsmen students passing by the entrance of the academy. The guards at the entrance of the academy quickly found out about Hathaway and Beatrice. The two were graduates of the academy last year. They had successfully completed the academy's graduation assessment before winter last year. Both Hathaway and Beatrice had graduated from the academy. Only then did Soldak think that last year's trip to the Warsaw Plain was a graduation experience trip for the graduates of the Swordsman Academy. However, this group of graduates were not very lucky. In the Handenar County of the Warsaw Plain his performance was not very good. And he finally returned to the Swordsman Academy in despair. And took the graduation exam again. And then received the final graduation certificate from the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy. At this time, Soldak remembered that he had not received his graduation certificate from the Knight Academy yet. But this did not seem to affect his promotion to a first-class knight. Serdak and his party of four walked around the Swordsman Academy, but failed to find a chance to walk around the Academy. So they left with regrets on their faces. Walking on the streets of Bena City, Aphrodite, covered in black veil, is more eye-catching than Samira, who hides her face in a gray cloth hood, even though her graceful figure is completely hidden under the black blouse, and more sexy than the half-elf wearing salamander leather armor. No one took the initiative to strike up a conversation. Both Andrew and Serdak were wearing metal armor. And the full coverage armor on Andrew was standard armor. During a war, no one wants to have unnecessary conflicts with soldiers in the army in the city. Because at this time, many soldiers often have some war privileges. On a commercial street in Bena City, Serdak and the other four walked around the street with a flow of people before walking into a trading house called Char. In addition to selling some magic weapons and armors. This trading house also has the words acquisition of high-quality magic weapons on the plaque outside. Moreover, the trading hall on the first floor of the trading house is also very lively. Many knights are crowded in the hall to choose. Buy some magic weapons. Serdak wore magic pattern armor and was extremely eye-catching among the crowd. Seeing Serdak walking into the trading house, a clerk from the trading firm immediately came forward and asked Serdak, What do the guests need? Our Shire Trading Company mainly deals in magic weapons and armor. And most of them are in the lobby on the first floor. Excellent quality weapons and armor. And there are also some exquisite high quality weapons and armor upstairs. Serdak glanced at the clever trading clerk. And he hesitated before saying, I want to sell two magic weapons. The merchant's clerk led Soldak into the merchant's office and said to the group, Wait a moment. Then he turned and walked back to the noisy crowd in the hall. In fact, 
He didn't wait long before he saw a business manager, who was obviously more gorgeously dressed walking out of the crowd and asked Serdek. Do you want to sell magic weapons? Serdek nodded. Please follow me. Before we purchase your magic weapons, we need to appraise your magic weapons. They must be sophisticated magic weapons. Only then will the trading house be willing to purchase them at a price that is 20% lower than the market price. The commercial bank manager said, while leading the four people to the second floor. Several people came to a deserted looking room on the second floor. The room was separated by an iron fence. Three not-so-large windows were opened on the iron fence. Inside the windows was a long counter. Behind the counter sat three magicians in magic robes. Several green empire people were waiting. Outside the window, the business manager brought Soldak and his party in and asked them to sit in the rest area at the door of the room and wait for a while. At this time, I heard a magician inside the iron fence hand a broad-edged sword with a simple pattern on the outside and many rubies and sapphires and laid on the scabbard out of the window and said expressionlessly, Sorry, you although this broadsword is inlaid with some precious gems, it is not a magic weapon. So the business cannot give any price and it does not accept such jewelry-oriented swords. The young nobleman waiting outside the iron fence was obviously unwilling to accept the magician's appraisal result. He carefully held the sword in his arms and said to the magician, Isn't this a magic weapon? It can also emit light at night. Colorful magic streamer. And it's really sharp. The magician inside the iron fence smiled softly and said to the young noble, Maybe it's the gems inlaid on the scabbard of this sword that gave you the illusion. The young noble wanted to argue, but the magician smiled at him, nodded, and said, Okay, next one. Seeing what the magician said, the young noble could only hold his sword and leave angrily. Maybe you can try the jewelry store across the street. We only purchase magic weapons above the exquisite level. The store manager walked up and said to the disappointed young noble. The young noble didn't want to talk to the business manager and walked out of the room. An old woman with a faint smell of leather walked from the waiting area to the iron fence and took out a horn-shaped dagger from the cloth bag. The dagger looked very old and the copper handle was polished as smooth as a mirror. Serdak saw a magic crystal fragment as big as a small fingernail from the dagger's forehead protector. The magician inside the iron fence took the dagger, glanced at it casually, touched the edge of the dagger with his hand, shook his head slightly, and said to the old woman, This dagger of yours is too badly worn. The edge has been polished by the whetstone until there is not much left. However, the magic pattern array on the dagger is still well preserved. This dagger is called Seagull and belongs to a group of daggers. A skinning knife of excellent quality. The dagger is equipped with the water magic cleaning technique, which can always keep the dagger clean and tidy. This kind of dagger is the most common on the market. Many enchanters will probably choose to make it when they are in entry training. Seagull dagger to improve your proficiency in enchanting weapons. So even a brand new seagull dagger probably isn't worth much. The trading company does not purchase magic weapons below the exquisite level. Sorry. The old woman looked a little embarrassed and sighed, wrapping the dagger again. Okay. After saying that, he left the appraisal office of the trading company without saying a word. With his thin back, his steps were a bit unsteady. Finally, it was Serdek's turn. He walked over and sat on the chair, then took out the two rusty short-handled muskets from his magic waste bag, placed them in front of the counter, and pushed them in. The magician inside the fence picked up a handful and placed it on the flannel in front of him. After looking at it for a few times, he took out a magnifying glass with a crystal lens from the box on the side and used a steel needle to scrape off the patina on the pattern. A small piece. And then he stopped. He stretched his neck, glanced at the other magician beside him, and pushed the short-handled musket over. Look at this for me, the magician said. The magician companion took the short-handled musket and also fumbled with the pattern on the gun. He looked more professional and rubbed off more patina with a brush and then found the rusted safety from the side. The wrench, after a few gentle movements, actually opened the safety, and pulled off the firing pin at the end of the musket, revealing the firing device pushed by the firing pin. The magician had a slightly long mouth, as if he had seen someone holding the gun in a nightclub. The eyes of the stripper dancing on the pole were almost attached to the firing device of the sawn-off musket. Nyan, what do you think? The magician from before asked. The magician who removed the firing pin from behind nodded eagerly and said, It should be a technological product of that era. Magic and technology are perfectly combined. The excitation device should be reparable. The previous magician exhaled slightly, then took the disassembled short-handled musket, reinstalled the firing pin at the back, 
and then placed it in front of Soldek. He paused briefly, and then Kai said, These two antiques look like works from the Hex era. It is really rare that they can be preserved in such good condition. I don't know if you want the firm to appraise and make a valuation on your behalf, or if you want to sell these two magic pattern weapons. Then fired a pistol? For sale, Serdak said without hesitation. Just because this has been a city, it may be possible to sell this kind of antique musket that is almost rusty. He didn't want to take these two short-handled muskets back to Alensa. The magic trading company there would not take the risk of acquiring such things. The magician inside the iron fence said, Oh, in this case, we can refer to the several auctions in Bena City last summer, which auctioned several flintlock short-handled muskets brought back from the dwarf country. Although those muskets are of a certain age, they are not as these two muskets are so old. The bidding price at that time was about 70 gold coins. There is indeed no reference price for this type of muskets on the market. When it comes to the magic weapons of the Hex era, especially the short-handled muskets, there are still some valuable. Of course, if you are not in a hurry, you can go to the auction house to bid. If you are lucky, you will gain more than in our trading house. Even if the auction fails, you will not lose anything. The magician then added one sentence. Soldak was not planning to stay in Bena City for a while. He said directly, If the price reaches my psychological price, I want to sell it to a commercial bank. The magician's eyes lit up. And then he said, Okay, wait a moment. According to the procedures, we need to conduct a second appraisal and negotiation. The three magicians behind the iron fence got together, took the two muskets to the table further inside, and discussed in a low voice there for a while, without letting Serdak wait too long. The three magicians came to the conclusion of their discussion. The magician who first appraised Serdak said to Serdak, The purchase price of each musket is 100 gold coins. If you are willing to sell both of them to us, the two together can get 215 gold coins. We hope to buy both. I didn't expect that two muskets, which were rusted into scrap copper, could be so valuable. Serdak did not worry too much about the potential value of these two antique muskets, and readily agreed to the purchase price offered by the magician. He successfully obtained a purse full of gold coins, and then the four of them left the trading house. He touched the magic belt bag tied around his waist. It was filled with some books about the Hex era. These were all brought out from the library of the underground city ruins. Now he only bought two muskets, making Serdak feel like a nouveau riche. He couldn't help but wonder, how much would a magic pocket full of books be worth? Located in a rented warehouse next to the slave market in the southern district of Bena City, several slave traders were holding whips in their hands and were beating two kobolds who were fighting. The bodies of these two male kobolds were stronger than ordinary dog heads. Long manies grew out of their necks. One meter long. Standing around four or five years old. They look like rickety old men. And the most obvious feature of their wrinkled faces is their long mouths topped with dog noses. Their tops are very flat. And they have two only long ears. The two kobolds tore at each other. Biting each other's shoulders and necks at the same time. Entangled tightly. And refused to stop. The slave trader first beat the two kobolds with a whip. Although the whip left blood marks on the two kobolds. The two kobolds seemed not to feel the pain. The slave traders poured several buckets of cold water on them. But to no avail. In the end. They could only use a few long iron hooks to poke into the flesh and blood of the kobold's body. Several slave traders used the iron hooks to forcefully separate the two kobolds. Chapter 490 Business in Dejinxi Although the two kobolds were pulled apart by the slave traders with iron hooks, the two kobolds were already dying when they were separated. The main artery in the neck of one of the kobolds was bitten off, and the blood stained the thickness of the kobold's body red. The hair of the other kobold was not much better. A piece of flesh as big as a fist was bitten off from the neck, directly exposing the dense white bones under the tendons. In this slave camp converted from a warehouse. This kind of endless struggle has been repeated over the past few days. Under the recent brutality and oppression of slave traders, the cobalt slaves have developed strong uneasiness and fear. They need a spiritual leader to give everyone some spiritual comfort. Of course, those participating in this kind of battle are the strongest male cobalts among this group of cobalt slaves in order to become the new leader of this group. They privately participate in duels called blood sacrifices. In recent days, bulk grain transactions have been strictly restricted in Bena City due to the large amount of materials that need to be transported to Wazimra City and Iverson City. Slave traders usually easily purchase wheat bran and black beans and sent them to the front line to feed the war horses. 
the cheaper potatoes on the market were not so abundant. They fed these cobalt slaves wheat bran and multigrain potato cakes every day. Nowadays, almost all of them are sweet potatoes. If you eat too much of these sweet potatoes, which contain trace amounts of toxins, your mouth and tongue will be numb for a long time. Yesterday, there was news that due to the inability to buy enough food and no suitable place to house them, the slave master sent nearly a thousand cobalt slaves to the slaughterhouse. This turned the group of cobalts in the warehouse into getting more and more uneasy. Dejinsi took the towel handed by the assistant, covered his mouth and nose, and walked into the dirty warehouse. The cages in the warehouse were crowded with cobalts. These cobalts didn't even have a place to lie down in the cages. They were almost curled up. The cobalts on the edge of the cage are leaning against the pillars of the wooden cage. They have to stay vigilant at all times. If they don't like it, the slave traders outside the cage will raise their hands. Whip. When the slave trader saw Dejinsi walking in, he quickly dragged the two dying cobalts away. The warehouse was filled with a stench and smell of urine, which made people breathless. Although slave traders cleaned out the feces from the warehouses every day, the smell became stronger as the weather warmed. This is a specially modified warehouse, specially used to temporarily house slaves. There are no windows around the walls of the warehouse. There are only a few ventilation windows on the roof, and beams of sunlight shine down from above. It is such a simple room. The warehouse has become very popular in Benes City. The lease is about to expire. The owner is a nobleman in Benes City and is clamoring for a rent increase. Nowadays, the warehouses in Benes City are basically filled with war supplies. And many supplies are piled directly near the airport terminal outside Benes City. It is basically impossible to rent a vacant warehouse in the city during this period. Possible. At the end of this month, a group of slaves transported from the field plane arrived in Benes City. They will stay here for a week or two before being transferred to various places in batches. Before those slaves arrive in Benes City, Dejinxi needs to prepare a temporary settlement. All these cheap cobalts were supposed to be disposed of last month. But several orders in succession were cancelled due to the sudden plane war. Tang. Dejinxi is worried about this matter. These cobalts have been locked up in this warehouse for nearly two months. Even the slaughterhouse thinks they are too thin and is unwilling to take over the slaughtering and shaving meat at the lowest price. Dejinsi was extremely upset. During his trip to the Ifa plane two months ago, one of his partners and a mercenary group captured a mine in southern Beleriand. A large number of the mercenary group's mines tin ore. And the partner chose the cobalts that seemed relatively strong at the time and brought back more than a thousand cobalts from the Ifa plane. At the end of last month, when the unlucky partner was secretly dating a lover in the city, he was accidentally caught by the lover's husband, Viscount Bilbo. It happened that the city of Binna was full of supporting Makabits. In front of the army, the partner jumped from the hotel to the street and was surrounded by soldiers of a heavy armored infantry regiment. This Count Bilbo chased him from behind and actually knew the leader of the heavy armored infantry regiment, discovered that Dejinsi's partner was not a noble, and he almost didn't even have a chance to speak. So he was stabbed into a sieve by ten halberdiers. You're so hacking brainless, Dejinsi cursed in a low voice. In the past two months, this group of cobalts with bottomless pits have almost eaten up all the profits from their business. And the remaining partners in Benes City told Dejinsi that these cobalts will not be dealt with again. If it falls, they will have to pay for it out of their own pockets. None of the nobles in Benes City would be willing to buy a dirty cobalt to guard their home. These cobalts are no different from blind men under the sun. Apart from digging caves, they have almost no skills. Several lords who own mines in Benes City have all participated in the plane war and they are no longer in Benes City. As for these cobalts, they have been unable to take action. Dejinsi gritted his teeth and said to a slave trader beside him, Since the slaughterhouse is unwilling to accept them, you go to find a secluded place near the cemetery mountain outside the city. Take people to dig a big pit and pull all these guys in. The vomit is buried outside the city. We must empty this warehouse as soon as possible and find someone to clean it up to prepare for receiving the lizard slaves transported from the south. The slave trader was dumbfounded when he saw a large group of cobalts in a dark warehouse and hurriedly said, Boss, do you want to think of other ways? Or can we sell to distributors in other areas? He didn't want to dig a hole in Cemetery Mountain in the middle of the night. He wanted to sell all these cobalts. How big of a hole would he dig? Forget it in normal times. Now those guys will only watch our good show. The Jinsi said irritably while touching his chin. Now no one here in Benes City is willing to take over this mess. So Dejinsi hurriedly came from Wazamala City 
but he has no good solution for the time being. In order not to affect the next business, the Jinsi wants to stay on the spot get rid of these worthless kobolds. When he walked to the door of the warehouse, a subordinate hurriedly walked towards him. Boss, the knight Serdak came yesterday, the slave trader said in a low voice. The Jinsi didn't expect that Serdak would still look for him. So he asked his subordinates. Did he say anything? The subordinate quickly replied. I want to buy 200 kobolds. The Jinsi's eyes lit up and he immediately said energetically. Go and invite Soldak over. I'll go see him with you. Hurry up and prepare your horses. Chapter 491 Return The Bena City Slave Market is located on the west side of Nancheng District, close to the Nancheng Workshop District. It is the end of a free market built along the street. This place is occupied by some slave traders all year round. The slaves have shackles on their bodies and stand on a high stone platform next to the street. Some slaves have wooden signs with prices under their feet. And some have nothing at all. As long as someone is in front of these slaves. Stop and the slave trader waiting next to you will enthusiastically introduce the price of each slave on the stage. The metallurgy and leather making workshops of Bena City are planned in the same area. Which is called the workshop area by the citizens. This workshop area is close to the south city wall. The city hall and urban development department diverts water from the moat outside the city into an independent inland river in the workshop area. And the industrial wastewater generated here is directly discharged to the city through a kilometer-long culvert. Outside, there are nearly 200 chimneys standing in the workshop area. And there is a workshop under each chimney. The sky above the workshop is covered with thick smoke. The slum area of the workshop area is adjacent to the city of Bina. And it is also covered by the thick smoke above the city. Shrouded in it. It can be said that the slums here were gradually formed due to the existence of the workshop area. Dejinxi owns a high platform near the slave market. In addition to a few green-faced and fanged half-beast female slaves standing on it, there are only a dozen indigenous slaves captured from unknown planes. These slaves automatically formed on the high platform. Two small groups, standing on the edge of the high platform, were several kobolds with ugly faces like San Pei. They were locked together by a chain half lying on the stone platform with squinted eyes, looking a little depressed. During the plane war, a large number of slaves were sent to the outside battlefield. So there were almost no strong male slaves on the market. Serdak passed through the lively market and saw several richly dressed nobles standing in front of the dwarf slaves, bargaining with the slave owners. Dwarf slaves are quite popular in the market, mainly because they are born familiar with forging and brewing ale. A strong dwarf slave is more like a money-making machine. Compared with these dwarf slaves, those orc slaves from the remote mountainous areas of the empire are not so popular. Most of these half-orcs were born in the vast mountains bordering the orc tribes. Many villages there are mixed with humans and orcs. The half-orcs captured by slave traders from there are neither humans nor orcs. They are neither humans nor orcs. Not protected by imperial decrees and tribal orc laws. He has become a frequent visitor to the slave market. Samira recognized a slave trader standing under the high platform as Dejinsi's subordinate and secretly told Soldak. Serdak and his party walked around the slave market and found that there were cobalt slaves only on the high platform of Dejinxi. They asked the slave trader about the price of cobalt slaves. He also knew the slave trader. Samira then hurried to the warehouse and called Dejinxi over. The plane war made the slave market unprecedentedly prosperous. Many male slaves were sent to the battlefield to become cannon fodder at the forefront. As a result, the price of male slaves in the slave market was much higher than that of female slaves. And the supply was basically in short supply. Dejinsi met Soldak, Samira, and others in front of the stall. Night, Serdak. I heard that you want to buy a kobold slave. Dejinsi hurried over from across the street. The scar on his face turned a little red. That's what I meant. Serdak replied standing in front of the high platform. Dejinsi's eyes lit up. He approached Soldak with a smile. Turned to look at the kobold slaves and said repeatedly, You are so discerning. These cobalts come from the plain of Fio. Look at them, you can tell how young they are by their teeth. They are easy to feed. They only need some sweet potatoes, some melons, vines, and wheat bran to live well. What they are best at is digging. But if you want to use them to cultivate land, that is not the case. No, they can definitely do some simple farm work. In order to verify the health status of these cobalts, Dejinsi stabbed the cobalt slave's mouth with an iron hook, pulled open the cobalt slave's thick lips, and forcibly exposed the canine teeth inside. The cobalt slave howled dully. Soldak stopped Dejinsi and continued to open the lips of another cobalt slave and said to Dejinsi, 
I plan to buy 200 cobalt slaves. But before that, I want to know the price first. Da Jinsi touched his shiny forehead and said to Soldek. The price is easy to say. And when you buy cobalt from me, the more you buy, the bigger the discount will be. Excluding those special slaves. The current price of dwarves in the slave market is probably more than 15 gold. And the adult craftsman dwarf can even reach about 20 gold. The second is male half-orcs, who can be sent to the battlefield. These half-orcs have strong bodies. This kind of men orcs have a wide range of uses on the battlefield. And they basically have a price but no market. And the market price is clearly marked at 15 gold. The second is the indigenous slaves transported from some small plains. These indigenous slaves can be used to cultivate plantations. But they are not suitable for fighting. They are worth about 8 gold. The next level is these orc female slaves. Due to their due to gender issues, it is difficult to be sent to the battlefield. These half-orc female slaves are difficult to tame and discipline. And their physical strength is comparable to that of adult imperial people. So the price must be greatly discounted. Usually around hardware. As for these cobalt slaves, you can get another half discount on the price of the orc female slave. Now it's two gold coins each. 200 cobalt slaves only cost 400 gold coins. With such a low price, if you have enough budget, I suggest you should buy more. Serdek had just walked around the slave market and roughly inquired about the prices of slaves in the market. Basically, there was no difference from what Dejinsi said. Serdak thought carefully about it, and based on his limited bargaining experience, he felt that it was necessary to meet and cut half of the price. So he said very decisively, One gold coin for each. If you can, help me select 200 strong and capable people. Cobalt of any disease. Dejinsi didn't expect that Knight Serdak would cut him severely on top of the best price he offered. A breath was held at his chest, which instantly made his face turn red. The words of rejection were stuck in his throat, but he swallowed them back in his stomach. I thought that if Serdak hadn't been rushing over from the warehouse, the cobalt slaves in the warehouse might have been ready to load the trucks and transport them to the cemetery mountain outside the city to dig holes and bury them on the spot. Now someone is willing to take over. Although the price is extremely low, at least some of the costs can be recovered. Dejinsi's face turned red and white several times. But finally his face softened, and he smiled and said to Soldak, Don't worry about this. You can choose as you like. And I guarantee that all cobalt slaves have no regarding infectious diseases. Before coming to the Green Empire, I use quicklime powder to repeatedly kill parasites on my body. So there will definitely be no problems in this regard. Soldak considered that if he wanted to transport 200 cobalt slaves back to Alensa, even if he rented a magic truck, he would probably have to pay a high transportation fee to the horse and carriage company. So he said to Dijinsi, These slaves the final destination is my night territory outside the city of Alanza, and you will be responsible for the transportation of this batch of slaves. Dijinsi's eyes darkened when he heard this. The veins on his forehead bulged, and his heart was filled with thoughts of beating people. You must know that to launch a magic airship, in addition to the labor costs of the crew and other labor costs, the 16 magic crystals required to activate the floating device alone are worth nearly a 100 gold coins. To send these cobalt slaves to the city of Alanza, Dejinsi had less than a 100 gold coins left. But at this time, an assistant beside him quickly whispered a few words in Dejinsi's ear. The magic airship docked near the airport terminal of Bena City and Dejinsi happened to be temporarily recruited by the Bena Provincial War Command to transport war supplies to the northern region of Bena Province. Alensa City happened to be one of them. And these were the cobalt slave passed by. But it was actually nothing. Dejinsi quickly raised his chest and said to Soldak, It's no problem to leave the transportation to us. But I can only agree to help you deliver it to the Alensa Airport Terminal. You need to think about the rest of the journey yourself method, and I sincerely invite you to join this pleasant journey, which will also make it easier for us to hand over these slaves as soon as we arrive at the airport terminal of Alensa City. The other party promised free transportation, which was something Soldak didn't expect. He thought that Dejinxi would take the opportunity to ask for some transportation fees, but he didn't expect that the other party didn't even mention it. Seeing Dejinxi agreeing to his request so readily, Soldak also readily extended his hand and said to Dejinxi, Deal! A pleasure to work with. Dejinsi and Soldak high-fived each other. And the deal was finalized. Serdak was also quite cheerful. He directly took the bag of gold coins that he had just obtained from selling two short-handled muskets at the magic trading company in the morning from his waist. Picked out 15 coins from it. And handed the rest along with the money bag. 
the Great Golden West. The price of one gold coin for one cobalt is absolutely acceptable. Serdak used 200 cobalt slaves to liberate the young labor force of Wall Village, which can also speed up the transformation project of Wall Village. Dejinsi provided door-to-door -door delivery service to Soldak, so Soldak made a temporary decision, and the team followed Dejinsi's magic airship to return to Alanza City in advance. Of course, in order to return to Alanza City in advance, you have to ask for leave from Carl and Viscount Emmett in the courtyard of the hotel. You want to leave early? Carl stopped practicing the wooden sword in his hand and asked the sparring knights to find someone else. He pointed to a row of wooden swords on a wooden stand in the yard and motioned for Serdak to compete with him. Serdak stood next to the ogre ghoul item. He had no interest in this kind of wooden sword battle. So he shook his head and rejected Carl's invitation. This kind of battle practice has many restrictions. Although it can improve one's swordsmanship, it is very impractical on the battlefield. Well, it's your freedom. Looking at the ogre ghoul item in the inner courtyard, Carl felt that Serdak had considered the ogre's feelings. So he gave up taking the more comfortable magic airship and returned to Alanza City by land. He said to Soldak, This season, there are barren mountains and ridges everywhere outside the city. In fact, there is no good scenery. It is far better to take a magic airship to appreciate the scenery of Bena province. Serdak thought to himself, I didn't say I wouldn't take the magic airship back to Alanza City. However, he did not explain any more. It would be the worst if these guard camp knights heard that a magic airship was about to leave for Helenza City, and if they all proposed to take this magic airship back to Helenza. On one side are slave traders who wander on the fringes of imperial laws, and on the other are the knights of the guard camp who strictly enforce imperial laws to maintain order in the city. A lot of unforeseen things are sure to happen on a ship. Serdak finally held back and did not tell Carl how he would return to the city of Helenza. Carl wrote an application and submitted it directly to Viscount Emmett. The Helenza Guard Battalion returned triumphantly, and Viscount Emmett signed the application without any additional restrictions. Before the separation was imminent, Carl personally sent the Serdak team out of the hotel. Then let's meet in Helenza City. The two hugged. A group of knights stood at the door of the hotel and said goodbye to Serdak. Serdak boarded a magic caravan, and the ogre sat on the shelf behind the magic caravan. The whole magic caravan creaked under the weight of the ogre and drove away from the road. Narrow alley. The magic caravan turned at the crossroads ahead and drove south along a flat avenue in the city to the airport terminal outside the city. 1. The setting sun casts a long shadow on the airport pier in the fields. At the airport terminal outside Bena City, a long group of cobalt slaves climbed up the airport tower with heavy steps. Several slave traders stood outside the group with long whips in their hands. Those cobalt slaves who had never seen the sun all day long with chains hanging on their bodies. They walked up the tower one by one and got into the bottom cabin of the magic airship. These cobalt slaves are probably among the few that can be shipped across the empire without any control, barely needing to be driven away by the slave traders. He walked numbly into the cabin. The internal staff standing on the airport terminal looked at these slave traders with disdain and kept urging them. Hurry up! Let them go quickly! Be careful! Don't let these stinking cobalts tower the floor of the terminal! You slave traders are responsible for the final cleaning. There are other airships that are about to dock. You must set sail immediately and make way for the airships behind to dock. An old man standing under the airport tower shouted to the captain of the magic airship who was standing with the slave traders. We'll leave right away. The captain of the magic airship quickly agreed. At this time, a magic caravan stopped outside the airport terminal. The tall ogre Gulidum jumped down from the shelf behind the caravan and stood at the door of the port. Immediately attracting the attention of many people, the door of the carriage was pushed open, and Serdak walked out of the carriage with Samira, Andrew and Aphrodite. Walking into the airport terminal, Serdak looked at the old man who was responsible for buying tickets from a distance. The old man probably recognized Serdak and raised his hat and waved to Serdak. Serdak performed the night salute and went directly to the airport tower. The slave trader in charge saw Serdak and said to Serdak pleasantly, You guys came just in time. At this time, Serdak happened to see the last few cobalt slaves walking into the bilge of the ship and asked the slave trader, Are you all ready? When will we set off? Let's go now, said the captain standing next to the slave trader. We must find the channel in the air layer before it gets dark. Chapter 492, by one get four free. The magic airship floats above the sea of clouds. After the airship entered the airflow channel last night, after a night's flight, 
it had sailed out of the territory of the Newman family in Bennis City. The light green mountains under its feet now belong to the territory of the Collins family. After a while, you will see two lions. Pulak City surrounded by mountain ridges. The wind is very strong on the deck, and several crew members are raising the seventh jib sail on the bow. The difference between the magic airship and the sea ship is that these jib sails and spinnakers control the course of the airship. After entering the channel, unless it encounters extreme weather, otherwise the airship will fly very smoothly for several days. During this period, the crew only need to make corrections to the airship's course according to the captain's instructions to allow the airship to sail normally. It was the first time for all four of Sirdak's men to ride a magic airship, and they seemed very novel about the magic airship, except for the ogre Gulitem, who was afraid of heights and hid in the cabin and refused to come out. The other three boarded the top deck of the magic airship, holding onto the railings and looking at the spectacular sea of clouds. The succubus Aphrodite looked at the dazzling sun in the distant sky and asked Sirdak curiously, Captain, how far is it from the city of Valenza? She followed Samira and Andrew's example, and called Serdak captain. Serdak pointed his finger directly in front of the airship and replied, Flying in this direction, it will take at least six days to reach Halanza. Aphrodite turned her head, squinting her eyes under the black veil, with a faint smile on her lips, and said, It's so far. Samira's hood was lifted by the wind, and the wind blew away the broken hair on her head. She leaned on the railing of the magic airship, quietly looking through the gaps in the clouds at the pale green land a piece of deciduous forest with new buds sprouting, and rolling hills covered with a carpet of green grass. In early spring in Bina province, the fields of many farms have been leveled. These fields and those that have not been plowed form two distinct colors. Thick steam came out of the galley vent at the stern of the ship. The crew and slave traders in the galley were very busy all day long. The trolleys pushed out from the galley were filled with dishes made of wheat bran, sweet potatoes, and cabbage, for vegetable porridge. The crew transported the vegetable porridge to the shaft on the stern side of the ship and hoisted a pot of vegetable porridge down the airship bottom cabin along the shaft. Serdak couldn't understand how edible the cobalt slaves in the bottom cabin were, so they made the crew and slave traders cook vegetable porridge in the kitchen all day long. Originally, Serdak planned to ask these slave traders about the living habits of cobalt slaves, but after asking several questions in succession, the slave traders could not answer anything. He only said that these cobalt slaves were easy to raise and could do anything. They were willing to eat, and they could live on whatever they gave them. They also said that these cobalt slaves were very lazy, and if they wanted them to work obediently, they would have to whip them with a whip in their hands. Serdak proposed to see the health of the 200 cobalt slaves in the cabin. This time the slave trader had no reason to shirk, so he took the initiative to lead Serdak into the bottom cabin along the ladder. The two slave traders guarding the door of the bilge opened the iron door bolt, and slowly pushed open the large iron door of the bilge. The slave traders were already prepared to cover their mouths and noses with the scars around their necks. Serdak was about to when he walked into the bottom cabin. He felt a stinking heat wave rushing towards his face. The strong smell almost knocked Soldak down. The bottom floor of the airship is divided into ten independent cabins. In the middle is a corridor from the bow to the stern. There are five cabins on the left and right sides. Now it seems that the cabins and even the corridors are crowded with cobalt slaves. These the cobalt slaves were so frightened that they took a few steps back when they saw the door being suddenly opened. Serdak was also shocked by so many cobalt slaves crowded together. He did not expect that so many cobalts were crammed into the bottom cabin of less than 300 square meters. No wonder those slave traders had to cook for a whole day. Porridge. There are so many cobalt slaves in the bottom cabin. The food is indeed a little short. The slave trader strode into the corridor of the bottom cabin, reached out and grabbed the ear of a cobalt sitting in the corridor, and savagely dragged the cobalt slave to the door to look at his teeth and eyes, showing the cobalt's relatively healthy physique, and finally explained to Serdak. Night, Serdak. Look how healthy it is. When we get to Helanza City, there are so many cobalt slaves. You can choose take those that are healthiest. That's what the slave trader said. And it's exactly what they did. After a whole week of flying, at noon on the seventh day, the magic airship finally arrived at the territory of Halanza City. The oak trees all over the mountains and fields have begun to sprout branches, and the mountains and fields are filled with a layer of green. The sea of clouds has a fault here. When it is about to reach the city of Halanza, the magic airship breaks away from the channel of the air layer. In the field of vision, the mountain city became clearer and clearer. Serdak, Andrew, Samira, 
and Aphrodite were standing on the bow deck. The ogre had gradually adapted to life on the magic airship these days. But he still didn't want to come to the side of the ship and kept holding the thickest mast in the middle of the airship. When Serdek said that he was about to arrive at the city of Alanza, his face gradually showed joy. Serdek pointed to the mountain city standing halfway up the mountain in the distance and introduced this small mountain city to everyone. Alanza city is much smaller than was Zimra city. The buildings in the city are built against the mountain, making the buildings look particularly special. It is compact, and every inch of space in the mountain city has been perfectly utilized. When looking down from a high altitude, Alanza city feels like a three-dimensional exquisite sculpture. Are we going to live in this city in the future? Aphrodite asked with a look of longing on her face. Serdak shrugged his shoulders and said, I may go to the deserted land in the Paglos Mountains to serve as the sheriff there. I won't live here for long. This city is so beautiful, Aphrodite exclaimed. Serdak said, If you want to stay here, I can help you make arrangements in advance. Aphrodite blinked her bright eyes and said with a smile, I'd better follow you. On your territory. It may be safer that way. After saying that, she pointed behind her and signaled to Serdak that her wings were broken and she was a succubus who had lost most of her power. But there was no expression of frustration on her face. Returning to the city of Aranza again, an emotion that was hard to let go arose in my heart. Before Serdak could sigh in his heart, a sound of whistle woke Serdak out of his mixed emotions. The airship slid slowly in the air. The crew lowered all the sails on the airship. The magic airship relied on the magical power on the ship to move forward slowly. The flotation device made a buzzing sound and the huge mass creaked. There was a sound and the sail on the mast was tied to the lowest mast by the crew. The captain docked the magic airship on the high tower of Helensa City Airport Terminal and docked it firmly at the high tower terminal. The crew member standing next to the ship sighed through the huge rope up to the terminal. The staff of the airport terminal used hooks to the rope smeared with tongue oil was hung on the docking pile and the airship was pulled forward. The floating airship successfully docked at the airport terminal. There happened to be a magic airship filled with supplies on the opposite side of the tower ready to set sail. The crew on the airship looked here curiously, as if to see if there were any friends they knew on board the airship. The captain raised the hovering position of the magic airship slightly, and the crew opened the hatch from the bottom of the ship and built a passage. A slave trader jumped from the ship to the airport tower and negotiated with the staff on the tower. At this time, Cobalt slaves were strung together by ropes and stepped off the airship one by one. Their lives on the airship these days were not very good. They walked out of the bottom cabin of the airship, one by one with empty steps. Some cobalts were swaying, as if they might fall at any time, when they heard the whistle of the whip thrown by the slave trader. Their bodies kept shaking instinctively. A slave trader walked quickly to Serdak, showed a flattering smile, and said to him, Night, Serdak. Can you also help us and send these cobalt slaves off the airship? So that it is also convenient for you to select those strong cobalts from these slaves. I'm more than happy to help. But my people won't go into the hold. Serdak said to the slave trader. Slave trader. Thank you so much. He looked at Andrew and Samira, who were about to jump off the airship next to him. He held Aphrodite's arm, supported her slender waist with one hand, and jumped directly onto the side of the ship which was about three meters high from the airport terminal platform. He fell down and landed steadily on the platform with the veiled Aphrodite. Samira and Andrew jumped off right behind Serdak. Behind them was the ogre Gulitum. The three-meter-tall ogre jumped off the airship, and the entire terminal platform erupted. A slight tremor. Serdak walked along the winding stairs of the tower to the ground. He carefully observed these cobalt slaves along the way. Indeed, as the slave trader said, these cobalt slaves were not only mentally weak and physically weak, but also free from any diseases and health problems. The thick brown hair on their bodies has not been bathed for too long. So the hair is stuck together and formed into dark hard scabs. Just like the scales covering the body. The whole body exudes a stench. And everyone tries to get close to them. Everyone had to twist their noses. And their pupils showed a kind of blue-gray. Maybe they had been locked up for too long. Their eyes looked a little dull. And their expressions were numb. Only when they saw the whips and iron hooks of the slave traders, they would some reactions. After disembarking from the ship, the slave traders applied for an open space from the management of the airport terminal, and all the cobalt slaves were driven to this open space. Serdak roughly counted these cobalt slaves and found that there were nearly a thousand cobalt slaves on the ship, and they were all crowded into ten cabins in the bottom. 
The slave trader had promised Serdak that when the airship arrived in the city of Aranza, Serdak could randomly select the healthiest kobolds among these kobold slaves. So even though these kobolds exuded a stench, Serdak still endured the discomfort and walked into the slave group to select the strongest kobold. Serdak thought that the remaining kobold slaves would be sent to other places. But he did not expect that all the kobolds on the ship actually got off the airship. The captain and crew of the magic airship did not disembark. When Serdak got off the boat, the captain waved to him and said goodbye to him with a smile. When more than a thousand kobold slaves had all disembarked from the ship, Dajinsi's assistant gave Soldak a letter written by Dajinsi, and then took several slave traders and boarded the magic ship without looking back. Airship. While Soldak was still reading the letter, the magic airship actually flew away from the airport terminal at the fastest speed. The airship was not replenished at the Halanza airport terminal, as the flotation device on the airship was operating at full speed. It continued to climb high into the sky and gradually disappeared into the blue sky. The letter written by Dejinsi to Soldak. Dear Knight Serdak, I believe that by the time you read this letter, my men have already left Halanza City and headed for their next destination. I promise you that I will give you the 200 strongest kobold slaves. However, the selection process seems a bit cumbersome. So please select them yourself this time. You can definitely choose the one you like among these more than a thousand kobold slaves. Since the warehouse in Bena City is used for other purposes, we have no place to house the remaining kobold slaves. Therefore, please handle the remaining kobold slaves on your behalf. You can do whatever you want with it. Sell it or throw it away. In short, I decided to throw away all the remaining kobold slaves. If it brings you some unnecessary trouble, please forgive me. Of course, what I most want to see is that this kobold is a small gift that can be added to your team of kobold slaves. Ferdinand, sincerely, Jinsi, seeing a group of nearly a thousand kobolds gathered in front of him. Soldak realized that what was before him turned out to be a big problem. As a knight of the guard camp of Alinsa City, he certainly could not leave 800 kobolds here. At that time, the security chaos at the airport terminal will be caused, and the one responsible for the end will be the Hellanza Guard Battalion. It's just that he is only a knight after all, and the fief he owns is only a small knight's territory. It is really a big problem for Serdak to feed these more than a thousand kobold slaves. Even the slave trader Dijinsi failed to sell these kobolds, and Serdak didn't think he could sell them all. Looking at the densely packed kobolds in the field, Soldak regretted letting the slave traders go so easily just now. Andrew and Samira stood next to Soldak. Andrew saw clearly the contents of the letter in Serdak's hand and asked Soldak, Captain, what should we do? Soldak rubbed his forehead vigorously and ordered Andrew, You guys stay here. I will go to the carriage house to rent some carriages and transport them out of the city first. Oh, Andrew agreed. The ogre standing aside once again fell into the crowd of people around him. But he didn't pay too much attention to it. Taking the magic airship kept the ogre in a state of nervousness. He didn't even have a good meal along the way. Now he touching his shriveled belly. He was fully expecting to have a delicious meal at the most famous barbecue restaurant in Alenza. As Soldak had promised. After arriving in the city of Alenza, the succubus Aphrodite stood at the door of the airport terminal. Watching the flow of people coming and going at the airport terminal, she closed her eyes and opened her arms as if to embrace the earth. Chapter 493 Going Home the largest carriage house in Halinsa City is located in the southwest corner of the workshop area of Halinsa City. It is only one street away from the South City Gate. Opposite the carriage house is the largest free market in Halinsa City. This is also the entire city. The busiest place in the city. Where many citizens are willing to buy cheap goods. In early spring, a fresh and tender red cabbage appears on the free market. This kind of fern that grows under rotten leaves is the first wild vegetable to emerge after the arrival of spring. The people of Halanza, who could only eat radishes, pumpkins, cabbage, potatoes and various dried vegetables and dried mushrooms throughout the winter. There is no resisting these tender sprouts. Some mountain people put red cabbage on their stalls. And they are immediately sold out. The mountain people outside the city of Halanza took advantage of this season. When the frozen soil on the southern slope of the mountain had completely melted and went up the mountain with hose to collect wild vegetables and dig cassava. Cassava is the root of a tree. One cassava tree can produce hundreds of kilograms of cassava. This kind of cassava grows deep in the mountains. The cassava trees around the villages are basically the private property of nobles and knights. And many poor families are. Rely on this cassava with trace amounts of toxins to survive the food shortage. Every spring, 
a large amount of cassava is stocked in the free market in Alanza. Some wanderers even stand outside the gate of the free market. They help merchants carry bags in the market. They can buy a small cassava for a copper plate. Cassava as thick as a child's arm. Large orders of cassava are traded in this free market every day. So as long as the homeless are willing to work hard, it is not difficult to fill their stomachs in Alinsa City. After entering spring, the business of carriage shops in the city has also entered the off-season. During this season, there will be carriages in the carriages going into the mountains to bring back some cassava and selling them to the free market in Alinsa City. But the meager gross profit is not even as good as the commission for clearing snow in the city in winter. This horse-drawn carriage shop opened a store on the street. Soldak walked into the open store door and was greeted by a blonde girl standing behind the counter, lowering her head and sorting out the accounts. There was some noise in the hall of the store. A group of horse-drawn carriage drivers. We are sitting in the rest area of the store chatting. The only people who have time to chat at this time are basically truck drivers. Everyone is waiting for the evening bell to ring so that they can go home in twos and threes for dinner. Through the open back door, Soldak could clearly see that the carriage house's backyard was full of four-wheeled carriages. Some grooms unloaded the ancient bolai horses from the carriages and carefully brushed the horses with a brush and then led the horse back to the stable. There are also some people who are cutting grass next to the warehouse where the fodder is stored. The forage must be mixed with wheat bran and bean cake embryos and stirred evenly before feeding these ancient horses to prevent them from losing weight in the spring. Hearing the footsteps, the blonde girl raised her head and saw a construct knight walking in the door. She immediately stood up and said enthusiastically to Soldek, Hello, Lord Knight. How can I help you? I want to hire some four-wheel trucks, Soldek said to the female dealer. Then where are you going? The female clerk placed a parchment map on the counter and pushed a thin wooden stick in front of Soldek. Serdek picked up the thin wooden stick and pointed to the mountainous wall village on the map at the easternmost end of the deserted land at the southern end of the Paglos Mountains, adjacent to the side of Halinsa City, and said, Go to Wall Village, in the deserted land outside Paglos Pass, about a day's journey from the city of Halanza. Do you want to use it now? The blonde female clerk asked Soldak with her big blue eyes. Yeah. Soldak nodded. The female clerk reminded Soldak. Although the ice and snow in the mountains have melted, and the road leading out of the mountain pass is clear, walking at night is a little more expensive than the normal fare during the day. If you don't have anything too important, I suggest you make an appointment tomorrow morning. Soldak shook his head and said, I'm going to use it tonight. I can't wait until tomorrow. The female clerk smiled awkwardly, thought for a moment, and then asked Soldak, So what other requirements do you have for these four-wheeled carriages? Soldak thought about it seriously and said casually, there is nothing wrong. At least these coachmen can't be too afraid of dogs. The female clerk wrote down the request in the register very seriously, lowered her head, and said as she wrote, From the city of Aranza to the village of Wall, outside the Paglos Pass. We need to cross the city's Golden Oak Mountains. Hire a car. For a four-wheeled carriage. You need to pay about six silver coins. By the way, how many four-wheeled carriages do you need to hire? Serdak calculated that it would be no problem to carry 50 cobalt slaves in a four-wheeled carriage. So more than a thousand cobalt slaves would require almost 20 four-wheeled carriages. In addition, the ogre Gulitum would need an addition to a spacious four-wheeled carriage. Soldak also planned to buy a batch of cheap cassava in the city of Valenza. He thought for a moment and said, I need 30. The blonde female clerk's expression was slightly suffocating. But then she returned to normal and said to Soldak, Okay. Lord Knight. As soon as Soldak entered the carriage house, he was noticed by the carriage drivers in the rest area next to him. Although they were still chatting, they were a little absent-minded. The carriage drivers could not swarm around Soldak to grab the door-to-door -door business. They could only wait quietly in the rest area. This was a rule set by the carriage house a long time ago. According to the carriage driver's registration in the morning, sorting, orders assigned by Miss Nelly. However, this time Miss Nelly took a long time to select the coachman and she even went to the rest area in person to ask the coachman one by one if they were afraid of dogs. For the hard-earned job. Even if the coachman were afraid, they would not be afraid at this time. It's impossible to tell. Miss Nellie didn't ask around in the rest area. She ran to the backyard and went directly to the coachmen who were washing the horses and asked them if they were afraid of dogs. These coachmen in the backyard are the few coachmen who have received work today and are at the bottom of the queue in the carriage shop. They are sure that if they get another job, it will not be their turn. So they squat in the backyard to brush the horses. 
Miss Nelly asked the coachman in the backyard. Anellen, Dirk, and Floor, are you three willing to take on the night job? Go to the deserted land outside Paglo's Pass. One of the coachmen who was washing the leather saddle cover stood up straight, holding a wet brush in his hand, and asked Miss Nelly, Are you going overnight? The inner courtyard was full of carriages. Miss Nelly held the registration book and squinted her eyes against the sun and said, That's right. The coachman glanced at the carriage shop and hesitated before saying, Miss Nelly, of course we are willing. But if you come to us, won't those people in the rest area complain about you? Miss Nelly smiled brightly at the handsome coachman her white teeth appearing exceptionally neat. And she said, No, because they are all going too. The coachman next to him immediately cheered. Wow, it looks like this is a big deal. Miss Nellie nodded proudly, turned around and walked back with the register in her arms, saying as she walked, That's right, the customer is a knight. This time we have ordered 34 wheeled carriages. If there is no problem, come to the store with me. The coachman whose name was called quickly stopped what he was doing and followed Miss Nelly into the store. Two horse four-wheeled wagons drove out of the carriage house one after another and parked neatly in a row on the side of the carriage road. Soldak did not wait in the carriage shop. He walked into the free market opposite the carriage shop, casually asked about the market price of cassava, and then began to buy a large amount of goods in the free market. Several hundred kilograms or even dozens of kilograms. As long as the price I bought them all if they were suitable but the delivery location was required to be at the door of the carriage house. He just walked around the free market and bought a lot of cassava. This kind of cassava has a particularly large yield, but it contains trace amounts of toxins. If you eat too much, your lips will swell and you will have diarrhea. Even the poor do not dare to eat too much. It didn't take long for the stall owners in the free market to carry cassava and arrive at the door of the carriage house. According to the procedure, the cassava will be weighed first and then Serdak will pay. Then the stall owners will load the cassava into the last nine four-wheeled wagons until all nine four-wheeled wagons are filled with cassava. Serdak Kasai finally called a halt, and the extra cassava was packed into the carriages of the remaining four-wheel trucks. Serdak ordered several carriages loaded with cassava to drive directly out of the city and wait beside the road outside the city leading to Paglos Pass. Then he jumped on the front four-wheel carriage and rushed to the airport terminal with a long line of four-wheel carriages. Andrew who was waiting at the entrance of the airport terminal, saw Soldak standing in the four-wheel carriage carriage, and then he breathed a long sigh of relief and waved to Soldak in the distance. The cobalt slaves were trapped in a string by ropes. They lined up in a long line to board the four-wheel carriage, and finally left the city of Alanza in the four-wheel carriage before the city gate closed. Serdak did not let these cobalt slaves walk directly out of the city of Alanza. In addition to the fact that these cobalt slaves were exhausted, he was still worried that these smelly cobalt slaves walking through the streets would cause unnecessary commotion. There is a shortage of manpower here, and he is worried that the cobalt slaves will take the opportunity to escape. Once there are signs of this, there is probably no way to stop it. It is much safer to load these cobalt slaves into a four-wheel carriage, and it is also easier to control these cobalt slaves. The cobalt slaves, who had been hungry all day, boarded the four-wheel carriage, only to find that some cassava had been prepared in the carriage. They got into the carriage in a hurry, sat down silently, and munched on the cassava. Get up. They have been hungry all day, and now they don't care about the toxins in cassava. Looking at these short cobalt slaves exuding a strong odor, the coachman couldn't help but complain in their hearts. This big business is really difficult to do. Once the business is done, it is inevitable to turn the truck from inside to out. The outside had to be carefully scrubbed, but when the carriage was filled with cobalt slaves, the coachman quickly inserted the box boards at the back of the carriage. Some coachmen would even pinch their noses and walk up to push a frail young cobalt slave when they saw that they were unable to climb onto the cargo box. Nanai native warrior Andrew and half-elf archer Samira guarded the front and rear ends of the convoy to prevent cobalt slaves from escaping in the chaos. Once these cobalt slaves without identities escaped, it would be easy to catch them. The arrest will bring some unnecessary security risks to the security of Helensa City. The succubus Aphrodite sat obediently in a magic caravan at the airport terminal. Before she was familiar with the imperial laws, Soldak did not let her wander around outside. After all, she was a succubus. However, Aphrodite didn't seem to care too much about this. She lay quietly by the window, her face covered with black veil, looking curiously at the street with people coming and going. Through the black veil, Serdak, you can feel the smile on her face. 
Zerdak stood in front of the ogre Gulitem and said apologetically, Sorry, Gulitem. Today's dinner may be a little late. The ogre patted his belly and said that it was okay to be hungry occasionally. After saying that, he picked up a piece of cassava and rubbed it hard on his belly twice. Chewing it like a crispy radish, he awkwardly boarded the last four-wheel truck, and the whole carriage made a creaking sound. The coachman watched the ogre sitting in his truck box, stretching the sides of the truck into an exaggerated arc, and almost falling about to burst into tears. When he saw that the convoy in front had already set off, the coachman could only quickly get into the driver's seat, and the four-wheeled truck carried the ogre and chased after him as hard as he could. When the motorcade passed a bakery on Central Street, Soldak stopped the magic caravan, bought white bread and toasted wheat cakes for 60 people, and spent 20 silver coins at a barbecue stall. He bought two hot roasted lambs and threw a pile of roasted wheat cakes and a whole roasted lamb into the ogre Gulidum's carriage. The ogre's exclamation immediately came from the carriage. In the magic caravan, the indigenous warrior tore off a roasted leg of lamb, cut it into small pieces with a peeling knife, and put it on a silver plate. The succubus Aphrodite took off her veil, stretched out her hand, and elegantly pinched a piece of lamb leg meat and put it into her mouth. While eating, he said vaguely to Soldak, I have never eaten such delicious roast lamb. Facing the three people in front of her, Samira could only sit in the corner of the carriage and chew an apple. The convoy finally left the city of Alinsa before the city gate closed. The mountain road leading outside the Paglos Pass is not easy to walk. The ice and snow melted in early spring, making the mountain road a little muddy. However, Sernak hired two-horse, four-wheel carriages. No matter how difficult the road was, the best he could do was walk. You have to go slower. This kind of truck won't easily get stuck in the mud and be unable to get out. The mountain wind at night was still so cold. But the night sky in the mountains was full of stars. The wind carried the fragrance of trees. The convoy passed quietly through the mountains covered with oak trees until the sun climbed up the mountain in the early morning. The last carriage in the convoy passed the mountain pass. The dazzling rising sun clearly reflected the wooden crosses on the top of the mountain. After a harsh winter, the skeletons of the robbers had completely disappeared from the wooden crosses leaving only some lonely skulls hanging on the top of the wooden crosses. Just on the far side of the road, Serdak could clearly see the ravine in Wall Village. Serdak pushed open the door of the magic caravan, pointed at the village that was becoming clearer and clearer in his sight, and said excitedly to several of his men in the carriage, Look over there! That's the village of Wall! The succubus Aphrodite looked at the desolate land in front of her in surprise, and sighed, It's unexpected that this place can be so desolate, Soldak said confidently. It will get better gradually. Chapter 494 Spring in Wall Village 22 four-wheeled carriages stopped by the reed pond at the entrance of the village. The carriage drivers jumped out and removed the carriage panels. The cobalt slave walked out of the carriage with a numb look on his face. The cobalt slave was in a strange environment with a confused look on his face. He was surrounded by large areas of withered yellow reeds and red thatch. Looking around, he saw bare mountains and desolation everywhere in the distance. A small, dilapidated village is hidden in a ravine between the mountains. A stream that is almost dead flows out of the ravine. It is connected to this swamp in the river bend. The reed pond is not very big. In late spring, early summer is the dry season on Paglos. At this time, the reed ponds will dry up little by little. And finally only small ponds with countless silt deposits in the center of the swamp will remain. In midsummer, when the rainy season comes, the southeast monsoon blows the moist air from the endless sea. After a heavy rain, the place will turn into a swamp. At this time, the floating ice on the pond at the entrance of the river bend had just melted, and the breeze was blowing, and the water surface was sparkling. Andrew drove more than a thousand cobalt slaves to the pond. According to Soldak's instructions, these cobalt slaves need to take a good bath here. The cobalt slaves are covered with this light brown soft hair. Even if they are not, they are not afraid of the cold, even if they were warm clothes. But if they jump into the cold river water in early spring, it will be quite a challenge for these cobalt slaves at this time. These cobalt slaves have completely succumbed to the whips of the slave traders. They are used to receiving instructions to do things. Andrew drove a large group of cobalt slaves into the pond with little trouble. However, due to the large number of cobalt slaves, the pond in the area for cobalts to bathe was very limited. So Andrew directed some cobalts to collect some wreaths and pile them into huge haystacks on the shore. Andrew used the fire-gathering scroll to light the haystack and the flames started to spread. The haystack burst into flames, and the temperature within 10 meters around it rose sharply. 
thick smoke billowed from the fire, and was blown north by the wind. Those cobalt slaves who washed off their dirt in the pond climbed ashore from the pond, and were arranged by Andrew to warm themselves next to the fire. Moreover, each cobalt was given half a piece of cassava to eat breakfast while warming themselves, because last night was the lips of these cobalt slaves were slightly swollen from the cassava they ate. But this did not affect them, seeing that they could receive food after taking a bath and sit there to warm themselves by the fire. These slow and dull cobalt slaves began to become more agile. The coachmen who had completed their transportation tasks were driving four-wheeled carriages back one after another. If the journey went well, they should be able to return to Olanza City before the city gate closed. There was a pile of cassava at Andrew's feet. He stepped on the pile of cassava with one foot, holding a cassava in his hand, and shouted loudly to the cobalt slave in front of him, who was dripping with water and huddled in the cold wind. Who? Whoever takes a bath first can eat cassava. And anyone who doesn't want to take a bath doesn't get breakfast. The cobalt slaves who have been locked up in the Benes City warehouse for more than three months really need a good bath. Half-elf Archer Samira, wearing red salamander leather armor, stood on a high hillside with a forest bow on her back. She stared at the cobalt slaves in the pond to prevent them from sneaking into the reeds and escaping. These cobalt slaves were the private property of the Serdek Knights. And even one of them could not be left behind looking at the desolate land with no woods around. Samira couldn't imagine what the people in the nearby villages did for a living. The ogre Gulitam sitting by the pond didn't think so much. He was looking expectantly at the cobalt slaves in the pond, hoping that one of the cobalt slaves would have the courage to escape, so that he could justifiably catch them back, and then throw them into a bonfire aside to burn. He licked his honest lips and squinted his eyes, like a lion hunting antelope in the grass. He thought to himself, if you can sprinkle a layer of salt on the roasted cobalt slave, it shouldn't be too unpalatable. Looking at the desolate mountains around her, the succubus Aphrodite walked alone to the distant ridge. After the reddish-brown rocks are weathered and broken, they are scattered on the hillside. If you step on them, they will roll down the hillside. There are some large rocks piled up at the foot of the mountain. If you walk up the hillside, you will find small pieces of gravel. More and more. Aphrodite looked at the blue sky, and when she thought about living here for a long time in the future, she couldn't wait to get to know the surrounding environment. In the past, when she had wings, she could see wherever she flew in the sky, so she was used to knowing her surroundings no matter where she went. Now that her wings were chopped off by a succubus of her own race, she could only climb the highest hillside with her legs. However, Aphrodite will not feel disappointed about this. Whenever she subconsciously prepares to flap her wings and fly, she will comfort herself in her heart. I have lost a pair of wings, but I have gained a vast sea and sky. After handing over a thousand cobalt slaves to the care of the indigenous warrior Andrew, Serdak walked into Wall Village alone. He is not worried about these cobalt slaves escaping. It doesn't really matter if there are so many cobalts and a few run away. What's more, they are unfamiliar with this deserted land. As long as they don't cross the Pagos Pass, they can't survive here. Eight four-wheeled carriages loaded with cassava stopped at the entrance of the village although the cassava was piled up like a hill, for more than a thousand kobolds. It was only ten days of rations at best. If you want to continue to feed them, you have to continuously buy more cassava from Alanza City. Having to feed so many kobold slaves at once, Serdak suddenly felt that the gold coins in his pocket would not last long. A total of thirty-four wheeled carriages were hired this time. Soldak asked the carriage drivers carrying kobold slaves to come to the entrance of the village to help unload the carriages. However, some carriage drivers carrying cobalt slaves were waiting for the cobalts on the carriages. The human slave stepped off the cargo box, completed his task of hauling, and then quietly bypassed the village entrance and returned to the city of Alanza through the Paglos Mountain Pass. Some coachmen hurriedly drove their four-wheeled carriages to the village entrance to help. With the help of the carriage drivers, several kilograms of cassava were unloaded into the open space at the entrance of the village. Soldak counted and found that there were only seven coachmen who were willing to rush over to help unload the carriage. It cost about 15 silver coins to buy a cart full of cassava from Alenza City. In addition to the shipping fee of 6 silver coins, a cart full of cassava cost almost 20 silver coins. Serdak took it from the money bag again. He paid 3 gold coins and signed another purchase agreement with the 15 coachmen who stayed behind, asking them to deliver another cart of cassava to Wall Village in 5 days. Moreover, Serdak also promised that when the time comes, they will not be left empty when they return to the city. The remaining carriage drivers did not expect that there would be business coming later, and they drove the carriages out of Wall Village with joy on their faces. 
although this kind of long-distance business was a bit harder. The earnings from one trip could be as much as the usual three days. With a daily income, it is naturally very happy to be able to receive this kind of transportation task in the off-season of this kind of horse and carriage business. Watching these four-wheeled carriages gradually go away, Soldak walked into Wall Village. It has been nearly three months since I left Wall Village. From the outside, this small village has not changed much. There are some unfinished civil engineering projects on the top of the ravine. And there are some scaffolding made of wood at the gate of the reservoir. But it seems to be on hiatus now. The branches of the dead tree at the entrance of the village have obviously lost some weight after this winter. The broken wooden board with the word Wall Village written on it in white foundation is hung on the horizontal branch of the dead tree. Swaying back and forth when the wind blows, Serdak walked up the dirt road. And the smoke from the village of were curled up in the early morning. Breakfast is undoubtedly very luxurious for the villagers of Wall Village. Except for the days when they are busy in the wheat fields. Breakfast is generally two meals a day. So basically they have to wait until the sun climbs over the ridge before starting. Eat breakfast. The traditional breakfast food here is chestnut and rice porridge. Which is a gruel made from chestnut kernels. Barley grains and beans. It is cooked in the fireplace for more than two hours to make the beans extremely fluffy and soft. After cooling, add a spoonful of maple sugar also tastes very good. But in Wall Village, not many people can afford maple sugar. If there is a famine year, some diced cassava will occasionally be added to the porridge. In order to remove the toxins in the cassava, the villagers' method is to cut the cassava into fine dices about the size of soybeans and soak them in cold water for two days so that they can drink until they are full. It won't be poisoned. A few village women walk down from the upper reaches of the river carrying water cans while talking and laughing. This winter was not difficult. Every household had sufficient food reserves. And there was no tragedy like heavy snowfall that collapsed the roof. Occasionally, they can have a meal of dried chicken, duck and frozen sea fish, which they never dared to think about before. But now everyone knows that it is the mining of yellow or on Pudong Mountain that has improved the lives of the whole village. Spring is here and the dry season has just begun. Last autumn, the old village chief Bright led everyone to build a large dam upstream of the village. At this time, it also filled a pool of spring water. The water shortage during the planting season in previous years will probably no longer exist. When the village women saw Serdak walking in from the entrance of the village, their eyes became bright. She almost went up to him, surrounded him, pushed her plump and bulging breasts up, and boasted about him, just like what she usually said in casual chat. Oh, that's not little duck. Someone among the village women exclaimed. A village woman, who was relatively well-informed, immediately corrected her. You have to call me Sir Knight Serdak. Ha ha. Little duck has actually become a knight. The other village women said with a smile. They smiled exaggeratedly. But the smiles on their faces were so bright. From the mouths of these village women, there seemed to be no trace of awe for the knights. Serdak simply said H low and walked home. When passing Selena's house, he saw a faint smoke coming from the chimney on the roof from a distance. He did not enter the small courtyard, but walked quickly to the house. The courtyard wall was still a bit shabby. For a canonized knight with a knighthood, it is a bit too shabby to still live in such a house. There was no time to build a new house before. Carl suggested that Soldak buy the Fornak Manor directly. However, Soldak still preferred to build a big house in Wall Village. The kind of house that old Sheila longed for most. A large villa with an attic should be built near a stream. It would be best if a small wooden bridge could be built. And a few chestnut trees could be transplanted in front of the house. The old cow in the yard made a dull low cry. And Rita's clear whisper could be heard through the yard wall. She seemed to be chatting with Natasha. Soldak raised his hand and pushed open the courtyard door. And saw Rita and Natasha squatting beside the cow. Milking the cow with a small iron bucket. The courtyard door was suddenly pushed open, and both of them turned to look at the door at the same time. They saw Soldak standing at the door. Rita stood up from the ground in surprise, wiped her little hands on her apron twice, and then shouted, It's Soldak who's back! As he spoke, he strode to the door and threw himself into Soldak's arms. His big blue eyes were filled with excitement and joy. On the contrary, Natasha stood quietly next to the cow. She was wearing an off-white cotton skirt, her long blonde hair was wrapped in a silk handkerchief. Her big eyes were like shining stars at night. And she had a faint smile on her face. Hearing Rita's cry, the door of the room was pushed open. Little Peter rushed out with a wooden sword in his hand and was squeezed between Rita and Soldak. Old Sheila stood holding the door. 
The wrinkles on old Sheila's face had deepened a bit this winter. Didn't you go out on a mission with the guard battalion? How come you still have time to come back? Old Sheila asked Soldak. When she received the letter from Soldak, she actually had nightmares for several days in a row. She didn't expect that Soldak would come back just three months ago. Soldak let go of Rita, lifted little Peter onto his shoulders, then walked directly to the door and said to old Sheila, I went to the Maka plane this time. I just returned to the city on the magic airship yesterday because I wanted to settle down some slaves. So I came back overnight. Have you not had breakfast yet? Old Sheila asked, squinting her eyes and looking at Soldak with cloudy eyes. Soldak smiled and nodded, following old Sheila into the house. As soon as Soldak sat down on the chair, he said to Rita who followed him in, By the way, Rita, you will help me cook a big pot of wheat porridge later. I have a few men at the entrance of the village. Waiting. We will also prepare some breakfast for them. So let's prepare it for twenty people. Your men. Rita's eyes widened and she asked Serdak in confusion. Soldak proudly pointed to the night badge on his chest and said to Rita, I am now a squad leader in the guard camp. This time I participated in the Maka playing war and recruited several subordinates. However, they are a bit special. So you better be prepared when you see them later. There is a big guy and he is very kind. Don't be afraid when you see him going. And don't look too surprised. I heard from Charlie that you joined the guard camp in the city and now you have been promoted to a captain. Rita kept asking questions like a barrage of questions. Will we have to move to the city in the future? Serdak touched his nose and replied. Not for the time being. The official appointment at the guard camp will be made soon. I will serve as the peace officer of the deserted land outside the Paglos Pass in Helensa City. Rita opened her mouth wide and looked at Serdak in disbelief. Unexpectedly, just after a winter, Serdak actually became the night master in the guard camp. Chapter 495 The Old Village Chief Visits Hearing that Soldak had returned to the village, before he could finish his breakfast, the old village chief Bright came to the door with Charlie and Luke. Uncle Bright! Soldak swallowed the last mouthful of multi-grain porridge and asked the old village chief and others to sit down in the living room. Old Sheila pulled little Peter out of the house to prevent little Peter from pestering Soldak and affecting everyone's conversation. Natasha brought out a pot of tea from the kitchen and made lemon tea for everyone. After entering spring, the water storage tank that Soldak organized and built last fall has already produced results. The period of late spring and early summer has always been the driest season in Wall Village. When there is usually sufficient water, almost all the mountain spring water in Wall Village flows into the downstream swamps and seeps into the ground. When it is time to sow seeds in spring, however, the springs on the mountain cannot provide sufficient water, which leads to a tense situation of irrigation water in the village. With this first level reservoir, the villagers no longer have to compete for irrigation water. This also solves the most troublesome problem of the old village chief Bright. Every year, there are several conflicts in the village due to the competition for irrigation rights. Now it seems, these problems seem to have been solved. When a war broke out in the Maka Plain, the city of Halinsa not only sent out the knights of the guard camp to provide support, but also successively collected a batch of strategic materials in the later period. Due to the huge gap in the fire scale bombs, the price of sulfur, or in the city of Halinsa, the prices continued to rise, and there was no way to discuss it with Soldak. The old village chief decisively sold a batch of sulfur ore, allowing Wall Village to make a lot of money in the winter. The old village chief held a lemon tea with maple syrup and took a sip while it was hot to moisten his dry throat. Then he asked Soldak, Dak, I heard that you went on a mission with the guard camp. Why are you back so soon? Luke and Charlie stared at the Soldak magic pattern structure with envy. Although they did not have this kind of magic armor, it did not mean that they did not recognize this precious magic pattern structure. Serdak nodded slightly and explained to the old village chief, The mission of the guard battalion is over. So we withdrew from there. Seeing the old village chief looking over in surprise, Serdak said, This time, I followed the guard battalion to the Maka plain to participate in the city defense battle there. The plane war went very smoothly and solved the problem there. Due to the problem, the guard battalions in each city took the lead in withdrawing. This time, I brought back a few helpers from the Maka Plain. They will join me to form a security team in the deserted land outside the Paglos Pass. The guard battalion's Captain Sauron appointed me as the captain of the security team, mainly responsible for the security issues in this area. Then will your studies at the Night Academy be affected? Old Village Chief Bright asked Serdek. Serdek replied, It will not affect my graduation certificate from the Night Academy. In fact, 
I have become a canonized knight of the Green Empire, and the fiefdom has been officially approved. I will choose the knight leader in Pussy Mountain. When Serdak said this, there was an exclamation in the room. Which volcano is your knighthood painted on in Pudu Mountain? The old village chief frowned and asked Soldak with some dissatisfaction. Serdak nodded, and he took out his knight certificate from his magic pocket. Inside the certificate was a land authorization letter, and there was an attached map on it, which clearly showed the general outline of the Pussy Mountain area. In this map, Serdak's territory is surrounded by a dotted line. Soldak spread the map on the table, gestured to the old village chief and said, To be precise, it should be the entire Pudu Mountain. I think we will increase efforts to mine the sulfur mines near Pudu Mountain. At least, we need to grab as much as possible before those salamanders eat up all the sulfur mines in the rocky area. The old village chief said with some embarrassment. Duck, that's pretty much the number of laborers in our village. And the barley sowing season is about to begin. During this period, I'm afraid, we won't be able to continue mining sulfur mines in the Pudong Mountain Rock area. Serdek waved his hand and said, I have already considered this. So this time, I came back with a group of kobold slaves. They will be the miners of the Pudu Mountain Sulfur Mine in the future. We only need to send a few supervisors to watch them. Enough. Except for the supervisors. I hope all the villagers in the village will withdraw from Pudong Mountain. In addition, I also plan to seize the time to completely build the five-level reservoir upstream of the village before the rainy season arrives. Build two drainage channels around the river bend and transform the swampland in the river bend into wheat fields. Soldak briefly stated his thoughts. And the old village chief Bright said with a sudden look on his face. Dak, it turns out that you built the reservoir not only to ensure water for the wheat fields in the village, but also to control the river bend. That tidal flat downstream? Serdak smiled at the old village chief sitting opposite and said, Currently, the rations produced by the wheat fields in the village are not enough to feed the whole village for the first half of the year. To improve this situation, of course, we need to cultivate new land around the village. The wheat fields in Bago are very limited in the areas that can be transformed. At present, only Bago grassland and Heaven Tidal Flat are suitable for transformation. It is much more difficult to open up wheat fields on Bago grassland than the Tidal Flat on Heaven. Therefore, I just want to control the Tidal Flat downstream. Hearing what Suldak said, the old village chief nodded slightly, and then asked, Dak, why don't you conquer Wall Village as your knight territory? Suldak shook his head and said, Alanza City's tax on Wall Village is already at the lowest tax point. Even if you become my knight territory, there will be no more reductions in taxation. There are at least some sulfur mines over there in Pudu Mountain. Now we can now legitimately build a mine there. But no matter what, we need the mining rights to that land. By the way, Uncle Bright, I bought some kobolds this time. They currently need some temporary homes. But they shouldn't stay here for long. Then I will organize people to send them to the sulfur mine in Pudu Mountain. Saldak said to the old village chief again, Let's go. Take me to see your kobold slave. If it doesn't work, keep it temporarily in the warehouse of the village's carpenter's workshop. Village chief Bright said, Rhea was cooking chestnut, rice and multi-grain porridge in a large pot. After Saldak asked Rita to prepare breakfast, he sent it to the river bend outside the village. Rhea readily agreed and waved the spoon in her hand to Serdak. After saying this, he and the old village chief walked out of the house. As they walked, everyone discussed the placement of the cobalt slaves. Chapter 496 Moonlight A group of villagers stared at the thousands of cobalt slaves beside the reed pond. Their eyes filled with wonder. Several local dogs in the village barked crazily at these cobalt slaves. But after barking for a while, the barking gradually weakened. The cobalt slaves dried their fur in the campfire and ate another meal of raw cassava before Andrew drove them into the dry reed pond. They pulled out the reeds with their hands and carried them out in bundles. These more than a thousand cobalt slaves probably suffered a lot under the whips of slave traders. The Nanai indigenous warriors stood on the shore holding a whip and let these cobalt slaves work honestly. The reeds and haystacks were piled up, and the villagers began to take courage and sit in the open space beside the reed pond. They first peeled off the leaves from the dry reeds and then used stone rollers to crush the reeds. Then some villagers, the villagers, who were weaving reed mats began to demonstrate to everyone. According to the old village chief's request, these mats do not need to be exquisite. It doesn't matter if they are rough, but they must be strong. Just like magic, the reed mats under the villagers gradually grew longer, and then more and more villagers joined in the process of weaving the mats. In Ware Village, almost every villager can weave reed mats. 
Some are very skilled while others are a bit rough. Of course, it doesn't matter even if it's a little bit close. Because these mats were prepared by the old village chief for these cobalt slaves. The old village chief asked people to build a row of low frames with logs next to the yellow sheep pen at the entrance of the village. And then put these woven mats were wrapped around the frame. And a row of temporary work sheds was soon erected. In early spring, the night wind in the deserted land was very cold. The old village chief felt that even if these cobalts were slaves, they should live in houses that could protect them from the wind and rain. Especially when he saw that some of the cobalt slaves were old and young. Young? Although he didn't say anything, he disagreed with Serdak's purchase of slaves. After the low work shed was built, the old village chief placed the cobalt slaves in it. He originally wanted to build a fence around the work shed, but the wood in the village's carpenter's workshop was very limited. And to build a fence, go to Oak Ridge. Just pick some branches from the forest. Helensa owns a large area of oak ridges. These oak forests belong to the territory of some nobles in the city of Helensa. The ownership of the output belongs to these nobles. However, as long as you do not steal the acorns produced and do not hunt in the oak forest, just simply picking up some dead branches, mushrooms and chestnuts, the noble master will not care about these poor villagers. A group of women in the village were squatting at the entrance of the village, processing the cassava piled in a hill. Old Sheila took little Peter and other children to sit under a dead tree at the entrance of the village, quietly watching the women wash the cassava which is very convenient. Store it in a cool place, and it won't rot even if you leave it for a few weeks. The women in the village are no strangers to cassava. During the famine years, the villagers had to eat some. Serdak called over the Nanai native Andrew, the ogre Gulitum, the half-elf archer, and the succubus Aphrodite, and introduced them to the old village chief and the young people in the village. Andrew was wearing a full metal armor and carrying two large axes behind his back. He was filled with murderous aura. At first glance, he looked like a ferocious warrior who had just walked off the battlefield. When the young people in the village faced Andrew, they couldn't even breathe. A little lighter, the half-elf archer Samira wears salamander leather armor. This tight-fitting leather armor sets off Samira's slender figure extremely gracefully. Although the half-elf archer did not lift the hood on his head, a group of young people in the village still stared blankly. However, when Serdak introduced to the old village chief that Samira had served in the defense battle of Wazimra City, Using the forest bow at his hand to kill more than 50 H. L. dogs, the young people in the village looked at Samira with fear. The succubus Aphrodite did not take off the black veil on her face, even if she did not use charm. Her beautiful face still had a fatal attraction for the villagers. In addition, Serdak introduced the succubus Aphrodite. The origin was a little vague, except that he was a homeless foreigner rescued on the battlefield. The villagers thought that the succubus Aphrodite was just like Andrew, a native of the Maka Plain. Moreover, the custom of this indigenous people is to be veiled. So no one thought that she could be a succubus. No one dared to get close to the ogre Gulitum. The ogre Gulitum was sitting on the slope beside the reed pond, looking like a mountain of meat. In order to eliminate the fear in the hearts of the villagers, Gulitum Temu took the initiative and tried to smile at the villagers, which immediately frightened a group of older children standing nearby to watch the fun and fled in all directions. One little one was so frightened that his legs became weak and he rolled and crawled on his hands and feet. Open. There is no way. The title of ogre brings great fear to the villagers. Rita carried a large barrel of grain porridge in front of the ogre. She was wearing an apron and holding a spoon in her other hand. She stood in front of the ogre and raised her red little tongue. He faced the ogre and said, Your name is Gulitum? The name of the ogre was mentioned by Serdek. The ogre nodded honestly. His eyes fell on the barrel, and saliva flowed from the corners of his mouth. These are prepared for you. I didn't expect you to be so strong. I only prepared so much chestnut porridge. Rita lifted the barrel with force and handed it to the ogre. Thank you, the ogre Gulitum said angrily. After saying that, he took the barrel with one hand, held the bottom of the barrel, opened his mouth directly, and poured a barrel of chestnut porridge into his mouth. He drank it in one breath without even chewing it carefully. The chestnut porridge entered the ogre's stomach in an instant. The ogre licked his lips with unfulfilled interest, feeling the sweetness that passed through his tongue and taste buds into his mind. In Rita's stunned eyes, he turned his head in embarrassment. The bucket was returned to Rita. Rita looked at Serdak, who had completed the task. She held up the hem of her sarong with one hand and carried the empty barrel back to the entrance of the village. She squeezed in next to Natasha and worked with the village women to deal with the pile. Cassava at the entrance of the village. 
Selina pulled little Zigna out of the village and did not get close to Suldak. Selina was the old village chief's assistant and was currently responsible for managing the village's accounts. She sewed a linen cloth for herself. Her crossbody bag contains a parchment account book, which she carries with her wherever she goes. Now she is counting the cassava at the entrance of the village. Signa was still hiding in Selina's long skirt, only occasionally sticking her head out cautiously. Soldak couldn't get away, so he waved to the two of them. In the bleak cold wind, Selina's face bloomed with a smile as bright as a tulip. Seeing Soldak, Signa had the courage to get out of Selina's skirt. She first looked at Andrew and Samira, then at the ogre lying on the withered grass slope with his head resting on his arms, and finally fell on the succubus Aphrodite, with some caution in her eyes. Luodi also noticed this little girl, but before she could take a few more glances, Soldak picked up little Signa. He took out a bag of candies from the magic waste bag and gave it to Zigna. He looked at her hair with a bunch of fine braids, and her fair little face was rosy. She no longer looked as skinny and pretty as before. So he stretched out his hand and shaved her. With her small nose, she asked, How have you been lately? Signa pushed Soldak's hand away dissatisfied, then gave Soldak a sweet smile, and said solemnly, Fortunately, Selina is always reluctant to give me meat. You have to tell her about this for me. She will listen to you. Besides, that big fish tastes great. You can bring us more next time. Okay, wait until I have time to talk to Selina. Soldak put Zigna down and asked Samira beside him. Our little Zigna wants to eat fish. Samira La, do you have any smoked fish? As a half-elf, Samira prefers L's eating habits and likes to eat fish and fruits. Now Samira's wallet is gradually bulging, and she always carries some apples and smoked fish with her. However, the half-elf archer showed his disdain unabashedly when Serdak used her dry food to coax the little girl. At night, the kobolds finally lived in a work shed surrounded by reed mats. This kind of work shed leaks air everywhere, but it is much better than sleeping on the wasteland outside by the reed pond. The work shed is very simple, with only a reed mat blocking the door, and there is no intention of locking it. The person in charge of the night watches there were two young men in the village but they were only guarding the yellow sheep pen at the entrance of the village from a distance. Judging from their intentions, it was more like they were worried that these cobalt slaves would steal the village's yellow sheep at night. The dinner of the cobalt slaves is cassava porridge cooked by the women in the village. The cassava is soaked in water for an afternoon and then boiled. The paralyzing poison is not so strong. Serdak's home is not big. He gave up his house to Samira and the succubus Aphrodite. Andrew could only set up a tent in the yard. The ogre originally wanted to live with Serdak. The cow at home was squeezed in the cowsheet and was driven directly to the yard by Soldak. As a non-staff member of the guard camp, the ogre now also has a set of large marching tents set up in the yard. It takes up almost half of the yard. Rita and little Peter slept in old Sheila's house. This was the first time that Soldak walked into Natasha and Rita's room. There were two wooden beds on the left and right sides of the room, covered with cotton sheets. They looked soft and clean except for the two beds. Outside, there was only a wooden table and a cabinet in the room. The furnishings in the room were very simple. He was sitting on the chair beside the table, and the room was filled with a faint fragrance. The door was pushed open, and Natasha walked in carrying a steaming wooden basin filled with hot water. She placed the wooden basin in front of Serdak's feet, and first carefully used a hot towel to give it to him. Serdak wiped his face and hands, and then squatted down to unbuckle Serdak's leather boots took off his boots, and let him dip his feet into the warm water basin. There was a candle lit on the wooden table. Under the dim light, Natasha lowered her head and carefully washed Soldak's feet. She was only wearing a thin pajamas, with a large area of fair skin exposed at the collar, and her hair was still a little wet. Yes, it looks like he has just taken a shower, and his body exudes a faint scent of soap locust. Looking at her fair and smooth face, Serdak leaned down and grabbed Natasha's hand. Natasha's face suddenly turned red, and neither of them spoke. Soldak lifted her up and put her on the bed, stared at her moist lips, and kissed her gently. The succubus Aphrodite turned over irritably and found that Samira across from her was not sleeping either. In the dark room, the half-elf archer's eyes were tinged with light red. Silently staring at Aphrodite, Aphrodite smiled faintly at the half-elf whose eyes were as sharp as arrows, and found out Samira was unmoved and changed to a more comfortable position but the wooden bed was too hard. So she pulled the blanket covering her body with her hands. It's been so noisy for so long that no one can sleep. 
Aphrodite complained in a low voice. Even when she was sleeping, Samira looked like a raccoon cat lying in the darkness. She curled up her body and slowly closed her light red eyes. However, the succubus Aphrodite did not. She asked Samira in a low voice. Hey, Samira, are you a little disappointed? The moonlight shone into the room through the window. Samira opened her eyes again and asked doubtfully. What? The succubus Aphrodite sat up from the bed hugging the blanket. Her long black hair hung down like a waterfall. Her body hidden under her pajamas had undulating peaks. With a narrow smile on her slightly gray face, she pointed at the moon outside the window. Looking down at the slightly desolate ridge, he said to Samira, Here, in this desolate land, I didn't expect the captain's house to be so shabby. I don't even need to look at it to know that the captain doesn't have much money. She turned her head and stared at Samira's light red eyes, raised her sexy lips slightly, and said to Samira, I heard that you followed him because he gave a large sum of money to the orphanage in Wazamala City. Now, do you regret your decision? Samira turned over, facing the ceiling. Her eyes fell on the dark roof and said in a nonchalant tone, I have received my salary for five years. What is there to be disappointed about? Now I am just fulfilling my promise. Andrew is probably in the same situation as me. Besides, do you think the captain's life will always be so embarrassing? Ha ha. Of course not. The succubus felt that Samira's gaze became a little sharp and fell on her, making her feel as if the skin on her face had been cut by a knife. Then what else is there to say? Samira closed her eyes again, and the magic patterned clothing on the bandaged arm hidden under the blanket gradually returned to calm, and said to Aphrodite, In addition, you will it's best not to confuse people in front of me. Lest one day when you are in a bad mood. I can't help but shoot you with an arrow. The fact that you can tell me this means that you won't do that. After Aphrodite finished speaking, she couldn't help but cast a fearful glance at the forest bow leaning against the wall. The room was quiet again. And the moonlight was like water. Chapter 497 returned to the territory. The night wind was a bit cold. So Soldak got up and closed the windows tightly so that the thunderous snoring of the ogre in the yard could be quieter. Is there old Sheila coughing coming from next door? Natasha lay on the bed like a lazy cat, with a hint of post-pregnancy flush on her face. Serdak lay back next to Natasha, thinking about what to do tomorrow, not feeling sleepy. Aren't you worried about those cobalt slaves running away? Natasha put her pointed chin on Soldak's solid chest and asked him softly. Serdak inserted five fingers into her disheveled hair and said with a smile. It doesn't matter if some of them run away. I didn't intend to buy so many cobalt slaves. I was worried that I wouldn't be able to raise so many cobalt slaves. I only planned to buy 200 at first. Bringing back so many cobalt slaves was a complete accident. Do you want to go into the mountains tomorrow? Natasha asked again. This was what Serdak was thinking about. After all, more than a thousand cobalts couldn't all stay in Wall Village. However, the stone hammers and chisels in the village were not sufficiently prepared. At best, they could only allow two famous cobalt slaves to start mining. To work, Serdak said. Well, I am going to send some dog heads to the rocky area of Pudu Mountain. We can't leave them in the village to eat and drink for free. I bought them back to let them work in mining. They, they are all good at mining. And I'm going to let Luke and Andrew take people with them. Andrew is the warrior carrying the axe? Natasha asked curiously, although her eyelids were so sleepy that she kept fighting. She still resisted her sleepiness and wanted to chat more with Soldak. Yes, Soldak agreed in a nasal voice, placing his hand on her back as smooth as brocade. Your subordinates are really special. The one covered in black veil, Natasha said vaguely. She spoke a little too vaguely, and Soldak didn't hear it clearly. So he asked, What? Natasha quickly closed her eyes, resting her head on his chest, feeling his strong heartbeat, and whispered, It's nothing. It's very late. I have to get up early tomorrow. Let's get some sleep. The next morning, Selina followed the old village chief to the cobalt slave's shed at the entrance of the village early, and found that the cobalts were sleeping soundly on the straw mat. The old village chief and Selina carefully counted them from beginning to end. Twice, I found that none of these cobalt slaves escaped. Not long after, the village woman who came over to make breakfast for these cobalt slaves hurried over carrying a wooden basin and a cauldron. The old village chief Bright stood at the entrance of the village and scolded these lazy women. It was obviously a little late to make breakfast at this time. Soldak brought Andrew and others to the entrance of the village. Andrew personally got into the work shed, selected 200 stronger cobalts 
from the group of cobalt slaves and asked them to line up alone. Two hundred cobalts lined up in a long queue and boarded four carriages parked at the entrance of the village. During this trip to Pussy Mountain, in addition to all the members of the Sertak security team, Luke also brought five young villagers. Luke and the five villagers will stay in the rocky area of Pussy Mountain to act as two hundred dog leaders. Overseer of Human Slaves After this winter, these young people have learned to ride horses. So even if the cobalt slaves in the rocky area rebel, as long as they have enough safety awareness, they can mount their horses and evacuate in time. Serdak repeatedly emphasized to Luke, these cobalt slaves will be fine no matter what. The five villagers brought to the rocky area must return safely. These overseers will rotate every month, as will the cobalt slave miners. In addition to these cobalt slaves, there were also two large carts of cassava. After all, they did not wait for the late breakfast. There were six four-wheeled carriages in the group. Serdak took Andrew, Samira and Afro, six villagers, including Dee and Luke, rode ten horses and left Wall Village facing the rising sun, heading towards Pussy Mountain along the desolate land. The ogre Gulitum threw off his big feet, followed the team slowly, entering the depths of the desolate land and seeing the exposed gravel and rock Gobi. You can truly feel the desolation here. Aphrodite looked at the surrounding scenery with her veil covered, riding on horseback, squinting her eyes to feel the warm sunshine. Suldak introduced this desolate mountain range to Andrew and Samira. When he mentioned that this was the area under the jurisdiction of their security team, Andrew couldn't help complaining. This is in the hinterland of the Empire. And only the only people who can appear here are some small force bandit groups are probably not willing to set foot in such a desolate place. So our security team will really have a leisurely mission in the future. Last summer, a small bandit group entered this deserted land. Our security group was established precisely to deal with the bandit group last summer. Soldek explained to Andrew. When passing a pile of rocks, Samira suddenly grabbed the forest bow from the saddle. She didn't even see how she opened the hunting bow. Nor did she see the arrow on the bow's string. She just heard a burst of sound from the bow's string. With a buzzing sound, a white wind blade carried an arrow and flew out from the center of the hunting bow. The arrow plunged into a piece of gray rock with a bang. And the loose gray rock suddenly exploded. A gray rock iguana that was secretly basking in the sun under the rock was pierced by an arrow. The arrow was stuck in the rock crevice, where the two-foot-long gray rock iguana kept twisting its body. The ogre cheered, ran up with great strides, picked up the gray rock iguana, and pulled it directly from the arrow. He grabbed the plump gray rock iguana in his hand, and without thinking, he opened it the big mouth bit the iguana's head in one bite, and then pulled the iguana's head off, making a crunching sound. Then, the ogre showed an extremely wonderful expression on his face, danced and waved the headless gray rock iguana in his hand at Serdek, and shouted indistinctly, Captain! This big guy it tastes really good. Serdak held his forehead with one hand and said to the ogre speechlessly, I said you should roast it before eating it. The ogre's expression was also very exciting. He laughed stupidly and said, I forgot about it when I was excited. Fortunately, I didn't eat much. I still have time to bake now. After saying that, he pulled out the arrow from the gray rock iguana, rubbed the blood on the arrow on his thigh, and handed the arrow to the half-elf archer. Samira, your arrow. Samira looked at the bloody arrow in the ogre's hand with disgust, turned her face away, did not reach out to take it, and just said lightly, I'll give it to you. Good. The ogre Gulitum retracted his hand happily and used his feather arrows to string up the soft gray rock iguana again. Three days later, the team successfully arrived at the rocky area at the foot of Pudu Mountain. There were also several stone houses built by the villagers of Wall Village last year. Except for being covered with volcanic ash. Everything else remained unchanged. Obviously, almost no one came here. Luke only needs to cover these roofless stone houses with tarpaulins later. And it will be considered as a simple stone house. The cobalt slaves looked at the pustule mountain that was billowing smoke not far away. And finally there was some light in their eyes. Some cobalt slaves even jumped out of the four-wheeled carriage and couldn't help but throw themselves into the volcanic ash and beat a few. Get out and let the fur on your body be covered with volcanic ash. Chapter 498 Knight's Territory Monument This time Serdak led the team into Pudu Mountain. In addition to carrying a large amount of cassava, the carriage also carried some reed mats, sunshade cloth and other supplies. Luke led several young villagers to put a reed mat on a low wall surrounded by stones which became the simplest work shed. 
He also covered it with a layer of black shading cloth to block the flying volcanic ash in the work shed. In addition, if you inhale a large amount of volcanic ash into your lungs, you will get a lung disease that is difficult to cure. At first, the villagers who were mining sulfur mines in the rocky area all wore scarves. Later, when Selena came to the sulfur mine in the rocky area, she saw that the villagers had to cover their faces with scarves even when they were sleeping. I suggested to the old village chief that the tent should be covered with a shade cloth that can block volcanic ash, so that at least you don't have to cover your face when sleeping at night. Later, the mining villagers used stones to build several roofless work sheds, and those low tents gradually became unusable. Serdak led 200 cobalt slaves into the mine in the rocky area. These work sheds can be used after a little tidying up, and this time, they also brought reed mats and spread them in the work sheds. The living conditions have changed compared to last autumn. Much better. The scariest thing here in Pussy Mountain is water. But since the magic scroll of water gathering, this problem has been solved. The most difficult thing is the natural environment here. With volcanic ash flying all over the sky, rivers of lava flowing freely, and occasionally encountering fire-based monsters such as salamanders, making this place full of dangers. Only locals like Luke know that on the pustules the flames in the crater have been burning for nearly a hundred years. But it has never erupted. Only rivers of lava occasionally flow from the top of the mountain. The cobalt slaves sat quietly in the work shed. These cobalts had fluffy hair and had little communication with each other. They sat silently on the reed mat. They would only go to the bucket at the door of the work shed when they wanted to drink water. After drinking, they would will sit back down again. Seeing that the mining area had settled down, and worried that Luke and the five villagers would not be able to suppress the 200 cobalt slaves. Soldak asked Andrew to stay. The biggest shortage here in the sulfur mine is not food, but water. Serdak handed a water-gathering magic rune board to Luke. This metal magic rune board consumes magic crystal fragments when operating. As long as the magic crystal fragments are replaced in time after the magic crystal fragments are exhausted, this will a magic rune board can be used continuously. In addition, Serdak also gave Luke two magical scrolls of water gathering in case of emergency. The magic metal rune plate and magic scroll were bought in the magic shop in Benna City before he went to the Maka Plane. In the Maka Plane, the plane war ended in just a few times. After handling these matters, Serdak took Samira, Gulitum and Aphrodite and left the sulfur mine in the rocky area, looking at the volcano standing in front of us like a black chimney. The top of the mountain is covered with dense gray clouds and thick smoke. Rivers of dark red lava flow down from the mountain. But when it reaches the mountainside, the surface slowly cools, forming layers of ash, rock crust and lava undercurrents. The surface of this kind of underground lava river is covered with a layer of black and shiny stone SH. L. It looks very hard. But in some places the hard SH. L has just formed. Once you step into it, it will easily collapse and break, causing your feet to sink into the lava. Very dangerous standing next to a lava underground river. It is the sulfur mine in a large rocky area of the diverted lava underground river. Captain, did you choose the night leader here? The elf archer, with his face covered with a thick scarf, asked Serdak with some confusion. Well, although the land here is barren, there is a large open pit sulfur mine. As long as these sulfur mines are transported out of here, the lives of the whole village can be changed. Serdak led the horse forward a few steps. Step forward pointing to the rocky area that suddenly appeared in front of him, and said to Samira and the others, Aphrodite stood on a raised black rock. She gently lifted the black gauze on her face and smiled at Soldak. If I hadn't hiked through it, I would have thought I was back in H. L. Serdak put his hands on his forehead and said to his men, This place is actually not as bad as it looks. These rivers of lava can flow into the abandoned land with a little guidance. Only the volcanic ash here is more troublesome to deal with. Serdak led the members of the security team to leave the sulfur mine in the rocky area and spent nearly a week following the areas marked on the sheepskin map to set up 29 boundary monuments on the edge of the knight's territory. These boundary monuments were basically he collected materials from the ground, found some eye-catching giant rocks, painted eye-catching arrows on them with white tree pulp and lime powder, and wrote the words, Soldak Knight's Collar, under the giant rocks. The northern part of Putu Mountain is connected to the Paglos Mountains, and part of the area passes through the peak of the volcano. It is not possible to erect a boundary marker there yet. But no matter what, the boundary monument of the Knight's territory has finally been erected. Within the boundary monument is the land of Serdak. 
the canonization of knights is not hereditary, which means that during Serdak's lifetime, this place belongs to Serdak. Due to the barren land, Serdak's knighthood was much larger than the ordinary knighthood. After erecting the boundary monument, he suddenly found that he had such a large area of land, and Serdak's heart was full of mixed feelings. Let's go back to the Luanchishan mining area. Soldak said to all his men, Captain, are we going to patrol here in the future to maintain law and order? On the way back to the sulfur mine in the rocky area, the ogre Gulitum asked uneasily. Serdak pulled the horse's reins and stopped. The volcanic ash in this area was almost a foot thick. It was very difficult for both the ogre and the ancient bolai horse to walk on it. He even considered buying some camels. Serdak thought for a while and said, Most of the time not. The area we are mainly responsible for is the dozen or so natural villages near Wall Village to prevent bandit groups from plundering and attacking the villagers there. As for my knight leadership here, I don't think there will be any bandit group who can't think of coming here. The ogre Gulitum breathed a sigh of relief when Serdak said this, patted his chest and said, Oh, that's good. The environment here is really terrible. When they returned to the sulfur mine, the second supply team from Wall Village had just arrived at the mine. Luke was standing in the carriage of a truck, directing dozens of cobalt slaves to carry cassava, scones, and some other items into the warehouse. Gone Kai. This group of cobalt slaves are obviously in much better condition than a week ago. Perhaps it is because they are full. The fur all over their bodies appears to be very smooth, although their movements are slower. No one is lazy. You can't rest until you finish unloading the last load of cassava. Luke shouted at the top of his lungs. Whoever moves the most will get a bran cake as a dinner reward. The cobalt slaves walked out of the rocky area one after another carrying rotan baskets on their backs and recorded the quantity of sulfur or delivered at the temporary warehouse. Then they put down the rotan baskets and joined the unloading army. In order to prevent this group of cobalt slaves from being lazy, Luca stipulated that these cobalt slaves must dig a certain amount of sulfur or before they are eligible for dinner. Obviously, these cobalt slaves have rich mining experience and can complete their daily tasks on time. Even in places where villagers have dug, cobalt slaves will re-excavate some sulfur mines. Dak, I discovered that these cobalts are naturally a group of miners. It won't be long before we can completely hollow out this area. Luke said to Soldak with excitement. He took Soldak to see the harvest of the past week. A large pile of sulfur or was piled outside Luke's residence. Like a hill, the four-wheeled trucks that had unloaded food supplies all gathered here. A group of cobalt slaves were loading sulfur or into the carriages. They seemed much more agile. Each cobalt slave looked good. At least the numb and empty eyes were restored. A glimmer of brilliance was restored. When I return to Wall Village, I will return to Helensa City to complete my further studies. The cobalt here will be managed by you. Be careful. If anything goes wrong, you must abandon this place decisively. Everything will be done after I come back. Don't be brave. Serdak glanced at the towering Pussy Mountain, and he was a little worried about the salamanders that might emerge from the mountain at any time. Luke didn't care much, and said to Soldak confidently, I know. I will manage these cobalts well. Dark. When it was dinner time, Luke and his team became cooks again. Two villagers carried a large pot and poured the cassava porridge cooked in it into a large wooden barrel. Luke stood with a spoon in his hand. Behind the big wooden barrel, a group of cobalt slaves lined up in a long line. Each cobalt slave had a large wooden bowl in his hand. Luke put a spoonful of cassava porridge into the bowl. Another villager, he even grabbed a piece of salty radish from another large wooden basin and gave it to the cobalts. Andrew walked up to Serdak at this time. And Serdak asked him, Have these cobalts been so honest these days? It's been like this all the time. Andrew wore a thick scarf around his neck. He didn't wear any armor on his upper body. He had a bare bronze upper body and wore a pair of trousers. His outfit was as unique as he wanted. Serdak patted Andrew on the shoulder and said, Tomorrow we will return to Wall Village. You, Samira, Gulitum and I will return to Aranza City. We have to rush back to the guard camp to report. What about here? Andrew asked a little uneasily. Leave it to Luke to manage for the time being, Soldak said decisively. Early the next morning, Serdak and a group of members of the security team left together with a four-wheeled carriage filled with sulfur, or, and returned to Wall Village. When we passed the Bago grassland, we saw a large patch of never-dying of thirst growing on the bank where the last pool of water at the bottom of the ditch was. This is the most common weed in this desolate land, except for the yellow sheep. 
All other livestock don't eat this weed that is full of thorns and doesn't have many leaves. Sure enough, on the side of the Bago grassland, Soldak found a group of yellow sheep in the village and a half-year-old child lying on the sunny slope with his eyes closed and basking in the sun. Aphrodite looked at the pasture with great interest. Since leaving the range of Pussy Mountain, her mood has improved again. At the river bend downstream, a large group of cobalt slaves are busy digging a river channel. According to Soldak's idea, if you want to control this large tidal flat in the lower reaches of the river bend, you must dig an artificial canal next to the tidal flat. Only only by diverting the abundant rainwater that gathers here from both sides of the valley during the rainy season can the large tidal flats here become fertile farmland. The end of this artificial canal is a large naturally formed fissure, which is more than 10 miles away from Wall Village. Two slopes have to be dug in the middle. It is not that the old village chief Bright has never thought about managing this tidal flat. However, the project was too heavy, and they had to give up midway. Now Serdak suddenly brought back more than a thousand cobalt slaves, except for 200 cobalts, who were sent to the sulfur mine at the foot of Pussy Mountain. The rest of the cobalt slaves were all killed by the old man. The village chief decisively invested in the project of digging artificial canals. When Serdak and his party returned to Wall Village, 800 cobalts had dug out nearly 2 kilometers of artificial water channels in the river bend. This section was the easiest section to dig, because of the large amount of silt and sand. It will be more difficult to get to the back, especially the two slopes we pass through. There are almost limestone layers under our feet. I am afraid we will have to use chisels and hammers to dig them out bit by bit. In fact, Serdak had other ideas. He was wondering whether to make black gunpowder. He still knew the basics of nitrate, disulfide and charcoal. It is said that alchemical potions similar to black powder once appeared in the Hextech era. However, with the demise of the goblin era, the black powder was not passed down. If this thing was used to blow up the river, it would probably be much easier to open the river. However, although the Green Empire does not have black powder, it does have another alternative. Fire scale bullets. When he was guarding Wazamala City, Serdak had also seen the power of this fire scale bullet. Like a Molotov cocktail filled with gasoline, it is lit and thrown out, and then explodes with a bang, causing a huge spark to fly and everything touched by the fire scale bomb will burn. Whether it is fire scale bullets or the development of black powder, Soldak feels that such professional matters should be completed by professionals. After returning to the city of Aranza, he plans to find an opportunity to meet Scholar Ferdinand. Maybe he I will give myself some good suggestions. Maybe I will be inspired by myself and develop black gunpowder directly. It's better to keep the formula of this kind of killer weapon in your own hands. Soldak thought. The entrance of Wall Village has become a lively market. Four-wheeled trucks from some carriage shops have brought in a lot of cassava. The quantity far exceeds Soldak's expectation. Now the old village chief has built five cassava at the entrance of the village. Large warehouses. Each warehouse is almost full of cassava. These cassava are probably enough for these cobalt slaves to eat for two or three months. However, there are still some four-wheeled carriages loaded with cassava at the mountain pass. They continue to drive from the city of Alanza and bring a large amount of cassava. The old village chief, Bright, was sitting on a chair with a sad face. He was surrounded by a group of businessmen. There were more than a dozen horse-drawn carriages piled with cassava around him. Selena was standing behind the old village chief holding an account book. It seems that the atmosphere of the negotiation is not very good. Chapter 499 Potions or Alchemy There are many mountains around the city of Valenza, and patches of oak forests produce gold and silver acorns. However, the oak forests are also mixed with chestnut trees, cassava trees, wild autumn pear trees, and some hardwood trees. Chestnut trees are also called tree trees. Rice is one of the most important winter storage foods for villagers in nearby mountainous areas in autumn. When many wheat fields reduce production, mountain people near barren lands will go into the mountains in autumn to collect a large number of wild chestnuts to survive the long winter. The main reason why cassava is not accepted by the mountain people is that it has a certain degree of toxicity. Even if the cassava is cut into small pieces and soaked in water, it is difficult to completely extract the paralyzing toxins. After eating it, not only will the mouth become swollen, and can also cause abdominal pain and other conditions. Serdak brought more than a thousand cobalt slaves from Benna City. These cobalt slaves need to eat at least 3,000 pounds of cassava every day. Therefore, when the coachman brought the first batch of cassava, Serdak let them continue to purchase cassava in the free market of Halinsa City, and transport it to Dewal village. 
Serdak promised that the purchase price of each cart of cassava would be no less than 20 silver. This was big business for the carriage house, which was experiencing a slump in transportation in the spring. Of course, the 12 coachmen would not let go of this good opportunity to make money. The day after returning to Alinsa City, the 12 coachmen arrived at Wall Village with 12 carts of cassava. The old village chief, Brett Satamura, had a sum of money that he had saved from several sulfur or transactions with the White Elephant Trading Company during the winter. And he happened to use it to pay the settlement commission for purchasing cassava. By the time Serdak returned to Wall Village, two weeks had passed since the cobalt slaves arrived at Wall Village. Within just two weeks, twelve four-wheeled carriages drove between the city of Halanza and Wall Village. After five trips back and forth, the cassava delivered by these twelve four-wheeled carriages alone allowed the old village chief, Bright, to build three large warehouses at the entrance of the village. But after the third batch of cassava was transported to a village, other coachmen in Halenza City learned the news. And they also bought cassava in the free market in the city and transported it to a village until Serdak returned to a village. So far in Air Village, the old village chief has built five large warehouses at the entrance of the village. Although the old village chief has sent a message to the carriage house to suspend the purchase of cassava, there is still a steady stream of four-wheeled carriages filled with cassava arriving in the village. Seeing these mountains of cassava, the old village chief Bright was dumbfounded and wanted to reject the cassava. However, the group of carriage drivers begged the old village chief that it was not easy to reach Wall Village with a full cart of cassava. I would rather keep the cassava here at a discount. The old village chief, Brett, was wondering whether he should collect these cassava. He felt someone secretly tugging at the corner of his clothes. He turned his head and glanced at Selena behind him. Selena looked towards the bago pasture, with a fiery light in his eyes. The old village chief followed Selena's gaze and saw a convoy slowly walking towards Wall Village. The knight at the front was Serdek. He pulled the horse's reins and waved to the old village chief. In the dusk, the old village chief stood up holding his chair a relief smile blooming on his wrinkled old face. Dak, you're back! The old village chief shouted to Suldak in a loud voice. Serdak jumped off the horse, and the ancient Bolai horse neighed. Leading the ancient Bolai horse, Serdak walked quickly towards the old village chief. The ogre Gulitam followed Serdak like a mountain of flesh, attracting the attention of many villagers and carriage drivers, while Aphrodite and Samira behind the team were ignored by everyone. Seeing many four-wheeled carriages stranded here, Saldak stepped forward and asked the old village chief, Uncle Bright, why are there so many carriages here? The old village chief Bright told Saldak the whole story. Then the old village chief said, There is nothing else, except that we have purchased so much cassava at once, and there are so many carriages filled with cassava waiting here. I am worried that the cobalt slaves will not be able to finish it. It's all over the mountain. I don't think we need to waste so much on acquiring it. Dak, why don't we collect less and let them pull back the rest? Serdak looked at the long line of four-wheeled carriages at the entrance of the village and said decisively to the old village chief Bright, Take it, Uncle Bright. Let's take all these cassava. The village chief Bright wiped his forehead with a handkerchief and shouted to the young villager standing next to Okura, Val, you guys come here and continue to weigh these cassava. All these cassava are weighed. Selene Na, you are responsible for calculating the weight of these cassava and how many silver coins we will spend. Okay. Uncle Bright! Several young villagers shouted. The carriage drivers at the entrance of the village originally thought they were going to bring the cassava back to Alensa City intact. Everyone gathered together to discuss countermeasures. When they saw that the old village chief was finally willing to relent and agreed to continue the purchase, they hurriedly ran back. Your own magic caravan. Lined up and waiting to be weighed. While the old village chief turned around, Soldak winked at Selena, who was standing behind the old village chief, and said H low quietly. Selena stood there holding the sheepskin account book, with a delicate and pretty face. When she turned around, she avoided the old village chief and gave Soldak a roll of her eyes. Her expression was extremely charming. The old village chief Bright approached Soldak, lowered his voice, and asked mysteriously, Dak, I know you have some ideas. Tell me what you need me to do for you. Soldak pressed his forehead with his hand. He actually thought of a way to remove the poison from cassava but he didn't know whether this method would work. He said to the old village chief Bright, I just have some ideas. Until now, I still don't know if it's possible. Uncle Bright really needs your intervention in this matter. I need some water tanks and wooden buckets. I can just move them to the village's usual laundry sink. Oh, by the way, please ask some women in the village to help. 
Village Chief Bright also has a resolute character. When Saldek said this, he immediately agreed. I will do it now. After saying that, he turned around and walked towards the village. Okay, Uncle Bright. Saldek followed and walked toward the village together. Selina took advantage of the old village chief not paying attention. Came over and asked Saldek in a low voice. What on earth are you doing? You'll find out when you wait and see. Saldek said with a smile to Selina. At this time, the young villager who was responsible for bearing the cassava shouted to Selina with no expression. Selina, 1,057 pounds. Hurry up and record it. Selina glanced at Soldek, held up the hem of her long fur skirt, turned around and walked back angrily. Aphrodite looked at Selina's back with curiosity as she turned away, with a faint smile on her face. Serdak turned to the ogre behind him and ordered, Gulitem, help me get some cassava here. There were several large boxes next to the cassava pile. The ogre easily carried a wooden box of cassava on his shoulders, followed Soldak as he walked towards the village, and asked him naively, Captain, what shall we have for dinner? He simply didn't want to eat the cassava in the box. When Soldak saw the herd of yellow sheep being driven back from the bago pasture by two and a half year old children, he smiled at the ogre and said, Let you try our sheep soup in Wall Village tonight. Oh, mutton soup. Gulitem likes to drink mutton soup. The ogre immediately grinned happily when he heard that he was not eating these mouth-numbing cassava. On the bank of the creek not far from the carpentry workshop, there is a natural pool. The women in the village usually wash their clothes here. In summer, the children in the village also bathe in this pool. There are also some pavements next to the pool. Slate. Even if the river has stopped flowing, there is still a pool full of clear water here. Serdak asked the ogre Gulitem to place the large wooden box of cassava by the pool first. Several women in the village were chatting and squatting by the pool to wash clothes. Suddenly, they saw an ogre walking from the village carrying a large wooden box. They were so frightened that they picked up the wooden basin and ran away, secretly stealing as they ran. Look back. Samira and Aphrodite looked at the poor village curiously. Serdak pointed to the uppermost reaches of the village and said, Let's go. I'll take you up there to have a look. The village's water reservoir project has resumed work, and the river has been completely cut off. Four-wheeled carriages are loaded with volcanic ash, driving along the village's main road towards the upper reaches of the village. Serdak led members of the security team come to the reservoir in the village. With the completion of the first-level reservoir and the construction of the water gate, the village's horse-drawn carriages continued to pull volcanic ash and lime powder to the construction site. The shape of the second-level reservoir is completely surrounding the first-level reservoir. It has been expanded by 10 meters. The terrain here is obviously nearly 2 meters lower than the first level reservoir. More than 50 bricklayers are smoothing the ground with cement. The foundation part of the second level reservoir has been completed and is just waiting. After the ground is ready, construction begins. At this time, Rita, Natasha, and several women in the village were cooking dinner for the bricklayers on the construction site. Serdak stood on the embankment of the first level reservoir pointed to a large piece of land downstream of the reservoir and introduced to Andrew, Samira, Aphrodite, and Gulitem. The next step is here. Three more stepped reservoirs need to be built to increase the water storage capacity on the upstream side. Affected by the climate and monsoon, Halensa City is dry and has little rain in spring. But in midsummer, abundant rainfall can easily form. There is water logging. So we built a reservoir here. And the water in the reservoir can irrigate some wheat fields downstream of the village to cope with this dry season. Half-elf archer Samira asked Serdak a little strangely. Since there is abundant rainfall here in summer, why is it still so deserted? Serdak pondered for a moment before saying, The geological feature of this deserted land is that it is covered with highly permeable limestone rock formations. Rainwater can easily seep into the ground. In addition, there is a lack of fertile soil for plant growth and the dry season happens to be with all things in the late spring and early summer when they are growing. Many plants cannot survive on this land. Only some thorn grass and thirsty grass can survive. Only some valleys with water sources can show a trace of vitality. Except for Wall Village. In addition, there are more than a dozen villages near here that are almost like this. Except for the main plain of Roland Continent. Nowhere else can compare to Wazamala. Andrew muttered to the side. But this is precisely the most important thing. Aphrodite countered, standing next to Andrew. The indigenous warrior's lips moved, but in the end, he couldn't think of any suitable words to say back. At this time, a young man ran up the embankment panting and shouted to Soldek. Dak, Uncle Bright is ready. 
I'll be there right away. Zoldak waved to the young man. He did not take the members of the security team directly back to the village pool, but took a detour to the stone roller in the village threshing floor and asked the ogre Gulitem to lift the base of the stone roller directly. And Andrew carried the top. Dinianzi then returned to the pool, under the surprised eyes of the villagers. The ogre placed the nearly thousand pound stone mill base by the pool, and then helped Andrew rearrange the stone mill. The old village chief Bright had moved eight large water tanks and collected dozens of wooden barrels. These wooden barrels almost filled the stone platform beside the pool. A group of village women were frightened when they saw the ogre. His face was pale, and his legs were weak. After being scolded by the old village chief Bright, his mood stabilized. Dak, what should we do? The old village chief Bright came up and asked Soldek. Uncle Bright, this process is not difficult. You just need to watch what we do. Soldek said to the old village chief. After saying that, Soldek asked Andrew to place the cassava in the box on the stone roller. The ogre Gulitem pushed the stone roller, crushing the crispy radish-like cassava to a pulp, making it look like mud. The milky white cassava juice flowed into the barrel along the stone trough and soon filled the barrel. Then Soldak spread a piece of coarse linen cloth on the water jar and then poured the barrel of white pulp into the barrel. Enter the water tank and add two buckets of clean water to the water tank. In this way, Gulitem and Andrew crushed all the cassava in a wooden box into white pulp. After filtering the white pulp, they mixed it with a large amount of clean water and put it into a water tank and let it stand. The old village chief led a group of women in the village to watch silently. No one could figure out what Serdak was doing by squeezing the cassava juice. Soon the water in the first water tank became clear and transparent. Serdak asked Samira to scoop out the clear water in the water tank until there was only a thick layer of white slurry at the bottom of the water tank. He filled in two more buckets of water and stirred the white slurry vigorously, then waited for the slurry in the water tank to become clear. After repeating this three times, Serdak collected the mushy white slurry in a wooden bucket. The old village chief came up with a frown, looked at the two barrels of white pulp that had settled after consuming a whole wooden box of cassava, and asked Serdak, Dak, is this potion science or alchemy? This thing, what is it called? Soldak rubbed his temples vigorously and introduced to the old village chief Bright. Now we can call them water starch. After they dry, they become starch. This thing not only removes the water starch from the cassava, but it is not toxic. But it is also quite delicious to eat. I also know how to cook this kind of food. People there call this kind of food stew dot. Chapter 500 Night in the Mountain Village The setting sun is almost setting on the ridge. And dusk is approaching. After a busy day, the villagers rushed back to the village one after another. The cobalt slaves on the riverbank tidal flat also returned to the work shed at the entrance of the village. The five large steamers placed in front of the work shed at the entrance of the village were steaming with steam. Opening the top steamer, it was filled with steamed buns mixed with a large amount of cassava, a small amount of wheat bran and miscellaneous grains, and paired with a bowl of salty vegetable soup. The taste made these cobalts digging in the riverbed. I almost bit my tongue. Obviously, the cobalt slaves probably haven't eaten such delicious food for a long time. The food at the reservoir construction site is obviously much better than the food of the cobalt slaves. Scones and multigrain porridge with some pickled salted vegetables are what most villagers outside the mountain pass eat in the spring when there is food shortage everywhere. The best meal you can have. The bricklayers who made a fortune in where village last year couldn't wait to leave the villages when the permafrost melted. And they pushed forward the second phase of the reservoir project by half a month. The villagers of Wall Village gather in the village square. Every time a bonfire dinner is held, the whole village gathers here to wait for a bowl of fragrant mutton soup. Two large iron pots were set up in the square in the center of the village. Five skinned and washed yellow sheep were placed on the wooden piers and chopped into pieces. The cooks poured the pots of mutton into the boiling iron pot, with almost nothing added to the pot except a little bit of herbs and green onions. The aroma of the broth can waft far away. In the past, this kind of bonfire dinner would only kill one sheep at a time. Since the village has monopolized the Bago grassland and the sulfur mine in the Pudong Mountain Rock area, the village has become rich. And every dinner will meet with the old village chief. Bright asked the butcher to kill two more sheep. The number of sheep this time was five. One was to catch the wind for Serdak. And the other was specially prepared for the ogre ghoul item. Selina is the best at cooking mutton soup in the village. Selina is responsible for cooking the mutton soup at every campfire dinner. She wears an apron and stands beside the big iron pot still looking graceful and graceful. Her daughter Zigna is obedient as usual. 
she squatted beside the big iron pot, eagerly waiting for the plump yellow mutton in the soup pot. But Zygna was no longer the skinny little girl last year. After a winter of nourishment, her little face turned red. Compared with other children in the village, Zygna is much quieter. She doesn't like to play with children of her own age and often hides under Selena's skirt. Signa turned her head and glanced at Soldak, who was standing by the stove not far away, and blinked with her big eyes. She doesn't understand what kind of delicious food a knight can cook. With Rhea's help, Soldak put on an apron and stood next to an iron pot. Villagers were crowded around the iron pot. Even Rita and Natasha crowded in a crowd of onlookers and looked at Sue with curiosity. In Erdak, the village women were whispering to each other, their eyes full of doubts wondering what kind of delicious food could be made from this white juice extracted from cassava. The boiling water in the pot keeps churning. Soldak poured the water starch into the boiling water, and then used a large wooden spoon to stir it in the iron pot until the water starch in the iron pot became a thick and translucent paste. With Andrew's help, he removed the large iron pot from the stove. Soldak believes that the most indispensable thing for food to become gourmet is to have a beautiful story. He put the big iron pot into the stone trough filled with water, and said to the surrounding villagers, When I was serving in the military in the Warsaw Plain, I once visited a seaside town. The people there were not only good at cooking, but seafood, and also know how to extract this white starch from plant rhizomes to make a variety of delicious foods. When I returned to Wall Village this time, I thought that maybe cassava could do the same. It seems like it should be done so far. It's considered a success. The next step is to cool down, and you have to wait for a while before you can taste this delicious food. Do you want to soak it in cold water to cool it down? Rita asked Serdak, standing in the crowd. She was probably asking on behalf of the village women around her. Those village women now dare not ask questions to a night lord casually. Yeah. Soldak nodded to Rita and replied. After the stew in the iron pot had cooled down a bit, Serdak used the peeling team to cut the stew into one-inch square cubes. The cooked dough needed to be fried again before it would be ready. Eat. Serdak wiped some mutton oil on the pan and placed the square stew side by side on the pan. After frying all six sides until brown, he sprinkled some chopped herbs in sauce. That kind of the scent spreads instantly. Of course, it was impossible for Serdak to cook enough in the iron pot to feed the whole village. So he chose the children in the village to eat first. He put the stews full of sauce into small wooden bowls. Looking at those pairs of eyes full of expectation, Soldak felt that he was suddenly touched by the softest place in his heart. Among these children, there were little Peter and Signa, looking at the corners of their mouths, with the sauce on his face and his eyes full of wonder at the delicious food. Soldak felt that his heart was completely melted. Selina looked at Soldak's profile with a focused expression as he bent over and distributed the food to the children with a spatula, and suddenly felt that her heart was filled to the brim. It turns out that in this way, the toxins in cassava can be completely removed, and the starch in cassava can also be extracted. The conversation at the dinner party suddenly turned to the subject of cassava. Subsequently, the old village chief Bright issued a sealing order on the refining and extraction methods of cassava. Anyone who dares to leak this refining and extraction method out of Wall Village will be charged with embezzling the private property of Knight Serdek, and will become the enemy of the entire village. Village chief Bright stood on the big rock in the center of the village and warned a group of Wall villagers who were holding large wooden bowls, drinking mutton soup and eating wheat cakes with great solemnity. Tomorrow, let the coachman in the carriage house transport more wheat bran and feed the cassava to these cobalt slaves. It is simply a waste of food. The old village chief Bright said to Charlie beside him. Charlie was speechless at his father's duplicitous words. Mayor Bright decided that night that starting from tomorrow, the village will refine and extract cassava starch in large quantities. Regardless of whether the cassava starch becomes one of the main foods in the village or is sold to the city, as long as this set of refining and extraction of cassava starch is if the starch method is not leaked. There will be huge profits. After the dinner party, Serdak returned home early with the ogres, half-elves, indigenous warriors, and succubi. People in the village are a little afraid of the ogre Gulitum, and they will unconsciously stay away from him when they see him. For the ogre Gulitum, who likes to be reasonable, he does not know that the villagers are so xenophobic. Will his emotions hit him? And he may feel a little disappointed? Some young people in the village wanted to see Samira's face hidden under the hood. So they always approached Samira intentionally or unintentionally. Serdak was worried that Samira was impatient and shot out an arrow. It didn't end well. As for Aphrodite, Serdak knew that her magic power had not been lost. 
he was really worried that this descendant of the demon clan could not help but secretly charm a few villagers, which would cause disharmony in their families, and it would be very troublesome. Compared to others, Andrew integrates well into the villagers. Little Peter likes chatting with Andrew and begs Andrew to teach him fighting skills. Of course, it was difficult for Andrew to refuse Little Peter's request. So the indigenous warrior Andrew stood in the yard, holding a big axe in his hand and teaching Little Peter some simple fighting skills. For this indigenous warrior with the bears or soul, there is no doubt that offense is the best defense. This is obviously completely opposite to Serdak's theory about the shield warrior's fighting skills. But I believe Little Peter this great probably can't understand this either. What he needs most now is to lay a good foundation. Old Sheila sat at the door and watched Andrew teach Little Peter. With eager eyes in her eyes, Samira took an apple and soaked in the big wooden bucket in the bathroom with Aphrodite. The climate in Wazimra City was not that dry, and she had been out for nearly half a month. A knight's collar was erected on Pussy Mountain. There is no chance to take a shower at the boundary marker, which is simply unbearable for Samira, who loves cleanliness. The succubus Aphrodite and Samira were crowded together. When she lived in the H, L world, she rarely had a bath for several years. Now that she has the opportunity to enjoy it, she can't wait to sleep in the bathtub directly. Gulitam ate a whole yellow sheep tonight, drank a large pot of sheep soup, and his belly was round. He lay in the cow sheet next to the wall and slept better than anyone else. The cows in old Sheila's house where he squeezed outside the cow sheet, lay aside and chewed cud silently silently staring at the ogre in the cowsheed, with a trace of drool hanging from the corner of his mouth. Serdak took the opportunity to get rid of everyone and sneak out of the yard. He will return to Alensa city tomorrow. He wants to say goodbye to Selena tonight. This time when he returns to Wall Village. The two of them haven't had a good conversation yet. Selena folded her apron, handed over the finishing work such as cleaning the iron pots to several village women, and then pulled Signa out of the village square, becoming the assistant and secretary to Mayor Bright. Selena's status in Wall Village has been significantly improved. Now no one in the village dares to talk about her behind her back with cold words. She knows that all this is because there was Serdak standing behind her. It was this man who suddenly walked up to her during her most difficult days, stretched out his strong and strong hand to her, and pulled her out of nightmares and fears. Selena lowered her head, thinking about the past in her mind as she walked. When she reached the entrance of the courtyard, she saw Soldak sitting under the chestnut tree. Why are you here? Selina ran to Soldak with a face of surprise, pushing open the courtyard door. Selina pulled Soldak into the courtyard. The two of them didn't care about the feelings of little Cygna standing aside, and hugged each other tightly until Selina felt a little suffocated, and the two separated. At this time, Serdak held Selina's fair face and whispered, I will return to Helensa City tomorrow and rush to the guard camp to report. I can't stay in the village for too long. I want to see you before leaving. One side. Selena's face turned red. Her lake blue eyes were full of sweetness, and there was a faint smile on her lips. Just when Selena was looking at Soldak affectionately, she heard a timid voice beside her whisper. Soldak, can you lend me this picture album to take a look at? Soldak glanced down and realized that what little Signa was holding was the black magician Cyrus, the magical notes left by Hickok. He didn't even know when he had put this magic notebook in his magic pocket. He couldn't bear to refuse the sensible, well-behaved and timid Signa. He reached out and touched Signa's head and told her, This is not an ordinary picture album. This is the notes of a very powerful magician. The illustrations inside are some magic patterns. If you look at these patterns if you feel dizzy, be sure to stop. Otherwise the magic backlash will cause some damage to your spiritual world. You still have a chance to awaken the magic pool when you are 12 years old. Before that, you cannot be too careful. I know. Little Signa smiled sweetly at Soldak. This time, Soldak and Selina didn't just roll into bed eagerly after meeting. Signa sat next to the small wooden table in the room and looked through the magic notes. The book turned to the last page. Celia Cooper secretly rolled her eyes at Signa and gave the girl a stiff smile. She wanted to tell Soldak how the little devil in front of her treated her. But when he thought of the oath he was forced to make, he quickly and subconsciously closed his mouth. Serdak and Selina chatted about some stories about what happened in the winter in Alinsa and some experiences in Wazamala City. And Selina listened with interest when she heard that Marquis Luther had written a letter of recommendation for Soldak. Selina covered her mouth in surprise and said, So, it's possible for you to be promoted to a noble? Soldak held Selina's soft hand and said, There's probably some chance that it's because I can sense magical elements with divine attributes. 
Selena pursed her lips and smiled, put her hand on his face and rubbed it. The Lord recommended you to become a noble. I am afraid that he will regard you as a confidant in the future. In order to further strengthen the relationship between you, I will inevitably give you a noble lady in the future. Soldak was slightly startled. I already have a wife. Isn't it? Selina smiled and said nothing. Serdak lay half on Selina's round and elastic thighs, looked up at her delicate face, and asked her, Would you like to go to Alensa City with me? Selina didn't expect that Serdak would actually send such an invitation. She was slightly startled, then smiled and said, Me? Forget it. Maybe I will go and see if I have the opportunity in the future. But not now. I'm afraid it will cause unnecessary trouble. Besides, I'm really enjoying my life here. So why would I take the risk to go to Holanza City? Seeing Selena's refusal, Saldek said no more. The two chatted like this for a while before reluctantly leaving Selena's residence, walking on the gravel road in the village, with a cool night breeze blowing on his face. Serdak unexpectedly had many feelings. When he just woke up from the battlefield, Serdak often thought about the meaning of his life in this strange world. Later, his first change of mind was when he followed the second team to the battlefield. At that time, he felt that fighting beside his companions was the meaning of life. Later, I felt that living in a small rural village and living an ordinary life might be the meaning of life. When Soldak stepped into Wall Village, he met old Sheila, Rita, Natasha and little Peter. It has become that giving a better life to the family is the meaning of life. And now Soldak feels that the value of his existence is to bring a prosperous life to the entire Wall Village. He raised his head and looked at the starry night sky. His young and handsome face seemed to be smiling and waving at him in the night sky. Then it turned into countless stars and dissipated in the night sky.